This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Part 2, Chapter 11. Winter arrived with the month of June, which is the December of the northern zones, and the great business was the making of warm and solid clothing. The musmons in the corral had been stripped of their wool, and this precious textile material was now to be transformed into stuff. Of course Cyrus Harding, having at his disposal neither carters, combers, polishers, stretchers, twisters, mule jenny, nor self-acting machine to spin the wool, nor loom to weave it, was obliged to proceed in a simpler way, so as to do without spinning and weaving. And indeed he proposed to make use of the property which the filaments of wool possess when subjected to a powerful pressure of mixing together, and of manufacturing by this simple process the material called felt. This felt could then be obtained by a simple operation which, if it diminished the flexibility of the stuff, increased its power of retaining heat in proportion. Now the wool furnished by the musmons was composed of very short hairs, and was in a good condition to be felted. The engineer, aided by his companions, including Pencroft, who was once more obliged to leave his boat, commenced the preliminary operations, the subject of which was to remove the wool of that fat and oily substance with which it is impregnated, and which is called grease. This cleaning was done in vats filled with water, which was maintained at the temperature of seventy degrees, and in which the wool was soaked for four and twenty hours. It was then thoroughly washed in baths of soda, and, when sufficiently dried by pressure, it was in a state to be compressed, that is to say, to produce a solid material, rough, no doubt, and such as would have no value in a manufacturing centre of Europe or America, but which would be highly esteemed in the Lincoln Island markets. This sort of material must have been known from the most ancient times, and in fact the first woolen stuffs were manufactured by the process which Harding was now about to employ. Where Harding's engineering qualifications now came into play was in the construction of the machine for pressing the wool, for he knew how to turn ingeniously to profit the mechanical force, hitherto unused, which the waterfall on the beach possessed to move a fulling mill. Nothing could be more rudimentary. The wool was placed in troughs, and upon it fell in turns heavy wooden mallets. Such was the machine in question, and such it had been for centuries until the time when the mallets were replaced by cylinders of compression, and the material was no longer subjected to beating, but to regular rolling. The operation, ably directed by Cyrus Harding, was a complete success. The wool, previously impregnated with a solution of soap, intended on the one hand to facilitate the inner lacing, the compression and the softening of the wool, and on the other to prevent its diminution by the beating, issued from the mill in the shape of thick felt cloth. The roughnesses with which the staple of wool is naturally filled were so thoroughly entangled and interlaced together that a material was formed equally suitable either for garments or bedclothes. It was certainly neither merino, muslin, cashmere, rep, satin, alpaca, cloth, nor flannel. It was Lincolnian felt, and Lincoln Island possessed yet another manufacture. The colonists had now warm garments and thick bedclothes, and they could without fear await the approach of the winter of 1866-67. The severe coal began to be felt about the 20th of June and, to his great regret, Pencroft was obliged to suspend his boat-building, which he hoped to finish in time for next spring. The sailor's great idea was to make a voyage of discovery to Tabor Island. Although Harding could not approve of a voyage simply for curiosity's sake, for there was evidently nothing to be found on this desert and almost arid rock, a voyage of a hundred and fifty miles in a comparatively small vessel, over unknown seas, could not but cause him some anxiety. Suppose that their vessel, once out at sea, should be unable to reach Tabor Island, and could not return to Lincoln Island, what would become of her in the midst of the Pacific, so fruitful of disasters? Harding often talked over this project with Pencroft, 
and he found him strangely bent upon undertaking this voyage, for which determination he himself could give no sufficient reason. Now, said the engineer one day to him, I must observe, my friend, that after having said so much in praise of Lincoln Island, after having spoken so often of the sorrow you would feel if you were obliged to forsake it, you are the first to wish to leave it. Only to leave it for a few days, replied Pencroft. Only for a few days, Captain. Time to go and come back, and see what that island is like. But it is not nearly as good as Lincoln Island. I know that beforehand. Then why venture there? To know what is going on in Tabor Island. But nothing is going on there. Nothing could happen there. Who knows? And if you are caught in a hurricane? There's no fear of that in the fine season, replied Pencroft. But, Captain, as we must provide against everything, I shall ask your permission to take Herbert only with me on this voyage. Pencroft, replied the engineer, placing his hand on the sailor's shoulder, if any misfortune happens to you, or to this lad, whom chance has made our child, do you think we could ever cease to blame ourselves? Captain Harding, replied Pencroft, with unshaken confidence, we shall not cause you that sorrow. Besides, we will speak further of this voyage when the time comes to make it. And I fancy, when you have seen our tight-rigged little craft, when you have observed how she behaves at sea, when we sail round our island, for we will do so together, I fancy, I say, that you will no longer hesitate to let me go. I don't conceal from you that your boat will be a masterpiece. Say, our boat, at least, Pencroft, replied the engineer, disarmed for the moment. The conversation ended thus, to be resumed later on, without convincing either the sailor or the engineer. The first snow fell towards the end of the month of June. The corral had previously been largely supplied with stores, so that daily visits to it were not requisite. But it was decided that more than a week should never be allowed to pass without someone going to it. Traps were again set, and the machines manufactured by Harding were tried. The bent whalebones, imprisoned in a case of ice, and covered with a thick outer layer of fat, were placed on the border of the forest at a spot where animals usually passed on their way to the lake. To the engineer's great satisfaction, this invention, copied from the Aleutian fishermen, succeeded perfectly. A dozen foxes, a few wild boars, and even a jaguar were taken in this way the animals being found dead, their stomachs pierced by the unbent bones. An incident here must be related, not only as interesting in itself, but because it was the first attempt made by the colonists to communicate with the rest of mankind. Gideon Spilett had already several times pondered whether to throw into the sea a letter enclosed in a bottle, which currents might perhaps carry to an inhabited coast, or to confide it to pigeons. But how could it be seriously hoped that either pigeons or bottles could cross the distance of twelve hundred miles, which separated the island from any inhabited land? It would have been pure folly. But on the 30th of June the capture was effected, not without difficulty, of an albatross, which a shot from Herbert's gun had slightly wounded in the foot. It was a magnificent bird, measuring ten feet from wing to wing and which could traverse seas as wide as the Pacific. Herbert would have liked to keep this superb bird, as its wound would soon heal, and he thought he could tame it. But Spilett explained to him that he should not neglect this opportunity of attempting to communicate by this messenger with the lands of the Pacific, for if the albatross had come from some inhabited region, there was no doubt but that it would return there so soon as it was set free. Perhaps in his heart Gideon Spilett, in whom the journalist sometimes came to the surface, was not sorry to have the opportunity of sending forth to take its chance an exciting article relating the adventures of the settlers in Lincoln Island. What a success for the authorized reporter of the New York Herald, and for the number which should contain the article, if it should ever reach the address of its editor, the Honorable James Bennett. Gideon Spilett then wrote out a concise account, which was placed in a strong waterproof bag, 
with an earnest request to whoever might find it, to forward it to the office of the New York Herald. This little bag was fastened to the neck of the albatross, and not to its foot, for these birds are in the habit of resting on the surface of the sea. Then liberty was given to this swift courier of the air, and it was not without some emotion that the colonists watched it disappear in the misty west. "'Where is he going to?' asked Pencroft. "'Towards New Zealand,' replied Herbert. "'A good voyage to you!' shouted the sailor, who himself did not expect any great result from this mode of correspondence. With the winter, work had been resumed in the interior of Granite House, mending clothes and different occupations, among others making the sails for their vessel, which were cut from the inexhaustible balloon case. During the month of July the cold was intense, but there was no lack of either wood or coal. Cyrus Harding had established a second fireplace in the dining-room, and there the long winter evenings were spent. Talking while they worked, reading when the hands remained idle, the time passed with profit to all. It was real enjoyment to the settlers when in their room, well lighted with candles, well warmed with coal, after a good dinner, elderberry coffee smoking in the cups, the pipes giving forth an odoriferous smoke, they could hear the storm howling without. Their comfort would have been complete, if complete comfort could ever exist for those who are far from their fellow-creatures, and without any means of communication with them. They often talked of their country, of the friends whom they had left, of the grandeur of the American Republic, whose influence could not but increase. And Cyrus Harding, who had been much mixed up with the affairs of the Union, greatly interested his auditors by his recitals, his views, and his prognostics. It chanced one day that Spilett was led to say, "'But now, my dear Cyrus, all this industrial and commercial movement to which you predict a continual advance, does it not run the danger of being sooner or later completely stopped?' "'Stopped? And by what?' "'By the want of coal, which may justly be called the most precious of minerals.' "'Yes, the most precious, indeed,' replied the engineer. "'And it would seem that nature wished to prove that it was so, by making the diamond, which is simply pure carbon crystallized.' "'You don't mean to say, Captain,' interrupted Pencroft, "'that we burn diamonds in our stoves in the shape of coal?' <laughs> "'No, my friend,' replied Harding. "'However,' resumed Gideon Spilett, you do not deny that some day the coal will be entirely consumed? Oh, the veins of coal are still considerable, and the hundred thousand miners who annually extract from them a hundred millions of hundred weights have not nearly exhausted them. With the continuing consumption of coal, replied Gideon Spilett, it can be foreseen that the hundred thousand workmen will soon become two hundred thousand, and that the rate of extraction will be doubled. Doubtless, but after the European mines, which will be soon worked more thoroughly with new machines, the American and Australian mines will for a long time yet provide for the consumption in trade. "'For how long a time?' asked the reporter. "'For at least two hundred and fifty or three hundred years.' "'That is reassuring for us, but a bad lookout for our great-grandchildren,' observed Pencroft. They will discover something else, said Herbert. It is to be hoped so, answered Spilett, for without coal there would be no machinery, and without machinery there would be no railways, no steamers, no manufactories, nothing of that which is indispensable to modern civilization. But what will they find? asked Pencroft. Can you guess, Captain? Nearly, my friend. And what will they burn instead of coal? Water replied Harding. Water! cried Pencroft. Water is fuel for steamers and engines? Water to heat water? Yes, but water decomposed into its primitive elements, replied Cyrus Harding, and decomposed doubtless by electricity, which will then have become a powerful and manageable force, for all great discoveries, by some inexplicable law, appear to agree and become complete at the same time. Yes, my friends, 
I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, of an intensity of which coal is not capable. Some day the coal rooms of steamers and the tenders of locomotives will, instead of coal, be stored with these two condensed gases, which will burn in the furnaces with enormous calorific power. There is therefore nothing to fear. As long as the earth is inhabited, it will supply the wants of its inhabitants, and there will be no want of either light or heat, as long as the productions of the vegetable, mineral, or animal kingdoms do not fail us. I believe, then, that when the deposits of coal are exhausted, we shall heat and warm ourselves with water. Water will be the coal of the future. I should like to see that, observed the sailor. You were born too soon, Pencroft, returned Neb, who only took part in the discussion by these words. However, it was not Neb's speech which interrupted the conversation, but Top's barking which broke out again with that strange intonation which had before perplexed the engineer. At the same time Top began to run round the mouth of the well, which opened at the extremity of the interior passage. "'What can Top be barking in that way for?' asked Pencroft. "'And Jup be growling like that,' added Herbert. In fact, the orang, joining the dog, gave unequivocal signs of agitation and, singular to say, the two animals appeared more uneasy than angry. "'It is evident,' said Gideon Spilett, "'that this well is in direct communication with the sea, and that some marine animal comes from time to time to breathe at the bottom.' "'That's evident,' replied the sailor, "'and there can be no other explanation to give. Quiet there, Top,' added Pencroft, turning to the dog, "'and you, Jupe, be off to your room.' The ape and the dog were silent. Jupe went off to bed, but Top remained in the room, and continued to utter low growls at intervals during the rest of the evening. There was no further talk on the subject, but the incident, however, clouded the brow of the engineer. During the remainder of the month of July there was alternate rain and frost. The temperature was not so low as during the preceding winter, and its maximum did not exceed eight degrees Fahrenheit. But although this winter was less cold, it was more troubled by storms and squalls. The sea, besides, often endangered the safety of the chimneys. At times it almost seemed as if an undercurrent raised these monstrous billows which thundered against the wall of Granite House. When the settlers, leaning from their windows, gazed on the huge watery masses breaking beneath their eyes, they could not but admire the magnificent spectacle of the ocean in its impotent fury. The waves rebounded in dazzling foam, the beach entirely disappearing under the raging flood, and the cliff appearing to emerge from the sea itself, the spray rising to a height of more than a hundred feet. During these storms it was difficult and even dangerous to venture out, owing to the frequently falling trees. However, the colonists never allowed a week to pass without having paid a visit to the corral. Happily, this enclosure, sheltered by the southeastern spur of Mount Franklin, did not greatly suffer from the violence of the hurricanes, which spared its trees, sheds, and palisades. But the poultry yard on Prospect Heights, being directly exposed to the gusts of wind from the east, suffered considerable damage. The pigeon house was twice unroofed, and the paling blown down. All this required to be remade more solidly than before, for, as may be clearly seen, Lincoln Island was situated in one of the most dangerous parts of the Pacific. It really appeared as if it formed the central point of vast cyclones, which beat it perpetually as the whip does the top. Only here it was the top which was motionless, and the whip which moved. During the first week of the month of August, the weather became more moderate, and the atmosphere recovered the calm which it appeared to have lost forever. With the calm the cold again became intense, and the thermometer fell to eight degrees Fahrenheit below zero. 
on the third of august an excursion which had been talked of for several days was made into the southeastern part of the island towards tadorn marsh the hunters were tempted by the aquatic game which took up their winter quarters there wild duck snipe teal and grebe abounded there and it was agreed that a day should be devoted to an expedition against these birds not only gideon spilett and herbert but Pencroft and Neb also took part in this excursion. Cyrus Harding alone, alleging some work as an excuse, did not join them, but remained at Granite House. The hunters proceeded in the direction of Port Balloon, in order to reach the marsh, after having promised to be back by the evening. Top and Jup accompanied them. As soon as they had passed over the Mercy Bridge, the engineer raised it and returned, intending to put into execution a project for the performance of which he wished to be alone. Now this project was to minutely explore the interior well, the mouth of which was on a level with the passage of Granite House, and which communicated with the sea, since it formerly supplied a way to the waters of the lake. Why did Top so often run around this opening? Why did he utter such strange barks, when a sort of uneasiness seemed to draw him towards this well. Why did Jupe join Top in a sort of common anxiety? Had this well branches besides the communication with the sea? Did it spread towards other parts of the island? This is what Cyrus Harding wished to know. He had resolved, therefore, to attempt the exploration of the well during the absence of his companions, and an opportunity for doing so had now presented itself. It was easy to descend to the bottom of the well by employing the rope-ladder, which had not been used since the establishment of the lift. The engineer drew the ladder to the hole, the diameter of which measured nearly six feet, and allowed it to unroll itself after having securely fastened its upper extremity. Then, having lighted a lantern, taken a revolver, and placed a cutlass in his belt, he began the descent. The sides were everywhere entire, but points of rock jutted out here and there, and by means of these points it would have been quite possible for an active creature to climb to the mouth of the well. The engineer remarked this, but although he carefully examined these points by the light of his lantern, he could find no impression, no fracture which could give any reason to suppose that they had either recently or at any former time been used as a staircase. Cyrus Harding descended deeper, throwing the light of his lantern on all sides. He saw nothing suspicious. When the engineer had reached the last rounds he came upon the water, which was then perfectly calm. Neither at its level nor in any other part of the well did any passage open which could lead to the interior of the cliff. The wall which Harding struck with the hilt of his cutlass sounded solid. It was compact granite, through which no living being could force a way. To arrive at the bottom of the well and then climb up to its mouth, it was necessary to pass through the channel under the rocky subsoil of the beach, which placed it in communication with the sea, and this was only possible for marine animals. As to the question of knowing where this channel ended, at what point of the shore, and at what depth beneath the water, it could not be answered. Then Cyrus Harding, having ended his survey, reascended, drew up the ladder, covered the mouth of the well, and returned thoughtfully to the dining-room, saying to himself, I have seen nothing, and yet there is something there. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Twelve. In the evening, the hunters returned, having enjoyed good sport and being literally loaded with game. 
Indeed, they had as much as four men could possibly carry. Top wore a necklace of teal, and Jupe wreaths of snipe round his body. "'Here, master,' cried Neb, "'here's something to employ our time. Preserved and made into pies, we shall have a welcome store. But I must have someone to help me. I count on you, Pencroft.' "'No, Neb,' replied the sailor. "'I have the rigging of the vessel to finish and to look after, and you will have to do without me.' "'And you, Mr. Herbert?' "'I must go to the corral to-morrow, Neb,' replied the lad. "'It will be you, then, Mr. Spilett, who will help me?' "'To oblige you, Neb, I will,' replied the reporter. "'But I warn you that if you disclose your recipes to me, I shall publish them.' "'Whenever you like, Mr. Spilett,' replied Neb. "'Whenever you like.' And so the next day Gideon Spilett became Neb's assistant, and was installed in his culinary laboratory. The engineer had previously made known to him the result of the exploration which he had made the day before, and on this point the reporter shared Harding's opinion, that although he had found nothing, a secret still remained to be discovered. The frost continued for another week and the settlers did not leave Granite House unless to look after the poultry-yard. The dwelling was filled with appetizing odors, which were emitted from the learned manipulation of Neb and the reporter. But all the results of the chase were not made into preserved provisions, and as the game kept perfectly in the intense cold, wild duck and other fowl were eaten fresh, and declared superior to all other aquatic birds in the known world. During this week, Pencroft, aided by Herbert, who handled the sailmaker's needle with much skill, worked with such energy that the sails of the vessel were finished. There was no want of cordage. Thanks to the rigging which had been discovered with the case of the balloon, the ropes and cables from the net were all of good quality, and the sailor turned them all to account. To the sails were attached strong bolt ropes and there still remained enough from which to make the halyards, shrouds, and sheets, etc. The blocks were manufactured by Cyrus Harding under Pencroft's directions by means of the turning lathe. It therefore happened that the rigging was entirely prepared before the vessel was finished. Pencroft also manufactured a flag, that flag so dear to every true American, containing the stars and stripes of their glorious union. The colors for it were supplied from certain plants used in dyeing, and which were very abundant in the island. Only to the thirty-seven stars, representing the thirty-seven states of the Union, which shine on the American flag, the sailor added a thirty-eighth, the star of the state of Lincoln, for he considered his island as already united to the great republic. And, said he, it is so already in heart, if not in deed. In the meantime, the flag was hoisted at the central window of Granite House, and the settlers saluted it with three cheers. The cold season was now almost at an end, and it appeared as if this second winter was to pass without any unusual occurrence, when on the night of the 11th of August the plateau of Prospect Heights was menaced with complete destruction. After a busy day the colonists were sleeping soundly, when towards four o'clock in the morning they were suddenly awakened by Top's barking. The dog was not this time barking near the mouth of the well, but at the threshold of the door, at which he was scratching, as if he wished to burst it open. Jupe was also uttering piercing cries. "'Hello, Top!' cried Neb, who was the first awake. But the dog continued to bark more furiously than ever. "'What's the matter now?' asked Harding and all, dressing in haste, rushed to the windows, which they opened. Beneath their eyes was spread a sheet of snow which looked grey in the dim light. The settlers could see nothing, but they heard a singular yelping noise away in the darkness. It was evident that the beach had been invaded by a number of animals which could not be seen. "'What are they?' cried Pencroft. "'Wolves, jaguars, or apes?' replied Neb. They have nearly reached the plateau, said the reporter. And our poultry yard, exclaimed Herbert, and our garden. Where can they have crossed? asked Pencroft. They must have crossed the bridge on the shore, replied the engineer, which one of us must have forgotten to close. 
True, said Spilett. I remember having left it open. A fine job you've made of it, Mr. Spilett, cried the sailor. What is done cannot be undone, replied Cyrus Harding. We must consult what it will now be best to do. Such were the questions and answers which were rapidly exchanged between Harding and his companions. It was certain that the bridge had been crossed, that the shore had been invaded by animals, and that whatever they might be, they could, by ascending the left bank of the Mercy, reach Prospect Heights. They must therefore be advanced against quickly and fought with, if necessary. "'But what are these beasts?' was asked a second time, as the yelpings were again heard more loudly than before. These yelps made Herbert start, and he remembered having heard them before during his first visit to the sources of the Red Creek. "'They are Colpios! Foxes!' he exclaimed. "'Forward!' shouted the sailor. And all arming themselves with hatchets, carbines, and revolvers, threw themselves into the lift and soon set foot on the shore. Colpios are dangerous animals when in great numbers and irritated by hunger. Nevertheless, the colonists did not hesitate to throw themselves into the midst of the troop, and their first shots, vividly lighting up the darkness, made their assailants draw back. The chief thing was to hinder these plunderers from reaching the plateau, for the garden and the poultry-yard would then have been at their mercy. An immense, perhaps irreparable mischief, would inevitably be the result especially with regard to the cornfield. But as the invasion of the plateau could only be made by the left bank of the Mercy, it was sufficient to oppose the Colpios on the narrow bank between the river and the cliff of granite. This was plain to all, and by Cyrus Harding's orders they reached the spot indicated by him, while the Colpios rushed fiercely through the gloom. Harding, Gideon Spilett, Herbert, Pencroft, and Neb posted themselves in impregnable line. Top, his formidable jaws open, preceded the colonists, and he was followed by Jupe, armed with knotty cudgel, which he brandished like a club. The night was extremely dark. It was only by the flashes from the revolvers as each person fired that they could see their assailants, who were at least a hundred in number, and whose eyes were glowing like hot coals. "'They must not pass!' shouted Pencroft. They shall not pass, returned the engineer. But if they did not pass, it was not for want of having attempted it. Those in the rear pushed on the foremost assailants, and it was an incessant struggle with revolvers and hatchets. Several Colpios already lay dead on the ground, but their number did not appear to diminish, and it might have been supposed that reinforcements were continually arriving over the bridge. The colonists were soon obliged to fight at close quarters, not without receiving some wounds, although happily very slight ones. Herbert had, with a shot from his revolver, rescued Neb, on whose back a colpio had sprung like a tiger-cat. Top fought with actual fury, flying at the throats of the foxes and strangling them instantaneously. Jupe wielded his weapon valiantly, and it was in vain that they endeavoured to keep him in the rear. Endowed, doubtless with sight, which enabled him to pierce the obscurity, he was always in the thick of the fight, uttering from time to time a sharp hissing sound, which was with him the sign of great rejoicing. At one moment he advanced so far, that by the light from a revolver he was seen surrounded by five or six large colpios, with whom he was coping with great coolness. However, the struggle was ended at last and victory was on the side of the settlers, but not until they had fought for two long hours. The first signs of the approach of day doubtless determined the retreat of their assailants, who scampered away towards the north, passing over the bridge, which Neb ran immediately to raise. When day had sufficiently lighted up the field of battle, the settlers counted as many as fifty dead bodies scattered about on the shore. "'And Jupe!' cried Pencroft. Where is Jupe? Jupe had disappeared. His friend Neb called him, and for the first time Jupe did not reply to his friend's call. Everyone set out in search of Jupe, trembling lest he should be found among the slain. They cleared the place of the bodies which stained the snow with their blood. 
Jupe was found in the midst of a heap of colpios whose broken jaws and crushed bodies show that they had to do with the terrible club of the intrepid animal. Poor Jupe still held in his hand the stump of his broken cudgel, but deprived of his weapon he had been overpowered by numbers, and his chest was covered with severe wounds. "'He is living!' cried Neb, who was bending over him. "'And we will save him!' replied the sailor. "'We will nurse him as if he was one of ourselves.' It appeared as if Jupe understood, for he leaned his head on Pencroft's shoulder as if to thank him. The sailor was wounded himself, but his wound was insignificant, as were those of his companions, for thanks to their firearms they had been almost always able to keep their assailants at a distance. It was therefore only the orang whose condition was serious. Jupe, carried by Neb and Pencroft, was placed in the lift, and only a slight moan now and then escaped his lips. He was gently drawn up to Granite House. There he was laid on a mattress taken from one of the beds, and his wounds were bathed with the greatest care. It did not appear that any vital part had been reached, but Jupe was very weak from loss of blood, and a high fever soon set in after his wounds had been dressed. He was laid down. Strict diet was imposed. Just like a real person, as Neb said, and they made him swallow several cups of a cooling drink, for which the ingredients were supplied from the vegetable medicine chest of Granite House. Jupe was at first restless, but his breathing gradually became more regular, and he was left sleeping quietly. From time to time Top, walking on tiptoe, as one might say, came to visit his friend, and seemed to approve of all the care that had been taken of him. One of Jupe's hands hung over the side of his bed, and Top licked it with a sympathizing air. They employed the day in interring the dead, who were dragged to the forest of the far west, and there buried deep. This attack, which might have had such serious consequences, was a lesson to the settlers, who from this time never went to bed until one of their number had made sure that all the bridges were raised, and that no invasion was possible. However, Jupe, after having given them serious anxiety for several days, began to recover. His constitution brought him through. The fever gradually subsided, and Gideon Spilett, who was a bit of a doctor, pronounced him quite out of danger. On the 16th of August Jupe began to eat. Neb made him nice little sweet dishes, which the invalid devoured with great relish, for if he had a pet failing it was that of being somewhat of a gourmand, and Neb had never done anything to cure him of this fault. "'What would you have?' said he to Gideon Spilett, who sometimes expostulated with him for spoiling the ape. "'Poor Jupe has no other pleasure than that of the palate, and I am only too glad to be able to reward his services in this way.' Ten days after having taken to his bed, on the twenty-first of August, Master Jupe arose. His wounds were healed, and it was evident that he would not be long in regaining his usual strength and agility. Like all convalescents, he was tremendously hungry, and the reporter allowed him to eat as much as he liked, for he trusted to that instinct, which is too often wanting in reasoning beings, to keep the orang from any excess. Neb was delighted to see his pupil's appetite returning. "'Eat away, my Jupe!' said he, and don't spare anything. You have shed your blood for us, and it is the least I can do to make you strong again. On the 25th of August, Neb's voice was heard calling to his companions, Captain, Mr. Spilett, Mr. Herbert, Pencroft, come, come. The colonists who were together in the dining room rose at Neb's call, who was then in Jupe's room. What's the matter? asked the reporter. Look! replied Neb, with a shout of laughter. And what did they see? Master Jupe, smoking calmly and seriously, sitting cross-legged like a Turk at the entrance to Granite House. "'My pipe!' cried Pencroft. "'He has taken my pipe!' "'Hello, my honest Jupe. I make you a present of it. Smoke away, old boy, smoke away!' And Jupe gravely puffed out clouds of smoke, which seemed to give him great satisfaction." 
Harding did not appear to be much astonished at this incident, and he cited several examples of tame apes, to whom the use of tobacco had become quite familiar. But from this day Master Jupe had a pipe of his own, the sailor's ex-pipe, which was hung in his room near his store of tobacco. He filled it himself, lighted it with a glowing coal, and appeared to be the happiest of quadrumana. It may readily be understood that this similarity of tastes of Jupe and Pencroft served to tighten the bonds of friendship which already existed between the honest ape and the worthy sailor. "'Perhaps he's really a man,' said Pencroft, sometimes to Neb. "'Should you be surprised to hear him beginning to speak to us some day?' "'My word, no!' replied Neb. "'What astonishes me is that he hasn't spoken to us before, for now he wants nothing but speech.' "'It would amuse me all the same.' resumed the sailor. "'Is some fine day,' he said to me. "'Suppose we change pipes, Pencroft?' "'Yes,' replied Neb. "'What a pity he was born dumb!' With the month of September the winter ended, and the works were again eagerly commenced. The building of the vessel advanced rapidly. She was already completely decked over, and all the inside parts of the hull, were firmly united with ribs bent by means of steam, which answered all the purposes of a mould. As there was no want of wood, Pencroft proposed to the engineer to give a double lining to the hull, to ensure the strength of the vessel. Harding, not knowing what the future might have in store for them, approved the sailor's idea of making the craft as strong as possible. The interior and deck of the vessel was entirely finished towards the 15th of September. For caulking the seams they made oakum of dry seaweed, which was hammered in between the planks. Then these seams were covered with boiling tar, which was obtained in great abundance from the pines in the forest. The management of the vessel was very simple. She had from the first been ballasted with heavy blocks of granite walled up in a bed of lime twelve thousand pounds of which they stowed away. A deck was placed over this ballast, and the interior was divided into two cabins, two benches extended along them, and served also as lockers. The foot of the mast supported the partition which separated the two cabins, which were reached by two hatchways let into the deck. Pencroft had no trouble in finding a tree suitable for the mast. He chose a straight young fir, with no knots, and which he had only to square at the step and round off at the top. The ironwork of the mast, the rudder, and the hull had been roughly but strongly forged at the chimneys. Lastly, yards, masts, boom, spars, oars, etc., were all finished by the first week in October and it was agreed that a trial trip should be taken round the island, so as to ascertain how the vessel would behave at sea, and how far they might depend upon her. During all this time the necessary works had not been neglected. The corral was enlarged, for the flock of musmons and goats had been increased by a number of young ones, who had to be housed and fed. The colonists had paid visits also to the oyster-bed, the warren, the coal and iron mines, and to the till then unexplored districts of the far west forest which abounded in game. Certain indigenous plants were discovered, and those fit for immediate use contributed to vary the vegetable stores of Granite House. They were a species of ficoide, some similar to those of the cape, with eatable fleshy leaves, others bearing seeds containing a sort of flower. On the 10th of October the vessel was launched. Pencroft was radiant with joy. The operation was perfectly successful. The boat completely rigged, having been pushed on rollers to the water's edge, was floated by the rising tide amid the cheers of the colonists, particularly of Pencroft, who showed no modesty on this occasion. Besides, his importance was to last beyond the finishing of the vessel, since, after having built her, he was to command her. The grade of captain was bestowed upon him with the approbation of all. To satisfy Captain Pencroft, it was now necessary to give a name to the vessel, and after many propositions had been discussed, 
the votes were all in favour of the Bonaventure. As soon as the Bonaventure had been lifted by the rising tide, it was seen that she lay evenly in the water, and would be easily navigated. However, the trial trip was to be made that very day, by an excursion off the coast. The weather was fine, the breeze fresh, and the sea smooth, especially towards the south coast, for the wind was blowing from the northwest. "'All hands on board!' shouted Pencroft, but breakfast was first necessary, and it was thought best to take provisions on board, in the event of their excursion being prolonged until the evening. Cyrus Harding was equally anxious to try the vessel, the model of which had originated with him, although on the sailor's advice he had altered some parts of it, but he did not share Pencroft's confidence in her, and as the latter had not again spoken of the voyage to Tabor Island, Harding hoped he had given it up. He would have indeed great reluctance in letting two or three of his companions venture so far in so small a boat which was not of more than fifteen tons burden. At half-past ten everybody was on board, even Top and Jupe, and Herbert weighed the anchor, which was fast in the sand near the mouth of the Mercy. The sail was hoisted, the Lincolnian flag floated from the masthead, and the Bonaventure, steered by Pencroft, stood out to sea. The wind blowing out of Union Bay, she ran before it and thus showed her owners, much to their satisfaction, that she possessed a remarkably fast pair of heels, according to Pencroft's mode of speaking. After having doubled Flotsam Point and Claw Cape, the captain kept her close-hauled, so as to sail along the southern coast of the island, when it was found she sailed admirably within five points of the wind. All hands were enchanted. They had a good vessel, which, in case of need, would be of great service to them, and with fine weather and a fresh breeze the voyage promised to be charming. Pencroft now stood off the shore, three or four miles across from Port Balloon. The island then appeared in all its extent, and under a new aspect, with the varied panorama of its shore from Claw Cape to Reptile End, the forests in which dark firs contrasted with the young foliage of other trees, and overlooked the whole and Mount Franklin, whose lofty head was still whitened with snow. "'How beautiful it is!' cried Herbert. "'Yes, our island is beautiful and good,' replied Pencroft. "'I love it as I love my poor mother. It received us poor and destitute, and now what is wanting for us five fellows who fell on it from the sky?' "'Nothing,' replied Neb. "'Nothing, Captain.' and the two brave men gave three tremendous cheers in honour of their island. During all this time Gideon Spilett, leaning against the mast, sketched the panorama which was developed before his eyes. Cyrus Harding gazed on it in silence. "'Well, Captain Harding,' asked Pencroft, "'what do you think of our vessel?' "'She appears to behave well,' replied the engineer. "'Good!' And do you think now that she could undertake a voyage of some extent? What voyage, Pencroft? One to Tabor Island, for instance. My friend, replied Harding, I think that in any pressing emergency we need not hesitate to trust ourselves to the Bonadventure even for a longer voyage. But you know I should see you set off to Tabor Island with great uneasiness, since nothing obliges you to go there. "'One likes to know one's neighbors,' returned the sailor, who was obstinate in his idea. "'Tabor Island is our neighbor, and the only one. Politeness requires us to go at least to pay a visit.' "'By Jove,' said Spilett, "'our friend Pencroft has become very particular about the proprieties all at once.' "'I am not particular about anything at all,' retorted the sailor, who was rather vexed by the engineer's opposition but who did not wish to cause him anxiety. "'Consider, Pencroft,' resumed Harding, "'you cannot go alone to Tabor Island. One companion will be enough for me.' "'Even so,' replied the engineer. "'You will risk depriving the colony of Lincoln Island of two settlers out of five. "'Out of six, replied Pencroft. "'You forget, Jupe.' "'Out of seven, added Neb. 
top is quite worth another. There is no risk at all in it, Captain, replied Pencroft. That is possible, Pencroft, but I repeat it is to expose ourselves uselessly. The obstinate sailor did not reply, and let the conversation drop, quite determined to resume it again. But he did not suspect that an incident would come to his aid and change into an act of humanity that which was at first only a doubtful whim. After standing off the shore, the Bonaventure again approached it in the direction of Port Balloon. It was important to ascertain the channels between the sandbanks and reefs, that buoys might be laid down, since this little creek was to be the harbour. They were not more than half a mile from the coast, and it was necessary to tack to beat against the wind. The Bonaventure was then going at a very moderate rate, as the breeze, partly intercepted by the high land, scarcely swelled her sails, and the sea, smooth as glass, was only rippled now and then by passing gusts. Herbert had stationed himself in the bows that he might indicate the course to be followed among the channels, when all at once he shouted, "'Luff, Pencroft! Luff!' "'What's the matter?' replied the sailor. "'A rock?' "'No. Wait,' said Herbert. "'I don't quite see. Luff again. Right now.' So saying, Herbert, leaning over the side, plunged his arm into the water, and pulled it out, exclaiming, "'A bottle!' He held in his hand a corked bottle, which he had just seized a few cables' length from the shore. Cyrus Harding took the bottle. Without uttering a single word he drew the cork, and took from it a damp paper, on which were written these words, "'Castaway, Tabor Island, 153 degrees west longitude, 37 degrees 11 minutes south latitude.'" End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Two, Chapter Thirteen A castaway! exclaimed Pencroft. Left on this Tabor Island not two hundred miles from us. Ah, Captain Harding, you won't now oppose my going. No, Pencroft, replied Cyrus Harding, and you shall set out as soon as possible. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. The engineer still held in his hand the paper which he had taken from the bottle. He contemplated it for some instants, then resumed. From this document, my friends, from the way in which it is worded, we may conclude this. First, that the castaway on Tabor Island is a man possessing a considerable knowledge of navigation, since he gives the latitude and longitude of the island exactly as we ourselves found it, and to a second of approximation. Secondly, that he is either English or American, as the document is written in the English language. "'That is perfectly logical,' answered Spilett. "'And the presence of this castaway explains the arrival of the case on the shores of our island. There must have been a wreck, since there is a castaway. As to the latter, whoever he may be, it is lucky for him that Pencroft thought of building this boat, and of trying her this very day.' for a day later, and this bottle might have been broken on the rocks. "'Indeed,' said Herbert, "'it is a fortunate chance that the Bonaventure passed exactly where the bottle was still floating.' "'Does this not appear strange to you?' asked Harding of Pencroft. "'It appears fortunate, that's all,' answered the sailor. "'Do you see anything extraordinary in it, Captain? The bottle must go somewhere, and why not here as well as anywhere else?' "'Perhaps you are right, Pencroft,' replied the engineer. "'And yet—' "'But,' observed Herbert, "'there's nothing to prove that this bottle has been floating long in the sea.' "'Nothing,' replied Gideon Spilett, "'and the document appears even to have been recently written. 
What do you think about it, Cyrus? During this conversation Pencroft had not remained inactive. He had put the vessel about, and the Bonaventure, all sails set, was running rapidly towards Claw Cape. Everyone was thinking of the castaway on Tabor Island. Should they be in time to save him? This was a great event in the life of the colonists. They themselves were but castaways, but it was to be feared that another might not have been so fortunate, and their duty was to go to his succour. Claw Cape was doubled, and about four o'clock the Bonaventure dropped her anchor at the mouth of the Mercy. That same evening the arrangements for the new expedition were made. It appeared best that Pencroft and Herbert, who knew how to work the vessel, should undertake the voyage alone. By setting out the next day, the 10th of October, they would arrive on the 13th, for with the present wind it would not take more than forty-eight hours to make this passage of a hundred and fifty miles. One day in the island, three or four to return, they might hope, therefore, that on the 17th they would again reach Lincoln Island. The weather was fine, the barometer was rising, the wind appeared settled. Everything then was in favour of these brave men whom an act of humanity was taking far from their island. Thus it had been agreed that Cyrus Harding, Neb, and Gideon Spilett should remain at Granite House. But an objection was raised, and Spilett, who had not forgotten his business as reporter to the New York Herald, Having declared that he would go by swimming rather than lose such an opportunity, he was admitted to take a part in the voyage. The evening was occupied in transporting on board the Bonaventure, articles of bedding, utensils, arms, ammunition, a compass, provisions for a week. This being rapidly done, the colonists ascended to Granite House. The next day, at five o'clock in the morning, the farewells were said not without some emotion on both sides, and Pencroft setting sail made towards Claw Cape, which had to be doubled in order to proceed to the southwest. The Bonaventure was already a quarter of a mile from the coast when the passengers perceived on the heights of Granite House two men waving their farewells. They were Cyrus Harding and Neb. "'Our friends,' exclaimed Spilett, "'this is our first separation in fifteen months.' Pencroft, the reporter, and Herbert waved in return, and Granite House soon disappeared behind the high rocks of the Cape. During the first part of the day the Bonaventure was still in sight of the southern coast of Lincoln Island, which soon appeared just like a green basket, with Mount Franklin rising from the centre. The heights, diminished by distance, did not present an appearance likely to tempt vessels to touch there. Reptile End was passed in about an hour, though at a distance of about ten miles. At this distance it was no longer possible to distinguish anything of the western coast, which stretched away to the ridges of Mount Franklin, and three hours after the last of Lincoln Island sank below the horizon. The Bonaventure behaved capitally. Bounding over the waves, she proceeded rapidly on her course. Pencroft had hoisted the foresail, and steering by the compass followed a rectilinear direction. From time to time Herbert relieved him at the helm, and the lad's hand was so firm that the sailor had not a point to find fault with. Gideon Spilett chatted sometimes with one, sometimes with the other. If wanted, he lent a hand with the ropes, and Captain Pencroft was perfectly satisfied with his crew. In the evening the crescent moon, which would not be in its first quarter until the sixteenth, appeared in the twilight, and soon set again. The night was dark but starry, and the next day again promised to be fine. Pencroft prudently lowered the foresail, not wishing to be caught by a sudden gust while carrying too much canvas. It was perhaps an unnecessary precaution on such a calm night, but Pencroft was a prudent sailor and cannot be blamed for it. The reporter slept part of the night. Pencroft and Herbert took turns for a spell of two hours each at the helm. The sailor trusted Herbert as he would himself, and his confidence was justified by the coolness and judgment of the lad. Pencroft gave him his directions as a commander to his steersman, and Herbert never allowed the Bonaventure to swerve even a point. 
The night passed quickly, as did the day of the 12th of October. A southeasterly direction was strictly maintained. Unless the Bonaventure fell in with some unknown current, she would come exactly within sight of Tabor Island. As to the sea over which the vessel was then sailing, it was absolutely deserted. Now and then a great albatross or frigate bird passed within gunshot, and Gideon Spilett wondered if it was to one of them that he had confided his last letter addressed to the New York Herald. These birds were the only beings that appeared to frequent this part of the ocean between Tabor and Lincoln Islands. "'And yet,' observed Herbert, "'this is the time that whalers usually proceed towards the southern part of the Pacific. Indeed, I do not think there could be a more deserted sea than this.' "'It is not quite so deserted as all that,' replied Pencroft. "'What do you mean?' asked the reporter. "'We are on it. Do you take our vessel for a wreck and us for porpoises?' And Pencroft laughed at his joke. By the evening, according to calculation, it was thought that the Bonaventure had accomplished a distance of a hundred and twenty miles since her departure from Lincoln Island, that is to say, in thirty-six hours, which would give her a speed of between three and four knots an hour. The breeze was very slight and might soon drop altogether. However, it was hoped that the next morning, by break of day, if the calculation had been correct and the course true, they would sight Tabor Island. Neither Gideon Spilett, Herbert, nor Pencroft slept that night. In the expectation of the next day they could not but feel some emotion. There was so much uncertainty in their enterprise. Were they near Tabor Island? Was the island still inhabited by the castaway to whose succour they had come? Who was this man? Would not his presence disturb the little colony, till then so united? Besides, would he be content to exchange his prison for another? All these questions, which would no doubt be answered the next day, kept them in suspense, and at the dawn of day they all fixed their gaze on the western horizon. "'Land!' shouted Pencroft, at about six o'clock in the morning and it was impossible that Pencroft should be mistaken. It was evident that land was there. Imagine the joy of the little crew of the Bonadventure. In a few hours they would land on the beach of the island. The low coast of Tabor Island, scarcely emerging from the sea, was not more than fifteen miles distant. The head of the Bonadventure, which was a little to the south of the island, was set directly towards it, and as the sun mounted in the east, its rays fell upon one or two headlands. "'This is a much less important isle than Lincoln Island,' observed Herbert, "'and is probably due like ours to some submarine convulsion.' At eleven o'clock the Bonadventure was not more than two miles off, and Pencroft, while looking for a suitable place at which to land, proceeded very cautiously through the unknown waters. The whole of the island could now be surveyed, and on it could be seen groups of gum and other large trees, of the same species as those growing on Lincoln Island. But the astonishing thing was that no smoke arose to show that the island was inhabited, no signal whatever appeared on the shore. And yet the document was clear enough, there was a castaway, and this castaway should have been on the watch. In the meanwhile, the Bonadventure entered the winding channels among the reefs, and Pencroft observed every turn with extreme care. He had put Herbert at the helm, posting himself in the bows, inspecting the water, while he held the halyard in his hand, ready to lower the sail at a moment's notice. Gideon Spilett with his glass eagerly scanned the shore, though without perceiving anything. However, at about twelve o'clock the keel of the Bonadventure grated on the bottom. The anchor was let go, the sails furled, and the crew of the little vessel landed. And there was no reason to doubt that this was Tabor Island, since according to the most recent charts there was no island in this part of the Pacific between New Zealand and the American coast. The vessel was securely moored, so that there should be no danger of her being carried away by the receding tide. Then Pencroft and his companions, well armed, ascended the shore, 
so as to gain an elevation of about two hundred and fifty or three hundred feet, which rose at a distance of half a mile. "'From the summit of that hill,' said Spilett, "'we can no doubt obtain a complete view of the island, which will greatly facilitate our search.' "'So as to do here,' replied Herbert, "'that which Captain Harding did the very first thing on Lincoln Island, by climbing Mount Franklin.' "'Exactly so,' answered the reporter, "'and it is the best plan.' While thus talking the explorers had advanced along a clearing which terminated at the foot of the hill. Flocks of rock-pigeons and sea-swallows, similar to those of Lincoln Island, fluttered around them. Under the woods which skirted the glade on the left they could hear the bushes rustling, and see the grass waving, which indicated the presence of timid animals but still nothing to show that the island was inhabited. Arrived at the foot of the hill, Pencroft, Spilett, and Herbert climbed it in a few minutes, and gazed anxiously round the horizon. They were on an islet, which did not measure more than six miles in circumference, its shape not much bordered by capes or promontories, bays or creeks, being a lengthened oval. All around the lonely sea extended to the limits of the horizon. No land nor even a sail was in sight. This woody islet did not offer the varied aspects of Lincoln Island, arid and wild in one part, but fertile and rich in the other. On the contrary, this was a uniform mass of verdure, out of which rose two or three hills of no great height. Obliquely to the oval of the island ran a stream through a wide meadow falling into the sea on the west by a narrow mouth. The domain is limited said Herbert. Yes, rejoined Pencroft. It would have been too small for us. And moreover, said the reporter, it appears to be uninhabited. Indeed, answered Herbert, nothing here betrays the presence of man. Let us go down, said Pencroft, and search. The sailor and his two companions returned to the shore, to the place where they had left the Bonadventure. They had decided to make the tour of the island on foot, before exploring the interior, so that not a spot should escape their investigations. The beach was easy to follow, and only in some places was their way barred by large rocks, which, however, they easily passed around. The explorers proceeded towards the south, disturbing numerous flocks of seabirds and herds of seals which threw themselves into the sea as soon as they saw the strangers at a distance. "'Those beasts yonder,' observed the reporter, "'do not see men for the first time. They fear them. Therefore they must know them.' An hour after their departure they arrived on the southern point of the islet, terminated by a sharp cape, and proceeded towards the north along the western coast, equally formed by sand and rocks the background bordered with thick woods. There was not a trace of a habitation in any part, not the print of a human foot on the shore of the island, which after four hours' walking had gone completely round. It was, to say the least, very extraordinary, and they were compelled to believe that Tabor Island was not, or was no longer, inhabited. Perhaps, after all, the document was already several months or several years old, and it was possible, in this case, either that the castaway had been enabled to return to his country, or that he had died of misery. Pencroft, Spilett, and Herbert, forming more or less probable conjectures, dined rapidly on board the Bonaventure, so as to be able to continue their excursion until nightfall. This was done at five o'clock in the evening, at which hour they entered the wood. Numerous animals fled at their approach, being principally, one might say, only goats and pigs, which were obviously European species. Doubtless some whaler had landed them on the island, where they had rapidly increased. Herbert resolved to catch one or two living, and take them back to Lincoln Island. It was no longer doubtful that men at some period or other had visited this islet, and this became still more evident when paths appeared trodden through the forest, felled trees, and everywhere traces of the hand of man. But the trees were becoming rotten, and had been felled many years ago. The marks of the axe were velveted with moss. 
and the grass grew long and thick on the paths, so that it was difficult to find them. But, observed Gideon Spilett, this not only proves that men have landed on the island, but also that they lived on it for some time. Now who were these men? How many of them remain? The document, said Herbert, only spoke of one castaway. Well, if he is still on the island, replied Pencroft, it is impossible but that we shall find him. The exploration was continued. The sailor and his companions naturally followed the route which cut diagonally across the island, and they were thus obliged to follow the stream which flowed towards the sea. If the animals of European origin, if works due to a human hand, showed incontestably that men had already visited the island, several specimens of the vegetable kingdom did not prove it less. In some places, in the midst of clearings, it was evident that the soil had been planted with culinary plants, at probably the same distant period. What, then, was Herbert's joy when he recognized potatoes, chicory, sorrel, carrots, cabbages, and turnips, of which it was sufficient to collect the seed to enrich the soil of Lincoln Island? "'Capital jolly!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'That will suit Neb as well as us. Even if we do not find the castaway, at least our voyage will not have been useless, and God will have rewarded us. Doubtless, replied Gideon Spilett, but to see the state in which we find these plantations, it is to be feared that the island has not been inhabited for some time. Indeed, answered Herbert, an inhabitant, whoever he was, could not have neglected such an important culture. Yes, said Pencroft, the castaway has gone. We must suppose so. It must then be admitted that the document has already a distant date? Evidently. And that the bottle only arrived at Lincoln Island after having floated in the sea a long time. Why not? returned Pencroft. But night is coming on, added he, and I think that it will be best to give up the search for the present. Let us go on board, and to-morrow we will begin again, said the reporter. This was the wisest course, and it was about to be followed, when Herbert, pointing to a confused mass among the trees, exclaimed, A hut! All three immediately ran towards the dwelling. In the twilight it was just possible to see that it was built of planks and covered with a thick tarpaulin. The half-closed door was pushed open by Pencroft, who entered with a rapid step. The hut was empty. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 2, Chapter 14 Pencroft, Herbert, and Gideon Spilett remained silent in the midst of the darkness. Pencroft shouted loudly. No reply was made. The sailor then struck a light and set fire to a twig. This lighted for a minute a small room, which appeared perfectly empty. At the back was a rude fireplace, with a few cold cinders, supporting an armful of dry wood. Pencroft threw the blazing twig on it, the wood crackled and gave forth a bright light. The sailor and his two companions then perceived a disordered bed, of which the damp and yellow coverlets proved that it had not been used for a long time. In the corner of the fireplace were two kettles, covered with rust, and an overthrown pot. A cupboard, with a few mouldy sailor's clothes. On the table a tin plate and a Bible, eaten away by damp. In a corner a few tools, a spade, pickaxe, two fowling pieces, one of which was broken. On a plank, forming a shelf, stood a barrel of powder, still untouched, a barrel of shot and several boxes of caps, all thickly covered with dust, accumulated perhaps by many long years. "'There's no one here,' said the reporter. "'No one,' replied Pencroft. 
"'It is a long time since this room has been inhabited,' observed Herbert. "'Yes, a very long time,' answered the reporter. "'Mr. Spillett,' then said Pencroft, "'instead of returning on board, I think it would be well to pass the night in this hut.' "'You are right, Pencroft,' answered Gideon Spillett. "'And if its owner returns well, perhaps he will not be sorry to find the place taken possession of.' "'He will not return.' said the sailor, shaking his head. "'You think that he has quitted the island?' asked the reporter. "'If he has quitted the island he would have taken away his weapons and his tools,' replied Pencroft. "'You know the value which castaways set on such articles as these, the last remains of a wreck?' "'No, no,' repeated the sailor, in a tone of conviction. "'No, he has not left the island. If he had escaped in a boat made by himself, he would still less have left these indispensable and necessary articles. No, he is on the island. Living? asked Herbert. Living or dead, but if he is dead, I suppose he has not buried himself, and so we shall at least find his remains. It was then agreed that the night should be passed in the deserted dwelling, and a store of wood found in a corner was sufficient to warm it. The door closed. Pencroft, Herbert, and Spilett remained there, seated on a bench, talking little but wondering much. They were in a frame of mind to imagine anything or expect anything. They listened eagerly for sounds outside. The door might be opened suddenly, and a man presented himself to them without their being in the least surprised, notwithstanding all that the hut revealed of abandonment, and they had their hands ready to press the hands of this man, this castaway, this unknown friend, for whom friends were waiting. But no voice was heard. The door did not open. The hours thus passed away. How long the night appeared to the sailor and his companions! Herbert alone slept for two hours, for at his age sleep is a necessity. They were all three anxious to continue their exploration of the day before, and to search the most secret recesses of the islet. The inferences deduced by Pencroft were perfectly reasonable, and it was nearly certain that, as the hut was deserted, and the tools, utensils, and weapons were still there, the owner had succumbed. It was agreed, therefore, that they should search for his remains, and give them at least Christian burial. Day dawned. Pencroft and his companions immediately proceeded to survey the dwelling. It had certainly been built in a favourable situation at the back of a little hill, sheltered by five or six magnificent gum-trees. Before its front and through the trees the axe had prepared a wide clearing, which allowed the view to extend to the sea. Beyond a lawn, surrounded by a wooden fence falling to pieces, was the shore, on the left of which was the mouth of the stream. The hut had been made of planks and it was easy to see that these planks had been obtained from the hull or deck of a ship. It was probable that a disabled vessel had been cast on the coast of the island, that one at least of the crew had been saved, and that by means of the wreck this man, having tools at his disposal, had built the dwelling. And this became still more evident when Gideon Spillett, after having walked around the hut, saw on a plank probably one of those which had formed the armour of the wrecked vessel, these letters already half effaced, B-R, space, T-A-N, more space, A. Britannia! exclaimed Pencroft, whom the reporter had called. It is a common name for ships, and I could not say if she was English or American. It matters very little, Pencroft. Very little, indeed, answered the sailor and we will save the survivor of her crew, if he is still living, to whatever country he may belong. But before beginning our search again, let us go on board the Bonaventure. A sort of uneasiness had seized Pencroft upon the subject of his vessel. Should the island be inhabited after all? And should some one have taken possession of her? But he shrugged his shoulders at such an unreasonable supposition. At any rate, the sailor was not sorry to go to breakfast on board, the road already trodden was not long, scarcely a mile. They set out on their walk, gazing into the wood and thickets through which goats and pigs fled in hundreds. Twenty minutes after leaving the hut, Pencroft and his companions 
reached the western coast of the island, and saw the Bonadventure held fast by her anchor, which was buried deep in the sand. Pencroft could not restrain a sigh of satisfaction. After all, this vessel was his child, and it is the right of fathers to be often uneasy when there is no occasion for it. They returned on board, breakfasted, so that it should not be necessary to dine until very late. Then the repast being ended, the exploration was continued and conducted with the most minute care. Indeed, it was very probable that the only inhabitant of the island had perished. It was therefore more for the traces of a dead than of a living man that Pencroft and his companions searched. But their searches were vain, and during the half of that day they sought to no purpose among the thickets of trees which covered the islet. There was then scarcely any doubt that, if the castaway was dead, no trace of his body now remained, but that some wild beast had probably devoured it to the last bone. "'We will set off to-morrow at daybreak,' said Pencroft to his two companions, as about two o'clock they were resting for a few minutes under the shade of a clump of firs. "'I should think that we might, without scruple, take the utensils which belong to the castaway,' added Herbert. "'I think so, too,' returned Gideon Spilett. "'And these arms and tools will make up the stores of Granite House. The supply of powder and shot is also most important.' "'Yes,' replied Pencroft. But we must not forget to capture a couple or two of these pigs, of which Lincoln Island is destitute. Nor to gather those seeds, added Herbert, which will give us all the vegetables of the old and the new worlds. Then perhaps it would be best, said the reporter, to remain a day longer on Tabor Island, so as to collect all that may be useful to us. No, Mr. Spilett, answered Pencroft, I will ask you to set off to-morrow at daybreak. The wind seems to me to be likely to shift to the west, and after having had a fair wind for coming, we shall have a fair wind for going back. Then do not let us lose time, said Herbert, rising. We won't waste time, returned Pencroft. You, Herbert, go and gather the seeds, which you know better than we do. While you do that, Mr. Spillett and I will go and have a pig hunt, and even without top I hope we shall manage to catch a few. Herbert accordingly took the path which led towards the cultivated part of the islet, while the sailor and the reporter entered the forest. Many specimens of the porcine race fled before them, and these animals, which were singularly active, did not appear to be in a humour to allow themselves to be approached. However, after an hour's chase, the hunters had just managed to get hold of a couple lying in a thicket, when cries were heard resounding from the north part of the island, where the cries were mingled terrible yells, in which there was nothing human. Pencroft and Gideon Spilett were at once on their feet, and the pigs by this movement began to run away, at the moment when the sailor was getting ready the rope to bind them. "'That's Herbert's voice,' said the reporter. "'Run!' exclaimed Pencroft and the sailor and Spilett immediately ran at full speed towards the spot from whence the cries proceeded. They did well to hasten, for at a turn of the path, near a clearing, they saw the lad thrown on the ground, and in the grasp of a savage being, apparently a gigantic ape, who was about to do him some great harm. To rush on this monster, throw him on the ground in his turn, snatch Herbert from him, then bind him securely, was the work of a minute for Pencroft and Gideon Spilett. The sailor was of Herculean strength, the reporter also very powerful, and in spite of the monster's resistance he was firmly tied so that he could not even move. "'You are not hurt, Herbert?' asked Spilett. "'No, no.' "'Oh, if this ape had wounded him!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'But he is not an ape,' answered Herbert. At these words, Pencroft and Gideon Spilett looked at the singular being who lay on the ground. Indeed, it was not an ape. It was a human being, a man. But what a man! A savage in all the horrible acceptation of the word, and so much the more frightful that he seemed to fall into the lowest degree of brutishness. Shaggy hair, untrimmed beard descending to the chest, the body almost naked except a rag round the waist, wild eyes, 
enormous hands with immensely long nails, skin the color of mahogany, feet as hard as if made of horn. Such was the miserable creature who yet had a claim to be called a man. But it might justly be asked if there was yet a soul in this body, or if the brute instinct alone survived in it. "'Are you quite sure that this is a man, or that he has ever been one?' said Pencroft to the reporter. "'Alas, there is no doubt about it,' replied Spilett. "'Then this must be the castaway?' asked Herbert. "'Yes,' replied Gideon Spilett. "'But the unfortunate man has no longer anything human about him.' The reporter spoke the truth. It was evident that if the castaway had ever been a civilized being, solitude had made him a savage, or worse, perhaps a regular man of the woods. Hoarse sounds issued from his throat between his teeth, which were sharp as the teeth of a wild beast made to tear raw flesh. Memory must have deserted him long before, and for a long time also he had forgotten how to use his gun and tools, and he no longer knew how to make a fire. It could be seen that he was active and powerful, but the physical qualities had been developed in him to the injury of the moral qualities. Gideon Spilett spoke to him. He did not appear to understand, or even to hear. And yet on looking into his eyes, the reporter thought he could see that all reason was not extinguished in him. However, the prisoner did not struggle, nor even attempt to break his bonds. Was he overwhelmed by the presence of men whose fellow he had once been? Had he found in some corner of his brain a fleeting remembrance which recalled him to humanity? If free, would he attempt to fly, or would he remain? They could not tell, but they did not make the experiment, and after gazing attentively at the miserable creature, "'Whoever he may be,' remarked Gideon Spilett, "'whoever he may have been, and whatever he may become, it is our duty to take him with us to Lincoln Island.' "'Yes, yes,' replied Herbert, "'and perhaps with care we may arouse in him some gleam of intelligence the soul does not die said the reporter and it would be a great satisfaction to rescue one of god's creatures from brutishness pencroft shook his head doubtfully we must try at any rate returned the reporter humanity commands us it was indeed their duty as christians and civilized beings all three felt this and they well knew that cyrus harding would approve of their acting thus "'Shall we leave him bound?' asked the sailor. "'Perhaps he would walk if his feet were unfastened,' said Herbert. "'Let us try,' replied Pencroft. The cords which shackled the prisoner's feet were cut off, but his arms remained securely fastened. He got up by himself, and did not manifest any desire to run away. His hard eyes darted a piercing glance at the three men, who walked near him, but nothing denoted that he recollected being their fellow, or at least having been so. A continual hissing sound issued from his lips. His aspect was wild, but he did not attempt to resist. By the reporter's advice the unfortunate man was taken to the hut. Perhaps the sight of the things that belonged to him would make some impression on him. Perhaps a spark would be sufficient to revive his obscured intellect to rekindle his dulled soul. The dwelling was not far off. In a few minutes they arrived there, but the prisoner remembered nothing, and it appeared that he had lost consciousness of everything. What could they think of the degree of brutishness into which this miserable being had fallen, unless that his imprisonment on the island dated from a very distant period, and after having arrived there a rational being, Solitude had reduced him to this condition. The reporter then thought that perhaps the sight of fire would have some effect on him, and in a moment one of those beautiful flames that attract even animals blazed up on the hearth. The sight of the flame seemed at first to fix the attention of the unhappy object, but soon he turned away, and the look of intelligence faded. Evidently there was nothing to be done, for the time at least but to take him on board the Bonaventure. This was done, and he remained there in Pencroft's charge. 
Herbert and Spilett returned to finish their work, and some hours after they came back to the shore, carrying the utensils and guns, a store of vegetables, of seeds, some game, and two couple of pigs. All was embarked, and the Bonaventure was ready to weigh anchor and sail with the morning tide. The prisoner had been placed in the fore-cabin, where he remained quiet, silent, apparently deaf and dumb. Pencroft offered him something to eat, but he pushed away the cooked meat that was presented to him, and which doubtless did not suit him. But on the sailor showing him one of the ducks which Herbert had killed, he pounced on it like a wild beast, and devoured it greedily. "'You think that he will recover his senses?' asked Pencroft. "'It is not impossible that our care will have an effect upon him, for it is solitude that has made him what he is, and from this time forward he will be no longer alone. "'The poor man must no doubt have been in this state for a long time,' said Herbert. "'Perhaps,' answered Gideon Spilett. "'About what age is he?' asked the lad. "'It is difficult to say,' replied the reporter, "'for it is impossible to see his features under the thick beard which covers his face, but he is no longer young, and I suppose he might be about fifty. "'Have you noticed, Mr. Spilett, how deeply sunk his eyes are?' asked Herbert. "'Yes, Herbert, but I must add that they are more human than one could expect from his appearance.' "'However we shall see,' replied Pencroft, "'and I am anxious to know what opinion Captain Harding will have of our savage. We went to look for a human creature, and we are bringing back a monster. After all, we did what we could.' The night passed, and whether the prisoner slept or not could not be known, but, at any rate, although he had been unbound, he did not move. He was like a wild animal which appears stunned at first by its capture, and becomes wild again afterwards. At daybreak the next morning, the 15th of October, the change of weather predicted by Pencroft occurred. The wind having shifted to the northwest favoured the return of the Bonadventure, but at the same time it freshened, which might render navigation more difficult. At five o'clock in the morning the anchor was weighed. Pencroft took a reef in the mainsail, and steered towards the northeast, so as to sail straight for Lincoln Island. The first day of the voyage was not marked by any incident. The prisoner remained quiet in the fore-cabin, and as he had been a sailor it appeared that the motion of the vessel might produce on him a salutary reaction. Did some recollection of his former calling return to him? However that might be, he remained tranquil, astonished rather than depressed. The next day the wind increased, blowing more from the north, consequently in a less favourable direction for the Bonadventure. Pencroft was soon obliged to sail close-hauled, and without saying anything about it, he began to be uneasy at the state of the sea, which frequently broke over the bows. Certainly, if the wind did not moderate, it would take a longer time to reach Lincoln Island than it had taken to make Tabor Island. Indeed, on the morning of the 17th, the Bonadventure had been forty-eight hours at sea, and nothing showed that she was near the island. It was impossible, besides, to estimate the distance traversed, or to trust to the reckoning for the direction, as the speed had been very irregular. Twenty-four hours after there was yet no land in sight. The wind was right ahead, and the sea very heavy. The sails were close-reefed and they tacked frequently. On the eighteenth a wave swept completely over the Bonadventure, and if the crew had not taken the precaution of lashing themselves to the deck, they would have been carried away. On this occasion Pencroft and his companions, who were occupied with loosing themselves, received unexpected aid from the prisoner, who emerged from the hatchway as if his sailor's instinct had suddenly returned broke a piece out of the bulwarks with a spar so as to let the water which filled the deck escape. Then, the vessel being clear, he descended to his cabin without having uttered a word. Pencroft, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert, greatly astonished, let him proceed. Their situation was truly serious. 
and the sailor had reason to fear that he was lost on the wide sea without any possibility of recovering his course. The night was dark and cold. However, about eleven o'clock, the wind fell, the sea went down, and the speed of the vessel, as she laboured less, greatly increased. Neither Pencroft, Spilett, nor Herbert thought of taking an hour's sleep. They kept a sharp lookout, for either Lincoln Island could not be far distant, and would be sighted at daybreak, or the Bonadventure, carried away by currents, had drifted so much that it would be impossible to rectify her course. Pencroft, uneasy to the last degree, yet did not despair, for he had a gallant heart, and grasping the tiller he anxiously endeavoured to pierce the darkness which surrounded them. About two o'clock in the morning he started forward. "'A light! A light!' he shouted. Indeed, a bright light appeared twenty miles to the northeast. Lincoln Island was there, and this fire, evidently lighted by Cyrus Harding, showed them the course to be followed. Pencroft, who was bearing too much to the north, altered his course and steered towards the fire, which burned brightly above the horizon, like a star of the first magnitude. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part 2, Chapter 15 The next day, the 20th of October, at seven o'clock in the morning, after a voyage of four days, the Bonadventure gently glided up to the beach at the mouth of the Mercy. Cyrus Harding and Neb, who had become very uneasy at the bad weather and the prolonged absence of their companions, had climbed at daybreak to the plateau of Prospect Heights, and they had at last caught sight of the vessel which had been so long in returning. "'God be praised! There they are!' exclaimed Cyrus Harding. As to Neb in his joy, he began to dance, to twirl round, clapping his hands and shouting, "'Oh, my master!' a more touching pantomime than the finest discourse. The engineer's first idea, on counting the people on the deck of the Bonadventure, was that Pencroft had not found the castaway of Tabor Island, or at any rate, that the unfortunate man had refused to leave his island and change one prison for another. Indeed, Pencroft, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert were alone on the deck of the Bonadventure. The moment the vessel touched, the engineer and Neb were waiting on the beach, and before the passengers had time to leap on to the sand, Harding said, "'We have been very uneasy at your delay, my friends. Did you meet with any accident?' "'No,' replied Gideon Spilett. "'On the contrary, everything went wonderfully well. We will tell you all about it.' However, returned the engineer, your search has been unsuccessful since you are only three just as you went. Excuse me, Captain, replied the sailor. We are four. You have found the castaway? Yes. And you have brought him? Yes. Living? Yes. Where is he? Who is he? He is, replied the reporter, or rather he was a man. There, Cyrus, that is all we can tell you. The engineer was then informed of all that had passed during the voyage, and under what conditions the search had been conducted, how the only dwelling in the island had long been abandoned, how at last a castaway had been captured, who appeared no longer to belong to the human species. "'And that's just the point,' added Pencroft. "'I don't know if we have done right to bring him here.' "'Certainly you have, Pencroft.' replied the engineer quickly. "'But the wretched creature has no sense.' "'That is possible at present,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'But only a few months ago the wretched creature was a man like you and me. And who knows what will become of the survivor of us after a long solitude on this island. It is great misfortune to be alone, my friends, and it must be believed that solitude can quickly destroy reason.' since you have found this poor creature in such a state. 
"'But, Captain,' asked Herbert, "'what leads you to think that the brutishness of the unfortunate man began only a few months back?' "'Because the document we found had been recently written,' answered the engineer, "'and the castaway alone can have written it.' "'Always supposing,' observed Gideon Spilett, "'that it had not been written by a companion of this man since dead.' "'That is impossible, my dear Spilett.' "'Why so?' asked the reporter. "'Because the document would then have spoken of two castaways,' replied Harding, "'and it mentioned only one.' Herbert then in a few words related the incidents of the voyage, and dwelt on the curious fact of the sort of passing gleam in the prisoner's mind, when for an instant in the height of the storm he had become a sailor. "'Well, Herbert,' replied the engineer, "'you are right to attach great importance to this fact. The unfortunate man cannot be incurable, and despair has made him what he is. But here he will find his fellow-men, and, since there is still a soul in him, this soul we shall save.' The castaway of Tabor Island, to the great pity of the engineer and the great astonishment of Neb, was then brought from the cabin which he occupied in the forepart of the Bonaventure when once on land he manifested a wish to run away. But Cyrus Harding approaching, placed his hand on his shoulder with a gesture full of authority, and looked at him with infinite tenderness. Immediately the unhappy man, submitting to a superior will, gradually became calm. His eyes fell, his head bent, and he made no more resistance. "'Poor fellow!' murmured the engineer. Cyrus Harding had attentively observed him. To judge by his appearance this miserable being had no longer anything human about him, and yet Harding, as had the reporter already, observed in his look an indefinable trace of intelligence. It was decided that the castaway, or rather the stranger as he was thenceforth termed by his companions, should live in one of the rooms of Granite House, from which, however, he could not escape. He was led there without difficulty, and with careful attention it might perhaps be hoped that some day he would be a companion to the settlers in Lincoln Island. Cyrus Harding, during breakfast, which Neb had hastened to prepare, as the reporter Herbert and Pencroft were dying of hunger, heard in detail all the incidents which had marked the voyage of exploration to the islet. He agreed with his friends on this point that the stranger must be either English or American, the name Britannia leading them to suppose this, and besides, through the bushy beard, and under the shaggy, matted hair, the engineer thought he could recognize the characteristic features of the Anglo-Saxon. "'But, by the by,' said Gideon Spilett, addressing Herbert, "'you never told us how you met this savage, and we know nothing.' except that you would have been strangled if we had not happened to come up in time to help you. "'Upon my word,' answered Herbert, "'it is rather difficult to say how it happened. I, I was, I think, occupied in collecting my plants, when I heard a noise like an avalanche falling from a very tall tree. I scarcely had time to look round. This unfortunate man, who was without doubt concealed in a tree, rushed upon me in less time than I take to tell you about it, and unless Mr. Spellett and Pancroft— My boy, said Cyrus Harding, you ran a great danger, but perhaps without that the poor creature would have still hidden himself from your search, and we should not have had a new companion. You hope, then, Cyrus, to succeed in reforming the man? asked the reporter. Yes, replied the engineer. Breakfast over— Harding and his companions left Granite House and returned to the beach. They there occupied themselves in unloading the Bonaventure, and the engineer, having examined the arms and tools, saw nothing which could help them to establish the identity of the stranger. The capture of pigs made on the islet was looked upon as being very profitable to Lincoln Island, and the animals were led to the sty, where they soon became at home. The two barrels, containing the powder and shot, as well as the box of caps, were very welcome. It was agreed to establish a small powder magazine, either outside Granite House or in the upper cavern, where there would be no fear of explosion. 
However, the use of peroxyl was to be continued, for this substance giving excellent results, there was no reason for substituting ordinary powder. When the unloading of the vessel was finished, "'Captain,' said Pencroft, "'I think it would be prudent to put our Bonaventure in a safe place.' "'Is she not safe at the mouth of the Mercy?' asked Cyrus Harding. "'No, Captain,' replied the sailor. "'Half of the time she's stranded on the sand, and that works her. She is a famous craft, you see, and she behaved admirably during the squall which struck us on our return. Could she not float in the river? No doubt, Captain, she could, but there is no shelter there, and in the east winds I think that the Bonaventure would suffer much from the surf. Well, where would you put her, Pencroft? In Port Balloon, replied the sailor. That little creek shut in by rocks seems to me to be just the harbour we want. Is it not rather far? Pooh! It is not more than three miles from Granite House, and we have a fine straight road to take us there. Do it then, Pencroft, and take your Bonaventure there, replied the engineer. And yet I would rather have her under our more immediate protection. When we have time, we must make a little harbour for her. Famous! exclaimed Pencroft. A harbour with a lighthouse, a pier, and a dock. Ha! Ah, really, with you, Captain, everything becomes easy. Yes, my brave Pencroft, answered the engineer, but on condition, however, that you help me, for you do as much as three men in all our work. Herbert and the sailor then re-embarked on board the Bonaventure. The anchor was weighed, the sail hoisted, and the wind drove her rapidly towards Claw Cape. Two hours after, she was imposing on the tranquil waters of Port Balloon. During the first days passed by the stranger in Granite House, had he already given them reason to think that his savage nature was becoming tamed? Did a brighter light burn in the depths of that obscured mind? In short, was the soul returning to the body? Yes, to a certainty, and to such a degree that Cyrus Harding and the reporter wondered if the reason of the unfortunate man had ever been totally extinguished. At first, accustomed to the open air, to the unrestrained liberty which he had enjoyed on Tabor Island, the stranger manifested a sullen fury, and it was feared that he might throw himself on to the beach, out of one of the windows of Granite House. But gradually he became calmer, and more freedom was allowed to his movements. They had reason to hope, and to hope much. Already, forgetting his carnivorous instincts, the stranger accepted a less bestial nourishment than that on which he fed on the islet, and cooked meat did not produce in him the same sentiment of repulsion which he had showed on board the Bonadventure. Cyrus Harding had profited by a moment when he was sleeping to cut his hair and matted beard, which formed a sort of mane and gave him such a savage aspect. He had also been clothed more suitably, after having got rid of the rag which covered him. The result was that, thanks to these attentions, the stranger resumed a more human appearance, and it even seemed as if his eyes had become milder. Certainly, when formerly lighted up by intelligence, this man's face must have had a sort of beauty. Every day Harding imposed on himself the task of passing some hours in his company. He came and worked near him and occupied himself in different things, so as to fix his attention. A spark, indeed, would be sufficient to re-illumine that soul, a recollection crossing that brain to recall reason. That had been seen during the storm on board the Bonaventure. The engineer did not neglect either to speak aloud, so as to penetrate at the same time by the organs of hearing and sight the depths of that torpid intelligence. Sometimes one of his companions, sometimes another, sometimes all joined him. They spoke most often of things belonging to the navy, which must interest a sailor. At times the stranger gave some slight attention to what was said, and the settlers were soon convinced that he partly understood them. Sometimes the expression of his countenance was deeply sorrowful, a proof that he suffered mentally, for his face could not be mistaken. But he did not speak, although at different times, however, they almost thought that words were about to issue from his lips. 
At all events, the poor creature was quite quiet and sad. But was not his calm only apparent? Was not his sadness only the result of his seclusion? Nothing could yet be ascertained. Seeing only certain objects and in a limited space, always in contact with the colonists, to whom he would soon become accustomed, having no desires to satisfy, better fed, better clothed, it was natural that his physical nature should gradually improve. But was he penetrated with the sense of a new life? Or rather, to employ a word which must be exactly applicable to him, was he not becoming tamed, like an animal in company with his master? This was an important question, which Cyrus Harding was anxious to answer, and yet he did not wish to treat his invalid roughly. Would he ever be a convalescent? How the engineer observed him every moment! How he was on the watch for his soul, if one may use the expression! how he was ready to grasp it. The settlers followed with real sympathy all the phases of the cure undertaken by Harding. They aided him also in this work of humanity, and all, except perhaps the incredulous Pencroft, soon shared both his hope and his faith. The calm of the stranger was deep, as has been said, and he even showed a sort of attachment for the engineer, whose influence he evidently felt. Cyrus Harding resolved then to try him, by transporting him to another scene, from that ocean which formerly his eyes had been accustomed to contemplate, to the border of the forest, which might perhaps recall those where so many years of his life had been passed. But, said Gideon Spilett, can we hope that he will not escape, if once set at liberty? The experiment must be tried, replied the engineer. Well, said Pencroft. When that fellow's outside, and feels the fresh air, he will be off as fast as his legs can carry him. I do not think so, returned Harding. Let us try, said Spilett. We will try, replied the engineer. This was on the 30th of October, and consequently the castaway of Tabor Island had been a prisoner in Granite House for nine days. It was warm and a bright sun darted its rays on the island. Cyrus Harding and Pencroft went to the room occupied by the stranger, who was found lying near the window and gazing at the sky. "'Come, my friend,' said the engineer to him. The stranger rose immediately. His eyes were fixed on Cyrus Harding, and he followed him, while the sailor marched behind them, little confident as to the result of the experiment. Arrived at the door, Harding and Pencroft made him take his place in the lift, while Neb, Herbert, and Gideon Spilett waited for them before Granite House. The lift descended, and in a few moments all were united on the beach. The settlers went a short distance from the stranger, so as to leave him at liberty. He then made a few steps toward the sea, and his look brightened with extreme animation, but he did not make the slightest attempt to escape. He was gazing at the little waves which, broken by the islet, rippled on the sand. "'This is only the sea,' observed Gideon Spilett, "'and possibly it does not inspire him with any wish to escape.' "'Yes,' replied Harding, "'we must take him to the plateau, on the border of the forest. There the experiment will be more conclusive.' "'Besides, he could not run away,' said Neb, "'since the bridge is raised.' Oh, said Pencroft, that isn't a man to be troubled by a stream like Creek Glycerin. He could cross it directly at a single bound. We shall soon see, Harding contented himself with replying, his eyes not quitting those of his patient. The latter was then led towards the mouth of the Mercy, and all climbing the left bank of the river reached Prospect Heights. Arrived at the spot on which grew the first beautiful trees of the forest, their foliage slightly agitated by the breeze, the stranger appeared greedily to drink in the penetrating odor which filled the atmosphere, and a long sigh escaped from his chest. The settlers kept behind him, ready to seize him if he made any movement to escape. And indeed, the poor creature was on the point of springing into the creek which separated him from the forest, and his legs were bent for an instant as if for a spring, but almost immediately 
he stepped back, half sank down, and a large tear fell from his eyes. Ah! exclaimed Cyrus Harding, you have become a man again, for you can weep. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Part 2. Chapter 16. Yes, the unfortunate man had wept. Some recollection doubtless had flashed across his brain, and to use Cyrus Harding's expression, by those tears he was once more a man. The colonists left him for some time on the plateau, and withdrew themselves to a short distance, so that he might feel himself free. But he did not think of profiting by this liberty, and Harding soon brought him back to Granite House. Two days after this occurrence, the stranger appeared to wish gradually to mingle with their common life. He evidently heard and understood, but no less evidently was he strangely determined not to speak to the colonists. For one evening Pencroft, listening at the door of his room, heard these words escape from his lips. No! Here! I! Never! The sailor reported these words to his companions. There is some painful mystery there," said Harding. The stranger had begun to use the laboring tools, and he worked in the garden. When he stopped in his work, as was often the case, he remained retired within himself, but on the engineer's recommendation they respected the reserve which he apparently wished to keep. If one of the settlers approached him, he drew back, and his chest heaved with sobs, as if overburdened. Was it remorse that overwhelmed him thus? They were compelled to believe so, and Gideon Spilett could not help one day making this observation. If he does not speak, it is because he has, I fear, things too serious to be told. They must be patient and wait. A few days later, on the 3rd of November, the stranger, working on the plateau, had stopped letting his spade drop to the ground and Harding, who was observing him from a little distance, saw that tears were again flowing from his eyes. A sort of irresistible pity led him towards the unfortunate man, and he touched his arm lightly. "'My friend,' said he. The stranger tried to avoid his look, and Cyrus Harding having endeavoured to take his hand, he drew back quickly. "'My friend,' said Harding in a firmer voice, Look at me! I wish it!" The stranger looked at the engineer, and seemed to be under his power, as a subject under the influence of a mesmerist. He wished to run away. But then his countenance suddenly underwent a transformation. His eyes flashed. Words struggled to escape from his lips. He could no longer contain himself. At last he folded his arms, then in a hollow voice, who are you? he asked Cyrus Harding. Castaways, like you, replied the engineer, whose emotion was deep. We have brought you here among your fellow men. My fellow men, I have none. You are in the midst of friends. Friends? For me? Friends! exclaimed the stranger, hiding his face in his hands. No! Never! Leave me! Leave me! Then he rushed to the side of the plateau which overlooked the sea, and remained there a long time motionless. Harding rejoined his companions and related to them what had just happened. Yes, there is some mystery in that man's life, said Gideon Spilett, and it appears as if he had only re-entered society by the path of remorse. I don't know what sort of man we have brought here, said the sailor. He has secrets, which we will respect, interrupted Cyrus Harding quickly. If he has committed any crime, 
he has most fearfully expiated it, and in our eyes he is absolved. For two hours the stranger remained alone on the shore, evidently under the influence of recollections which recalled all his past life, a melancholy life, doubtless, and the colonists, without losing sight of him, did not attempt to disturb his solitude. However, after two hours, appearing to have formed a resolution, he came to find Cyrus Harding. His eyes were red with the tears he had shed, but he wept no longer. His countenance expressed deep humility. He appeared anxious, timorous, ashamed, and his eyes were constantly fixed on the ground. Sir, said he to Harding, your companions and you are you English? No, answered the engineer. We are Americans. Ah, said the stranger, and he murmured, I prefer that. And you, my friend? asked the engineer. E English, replied he hastily. And as if these few words had been difficult to say, he retreated to the beach, where he walked up and down between the cascade and the mouth of the Mercy, in a strait of extreme agitation. Then, passing one moment close to Herbert, he stopped and in a stifled voice, "'What month?' he asked. "'December,' replied Herbert. "'What year?' Eighteen sixty-six. Twelve years!' Twelve years!' he exclaimed. Then he left him abruptly. Herbert reported to the colonists the questions and answers which had been made. "'This unfortunate man,' observed Gideon Spilett, "'was no longer acquainted with either months or years.' "'Yes,' added Herbert, "'and he had been twelve years already on the islet when we found him there.' Twelve years!' rejoined Harding. "'Ah!' Twelve years of solitude, after a wicked life, perhaps, may well impair a man's reason. "'I am induced to think,' said Pencroft, "'that this man was not wrecked on Tabor Island, but that in consequence of some crime he was left there.' "'You might be right, Pencroft,' replied the reporter. "'And if it is so, it is not impossible that those who left him on the island may return to fetch him some day.' and that they will no longer find him said herbert but then added pencroft they must return and my friends said cyrus harding do not let us discuss this question until we know more about it i believe that the unhappy man has suffered that he has severely expiated his faults whatever they may have been and that the wish to unburden himself stifles him do not let us press him to tell us his history. He will tell it to us, doubtless, and when we know it we shall see what course it will be best to follow. He alone, besides, can tell us, if he has more than a hope, a certainty, of returning some day to his country. But I doubt it. And why? asked the reporter. Because that, in the event of his being sure of his being delivered at a certain time, he would have waited the hour of his deliverance, and would not have thrown this document into the sea. No, it is more probable that he was condemned to die on that islet, and that he never expected to see his fellow-creatures again. But, observed the sailor, there is one thing which I cannot explain. What is it? If this man had been left for twelve years on Tabor Island, one may well suppose that he had been several years already in the wild state in which we found him. That is probable, replied Cyrus Harding. It must then be many years since he wrote that document. No doubt, and yet the document appears to have been recently written. Besides, how do you know that the bottle which enclosed the document may not have taken several years to come from Tabor Island to Lincoln Island? "'That is not absolutely impossible,' replied the reporter. "'Might it not have been a long time already on the coast of the island?' "'No,' answered Pencroft, "'for it was still floating. "'We could not even suppose that after it had stayed for any length of time on the shore "'it would have been swept off by the sea, "'for the south coast is all rocks, "'and it would certainly have been smashed to pieces there.' "'That is true.' 
rejoined Cyrus Harding thoughtfully. "'And then,' continued the sailor, "'if the document was several years old, if it had been shut up in that bottle for several years, it would have been injured by damp. Now there is nothing of the kind, and it was found in a perfect state of preservation.' The sailor's reasoning was very just, and pointed out an incomprehensible fact, for the document appeared to have been recently written when the colonists found it in the bottle. Moreover, it gave the latitude and longitude of Tabor Island correctly, which implied that its author had a more complete knowledge of hydrography than could be expected of a common sailor. "'There is in this, again, something unaccountable,' said the engineer. "'But we will not urge our companion to speak. When he likes, my friends, then we shall be ready to hear him.' During the following days the stranger did not speak a word, and did not once leave the precincts of the plateau. He worked away, without losing a moment, without taking a minute's rest, but always in a retired place. At meal-times he never came to Granite House, although invited several times to do so, but contented himself with eating a few raw vegetables. At nightfall he did not return to the room assigned to him but remained under some clump of trees, or when the weather was bad crouched in some cleft of the rocks. Thus he lived in the same manner as when he had no other shelter than the forest of Tabor Island, and as all persuasion to induce him to improve his life was in vain, the colonists waited patiently. And the time was near when, as it seemed, almost involuntarily urged by his conscience, a terrible confession escaped him. On the 10th of November, about eight o'clock in the evening, as night was coming on, the stranger appeared unexpectedly before the settlers, who were assembled under the veranda. His eyes burned strangely, and he had quite resumed the wild aspect of his worst days. Cyrus Harding and his companions were astounded on seeing that, overcome by some terrible emotion, his teeth chattered like those of a person in a fever. What was the matter with him? Was the sight of his fellow-creatures insupportable to him? Was he weary of this return to a civilized mode of existence? Was he pining for his former savage life? It appeared so, as soon he was heard to express himself in these incoherent sentences. Why am I here? By what right have you dragged me from my islet? Do you think there could be any tie between you and me? Do you know who I am? What I have done? Why I was there alone? And who told you that I was not abandoned there? That I was not condemned to die there? Do you know my past? How do you know that I have not stolen, murdered? That I am not a wretch, an accursed being, only fit to live like a wild beast, far from all. Speak! Do you know it? The colonists listened without interrupting the miserable creature, from whom these broken confessions escaped, as it were, in spite of himself. Harding wished to calm him, approached him, but he hastily drew back. No, no, he exclaimed. One word only. Am I free? You are free, answered the engineer. Farewell, then, he cried, and fled like a madman. Neb, Pencroft, and Herbert ran also towards the edge of the wood, but they returned alone. We must let him alone, said Cyrus Harding. He will never come back, exclaimed Pencroft. He will come back, replied the engineer. Many days passed. But Harding, was it a sort of presentiment, persisted in the fixed idea that sooner or later the unhappy man would return. "'It is the last revolt of his wild nature,' said he, "'which remorse is touched, and which renewed solitude will terrify.' In the meanwhile, works of all sorts were continued, as well on Prospect Heights as at the corral, where Harding intended to build a farm. It is unnecessary to say that the seeds collected by Herbert on Tabor Island had been carefully sown. 
The plateau thus formed one immense kitchen garden, well laid out and carefully tended, so that the arms of the settlers were never in want of work. There was always something to be done. As the esculents increased in number, it became necessary to enlarge the simple beds, which threatened to grow into regular fields and replace the meadows. But grass abounded in other parts of the island, and there was no fear of the onagers being obliged to go on short allowance. It was well worth while, besides, to turn Prospect Heights into a kitchen garden, defended by its deep belt of creeks, and to remove them to the meadows, which had no need of protection against the depredations of quadrumana and quadrupeds. On the 15th of November the third harvest was gathered in. How wonderfully had the field increased in extent since eighteen months ago, when the first grain of wheat was sown! The second crop of six hundred thousand grains produced this time four thousand bushels, or five hundred millions of grains. The colony was rich in corn, for ten bushels alone were sufficient for sowing every year to produce an ample crop for the food both of men and beasts. The harvest was completed, and the last fortnight of the month of November was devoted to the work of converting it into food for man. In fact, they had corn, but no flour, and the establishment of a mill was necessary. Cyrus Harding could have utilized the second fall which flowed into the Mercy to establish his motive power, the first being already occupied with moving the felting mill. But after some consultation it was decided that a simple windmill should be built on Prospect Heights. The building of this presented no more difficulty than the building of the former, and it was moreover certain that there would be no want of wind on the plateau, exposed as it was to the sea breezes. "'Not to mention,' said Pencroft, "'that the windmill will be more lively and will have a good effect in the landscape.' They set to work by choosing timber for the frame and machinery of the mill. Some large stones, found at the north of the lake, could be easily transformed into millstones, and as to the sails, the inexhaustible case of the balloon furnished the necessary material. Cyrus Harding made his model, and the site of the mill was chosen a little to the right of the poultry-yard, near the shore of the lake. The frame was to rest on a pivot supported with strong timbers, so that it could turn with all the machinery it contained according as the wind required it. The work advanced rapidly. Neb and Pencroft had become very skilful carpenters, and had nothing to do but to copy the models provided by the engineer. Soon a sort of cylindrical box, in shape like a pepper-pot, with a pointed roof, rose on the spot chosen. The four frames which formed the sails had been firmly fixed in the centre beam, so as to form a certain angle with it, and secured with iron clamps. As to the different parts of the internal mechanism, the box destined to contain the two millstones, the fixed stone and the moving stone, the hopper, a sort of large square trough, wide at the top, narrow at the bottom, which would allow the grain to fall on the stones, the oscillating spout intended to regulate the passing of the grain, and lastly the bolting machine, which by the operation of sifting separates the bran from the flour, were made without difficulty. The tools were good, and the work not difficult, for in reality the machinery of a mill is very simple. This was only a question of time. Everyone had worked at the construction of the mill, and on the 1st of December it was finished. As usual Pencroft was delighted with his work, and had no doubt that the apparatus was perfect. "'Now for a good wind,' said he, "'and we shall grind our first harvest splendidly.' "'A good wind, certainly,' answered the engineer. "'But not too much, Pencroft.' "'Pooh! Our mill could only go the faster.' "'There is no need for it to go very fast,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'It is known by experience that the greatest quantity of work is performed by a mill, when the number of turns made by the sails in a minute is six times the number of feet traversed by the wind in a second. A moderate breeze, which passes over twenty-four feet to the second, 
will give sixteen turns to the sails during a minute, and there is no need of more. Exactly, cried Herbert. A fine breeze is blowing from the northeast, which will soon do our business for us. There was no reason for delaying the inauguration of the mill, for the settlers were eager to taste the first piece of bread in Lincoln Island. On this morning two or three bushels of wheat were ground, and the next day at breakfast a magnificent loaf, a little heavy perhaps, although raised with yeast, appeared on the table at Granite House. Every one munched away at it with a pleasure which may be easily understood. In the meantime the stranger had not reappeared. Several times Gideon Spilett and Herbert searched the forest in the neighborhood of Granite House, without meeting or finding any trace of him. They became seriously uneasy at this prolonged absence. Certainly the former savage of Tabor Island could not be perplexed how to live in the forest, abounding in game, but was it not to be feared that he had resumed his habits, and that this freedom would revive in him his wild instincts? However, Harding, by a sort of presentiment, doubtless, always persisted in saying that the fugitive would return. "'Yes, he will return,' he repeated with a confidence which his companions could not share. When this unfortunate man was on Tabor Island, he knew himself to be alone. Here he knows that fellow-men are awaiting him. Since he has partially spoken of his past life, the poor penitent will return to tell the whole, and from that day he will belong to us." The event justified Cyrus Harding's predictions. On the 3rd of December, Herbert had left the plateau to go and fish on the southern bank of the lake. He was unarmed, and till then had never taken any precautions for defence, as dangerous animals had not shown themselves on that part of the island. Meanwhile Pencroft and Neb were working in the poultry-yard, while Harding and the reporter were occupied at the chimneys in making soda, the store of soap being exhausted. Suddenly cries resounded, "'Help! Help!' Cyrus Harding and the reporter, being at too great a distance, had not been able to hear the shouts. Pencroft and Neb, leaving the poultry-yard in all haste, rushed towards the lake. But before them the stranger, whose presence at this place no one had suspected, crossed Creek Glycerin, which separated the plateau from the forest, and bounded up the opposite bank. Herbert was there face to face with a fierce jaguar, similar to the one which had been killed on Reptile End. Suddenly surprised, he was standing with his back against a tree, while the animal gathering itself together was about to spring. But the stranger, with no other weapon than a knife, rushed on the formidable animal, who turned to meet this new adversary. The struggle was short. The stranger possessed immense strength and activity. He seized the jaguar's throat with one powerful hand, holding it as in a vise, without heeding the beast's claws which tore his flesh, and with the other he plunged his knife into its heart. The jaguar fell. The stranger kicked away the body, and was about to fly at the moment when the settlers arrived on the field of battle, but Herbert, clinging to him, cried, "'No, no, you shall not go!' Harding advanced towards the stranger, who frowned when he saw him approaching. The blood flowed from his shoulder under his torn shirt, but he took no notice of it. "'My friend,' said Cyrus Harding, "'we have just contracted a debt of gratitude to you. To save our boy you have risked your life.' "'My life!' murmured the stranger. "'What is that worth?' less than nothing. You are wounded? It is no matter. Will you give me your hand? And as Herbert endeavoured to seize the hand which had just saved him, the stranger folded his arms, his chest heaved, his look darkened, and he appeared to wish to escape, but making a violent effort over himself, and in an abrupt tone, "'Who are you?' he asked. And what do you claim to be to me? It was the colonist's history which he thus demanded, and for the first time. Perhaps this history recounted he would tell his own. 
In a few words, Harding related all that had happened since their departure from Richmond, how they had managed, and what resources they now had at their disposal. The stranger listened with extreme attention. Then the engineer told who they all were, Gideon Spilett, Herbert, Pencroft, Neb, himself, and, he added, that the greatest happiness they had felt since their arrival in Lincoln Island was on the return of the vessel from Tabor Island, when they had been able to include among them a new companion. At these words the stranger's face flushed, his head sunk on his breast, and confusion was depicted on his countenance. "'And now you know us,' added Cyrus Harding. "'Will you give us your hand?' "'No,' replied the stranger in a hoarse voice. "'No, you are honest men, and I—' End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 2, Chapter 17 These last words justified the colonists' presentiment. There had been some mournful past perhaps expiated in the sight of men, but from which his conscience had not yet absolved him. At any rate the guilty man felt remorse, he repented, and his new friends would have cordially pressed the hand which they sought, but he did not feel himself worthy to extend it to honest men. However, after the scene with the jaguar, he did not return to the forest, and from that day did not go beyond the enclosure of Granite House. What was the mystery of his life? Would the stranger one day speak of it? Time alone could show. At any rate, it was agreed that his secret should never be asked from him, and that they would live with him as if they suspected nothing. For some days their life continued as before. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett worked together, sometimes chemists, sometimes experimentalists. The reporter never left the engineer except to hunt with Herbert, for it would not have been prudent to allow the lab to ramble alone in the forest, and it was very necessary to be on their guard. As to Neb and Pencroft, one day at the stables and poultry yard, another at the corral, without reckoning work at Granite House, they were never in want of employment. The stranger worked alone, and he had resumed his usual life, never appearing at meals sleeping under the trees in the plateau, never mingling with his companions. It really seemed as if the society of those who had saved him was insupportable to him. "'But then,' observed Pencroft, "'why did he entreat the help of his fellow-creatures? Why did he throw that paper into the sea?' "'He will tell us why,' invariably replied Cyrus Harding. "'When?' "'Perhaps sooner than you think, Pencroft.' and, indeed, the day of confession was near. On the 10th of December, a week after his return to Granite House, Harding saw the stranger approaching, who, in a calm voice and humble tone, said to him, "'Sir, I have a request to make of you.' "'Speak,' answered the engineer, "'but first let me ask you a question.' At these words the stranger reddened, and was on the point of withdrawing. Cyrus Harding understood what was passing in the mind of the guilty man, who doubtless feared that the engineer would interrogate him on his past life. Harding held him back. "'Comrade,' said he, "'we are not only your companions, but your friends. I wish you to believe that, and now I will listen to you.' The stranger pressed his hand over his eyes. He was seized with a sort of trembling and remained a few moments without being able to articulate a word. "'Sir,' said he at last, "'I have come to beg you to grant me a favor. "'What is it?' "'You have four or five miles from here 
a corral for your domesticated animals. These animals need to be taken care of. Will you allow me to live there with them? Cyrus Harding gazed at the unfortunate man for a few moments with a feeling of deep commiseration. Then, My friend, said he, the corral has only stables hardly fit for animals. It will be good enough for me, sir. My friend, answered Harding, we will not constrain you in anything. You wish to live at the corral? So be it. You will, however, be always welcome at Granite House. But since you wish to live at the corral, we will make the necessary arrangements for your being comfortably established there. Never mind that. I shall do very well. My friend, answered Harding, who always intentionally made use of this cordial appellation, you must let us judge what it will be best to do in this respect. Thank you, sir, replied the stranger as he withdrew. The engineer then made known to his companions the proposal which had been made to him, and it was agreed that they should build a wooden house at the corral, which they would make as comfortable as possible. That very day the colonists repaired to the corral with the necessary tools, and a week had not passed before the house was ready to receive its tenant. It was built about twenty feet from the sheds, and from there it was easy to overlook the flock of sheep, which then numbered more than eighty. Some furniture, a bed, table, bench, cupboard, and chest were manufactured, and a gun, ammunition, and tools were carried to the corral. The stranger, however, had seen nothing of his new dwelling, and he had allowed the settlers to work there without him, while he occupied himself on the plateau, wishing, doubtless, to put the finishing stroke to his work. Indeed, thanks to him, all the ground was dug up and ready to be sowed when the time came. It was on the 20th of December that all the arrangements at the corral were completed. The engineer announced to the stranger that his dwelling was ready to receive him, and the latter replied that he would go and sleep there that very evening. On this evening the colonists were gathered in the dining-room of Granite House. It was then eight o'clock, the hour at which their companion was to leave them. Not wishing to trouble him by their presence, and thus imposing on him the necessity of saying farewells which might perhaps be painful to him, they had left him alone, and ascended to Granite House. Now they had been talking in the room for a few minutes, when a light knock was heard at the door. Almost immediately the stranger entered, and without any preamble, Gentlemen, said he, before I leave you, it is right that you should know my history. I will tell it you. These simple words profoundly impressed Cyrus Harding and his companions. The engineer rose. We ask you nothing, my friend, said he. It is your right to be silent. It is my duty to speak. Sit down, then. No, I will stand. We are ready to hear you, replied Harding. The stranger remained standing in a corner of the room, a little in the shade. He was bareheaded, his arms folded across his chest, and it was in this posture that in a hoarse voice, speaking like someone who obliges himself to speak, he gave the following recital, which his auditors did not once interrupt. On the 20th of December, 1854, a steam-yacht, belonging to a Scotch nobleman, Lord Glenarvan, anchored off Cape Bernoulli, on the western coast of Australia in the 37th parallel. On board this yacht were Lord Glenarvan and his wife, a major in the English army, a French geographer, a young girl, and a young boy. These last two were the children of Captain Grant, whose ship the Britannia had been lost crew and cargo a year before. The Duncan was commanded by Captain John Mangles, and manned by a crew of fifteen men. This is the reason the yacht at this time lay off the coast of Australia. Six months before, a bottle, enclosing a document written in English, German, and French, had been found in the Irish Sea, and picked up by the Duncan. 
This document stated in substance that there still existed three survivors from the wreck of the Britannia, that these survivors were Captain Grant and two of his men, and that they had found refuge on some land, of which the document gave the latitude, but of which the longitude, effaced by the sea, was no longer legible. This latitude was thirty-seven degrees eleven minutes south. Therefore, the longitude being unknown, if they followed the thirty-seventh parallel over continents and seas, they would be certain to reach the spot inhabited by Captain Grant and his two companions. The English Admiralty having hesitated to undertake this search, Lord Glenarvan resolved to attempt everything to find the captain. He communicated with Mary and Robert Grant, who joined him. The Duncan yacht was equipped for the distant voyage, in which the nobleman's family and the captain's children wished to take part, and the Duncan, leaving Glasgow, proceeded towards the Atlantic, passed through the Straits of Magellan, and ascended the Pacific as far as Patagonia, where, according to a previous interpretation of the document, they supposed that Captain Grant was a prisoner among the Indians. The Duncan disembarked her passengers on the western coast of Patagonia, and sailed to pick them up again on the eastern coast at Cape Corrientes. Lord Glenarvan traversed Patagonia, following the thirty-seventh parallel, and having found no trace of the captain, he re-embarked on the thirteenth of November, so as to pursue his search through the ocean. After having unsuccessfully visited the islands of Tristan d'Acuna and Amsterdam, situated in her course, the Duncan, as I have said, arrived at Cape Bernoulli, on the Australian coast, on the 20th of December, 1854. It was Lord Glenarvan's intention to traverse Australia as he had traversed America, and he disembarked. A few miles from the coast was established a farm, belonging to an Irishman, who offered hospitality to the travellers. Lord Glenarvan made known to the Irishman the cause which had brought him to these parts, and asked if he knew whether a three-masted English vessel, the Britannia, had been lost less than two years before on the west coast of Australia. The Irishman had never heard of this wreck, but, to the great surprise of the bystanders, one of his servants came forward and said, My Lord, praise and thank God! If Captain Grant is still living, he is living on the Australian shores. Who are you? asked Lord Glenarvan. A Scotchman like yourself, my Lord replied the man. I am one of Captain Grant's crew, one of the castaways of the Britannia. This man was called Ayrton. He was, in fact, the boatswain's mate of the Britannia, as his papers showed. But, separated from Captain Grant at the moment when the ship struck upon the rocks, he had till then believed that the captain with all his crew had perished, and that he, Ayrton, was the sole survivor of the Britannia. Only, he added, it was not on the west coast, but on the east coast of Australia, that the vessel was lost, and if Captain Grant is still living, as his document indicates, he is a prisoner among the natives, and it is on the other coast that he must be looked for. This man spoke in a frank voice and with a confident look. His words could not be doubted. The Irishman, in whose service he had been for more than a year, answered for his trustworthiness. Lord Glenarvan, therefore, believed in the fidelity of this man, and, by his advice, resolved to cross Australia, following the thirty-seventh parallel. Lord Glenarvan, his wife, the two children, the Major, the Frenchman, Captain Mangles, and a few sailors, composed the little band under the command of Ayrton, while the Duncan, under charge of the mate, Tom Austin, proceeded to Melbourne, there to await Lord Glenarvan's instructions. They set out on the 23rd of December, 1854. It is time to say that Ayrton was a traitor. 
He was, indeed, the boatswain's mate of the Britannia, but after some dispute with his captain, he endeavoured to incite the crew to mutiny and seize the ship, and Captain Grant had landed him, on the 8th of April, 1852, on the west coast of Australia, and then sailed, leaving him there, as was only just. Therefore this wretched man knew nothing of the wreck of the Britannia. He had just heard of it from Glenarvan's account. Since his abandonment he had become, under the name of Ben Joyce, the leader of the escaped convicts, and if he boldly maintained that the wreck had taken place on the east coast, and led Lord Glenarvan to proceed in that direction, it was that he hoped to separate him from his ship seize the Duncan, and make the yacht a pirate in the Pacific. Here the stranger stopped for a moment. His voice trembled, but he continued. The expedition set out, and proceeded across Australia. It was inevitably unfortunate, since Ayrton, or Ben Joyce, as he may be called, guided it, sometimes preceded, sometimes followed by his band of convicts, who had been told what they had to do. Meanwhile the Duncan had been sent to Melbourne for repairs. It was necessary, then, to get Lord Glenarvan to order her to leave Melbourne and go to the east coast of Australia, where it would be easy to seize her. After having led the expedition near enough to the coast, in the midst of vast forests with no resources, Ayrton obtained a letter which he was charged to carry to the mate of the Duncan, a letter which ordered the yacht to repair immediately to the east coast, to Twofold Bay, that is to say, a few days' journey from the place where the expedition had stopped. It was there that Ayrton had agreed to meet his accomplices, and two days after gaining possession of the letter he arrived at Melbourne. So far the villain had succeeded in his wicked design he would be able to take the Duncan into Twofold Bay, where it would be easy for the convicts to seize her, and her crew massacred. Ben Joyce would become master of the seas. But it pleased God to prevent the accomplishment of these terrible projects. Ayrton arrived at Melbourne, delivered the letter to the mate, Tom Austin, who read it and immediately set sail but judge of Ayrton's rage and disappointment when the next day he found that the mate was taking the vessel not to the east coast of Australia, to Twofold Bay, but to the east coast of New Zealand. He wished to stop him, but Austin showed him the letter. And indeed, by a providential error of the French geographer who had written the letter, the east coast of New Zealand was mentioned as the place of destination. All Ayrton's plans were frustrated. He became outrageous. They put him in irons. He was then taken to the coast of New Zealand, not knowing what would become of his accomplices, or what would become of Lord Glenarvan. The Duncan cruised about on this coast until the 3rd of March. On that day Ayrton heard the report of guns. The guns of the Duncan were being fired, and soon... Lord Glenarvan and his companions came on board. This is what had happened. After a thousand hardships, a thousand dangers, Lord Glenarvan had accomplished his journey, and arrived on the east coast of Australia at Twofold Bay. No Duncan, he telegraphed to Melbourne. They answered, Duncan sailed on the eighteenth instant, destination unknown. Lord Glenarvan could only arrive at one conclusion, that his honest yacht had fallen into the hands of Ben Joyce and had become a pirate vessel. However, Lord Glenarvan would not give up. He was a bold and generous man. He embarked in a merchant vessel, sailed to the west coast of New Zealand, traversed it along the 37th parallel, without finding any trace of Captain Grant but on the other side, to his great surprise, and by the will of heaven, he found the Duncan, under command of the mate, who had been waiting for him for five weeks. 
This was on the 3rd of March, 1855. Lord Glenarvan was now on board the Duncan, but Ayrton was there also. He appeared before the nobleman, who wished to extract from him all that the villain knew about Captain Grant. Ayrton refused to speak. Lord Glenarvan then told him that at the first port they put into he would be delivered up to the English authorities. Ayrton remained mute. The Duncan continued her voyage along the 37th parallel. In the meantime, Lady Glenarvan undertook to vanquish the resistance of the ruffian. At last her influence prevailed, and Ayrton, in exchange for what he could tell, proposed that Lord Glenarvan should leave him on some island in the Pacific, instead of giving him up to the English authorities. Lord Glenarvan, resolving to do anything to obtain information about Captain Grant, consented. Ayrton then related all his life, and it was certain that he knew nothing from the day on which Captain Grant had landed him on the Australian coast. Nevertheless, Lord Glenarvan kept the promise which he had given. The Duncan continued her voyage and arrived at Tabor Island. It was there that Ayrton was to be landed. It was there also that, by a veritable miracle, they found Captain Grant and two men exactly on the 37th parallel. The convict, then, went to take their place on this desert islet, and at the moment he left the yacht these words were pronounced by Lord Glenarvan. Here, Ayrton, you will be far from any land, and without any possible communication with your fellow creatures. You cannot escape from this islet on which the Duncan leaves you. You will be alone, under the eye of a god who reads the depths of the heart, but you will be neither lost nor forgotten, as was Captain Grant. Unworthy as you are to be remembered by men, men will remember you. I know where you are, Ayrton, and I know where to find you. I will never forget it. And the Duncan, making sail, soon disappeared. This was on the 18th of March, 1855. Footnote the events which have just been briefly related are taken from a work which some of our readers have no doubt read, and which is entitled Captain Grant's Children. They will remark on this occasion, as well as later, some discrepancy in the dates, but later again they will understand why the real dates were not at first given. End of footnote. Ayrton was alone, but he had no want of either ammunition, weapons, tools, or seeds. At his, the convict's disposal, was the house built by honest Captain Grant. He had only to live and expiate in solitude the crimes which he had committed. Gentlemen, he repented. He was ashamed of his crimes and was very miserable. He said to himself that if men came some day to take him from that islet, he must be worthy to return among them. How he suffered that wretched man! how he labored to recover himself by work, how he prayed to be reformed by prayer. For two years, three years, this went on, but Ayrton, humbled by solitude, always looking for some ship to appear on the horizon, asking himself if the time of expiation would soon be complete, suffered as none others suffered. Oh, how dreadful was this solitude! to a heart tormented by remorse. But doubtless heaven had not sufficiently punished this unhappy man, for he felt that he was gradually becoming a savage. He felt that brutishness was gradually gaining on him. He could not say if it was after two or three years of solitude, but at last he became the miserable creature you found. I have no need to tell you, gentlemen, that Ayrton, Ben Joyce, and I are the same. Cyrus Harding and his companions rose at the end of this account. It is impossible to say how much they were moved. What misery, grief, and despair lay revealed before them. Ayrton, said Harding, rising, you have been a great criminal, but heaven must certainly think that you have expiated your crimes, 
That has been proved by your having been brought again among your fellow creatures. Ayrton, you are forgiven, and now you will be our companion. Ayrton drew back. Here is my hand, said the engineer. Ayrton grasped the hand which Harding extended to him, and great tears fell from his eyes. Will you live with us? asked Cyrus Harding. Captain Harding, leave me some time longer, replied Ayrton. Leave me alone in the hut in the corral. As you like, Ayrton, answered Cyrus Harding. Ayrton was going to withdraw when the engineer addressed one more question to him. One word more, my friend. Since it was your intention to live alone, why did you throw into the sea the document which put us on your track? A document? repeated Ayrton, who did not appear to know what he meant. Yes, the document which we found enclosed in a bottle, giving us the exact position of Tabor Island. Ayrton passed his hand over his brow. Then, after having thought, I never threw any document into the sea, he answered. Never! exclaimed Pencroft. Never! And Ayrton, bowing, reached the door and departed. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Eighteen. Poor man," said Herbert, who had rushed to the door, but returned, having seen Ayrton slide down the rope on the lift and disappear in the darkness. "'He will come back,' said Cyrus Harding. "'Come now, Captain,' exclaimed Pencroft. "'What does that mean? What? Wasn't it Ayrton who threw that bottle into the sea? Who was it, then?' Certainly, if ever a question was necessary to be made, it was that one. "'It was he,' answered Neb. "'Only that unhappy man was half mad.' "'Yes,' said Herbert and he was no longer conscious of what he was doing. "'It can only be explained in that way, my friends,' replied Harding quickly. "'And I understand now how Ayrton was able to point out exactly the situation of Tabor Island, since the events which had preceded his being left on the island had made it known to him.' "'However,' observed Pencroft, "'if he was not yet a brute when he wrote that document,' And if he threw it into the sea seven or eight years ago, how is it that the paper has not been injured by damp? That proves, answered Cyrus Harding, that Ayrton was deprived of intelligence at a more recent time than he thinks. Of course it must be so, replied Pencroft. Without that the fact would be unaccountable. Unaccountable indeed, answered the engineer who did not appear desirous to prolong the conversation. "'But has Ayrton told the truth?' asked the sailor. "'Yes,' replied the reporter. "'The story which he has told is true in every point. I remember quite well the account in the newspapers of the yacht expedition undertaken by Lord Glenarvan, and its result.' "'Ayrton has told the truth,' added Harding. Do not doubt it, Pencroft, for it was painful to him. People tell the truth when they accuse themselves like that. The next day, the 21st of December, the colonists descended to the beach, and having climbed the plateau they found nothing of Ayrton. He had reached his house in the corral during the night, and the settlers judged it best not to agitate him by their presence. Time would doubtless perform what sympathy had been unable to accomplish. Herbert, Pencroft, and Neb resumed their ordinary occupations. On this day the same work brought Harding and the reporter to the workshop at the chimneys. "'Do you know, my dear Cyrus,' said Gideon Spilett, 
that the explanation you gave yesterday on the subject of the bottle has not satisfied me at all. How can it be supposed that the unfortunate man was able to write that document and throw the bottle into the sea without having the slightest recollection of it? Nor was it he who threw it in, my dear Spilett. You think, then, I think nothing. I know nothing, interrupted Cyrus Harding. I am content to rank this incident among those which I have not been able to explain to this day. Indeed, Cyrus, said Spilett, these things are incredible. Your rescue, the case stranded on the sand, Top's adventure, and lastly this bottle. Shall we never have the answer to these enigmas? Yes, replied the engineer quickly. Yes, even if I have to penetrate into the bowels of this island. Chance will perhaps give us the key to this mystery. Chance? Spill it. I do not believe in chance, any more than I believe in mysteries in this world. There is a reason for everything unaccountable which has happened here, and that reason I shall discover. But in the meantime we must work and observe. The month of January arrived. The year, 1867, commenced. The summer occupations were assiduously continued. During the days which followed, Herbert and Spilett, having gone in the direction of the corral, ascertained that Ayrton had taken possession of the habitation which had been prepared for him. He busied himself with the numerous flock confided to his care, and spared his companions the trouble of coming every two or three days to visit the corral. Nevertheless, in order not to leave Ayrton in solitude for too long a time, the settlers often paid him a visit. It was not unimportant, either, in consequence of some suspicions entertained by the engineer and Gideon Spilett, that this part of the island should be subject to a surveillance of some sort, and that Ayrton, if any incident occurred unexpectedly, should not neglect to inform the inhabitants of Granite House of it. Nevertheless, it might happen that something would occur which it would be necessary to bring rapidly to the engineer's knowledge. Independently of facts bearing on the mystery of Lincoln Island, many others might happen, which would call for the prompt interference of the colonists, such as the sighting of a vessel, a wreck on the western coast, the possible arrival of pirates, etc., Therefore Cyrus Harding resolved to put the corral in instantaneous communication with Granite House. It was on the 10th of January that he made known his project to his companions. "'Why, how are you going to manage that, Captain?' asked Bancroft. "'Do you by chance happen to think of establishing a telegraph?' "'Exactly so,' answered the engineer. "'Electric?' cried Herbert. "'Electric,' replied Cyrus Harding. We have all the necessary materials for making a battery, and the most difficult thing will be to stretch the wires. But by means of a draw-plate, I think we shall manage it. Well, after that, returned the sailor, I shall never despair of seeing ourselves some day rolling along on a railway. They then set to work, beginning with the most difficult thing, for, if they failed in that, it would be useless to manufacture the battery and other accessories. The iron of Lincoln Island, as has been said, was of excellent quality, and consequently very fit for being drawn out. Harding commenced by manufacturing a draw-plate, that is to say, a plate of steel pierced with conical holes of different sizes, which would successively bring the wire to the wish for tenacity. This piece of steel, after having been tempered, was fixed in as firm a way as possible in the solid framework planted in the ground, only a few feet from the great fall, the motive power of which the engineer intended to utilize. In fact, as the fulling mill was there, although not then in use, its beam moved with extreme power, would serve to stretch out the wire by rolling it round itself. It was a delicate operation, and required much care. The iron, prepared previously in long, thin rods, the ends of which were sharpened with the file, having been introduced into the largest hole of the draw-plate, was drawn out by the beam which wound it around itself, 
to a length of twenty-five or thirty feet, then unrolled, and the same operation was performed successively through the holes of a less size. Finally, the engineer obtained wires from forty to fifty feet long, which could be easily fastened together and stretched over the distance of five miles, which separated the corral from the bounds of Granite House. It did not take more than a few days to perform this work, and indeed as soon as the machine had been commenced, Cyrus Harding left his companions to follow the trade of wire-drawers, and occupied himself with manufacturing his battery. It was necessary to obtain a battery with a constant current. It is known that the elements of modern batteries are generally composed of retort coal, zinc, and copper. Copper was absolutely wanting to the engineer, who, notwithstanding all his researches, had never been able to find any trace of it in Lincoln Island, and was therefore obliged to do without it. Retort coal, that is to say, the hard graphite which is found in the retorts of gas manufactories after the coal has been dehydrogenized, could have been obtained, but it would have been necessary to establish a special apparatus involving great labor. As to zinc, it may be remembered that the case found at Flotsam Point was lined with this metal, which could not be better utilized than for this purpose. Cyrus Harding, after mature consideration, decided to manufacture a very simple battery, resembling as nearly as possible that invented by Becquerel in 1820, and in which zinc only is employed. The other substances, azotic acid and potash, were all at his disposal. The way in which the battery was composed was as follows, and the results were to be attained by the reaction of acid and potash on each other. A number of glass bottles were made, and filled with azotic acid. The engineer corked them by means of a stopper, through which passed a glass tube, bored at its lower extremity, and intended to be plunged into the acid by means of a clay stopper, secured by a rag. Into this tube... Through its upper extremity, he poured a solution of potash, previously obtained by burning and reducing to ashes various plants, and in this way the acid and potash could act on each other through the clay. Cyrus Harding then took two slips of zinc, one of which was plunged into azotic acid, the other into a solution of potash. A current was immediately produced, which was transmitted from the slip of zinc in the bottle to that in the tube and the two slips having been connected by a metallic wire, the slip in the tube became the positive pole, and that in the bottle the negative pole of the apparatus. Each bottle, therefore, produced as many currents as united could be sufficient to produce all the phenomena of the electric telegraph. Such was the ingenious and very simple apparatus constructed by Cyrus Harding, an apparatus which would allow them to establish a telegraphic communication between Granite House and the Corral. On the 6th of February was commenced the planting along the road to the Corral of posts furnished with glass insulators, and intended to support the wire. A few days after, the wire was extended, ready to produce the electric current at a rate of 20,000 miles a second. Two batteries had been manufactured, one for Granite House, the other for the Corral, for if it was necessary the corral should be able to communicate with Granite House, it might also be useful that Granite House should be able to communicate with the corral. As to the receiver and manipulator, they were very simple. At the two stations the wire was wound round a magnet, that is to say, round a piece of soft iron surrounded with a wire. The communication was thus established between the two poles. The current starting from the positive pole, traversed the wire, passed through the magnet which was temporarily magnetized, and returned through the earth to the negative pole. If the current was interrupted, the magnet immediately became unmagnetized. It was sufficient to place a plate of soft iron before the magnet, which, attracted during the passage of the current, would fall back when the current was interrupted. This movement of the plate thus obtained, Harding could easily fasten to it a needle arranged on a dial, bearing the letters of the alphabet, and in this way communicate from one station to the other. 
All was completely arranged by the 12th of February. On this day, Harding, having sent the current through the wire, asked if all was going on well at the corral, and received in a few moments a satisfactory reply from Ayrton. Pencroft was wild with joy, and every morning and evening he sent a telegram to the corral, which always received an answer. This mode of communication presented two very real advantages. Firstly, because it enabled them to ascertain that Ayrton was at the corral, and secondly, that he was thus not left completely isolated. Besides, Cyrus Harding never allowed a week to pass without going to see him, and Ayrton came from time to time to Granite House, where he always found a cordial welcome. The fine season passed away in the midst of the usual work. The resources of the colony, particularly in vegetables and corn, increased from day to day, and the plants brought from Tabor Island had succeeded perfectly. The plateau of Prospect Heights presented an encouraging aspect. The fourth harvest had been admirable, and it may be supposed that no one thought of counting whether the four hundred thousand millions of grains duly appeared in the crop. However, Pencroft had thought of doing so, but Cyrus Harding having told him that even if he managed to count three hundred grains a minute, or nine thousand an hour, it would take him nearly five thousand five hundred years to finish his task, the honest sailor considered it best to give up the idea. The weather was splendid, the temperature very warm in the daytime, but in the evening the sea breezes tempered the heat of the atmosphere and procured cool nights for the inhabitants of Granite House. There were, however, a few storms, which, although they were not of long duration, swept over Lincoln Island with extraordinary fury. The lightning blazed, and the thunder continued to roll for some hours. At this period the little colony was extremely prosperous. The tenants of the poultry-yard swarmed, and they lived on the surplus but it became necessary to reduce the population to a more moderate number. The pigs had already produced young, and it may be understood that their care for these animals absorbed a great part of Neb and Pencroft's time. The onagers, who had two pretty colts, were most often mounted by Gideon Spilett and Herbert, who had become an excellent rider under the reporter's instruction, and they also harnessed them to the cart, either for carrying wood and coal to Granite House, or different mineral productions required by the engineer. Several expeditions were made about this time into the depths of the far west forests. The explorers could venture there without having anything to fear from the heat, for the sun's rays scarcely penetrated through the thick foliage spreading above their heads. They thus visited all the left bank of the Mercy along which ran the road from the corral to the mouth of Falls River. But in these excursions the settlers took care to be well armed, for they met with savage wild boars, with which they often had a tussle. They also, during this season, made fierce war against the jaguars. Gideon Spilett had vowed a special hatred against them, and his pupil Herbert seconded him well. Armed as they were, they no longer feared to meet one of those beasts. Herbert's courage was superb, and the reporter's sang-froid astonishing. Already twenty magnificent skins ornamented the dining-room of Granite House, and if this continued, the jaguar race would soon be extinct in the island, the object aimed at by the hunters. The engineer sometimes took part in the expeditions made to the unknown parts of the island, which he surveyed with great attention. It was for other traces than those of animals that he searched the thickets of the vast forest, but nothing suspicious ever appeared. Neither Top nor Jupe, who accompanied him, ever betrayed by their behavior that there was anything strange there, and yet more than once again the dog barked at the mouth of the well, which the engineer had before explored without result. At this time Gideon Spilett, aided by Herbert, took several views of the most picturesque parts of the island by means of the photographic apparatus found in the cases, and of which they had not as yet made any use. This apparatus, provided with a 
powerful object glass, was very complete. Substances necessary for the photographic reproduction, collodion for preparing the glass plate, nitrate of silver to render it sensitive, hyposulfate of soda to fix the prints obtained, chloride of ammonium, in which to soak the paper destined to give the positive proof, acetate of soda and chloride of gold, in which to immerse the paper. Nothing was wanting. Even the papers were there, all prepared, and before laying in the printing frame upon the negatives, it was sufficient to soak them for a few minutes in the solution of nitrate of silver. The reporter and his assistant became in a short time very skillful operators, and they obtained fine views of the country, such as the island, taken from Prospect Heights with Mount Franklin in the distance, the mouth of the Mercy, so picturesquely framed in high rocks, the glade and the corral, with the spurs of the mountain in the background, the curious development of Claw Cape, Flotsam Point, etc. Nor did the photographers forget to take the portraits of all the inhabitants of the island, leaving out no one. "'It multiplies us,' said Pencroft. And the sailor was enchanted to see his own countenance, faithfully reproduced, ornamenting the walls of Granite House, and he stopped as willingly before this exhibition as he would have done before the richest shop windows in Broadway. But it must be acknowledged that the most successful portrait was incontestably that of Master Jupe. Master Jupe had sat with a gravity not to be described, and his portrait was lifelike. "'He looks as if he was just going to grin!' exclaimed Pencroft and if Master Jupe had not been satisfied, he would have been very difficult to please, but he was quite contented and contemplated his own countenance with a sentimental air which expressed some small amount of conceit. The summer heat ended with the month of March. The weather was sometimes rainy, but still warm. The month of March, which corresponds to the September of northern latitudes, was not so fine as might have been hoped. Perhaps it announced an early and rigorous winter. It might have been supposed one morning, the 21st, that the first snow had already made its appearance. In fact, Herbert, looking early from one of the windows of Granite House, exclaimed, "'Hallo! The island is covered with snow!' "'Snow at this time?' answered the reporter, joining the boy. Their companions were soon beside them, but could only ascertain one thing— that not only the islet but all the beach below Granite House was covered with one uniform sheet of white. "'It must be snow,' said Pencroft. "'Or rather is very like it,' replied Neb. "'But the thermometer marks fifty-eight degrees,' observed Gideon Spilett. Cyrus Harding gazed at the sheet of white without saying anything, for he really did not know how to explain this phenomenon at this time of year and in such a temperature. "'By Jove!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'All our plants will be frozen!' And the sailor was about to descend, when he was preceded by the nimble jupe, who slid down to the ground. But the orang had not touched the ground when the snowy sheet arose and dispersed in the air in such innumerable flakes that the light of the sun was obscured for some minutes. "'Birds!' cried Herbert. They were indeed swarms of sea-birds, with dazzling white plumage. They had perched by thousands on the islet and on the shore, and they disappeared in the distance, leaving the colonists amazed as if they had been present at some transformation scene, in which summer succeeded winter at the touch of a fairy's wand. Unfortunately, the change had been so sudden that neither the reporter nor the lad had been able to bring down one of these birds, of which they could not recognize the species. A few days after came the 26th of March, the day on which, two years before, the castaways from the air had been thrown upon Lincoln Island. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. THE MYSTERIOUS ISLAND by Jules Verne Part 2, Chapter 19 Two years already! And for two years the colonists had had no communications with their fellow creatures. They were without news from the civilized world, lost on this island, as completely as if they had been on the most minute star of the celestial hemisphere. What was now happening in their country? The picture of their native land was always before their eyes, the land torn by civil war at the time they left it, and which the southern rebellion was perhaps still staining with blood. It was a great sorrow to them, and they often talked together of these things, without ever doubting, however, that the cause of the North must triumph for the honor of the American Confederation. During these two years not a vessel had passed in sight of the island, or at least not a sail had been seen. It was evident that Lincoln Island was out of the usual track, and also that it was unknown, as was besides proved by the maps, for though there was no port, vessels might have visited it for the purpose of renewing their store of water. But the surrounding ocean was deserted as far as the eye could reach, and the colonists must rely on themselves for regaining their native land. However, one chance of rescue existed and this chance was discussed one day on the first week of April, when the colonists were gathered together in the dining-room of Granite House. They had been talking of America, of their native country, which they had so little hope of ever seeing again. "'Decidedly we have only one way,' said Spilett, "'one single way for leaving Lincoln Island, and that is, to build a vessel large enough to sail several hundred miles. It appears to me—' that when one has built a boat it is just as easy to build a ship. "'And in which we might go to the Pomatus, added Herbert, "'just as easily as we went to Tabor Island.' "'I do not say no,' replied Pencroft, who had always the casting vote in maritime questions. "'I do not say no, although it is not exactly the same thing to make a log as a short voyage.' If our little craft had been caught in any heavy gale of wind during the voyage to Tabor Island, we should have known that land was at no great distance either way. But twelve hundred miles is a pretty long way, and the nearest land is at least that distance. "'Would you not in that case, Pencroft, attempt the adventure?' asked the reporter. "'I will attempt anything that is desired, Mr. Spilett,' answered the sailor. "'And you know well that I am not a man to flinch.' "'Remember, besides, that we number another sailor amongst us now,' remarked Neb. "'Who is that?' asked Pencroft. "'Ayrton?' "'If he will consent to come,' said Pencroft. "'Nonsense,' returned the reporter. "'Do you think that if Lord Glenarvan's yacht had appeared at Tabor Island while he was still living there, Ayrton would have refused to depart?' "'You forget, my friends,' then said Cyrus Harding that Ayrton was not in possession of his reason during the last years of his stay there. But that is not the question. The point is to know if we may count among our chances of being rescued the return of the Scotch vessel. Now, Lord Glenarvan promised Ayrton that he would return to take him off from Tabor Island when he considered that his crimes were expiated, and I believe that he will return. Yes, said the reporter and I will add that he will return soon, for it is twelve years since Ayrton was abandoned. Well, answered Pencroft, I agree with you that the nobleman will return, and soon, too. But where will he touch? At Tabor Island, and not at Lincoln Island. That is the more certain, replied Herbert, as Lincoln Island is not even marked on the map. Therefore, my friends, said the engineer, we ought to take the necessary precautions for making our presence, and that of Ayrton on Lincoln Island, known at Tabor Island. Certainly, answered the reporter, and nothing is easier than to place in the hut which was Captain Grant's and Ayrton's dwelling, a notice which Lord Glenarvan and his crew cannot help finding, giving the position of our island. It is a pity, remarked the sailor that we forgot to take that precaution on our first visit to Tabor Island.' "'And why should we have done it?' asked Herbert. 
At that time we did not know Ayrton's history. We did not know that anyone was likely to come some day to fetch him, and when we did know his history, the season was too advanced to allow us to return then to Tabor Island. Yes, replied Harding, it was too late, and we must put off the voyage until next spring. But suppose the Scotch yacht comes before that, said Pencroft. That is not probable, replied the engineer, for Lord Glenarvan would not choose the winter season to venture into these seas. Either he has already returned to Tabor Island, since Ayrton has been with us, that is to say, during the last five months, and has left again, or he will not come till later, and it will be time enough in the first fine October days to go to Tabor Island and leave a notice there. "'We must allow,' said Neb, "'that it will be very unfortunate if the Duncan has returned to these parts only a few months ago.' I hope that is not so, replied Cyrus Harding, and that heaven has not deprived us of the best chance which remains to us. I think, observed the reporter, that at any rate we shall know what we have to depend on when we have been to Tabor Island, for if the yacht has returned there, they will necessarily have left some traces of their visit. That is evident, answered the engineer. So then, my friends, since we have this chance of returning to our country, we must wait patiently, and if it is taken from us we shall see what will be best to do. At any rate, remarked Pencroft, it is well understood that if we do leave Lincoln Island it will not be because we were uncomfortable there. No, Pencroft, replied the engineer, it will be because we are far from all that a man holds dearest in the world his family, his friends, his native land. Matters being thus decided, the building of a vessel large enough to sail either to the archipelagos in the north, or to New Zealand in the west, was no longer talked of, and they busied themselves in their accustomed occupations, with a view to wintering a third time in Granite House. However, it was agreed that before the stormy weather came on, their little vessel should be employed in making a voyage round the island. A complete survey of the coast had not yet been made, and the colonists had but an imperfect idea of the shore to the west and north, from the mouth of Falls River to the Mandible Capes, as well as of the narrow bay between them, which opened like a shark's jaws. The plan of this excursion was proposed by Pencroft, and Cyrus Harding fully acquiesced in it, for he himself wished to see this part of his domain. The weather was variable but the barometer did not fluctuate by sudden movements, and they could therefore count on tolerable weather. However, during the first week of April, after a sudden barometrical fall, a renewed rise was marked by a heavy gale of wind, lasting five or six days. Then the needle of the instrument remained stationary at a height of twenty-nine inches and nine-tenths, and the weather appeared propitious for an excursion. The departure was fixed for the 16th of April, and the Bonadventure, anchored in Port Balloon, was provisioned for a voyage which might be of some duration. Cyrus Harding informed Ayrton of the projected expedition, and proposed that he should take part in it. But Ayrton preferring to remain on shore, it was decided that he should come to Granite House during the absence of his companions. Master Jupe was ordered to keep him company, and made no remonstrance. On the morning of the 16th of April, all the colonists, including Top, embarked. A fine breeze blew from the southwest, and the Bonadventure tacked on leaving Port Balloon so as to reach Reptile End. Of the ninety miles which the perimeter of the island measured, twenty included the south coast between the port and the promontory. The wind being right ahead, it was necessary to hug the shore. It took the whole day to reach the promontory for the vessel on leaving port had only two hours of ebb tide, and had therefore to make way for six hours against the flood. It was nightfall before the promontory was doubled. The sailor then proposed to the engineer that they should continue sailing slowly with two reefs in the sail. But Harding preferred to anchor a few cable links from the shore, so as to survey that part of the coast during the day. It was agreed also that as they were anxious for a minute exploration of the coast, 
they should not sail during the night, but would always, when the weather permitted it, be at anchor near the shore. The night was passing under the promontory, and the wind having fallen, nothing disturbed the silence. The passengers, with the exception of the sailor, scarcely slept as well on board the Bonaventure as they would have done in their rooms at Granite House, but they did sleep, however. Pencroft set sail at break of day, and by going on the larboard tack they could keep close to the shore. The colonists knew this beautiful wooded coast, since they had already explored it on foot, and yet it again excited their admiration. They coasted along as close in as possible, so as to notice everything, avoiding always the trunks of trees which floated here and there. Several times, also, they anchored, and Gideon Spilett took photographs of the superb scenery. About noon the Bonaventure arrived at the mouth of Falls River. Beyond, on the left bank, a few scattered trees appeared, and three miles further even these dwindled into solitary groups among the western spurs of the mountain, whose arid ridge sloped down to the shore. What a contrast between the northern and southern part of the coast! In proportion as one was woody and fertile, so was the other rugged and barren. It might have been designated as one of those iron coasts, as they are called in some countries, and its wild confusion appeared to indicate that a sudden crystallization had been produced in the yet liquid basalt of some distant geological sea. These stupendous masses would have terrified the settlers if they had been cast at first on this part of the island. They had not been able to perceive the sinister aspect of this shore from the summit of Mount Franklin, for they overlooked it from too great a height, but viewed from the sea it presented a wild appearance which could not perhaps be equalled in any corner of the globe. The Bonaventure sailed along this coast for the distance of half a mile. It was easy to see that it was composed of blocks of all sizes, from twenty to three hundred feet in height, and of all shapes, round like towers, prismatic like steeples, pyramidal like obelisks, conical like factory chimneys. An iceberg of the polar seas could not have been more capricious in its terrible sublimity. Here bridges were thrown from one rock to another. There arches like those of a wave, into the depths of which the eye could not penetrate. In one place large vaulted excavations presented a monumental aspect. In another a crowd of columns, spires, and arches, such as no Gothic cathedral ever possessed. Every caprice of nature, still more varied than those of the imagination, appeared on this grand coast, which extended over a length of eight or nine miles. Cyrus Harding and his companions gazed, with a feeling of surprise bordering on stupefaction. But although they remained silent, Top, not being troubled with feelings of this sort, uttered barks which were repeated by the thousand echoes of the basaltic cliff. The engineer even observed that these barks had something strange in them, like those which the dog had uttered at the mouth of the well in Granite House. "'Let us go close in,' said he. And the Bonaventure sailed as near as possible to the rocky shore. Perhaps some cave, which it would be advisable to explore, existed there? But Harding saw nothing, not a cavern, not a cleft which could serve as a retreat to any being whatever for the foot of the cliff was washed by the surf. Soon Top's barks ceased, and the vessel continued her course at a few cables' length from the coast. In the northwest part of the island the shore became again flat and sandy. A few trees here and there rose above a low, marshy ground, which the colonists had already surveyed, and in violent contrast to the other desert shore life was again manifested by the presence of myriads of waterfowl. That evening the Bonaventure anchored in a small bay to the north of the island, near the land, such was the depth of water there. The night passed quietly, for the breeze died away with the last light of day, and only rose again with the first streaks of dawn. As it was easy to land, the usual hunters of the colony, that is to say, Herbert and Gideon Spilett, went for a ramble of two hours or so, 
and returned with several strings of wild duck and snipe. Top had done wonders, and not a bird had been lost, thanks to his zeal and cleverness. At eight o'clock in the morning the Bonaventure set sail, and ran rapidly towards North Mandible Cape, for the wind was right astern and freshening rapidly. However, observed Pencroft, I should not be surprised if a gale came up from the west. Yesterday the sun set in a very red-looking horizon, and now, this morning, those mare's tails don't forebode anything good. These mare's tails are cirrus clouds, scattered in the zenith, their height from the sea being less than five thousand feet. They look like light pieces of cotton wool, and their presence usually announces some sudden change in the weather. Well, said Harding, let us carry as much sail as possible, and run for shelter into Shark Gulf. I think that the Bonaventure will be safe there." Perfectly, replied Pencroft, and besides, the north coast is merely sand, very uninteresting to look at. I shall not be sorry, resumed the engineer, to pass not only to-night but to-morrow in that bay, which is worth being carefully explored. I think that we shall be obliged to do so, whether we like it or not answered Pencroft, for the sky looks very threatening towards the west. Dirty weather is coming on. At any rate, we will have a favorable wind for reaching Cape Mandible, observed the reporter. A very fine wind, replied the sailor. But we must tack to enter the gulf, and I should like to see my way clear in those unknown quarters. Quarters which appear to be filled with rocks, added Herbert if we judge by what we saw on the south coast of Chart Gulf. Pencroft, said Cyrus Harding, do as you think best. We will leave it to you. Don't make your mind uneasy, Captain, replied the sailor. I shall not expose myself needlessly. I would rather a knife were run into my ribs than a sharp rock into those of my bonadventure. That which Pencroft called ribs was the part of his vessel under water and he valued it more than his own skin. "'What o'clock is it?' asked Pencroft. Ten o'clock,' replied Gideon Spilett. "'And what distance is it to the Cape, Captain?' "'About fifteen miles,' replied the engineer. "'That's a matter of two hours and a half,' said the sailor. "'And we shall be off the Cape between twelve and one o'clock. Unluckily the tide will be turning at that moment, and will be ebbing out of the gulf.' I'm afraid that it will be very difficult to get in, having both wind and tide against us. And the more so that it is a full moon today, remarked Herbert, and these April tides are very strong. Well, Pencroft, asked Harding, can you not anchor off the Cape? Anchor near land with bad weather coming on? exclaimed the sailor. What are you thinking of, Captain? We should run aground of a certainty. What will you do, then? I shall try to keep in the offing until the flood, that is to say, till about seven in the evening, and if there is still light enough I will try to enter the gulf. If not, we must stand off and on during the night, and we will enter to-morrow at sunrise. As I told you, Pencroft, we will leave it to you, answered Harding. Ah, said Pencroft, if there was only a lighthouse on the coast it would be much more convenient for sailors. Yes, replied Herbert, and this time we shall have no obliging engineer to light a fire to guide us into port. Why, indeed, my dear Cyrus, said Spilett, we have never thanked you, but frankly, without that fire, we should never have been able— A fire? asked Harding, much astonished at the reporter's words. We mean, Captain, answered Pencroft that on board the Bonaventure we were very anxious during the few hours before our return, and we should have passed to windward of the island if it had not been for the precaution you took of lighting a fire the night of 19th of October on Prospect Heights. Yes, yes, that was a lucky idea of mine, replied the engineer. And this time, continued the sailor, unless the idea occurs to Ayrton, there will be no one to do us that little service. No, no one, answered Cyrus Harding. A few minutes after, finding himself alone in the bows of the vessel with the reporter, the engineer bent down and whispered, If there is one thing certain in this world, Spilett, 
it is that I never lighted any fire during the night of the 19th of October, neither on Prospect Heights nor on any other part of the island. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Twenty. Things happened as Pencroft had predicted, he being seldom mistaken in his prognostications. The wind rose, and from a fresh breeze it soon increased to a regular gale, that is to say, it acquired a speed of from forty to forty-five miles an hour, before which a ship in the open sea would have run under close-reefed topsails. Now, as it was nearly six o'clock when the Bonaventure reached the gulf, and as at that moment the tide turned, it was impossible to enter. They were therefore compelled to stand off, for even if he had not wished to do so, Pencroft could not have gained the mouth of the Mercy. Hoisting the jib to the mainmast by way of a storm-sail, he hove to, putting the head of the vessel towards the land. Fortunately, although the wind was strong, the sea, being sheltered by the land, did not run very high. They had then little to fear from the waves, which always endanger small craft. The Bonaventure would doubtlessly not have capsized, for she was well ballasted, but enormous masses of water falling on the deck might injure her if her timbers could not sustain them. Pencroft, as a good sailor, was prepared for anything. Certainly he had great confidence in his vessel, but nevertheless he awaited the return of day with some anxiety. During the night Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett had no opportunity for talking together, and yet the words pronounced in the reporter's ear by the engineer were well worth being discussed together with the mysterious influence which appeared to reign over Lincoln Island. Gideon Spilett did not cease from pondering over this new and inexplicable incident, the appearance of a fire on the coast of the island. The fire had actually been seen. His companions, Herbert and Pencroft, had seen it with him. The fire had served to signalize the position of the island during that dark night, and they had not doubted that it was lighted by the engineer's hand and here was Cyrus Harding expressly declaring that he had never done anything of the sort. Spilett resolved to recur to this incident as soon as the Bonaventure returned, and to urge Cyrus Harding to acquaint their companions with these strange facts. Perhaps it would be decided to make in common a complete investigation of every part of Lincoln Island. However that might be, on this island no fire was lighted on these yet unknown shores, which formed the entrance to the gulf, and the little vessel stood off during the night. When the first streaks of dawn appeared in the western horizon, the wind, which had slightly fallen, shifted two points, and enabled Pencroft to enter the narrow gulf with greater ease. Towards seven o'clock in the morning the Bonadventure, weathering the north mandible cape, entered the strait and glided on to the waters so strangely enclosed in the frame of lava. Well, said Pencroft, this bay would make admirable roads in which a whole fleet could lie at their ease. What is especially curious, observed Harding, is that the gulf has been formed by two rivers of lava thrown out by the volcano, and accumulated by successive eruptions. The result is that the gulf is completely sheltered on all sides, and I believe that even in the stormiest weather the sea here must be as calm as a lake. No doubt returned the sailor, since the wind has only that narrow entrance between the two capes to get in by, and besides, the north cape protects that of the south in a way which would make the entrance of guests very difficult. I declare our Bonaventure could stay here from one end of the year to the other, without even dragging at her anchor. "'It is rather large for her,' observed the reporter. "'Well, Mr. Spilett,' replied the sailor, I agree that it is too large for the Bonaventure, but if the fleets of the Union were in want of a harbor in the Pacific, I don't think they would ever find a better place than this. 
"'We are in the shark's mouth,' remarked Neb, alluding to the form of the gulf. "'Right into its mouth, my honest Neb,' replied Herbert. "'But you are not afraid that it will shut upon us, are you?' "'No, Mr. Herbert,' answered Neb. "'And yet this gulf here doesn't please me much. It has a wicked look.' Halloo! cried Pencroft. "'Here is Neb turning up his nose at my gulf, just as I was thinking of presenting it to America.' "'But at any rate, is the water deep enough?' asked the engineer. "'For a depth sufficient for the keel of the Bonadventure would not be enough for those of our ironclads.' "'That is easily found out,' replied Pencroft. And the sailor sounded with a long cord, which served him as a lead-line to which was fastened a lump of iron. This cord measured nearly fifty fathoms, and its entire length was enrolled without finding any bottom. "'There!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Our ironclads can come here, after all. They would not run aground.' "'Indeed,' said Gideon Spilett, "'this gulf is a regular abyss. But, taking into consideration the volcanic origin of the island, it is not astonishing that the sea should offer similar depressions. One would say, too, observed Herbert, that these cliffs were perfectly perpendicular, and I believe that at their foot, even with a line five or six times longer, Pencroft would not find bottom. That is all very well, then said the reporter, but I must point out to Pencroft that his harbour is wanting in one very important respect. And what is that, Mr. Spilett? an opening, a cutting of some sort, to give access to the interior of the island. I do not see a spot on which we could land. And, in fact, the steep lava cliffs did not afford a single place suitable for landing. They formed an insuperable barrier, recalling, but with more wildness, the fjords of Norway. The Bonadventure, coasting as close as possible along the cliffs, did not discover even a projection which would allow the passengers to leave the deck. Pencroft consoled himself by saying that with the help of a mine they could soon open out the cliff when that was necessary, and then, as there was evidently nothing to be done in the gulf, he steered his vessels toward the strait, and passed out at about two o'clock in the afternoon. "'Ah!' said Neb, uttering a sigh of satisfaction one might really say that the honest negro did not feel at his ease in those enormous jaws. The distance from Mandible Cape to the mouth of the Mercy was not more than eight miles. The head of the Bonadventure was put towards Granite House, and a fair wind filling her sails, she ran rapidly along the coast. To the enormous lava rocks succeeded soon those capricious sand-dunes along which the engineer had been so singularly recovered and which sea-birds frequented in thousands. About four o'clock, Pencroft, leaving the point of the islet on his left, entered the channel which separated it from the coast, and at five o'clock the anchor of the Bonadventure was buried in the sand at the mouth of the Mercy. The colonists had been absent three days from their dwelling. Ayrton was waiting for them on the beach, and Jupe came joyously to meet them, giving vent to deep grunts of satisfaction. A complete exploration of the coast of the island had now been made, and no suspicious appearances had been observed. If any mysterious being resided on it, it could only be under cover of the impenetrable forest of the Serpentine Peninsula, to which the colonists had not yet directed their investigations. Gideon Spilett discussed these things with the engineer, and it was agreed that they should direct the attention of their companions to the strange character of certain incidents which had occurred on the island, and of which the last was the most unaccountable. However, Harding, returning to the fact of a fire having been kindled on the shore by an unknown hand, could not refrain from repeating for the twentieth time to the reporter, "'But are you quite sure of having seen it? Was it not a partial eruption of the volcano, or perhaps some meteor?' "'No, Cyrus,' answered the reporter. It was certainly a fire lighted by the hand of man. Besides, question Pencroft and Herbert. They saw it as I saw it myself, and they will confirm my words. In consequence, therefore, a few days after, on the 25th of April, in the evening, 
when the settlers were all collected on Prospect Heights, Cyrus Harding began by saying, "'My friends, I think it my duty to call your attention to certain incidents which have occurred in the island, on the subject of which I shall be happy to have your advice. These incidents are, so to speak, supernatural.' "'Supernatural!' exclaimed the sailor, emitting a volume of smoke from his mouth. "'Can it be possible that our island is supernatural?' "'No, Pencroft, but mysterious, most certainly,' replied the engineer. "'Unless you can explain that which Spilett and I have until now failed to understand.' "'Speak away, Captain,' answered the sailor. "'Well, have you understood?' then said the engineer. How it was that after falling into the sea I was found a quarter of a mile into the interior of the island, and that without my having any consciousness of my removal there. Unless being unconscious, said Pencroft, that is not admissible, replied the engineer. But to continue, have you understood how Top was able to discover your retreat five miles from the cave in which I was lying? "'The dog's instinct,' observed Herbert. "'Singular instinct,' returned the reporter. "'Since notwithstanding the storm of rain and wind which was raging during that night, Top arrived at the chimneys, dry and without a speck of mud.' "'Let us continue,' resumed the engineer. "'Have you understood how our dog was so strangely thrown up out of the water of the lake after his struggle with the dugong?' "'No, I confess not at all,' replied Pencroft. "'And the wound which the dugong had in its side, a wound which seemed to have been made with a sharp instrument, that can't be understood either.' "'Let us continue again,' said Harding. "'Have you understood, my friends, how that bullet got into the body of the young peccary? How that case happened to be so fortunately stranded, without there being any trace of a wreck?' How that bottle containing the document presented itself so opportunely during our first sea excursion! How our canoe, having broken its moorings, floated down the current of the Mercy and rejoined us at the very moment we needed it! How, after the ape invasion, the latter was so obligingly thrown down from Granite House! And lastly, how the document, which Ayrton asserts was never written by him, fell into our hands! As Cyrus Harding thus enumerated, without forgetting one, the singular incidents which had occurred in the island, Herbert, Neb, and Pencroft stared at each other, not knowing what to reply, for this succession of incidents, grouped thus for the first time, could not but excite their surprise to the highest degree. "'Pon my word,' said Pencroft at last, "'you are right, Captain, and it is difficult to explain all these things.' "'Well, my friends,' resumed the engineer, "'a last fact has just been added to these, "'and it is no less incomprehensible than the others.' "'What is it, Captain?' asked Herbert quickly. "'When you were returning from Tabor Island, Pencroft,' continued the engineer, "'you said that a fire appeared on Lincoln Island?' "'Certainly,' answered the sailor. "'And you are quite certain of having seen this fire?' "'As sure as I see you now.' "'You also, Herbert?' "'Why, Captain,' cried Herbert, "'that fire was blazing like a star of the first magnitude.' "'But was it not a star?' urged the engineer. "'No,' replied Pencroft, "'for the sky was covered with thick clouds, "'and at any rate a star would not have been so low on the horizon. "'But Mr. Spilett saw it as well as we, "'and he will confirm our words.' I will add, said the reporter, that the fire was very bright, and that it shot up like a shade of lightning. Yes, yes, exactly, added Herbert, and it was certainly placed on the heights of Granite House. Well, my friends, replied Cyrus Harding, during the night of the 19th of October, neither Neb nor I lighted any fire on the coast. You did not! exclaimed Pencroft, in the height of his astonishment, not being able to finish his sentence. "'We did not leave Granite House,' answered Cyrus Harding. "'And if a fire appeared on the coast, it was lighted by another hand than ours.' 
Pancroft, Herbert, and Neb were stupefied. No illusion could be possible, and a fire had actually met their eyes during the night of the 19th of October. Yes, they had to acknowledge it. A mystery existed. An inexplicable influence, evidently favourable to the colonists, but very irritating to their curiosity, was executed always in the nick of time on Lincoln Island. Could there be some being hidden in its profoundest recesses? It was necessary at any cost to ascertain this. Harding also reminded his companions of the singular behaviour of Top and Jupe when they prowled round the mouth of the well, which placed Granite House in communication with the sea, and he told them that he had explored the well without discovering anything suspicious. The final resolve taken, in consequence of this conversation, by all the members of the colony, was that as soon as the fine season returned they would thoroughly search the whole of the island. But from that day Pencroft appeared to be anxious. He felt as if the island which he had made his own personal property belonged to him entirely no longer, and that he shared it with another master, to whom, willing or not, he felt subject. Neb and he often talked of those unaccountable things, and both, their natures inclining them to the marvellous, were not far from believing that Lincoln Island was under the dominion of one supernatural power. In the meanwhile, the bad weather came with the month of May, the November of the northern zones. It appeared that the winter would be severe and forward. The preparations for the winter season were therefore commenced without delay. Nevertheless, the colonists were well prepared to meet the winter, however hard it might be. They had plenty of felt clothing, and the musmons, very numerous by this time, had furnished an abundance of wool necessary for the manufacture of this warm material. It is unnecessary to say that Ayrton had been provided with this comfortable clothing. Cyrus Harding proposed that he should come to spend the bad season with them in Granite House, where he would be better lodged than at the corral, and Ayrton promised to do so as soon as the last work at the corral was finished. He did this towards the middle of April. From that time Ayrton shared the common life, and made himself useful on all occasions, but still humble and sad, he never took part in the pleasures of his companions. For the greater part of this, the third winter which the settlers passed in Lincoln Island, they were confined to Granite House. There were many violent storms and frightful tempests, which appeared to shake the rocks to their very foundations. Immense waves threatened to overwhelm the island, and certainly any vessel anchored near the shore would have been dashed to pieces. Twice, during one of these hurricanes, the mercy swelled to such a degree as to give reason to fear that the bridges would be swept away, and it was necessary to strengthen those on the shore, which disappeared under the foaming waters, when the sea beat against the beach. It may well be supposed that such storms, comparable to water-spouts in which were mingled rain and snow, would cause great havoc on the plateau of Prospect Heights. The mill and the poultry are particularly suffered. The colonists were often obliged to make immediate repairs, without which the safety of the birds would have been seriously threatened. During the worst weather, several jaguars and troops of Quadrumana ventured to the edge of the plateau, and it was always to be feared that the most active and audacious would, urged by hunger, managed to cross the stream, which, besides, when frozen, offered them an easy passage. Plantations and domestic animals would then have been infallibly destroyed, without a constant watch, and it was often necessary to make use of the guns to keep those dangerous visitors at a respectful distance. Occupation was not wanting to the colonists, for without reckoning their outdoor cares they had always a thousand plans for the fitting up of Granite House. They had also some fine sporting excursions, which were made during the frost in the vast Tador Marsh. Gideon Spillett and Herbert, aided by Jupe and Top, did not miss a shot in the midst of myriads of wild duck, snipe, teal, and others. The access to these hunting grounds was easy. Besides, whether they reached them by the road to Port Balloon, after having passed the Mercy Bridge, or by turning the rocks from Flotsam Point, 
the hunters were never distant from Granite House more than two or three miles. Thus passed the four winter months, which were really rigorous, that is to say, June, July, August, and September. But, in short, Granite House did not suffer much from the inclemency of the weather, and it was the same with the corral, which, less exposed than the plateau, and sheltered partly by Mount Franklin, only received the remains of the hurricanes, already broken by the forests and the high rocks of the shore. The damages there were consequently of small importance, and the activity and skill of Ayrton promptly repaired them, when some time in October he returned to pass a few days in the corral. During this winter no fresh inexplicable incident occurred. Nothing strange happened, although Pencroft and Neb were on the watch for the most insignificant facts to which they attached any mysterious cause. Top and Jup themselves no longer growled round the well, or gave any signs of uneasiness. It appeared, therefore, as if the series of supernatural incidents was interrupted, although they often talked of them during the evenings in Granite House, and they remained thoroughly resolved that the island should be searched, even in those parts the most difficult to explore. But an event of the highest importance, and of which the consequences might be terrible, momentarily diverted from their projects Cyrus Harding and his companions. It was the month of October. The fine season was swiftly returning. Nature was reviving, and among the evergreen foliage of the coniferae which formed the border of the wood, already appeared the young leaves of the banksias, deodoras, and other trees. It may be remembered that Gideon Spilett and Herbert had, at different times, taken photographic views of Lincoln Island. Now, on the 17th of this month of October, towards three o'clock in the afternoon, Herbert, enticed by the charms of the sky, thought of reproducing Union Bay, which was opposite to Prospect Heights, from Cape Mandible to Claw Cape. The horizon was beautifully clear, and the sea, undulating under a soft breeze, was as calm as the waters of a lake sparkling here and there under the sun's rays. The apparatus had been placed at one of the windows of the dining-room at Granite House, and consequently overlooked the shore and the bay. Herbert proceeded as he was accustomed to do, and the negative obtained, he went away to fix it by means of the chemicals deposited in a dark nook of Granite House. Returning to the bright light, and examining it well, Herbert perceived on his negative an almost imperceptible little spot on the sea horizon. He endeavoured to make it disappear by reiterated washing, but could not accomplish it. "'It is a flaw in the glass,' he thought. And then he had the curiosity to examine this flaw with a strong magnifier which he unscrewed from one of the telescopes. But he had scarcely looked at it when he uttered a cry, and the glass almost fell from his hands. Immediately running to the room in which Cyrus Harding then was, he extended the negative and magnifier towards the engineer, pointing out the little spot. Harding examined it. Then, seizing his telescope, he rushed to the window. The telescope, after having slowly swept the horizon, at last stopped on the looked-for spot, and Cyrus Harding, lowering it, pronounced one word only, A VESSEL! And, in fact, a vessel was in sight off Lincoln Island. End of chapter. This is also end of part two. Next we will begin with part three, The Secret of the Island. Stay tuned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, called The Secret of the Island Chapter One it was now two years and a half since the castaways from the balloon had been thrown on Lincoln Island, and during that period there had been no communication between them and their fellow-creatures. 
once the reporter had attempted to communicate with the inhabited world by confiding to a bird a letter which contained the secret of their situation. But that was a chance on which it was impossible to reckon seriously. Ayrton alone, under the circumstances which have been related, had come to join the little colony. Now, suddenly on this day, the 17th of October, other men had unexpectedly appeared in sight of the island on that deserted sea. There could be no doubt about it. A vessel was there. But would she pass on, or would she put into port? In a few hours the colonists would definitely know what to expect. Cyrus Harding and Herbert, having immediately called Gideon Spilett, Pencroft, and Neb into the dining-room of Granite House, told them what had happened. Pencroft, seizing the telescope, rapidly swept the horizon, and stopping on the indicated point, that is to say, on that which had made the almost imperceptible spot on the photographic negative, "'I'm blessed, but it is really a vessel!' he exclaimed in a voice which did not express any great amount of satisfaction. "'Is she coming here?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'Impossible to say anything yet,' answered Pencroft, "'for her rigging alone is above the horizon, and not a bit of her hull can be seen.' "'What is to be done?' asked the lad. "'Wait,' replied Harding. And for a considerable time the settlers remained silent given up to all the thoughts and the emotions, all the fears, all the hopes, which were aroused by this incident, the most important which had occurred since their arrival in Lincoln Island. Certainly the colonists were not in the situation of castaways, abandoned on a sterile islet, constantly contending against a cruel nature for their miserable existence, and incessantly tormented by the longing to return to inhabited countries. Pencroft and Neb especially, who felt themselves at once so happy and so rich, would not have left their island without regret. They were accustomed, besides, to this new life in the midst of the domain which their intelligence had, as it were, civilized. But at any rate this ship brought news from the world, perhaps even from their native land. It was bringing fellow-creatures to them and it might be conceived how deeply their hearts were moved at the sight. From time to time Pencroft took the glass and rested himself at the window. From thence he very attentively examined the vessel, which was at a distance of twenty miles to the east. The colonists had as yet, therefore, no means of signalizing their presence. A flag would not have been perceived, a gun would not have been heard, a fire would not have been visible. However, it was certain that the island, overtopped by Mount Franklin, could not escape the notice of a vessel's lookout. But why was this ship coming there? Was it simple chance which brought it to that part of the Pacific, where the maps mention no land except Tabor Island, which itself was out of the route, usually followed by vessels from the Polynesian archipelagos, from New Zealand? and from the American coast. To this question, which each one asked himself, a reply was suddenly made by Herbert. "'Can it be the Duncan?' he cried. The Duncan, as has been said, was Lord Glenarvan's yacht, which had left Ayrton on the islet, and which was to return there some day to fetch him. Now the islet was not so far distant from Lincoln Island, but that a vessel, standing for the one, could pass in sight of the other. A hundred and fifty miles only separated them in longitude, and seventy in latitude. "'We must tell Ayrton,' said Gideon Spilett, "'and send for him immediately. He alone can say if it is the Duncan.' This was the opinion of all, and the reporter, going to the telegraphic apparatus which placed the corral in communication with Granite House, sent this telegram, come with all possible speed. In a few minutes the bell sounded. I am coming, replied Ayrton. Then the settlers continued to watch the vessel. If it is the Duncan, said Herbert, Ayrton will recognize her without difficulty, since he sailed on board her for some time. And if he recognizes her, 
added Pencroft. It will agitate him exceedingly. Yes, answered Cyrus Harding. But now Ayrton is worthy to return on board the Duncan, and pray heaven that it is indeed Lord Glenarvan's yacht, for I should be suspicious of any other vessel. These are ill-famed seas, and I have always feared a visit from Malay pirates to our island. We could defend it, cried Herbert. No doubt, my boy, answered the engineer, smiling. But it would be better not to have to defend it. A useless observation, said Spilett. Lincoln Island is unknown to navigators, since it is not marked even on the most recent maps. Do you think, Cyrus, that that is a sufficient motive for a ship, finding herself unexpectedly in sight of new land, to try and visit rather than avoid it? Certainly, replied Pencroft. I think so, too, added the engineer. It may even be said that it is the duty of a captain to come and survey any land or island not yet known, and Lincoln Island is in this position. Well, said Pencroft, suppose this vessel comes and anchors there a few cable lengths from our island. What shall we do? This sudden question remained at first without any reply. But Cyrus Harding, after some moments' thought, replied in the calm tone which was usual to him. "'What shall we do, my friends? What we ought to do is this. We will communicate with the ship, we will take our passage on board her, and we will leave our island, after having taken possession of it in the name of the United States. Then we will return with any who may wish to follow us to colonize it definitely, and endow the American Republic with a useful station in this part of the Pacific Ocean.' Hurrah! exclaimed Pencroft. And that will be no small present which we shall make to our country. The colonization is already almost finished. Names are given to every part of the island. There is a natural port, fresh water, roads, a telegraph, a dockyard, and manufactories, and there will be nothing to be done but to inscribe Lincoln Island on the maps. But if any one seizes it in our absence, observed Gideon Spilett, "'Hang it!' cried the sailor. "'I would rather remain all alone to guard it, and trust to Pencroft. They shouldn't steal it from him, like a watch from the pocket of a swell.' For an hour it was impossible to say with any certainty whether the vessel was or was not standing towards Lincoln Island. She was nearer, but in what direction was she sailing? This Pencroft could not determine. However, as the wind was blowing from the northeast, in all probability the vessel was sailing on the starboard tack. Besides, the wind was favourable for bringing her towards the island, and, the sea being calm, she would not be afraid to approach, although the shallows were not marked on the chart. Towards four o'clock, an hour after he had been sent for, Ayrton arrived at Granite House. He entered the dining-room, saying, "'At your service, gentlemen.' Cyrus Harding gave him his hand, as was his custom to do, and leading him to the window. Ayrton, said he, we have begged you to come here for an important reason. A ship is in sight of the island. Ayrton at first paled slightly, and for a moment his eyes became dim. Then, leaning out the window, he surveyed the horizon, but could see nothing. Take this telescope, said Spilett. And look carefully, Ayrton, for it is possible that this ship may be the Duncan, come to these seas for the purpose of taking you home again. The Duncan, murmured Ayrton. Already? This last word escaped Ayrton's lips as if involuntarily, and his head drooped upon his hands. Did not twelve years' solitude on a desert island appear to him a sufficient expiation? Did not the penitent yet feel himself pardoned, either in his own eyes or in the eyes of others? No, said he. No, it can cannot be the Duncan. Look, Ayrton, then said the engineer, for it is necessary that we should know beforehand what to expect. Ayrton took the glass, and pointed it in the direction indicated. During some minutes he examined the horizon without moving, without uttering a word, 
then it is indeed a vessel said he but i do not think she is the duncan why do you not think so asked gideon spilett because the duncan is a steam yacht and i cannot perceive any trace of smoke either above or near that vessel perhaps she is simply sailing observed pencroft the wind is favourable for the direction which she appears to be taking and she may be anxious to economize her coal being so far from land it is possible that you may be right mr pencroft answered ayrton and that the vessel has extinguished her fires we must wait until she is nearer and then we shall know what to expect so saying ayrton sat down in a corner of the room and remained silent the colonists again discussed the strange ship but ayrton took no part in the conversation all were in such a mood that they found it impossible to continue their work gideon spilett and pencroft were particularly nervous going coming not able to remain still in one place. Herbert felt more curiosity. Neb alone maintained his usual calm manner. Was not his country that where his master was? As to the engineer, he remained plunged in deep thought, and in his heart feared rather than desired the arrival of the ship. In the meanwhile, the vessel was a little nearer the island. With the aid of the glass, it was ascertained that she was a brig, and not one of those Malay proas, which are generally used by the pirates of the Pacific. It was, therefore, reasonable to believe that the engineer's apprehensions would not be justified, and that the presence of this vessel in the vicinity of the island was fraught with no danger. Pencroft, after a minute examination, was able positively to affirm that the vessel was rigged as a brig and that she was standing obliquely towards the coast, on the starboard tack, under her topsails and top-gallant sails. This was confirmed by Ayrton. But by continuing in this direction she must soon disappear behind Claw Cape, as the wind was from the southwest, and to watch her it would be then necessary to ascend the heights of Washington Bay, near Port Balloon, a provoking circumstance for it was already five o'clock in the evening, and the twilight would soon make any observation extremely difficult. "'What shall we do when night comes on?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'Shall we light a fire, so as to signal our presence on the coast?' This was a serious question. And yet, although the engineer still retained some of his presentiments, it was answered in the affirmative. During the night the ship might disappear and leave forever, and, this ship gone, would another ever return to the waters of Lincoln Island? Who could foresee what the future would then have in store for the colonists? Yes, said the reporter, we ought to make known to that vessel, whoever she may be, that the island is inhabited. To neglect the opportunity which is offered to us might be to create everlasting regrets. It was therefore decided that Neb and Pencroft should go to Port Balloon, and that there at nightfall they should light an immense fire, the blaze of which would necessarily attract the attention of the brig. But at the moment when Neb and the sailor were preparing to leave Granite House, the vessel suddenly altered her course, and stood directly for Union Bay. The brig was a good sailor, for she approached rapidly. Neb and Pencroft put off their departure, therefore, and the glass was put into Ayrton's hands, that he might ascertain for certain whether the ship was or was not the Duncan. The Scotch yacht was also rigged as a brig. The question was whether a chimney could be discerned between the two masts of the vessel, which was now at a distance of only five miles. The horizon was still very clear. The examination was easy and Ayrton soon let the glass fall again, saying, "'It is not the Duncan. It could not be.' Pencroft again brought the brig within the range of the telescope, and could see that she was of between three and four hundred tons burden, wonderfully narrow, well-masted, admirably built, and must be a very rapid sailor. 
but to what nation did she belong? That was difficult to say. "'And yet,' added the sailor, "'a flag is floating from her peak, but I cannot distinguish the colours of it.' "'In half an hour we shall be certain about that,' answered the reporter. "'Besides, it is very evident that the intention of the captain of this ship is to land, and consequently, if not to-day, to-morrow at the latest, we shall make his acquaintance.' "'Never mind,' said Pencroft. It is best to know whom we have to deal with, and I shall not be sorry to recognize that fellow's colours. And, while thus speaking, the sailor never left the glass. The day began to fade, and with the day the breeze fell also. The brig's ensign hung in folds, and it became more and more difficult to observe it. "'It is not the American flag,' said Pencroft from time to time nor the English, the red of which could be easily seen, nor the French or German colours, nor the white flag of Russia, nor the yellow of Spain. One would say it was all one colour. Let's see. In these seas what do we generally meet with? The Chilean flag? But that is tricolour. Brazilian? It is green. Japanese? It is yellow and black, while this... At that moment the breeze blew out the unknown flag. Ayrton, seizing the telescope which the sailor had put down, put it to his eye, and in a hoarse voice, "'The black flag!' he exclaimed. And indeed the sombre bunting was floating from the mast of the brig, and they had now good reason for considering her to be a suspicious vessel. Had the engineer then been right in his presentiments? Was this a pirate vessel?' Did she scour the Pacific, competing with the Malay proas which still infest it? For what had she come to look at the shores of Lincoln Island? Was it to them an unknown island, ready to become a magazine for stolen cargoes? Had she come to find on the coast a sheltered port for the winter months? Was the settler's honest domain destined to be transformed into an infamous refuge, the headquarters of the piracy of the Pacific? All these ideas instinctively presented themselves to the colonists' imaginations. There was no doubt, besides, of the signification which must be attached to the colour of the hoisted flag. It was that of pirates. It was that which the Duncan would have carried, had the convicts succeeded in their criminal design. No time was lost before discussing it. "'My friends,' said Cyrus Harding, Perhaps this vessel only wishes to survey the coast of the island. Perhaps her crew will not land. There is a chance of it. However that may be, we ought to do everything we can to hide our presence here. The windmill on Prospect Heights is too easily seen. Let Ayrton and Neb go and take down the sails. We must also conceal the windows of Granite House with thick branches. All the fires must be extinguished so that nothing may betray the presence of men on the island. "'And our vessel?' said Herbert. "'Oh,' answered Pencroft, "'she is sheltered in Port Balloon, and I defy any of those rascals there to find her.' The engineer's orders were immediately executed. Neb and Ayrton ascended the plateau, and took the necessary precautions to conceal any indication of a settlement. While they were thus occupied, their companions went to the border of Jacamar Wood, and brought back a large quantity of branches and creepers, which would at some distance appear as natural foliage, and thus disguise the windows in the granite cliff. At the same time the ammunition and guns were placed ready so to be at hand in case of an unexpected attack. When all these precautions had been taken, "'My friends,' said Harding, and his voice betrayed some emotion. If the wretches endeavoured to seize Lincoln Island, we shall defend it, shall we not? Yes, Cyrus, replied the reporter, and if necessary we will die to defend it. The engineer extended his hand to his companions, who pressed it warmly. Ayrton remained in his corner, not joining the colonists. Perhaps he, the former convict, still felt himself unworthy to do so. Cyrus Harding understood what was passing in Ayrton's mind, and going to him, "'And you, Ayrton,' he asked, 
What will you do? My duty, answered Ayrton. He then took up his station near the window and gazed through the foliage. It was now half-past seven. The sun had disappeared twenty minutes ago behind Granite House. Consequently the eastern horizon was becoming obscured. In the meanwhile the brig continued to advance towards Union Bay. She was now not more than two miles off, and exactly opposite the plateau of Prospect Heights, for after having tacked off Claw Cape she had drifted towards the north in the current of the rising tide. One might have said that at this distance she had already entered the vast bay, for a straight line drawn from Claw Cape to Cape Mandible would have rested on her starboard quarter. Was the brig about to penetrate far into the bay? That was the first question. When once in the bay would she anchor there? That was the second. Would she not content herself with only surveying the coast, and stand out to sea again without landing her crew? They would know this in an hour. The colonists could do nothing but wait. Cyrus Harding had not seen the suspected vessel hoist the black flag without deep anxiety. Was it not a direct menace against the work which he and his companions had till then conducted so successfully? Had these pirates, for the sailors of the brig could be nothing else, already visited the island? since on approaching it they had hoisted their colours. Had they formally invaded it, so that certain unaccountable peculiarities might be explained in this way? Did there exist in the as yet unexplored parts some accomplice ready to enter into communication with them? To all these questions which he mentally asked himself, Harding knew not what to reply, but he felt that the safety of the colony could not but be seriously threatened by the arrival of the brig. However, he and his companions were determined to fight to the last gasp. It would have been very important to know if the pirates were numerous and better armed than the colonists. But how was this information to be obtained? Night fell. The new moon had disappeared. Profound darkness enveloped the island and the sea. No light could pierce through the heavy piles of clouds on the horizon. The wind had died away completely with the twilight. Not a leaf rustled on the trees, not a ripple murmured on the shore. Nothing could be seen of the ship, all her lights being extinguished, and if she was still in sight of the island, her whereabouts could not be discovered. "'Well, who knows?' said Pencroft. Perhaps that cursed craft will stand off during the night, and we shall see nothing of her at daybreak. As if in reply to the sailor's observation, a bright light flashed in the darkness, and a cannon shot was heard. The vessel was still there and had guns on board. Six seconds elapsed between the flash and the report. Therefore the brig was about a mile and a quarter from the coast. At the same time the chains were heard rattling through the hawse-holes. The vessel had just anchored in sight of Granite House. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Two There was no longer any doubt as to the pirates' intentions. They had dropped anchor at a short distance from the island, and it was evident that the next day, by means of their boats, they purposed to land on the beach. Cyrus Harding and his companions were ready to act, but, determined though they were, they must not forget to be prudent. Perhaps their presence might still be concealed in the event of the pirates contenting themselves with landing on the shore, without examining the interior of the island. It might be, indeed, that their only intention was to obtain fresh water from the Mercy and it was not impossible that the bridge, 
thrown across a mile and a half from the mouth, and the manufactory at the chimneys might escape their notice. But why was that flag hoisted at the brig's peak? What was that shot fired for? Pure bravado, doubtless, unless it was a sign of the act of taking possession. Harding knew now that the vessel was well armed. And what had the colonists of Lincoln Island to reply to the pirates' guns? A few muskets only. However, observed Cyrus Harding, here we are in an impregnable position. The enemy cannot discover the mouth of the outlet, now that it is hidden under reeds and grass, and consequently it would be impossible for them to penetrate into Granite House. "'But our plantations, our poultry-yard, our corral, all, everything!' exclaimed Pencroft, stamping his foot. "'They may spoil everything, destroy everything, in a few hours!' "'Everything, Pencroft,' answered Harding, "'and we have no means of preventing them.' "'Are they numerous? That is the question,' said the reporter. "'If they are not more than a dozen, we shall be able to stop them. But forty, fifty, more, perhaps!' "'Captain Harding,' then said Ayrton, advancing towards the engineer, "'will you give me leave?' "'For what, my friend?' "'To go to that vessel to find out the strength of her crew.' "'But Ayrton,' answered the engineer, hesitating, "'you will risk your life. "'Why not, sir? "'That is more than your duty.' "'I have more than my duty to do,' replied Ayrton. "'Will you go to the ship in the boat?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'No, sir, but I, I will swim. A boat would be seen where a man may glide between wind and water.' "'Do you know that the brig is a mile and a quarter from the shore?' said Herbert. "'I am a good swimmer, Mr. Herbert.' "'I tell you it is risking your life,' said the engineer. "'That is no matter,' answered Ayrton. Captain Harding, I ask this as a favor. Perhaps it will be a means of raising me in my own eyes. Go, Ayrton, replied the engineer, who felt sure that a refusal would have deeply wounded the former convict, now become an honest man. I will accompany you, said Pencroft. You mistrust me, said Ayrton quickly, then more humbly. Alas! No, no! exclaimed Harding with animation. No, Ayrton! Pencroft does not mistrust you. You interpret his words wrongly. Indeed, returned the sailor. I only propose to accompany Ayrton as far as the islet. It may be, although it is scarcely possible, that one of these villains has landed, and in that case two men will not be too many to hinder him from giving the alarm. I will wait for Ayrton on the islet and he shall go alone to the vessel, since he is proposed to do so. These things agreed to, Ayrton made preparations for his departure. His plan was bold, but it might succeed, thanks to the darkness of the night. Once arrived at the vessel's side, Ayrton, holding on to the main chains, might reconnoiter the number, and perhaps overhear the intentions of the pirates. Ayrton and Pencroft, followed by their companions, descended to the beach. Ayrton undressed and rubbed himself with grease, so as to suffer less from the temperature of the water, which was still cold. He might indeed be obliged to remain in it for several hours. Pencroft and Neb, during this time, had gone to fetch the boat, moored a few hundred feet higher up on the bank of the Mercy, and by the time they returned, Ayrton was ready to start. A coat was thrown over his shoulders, and the settlers all came round him to press his hand. Ayrton then shoved off with Pencroft in the boat. It was half-past ten in the evening when the two adventurers disappeared in the darkness. Their companions returned to wait at the chimneys. The channel was easily traversed, and the boat touched the opposite shore of the islet. This was not done without precaution, for fear lest the pirates might be roaming about there. But after a careful survey it was evident that the islet was deserted. Ayrton then, followed by Pencroft, crossed it with a rapid step, scaring the birds nestled in the holes in the rocks. Then, without hesitating, he plunged into the sea, 
and swam noiselessly in the direction of the ship, in which a few lights had recently appeared, showing her exact situation. As to Pencroft, he crouched down in a cleft of the rock, and awaited the return of his companion. In the meanwhile, Ayrton, swimming with a vigorous stroke, glided through the sheet of water without producing the slightest ripple. His head just emerged above it, and his eyes were fixed on the dark hull of the brig, from which the lights were reflected in the water. He thought only of the duty which he had promised to accomplish, and nothing of the danger which he ran, not only on board the ship, but in the sea, often frequented by sharks. The current bore him along, and he rapidly receded from the shore. Half an hour afterwards, Ayrton, without having been either seen or heard, arrived at the ship, and caught hold of the main chains. He took breath then, hoisting himself up, he managed to reach the extremity of the cutwater. There were drying several pairs of sailors' trousers. He put on a pair. Then, settling himself firmly, he listened. They were not sleeping on board the brig. On the contrary, they were talking, singing, laughing. And these were the sentences, accompanied with oaths, which principally struck Ayrton. "'Our brig is a famous acquisition. She sails well, and merits her name of the Speedy. She would show all the navy of Norfolk a clean pair of heels. Hurrah for her captain! Hurrah for Bob Harvey!' What Ayrton felt when he overheard this fragment of conversation may be understood when it is known that in this Bob Harvey he recognized one of his old Australian companions, a daring sailor, who had continued his criminal career. Bob Harvey had seized, on the shores of Norfolk Island, this brig, which was loaded with arms, ammunition, utensils, and tools of all sorts, destined for one of the Sandwich Islands. All his gang had gone on board, and pirates, after having been convicts, these wretches, more ferocious than the Malays themselves, scoured the Pacific, destroying vessels and massacring their crews. The convicts spoke loudly. They recounted their deeds, drinking deeply at the same time. And this is what Ayrton gathered. The actual crew of the Speedy was composed solely of English prisoners, escaped from Norfolk Island. Here it may be well to explain what this island was. In twenty-nine degrees two minutes south latitude, and one hundred sixty-five degrees forty-two minutes east longitude, to the east of Australia, is found a little island six miles in circumference, overlooked by Mount Pitt, which rises to a height of eleven hundred feet above the level of the sea. This is Norfolk Island, once the seat of an establishment in which were lodged the most intractable convicts from the English penitentiaries. They numbered five hundred, under an iron discipline, threatened with terrible punishments, and were guarded by one hundred and fifty soldiers, and one hundred and fifty employed under the orders of the governor. It would be difficult to imagine a collection of greater ruffians. Sometimes, although very rarely, notwithstanding the extreme surveillance of which they were the object, many managed to escape, and, seizing vessels which they surprised, they infested the Polynesian archipelagos. Thus had Bob Harvey and his companions done. Thus had Ayrton formerly wished to do. Bob Harvey had seized the brig Speedy, anchored in sight of Norfolk Island. The crew had been massacred, and for a year this ship had scoured the Pacific, under the command of Harvey, now a pirate, and well known to Ayrton. The convicts were, for the most part, assembled under the poop, but a few, stretched on the deck, were talking loudly. The conversations still continued amid shouts and libations. Ayrton learned that chance alone had brought the speedy inside of Lincoln Island. Bob Harvey had never yet set foot on it. But, as Cyrus Harding had conjectured, finding this unknown land in his course, its position being marked on no chart, he had formed the project of visiting it, and, if he found it suitable, of making it the brig's headquarters. As to the black flag hoisted at the Speedy's peak, and the gun which had been fired, in imitation of men of war when they lower their colors, 
It was pure piratical bravado. It was in no way a signal, and no communication yet existed between the convicts and Lincoln Island. The settlers' domain was now menaced with terrible danger. Evidently the island, with its water, its harbour, its resources of all kinds so increased in value by the colonists, and the concealment afforded by Granite House, could not but be convenient for the convicts. In their hands it would become an excellent place of refuge, and, being unknown, it would assure them, for a long time perhaps, impunity and security. Evidently also the lives of the settlers would not be respected, and Bob Harvey and his accomplices' first care would be to massacre them without mercy. Harding and his companions had, therefore, not even the choice of flying and hiding themselves in the island, since the convicts intended to reside there, and since, in the event of the speedy departing on an expedition, it was probable that some of the crew would remain on shore, so as to settle themselves there. Therefore it would be necessary to fight, to destroy every one of these scoundrels, unworthy of pity, and against whom any means would be right. So thought Ayrton, and he well knew that Cyrus Harding would be of his way of thinking. But was resistance, and in the last place, victory, possible? That would depend on the equipment of the brig, and the number of men which she carried. This Ayrton resolved learn at any cost, and as an hour after his arrival the vociferations had begun to die away, and as a large number of the convicts were already buried in a drunken sleep, Ayrton did not hesitate to venture on to the Speedy's deck, which the extinguished lanterns now left in total darkness. He hoisted himself on to the cutwater, and by the bowsprit arrived at the forecastle. Then, gliding among the convicts stretched here and there, he made the round of the ship, and found that the Speedy carried four guns, which would throw shot of from eight to ten pounds in weight. He found also, on touching them, that these guns were breech-loaders. They were, therefore, of modern make, easily used, and of terrible effect. As to the men lying on the deck, they were about ten in number but it was to be supposed that more were sleeping down below. Besides, by listening to them, Ayrton had understood that there were fifty on board. That was a large number for the six settlers of Lincoln Island to contend with. But now, thanks to Ayrton's devotion, Cyrus Harding would not be surprised. He would know the strength of his adversaries, and would make his arrangements accordingly. There was nothing more for Ayrton to do but to return and rendered to his companions an account of the mission with which he had charged himself, and he prepared to regain the bows of the brig so that he might let himself down into the water. But to this man whose wish was, as he had said, to do more than his duty, there came an heroic thought. This was to sacrifice his own life, but save the island and the colonists. Cyrus Harding evidently could not resist fifty ruffians, all well armed, who, either by penetrating by main force into Granite House, or by starving out the besieged, could obtain from them what they wanted. And then he thought of his preservers, those who had made him again a man, and an honest man, those to whom he owed all, murdered without pity, their works destroyed, their island turned into a pirate's den. He said to himself that he, Ayrton, was the principal cause of so many disasters, since his old companion, Bob Harvey, had but realized his own plans, and a feeling of horror took possession of him. Then he was seized with an irresistible desire to blow up the brig, and with her all whom she had on board. He would perish in the explosion, but he would have done his duty. Ayrton did not hesitate. To reach the powder-room, which is always situated in the after-part of a vessel, was easy. There would be no want of powder in a vessel which followed such a trade, and a spark would be enough to destroy it in an instant. Ayrton stole carefully along the between-decks, strewn with numerous sleepers, overcome more by drunkenness than sleep. A lantern was lighted at the foot of the mainmast. 
around which was hung a gun-rack, furnished with weapons of all sorts. Ayrton took a revolver from the rack, and assured himself that it was loaded and primed. Nothing more was needed to accomplish the work of destruction. He then glided towards the stern, so as to arrive under the brig's poop at the powder magazine. It was difficult to proceed along the dimly lighted deck without stumbling over some half-sleeping convict, who retorted by oaths and kicks. Ayrton was therefore more than once obliged to halt, but at last he arrived at the partition dividing the after-cabin, and found the door opening into the magazine itself. Ayrton, compelled to force it open, set to work. It was a difficult operation to perform without noise, for he had to break a padlock. But under his vigorous hand the padlock broke, and the door was open. At that moment a hand was laid on Ayrton's shoulder. "'What are you doing here?' asked a tall man, in a harsh voice, who, standing in the shadow, quickly threw the light of a lantern on Ayrton's face. Ayrton drew back. In the rapid flash of the lantern he had recognized his former accomplice, Bob Harvey, who could not have known him, as he must have thought Ayrton long since dead. "'What are you doing here?' again said Bob Harvey, seizing Ayrton by the waistband. But Ayrton, without replying, wrenched himself from his grasp, and attempted to rush into the magazine. A shot fired into the midst of the powder casks, and all would be over. "'Help, lads!' shouted Bob Harvey. Had his shout two or three pirates awoke, jumped up, and, rushing on Ayrton, endeavoured to throw him down. He soon extricated himself from their grasp. He fired his revolver, and two of the convicts fell, but a blow from a knife which he could not ward off made a gash in his shoulder. Ayrton perceived that he could no longer hope to carry out his project. Bob Harvey had reclosed the door of the powder magazine, and a movement on the deck indicated a general awakening of the pirates. Ayrton must reserve himself to fight at the side of Cyrus Harding. There was nothing for him but flight. But was flight still possible? It was doubtful, yet Ayrton resolved to dare everything in order to rejoin his companions. Four barrels of the revolver were still undischarged. Two were fired. One, aimed at Bob Harvey, did not wound him, or at any rate only slightly and Ayrton, profiting by the momentary retreat of his adversaries, rushed towards the companion-ladder to gain the deck. Passing before the lantern, he smashed it with a blow from the butt of his revolver. A profound darkness ensued, which favoured his flight. Two or three pirates, awakened by the noise, were descending the ladder at the same moment. A fifth shot from Ayrton laid one low, and the others drew back, not understanding what was going on. Ayrton was on deck in two bounds, and three seconds later, having discharged his last barrel in the face of a pirate who was about to seize him by the throat, he leaped over the bulwarks into the sea. Ayrton had not made six strokes before shots were splashing around him like hail. What were Pencroft's feelings, sheltered under a rock on the islet? What were those of Harding, the reporter, Herbert, and Neb, crouched in the chimneys when they heard the reports on board the brig? They rushed out on to the beach, and their guns shouldered, they stood ready to repel any attack. They had no doubt about it themselves. Ayrton, surprised by the pirates, had been murdered, and perhaps the wretches would profit by the night to make a descent on the island. Half an hour was passed in terrible anxiety. The firing had ceased, and yet neither Ayrton nor Pencroft had reappeared. Was the islet invaded? Ought they not to fly to the help of Ayrton and Pencroft? But how? The tide, being high at that time, rendered the channel impassable. The boat was not there. We may imagine the horrible anxiety which took possession of Harding and his companions. At last, towards half-past twelve, a boat carrying two men touched the beach. It was Ayrton, slightly wounded in the shoulder, and Pencroft, safe and sound whom their friends received with open arms. All immediately took refuge in the chimneys. There Ayrton recounted all that had passed, even to his plan for blowing up the brig, which he had attempted to put into execution. 
all hands were extended to Ayrton, who did not conceal from them that their situation was serious. The pirates had been alarmed. They knew that Lincoln Island was inhabited. They would land upon it in numbers and well armed. They would respect nothing. Should the settlers fall into their hands, they must expect no mercy. "'Well, we shall know how to die,' said the reporter. "'Let us go in and watch,' answered the engineer. "'Have we any chance of escape, Captain?' asked the sailor. "'Yes, Pencroft.' "'Huh! Uh, six against fifty. "'Yes, six, without counting.' "'Who?' asked Pencroft. Cyrus did not reply but pointed upwards. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Three, Chapter Three The night passed without incident. The colonists were on the qui vive, and did not leave their post at the chimneys. The pirates, on their side, did not appear to have made any attempt to land. Since the last shots fired at Ayrton, not a report, not even a sound, had betrayed the presence of the brig in the neighborhood of the island. It might have been fancied that she had weighed anchor, thinking that she had to deal with her match, and had left the coast. But it was no such thing, and when day began to dawn, the settlers could see a confused mass through the morning mist. It was the Speedy. "'These, my friends,' said the engineer, are the arrangements which appear to me best to make before the fog completely clears away. It hides us from the eyes of the pirates, and we can act without attracting their attention. The most important thing is that the convicts should believe that the inhabitants of the island are numerous, and consequently capable of resisting them. I therefore propose that we divide into three parties, the first of which shall be posted at the chimneys, the second at the mouth of the Mercy. As to the third, I think it would be best to place it on the islet, so as to prevent, or at all events delay, any attempt at landing. We have the use of two rifles and four muskets. Each of us will be armed, and as we are amply provided with powder and shot, we need not spare our fire. We have nothing to fear from the muskets, nor even from the guns of the brig. What can they do against these rocks? And as we shall not fire from the windows of Granite House, the pirates will not think of causing irreparable damage by throwing shell against it. What is to be feared is the necessity of meeting hand to hand, since the convicts have numbers on their side. We must therefore try to prevent them from landing, but without discovering ourselves. Therefore do not economize the ammunition. Fire often, but with a sure aim. We have each eight or ten enemies to kill, and they must be killed. Cyrus Harding had clearly represented their situation, although he spoke in the calmest voice, as if it was a question of directing a piece of work and not ordering a battle. His companions approved these arrangements without even uttering a word. There was nothing more to be done but for each to take his place before the fog should be completely dissipated. Neb and Pencroft immediately ascended to Granite House and brought back a sufficient quantity of ammunition. Gideon Spilett and Ayrton, both very good marksmen, were armed with the two rifles, which carried nearly a mile. The four other muskets were divided among Harding, Neb, Pegcroft, and Herbert. The posts were arranged in the following manner. Cyrus Harding and Herbert remained in ambush at the chimneys, thus commanding the shore to the foot of Granite House. Gideon Spilett and Neb crouched among the rocks at the mouth of the Mercy, from which the drawbridges had been raised, so as to prevent any one from crossing in a boat or landing on the opposite shore. As to Ayrton and Pencroft, they shoved off in the boat and prepared to cross the channel and to take up two separate stations on the islet. 
In this way, shots being fired from four different points at once, the convicts would be led to believe that the island was both largely peopled and strongly defended. In the event of a landing being effected without their having been able to prevent it, and also if they saw that they were on the point of being cut off by the brig's boat, Ayrton and Pencroft were to return in their boat to the shore and proceed towards the threatened spot. Before starting to occupy their posts, the colonists for the last time wrung each other's hands. Pencroft succeeded in controlling himself sufficiently to suppress his emotion when he embraced Herbert, his boy, and then they separated. In a few moments Harding and Herbert on one side, the reporter and Neb on the other, had disappeared behind the rocks, and five minutes later Ayrton and Pencroft, having without difficulty crossed the channel, disembarked on the islet and concealed themselves in the clefts of its eastern shore. None of them could have been seen, for they themselves could scarcely distinguish the brig in the fog. It was half-past six in the morning. Soon the fog began to clear away, and the topmasts of the brig issued from the vapour. For some minutes great masses rolled over the surface of the sea. Then a breeze sprang up, which rapidly dispelled the mists. The Speedy now appeared in full view, with a spring on her cable, her head to the north, presenting her larboard side to the island. Just as Harding had calculated, she was not more than a mile and a quarter from the coast. The sinister black flag floated from the peak. The engineer, with his telescope, could see that the four guns on board were pointed at the island. They were evidently ready to fire at a moment's notice. In the meanwhile the Speedy remained silent. About thirty pirates could be seen moving on the deck. A few more on the poop, two others posted in the shrouds and armed with spy-glasses, were attentively surveying the island. Certainly Bob Harvey and his crew would not be able easily to give an account of what had happened during the night on board the brig. Had this half-naked man, who had forced the door of the powder magazine, and with whom they had struggled, who had six times discharged his revolver at them, who had killed one and wounded two others, escaped their shot? Had he been able to swim to shore? Whence did he come? What had been his object? Had his design really been to blow up the brig, as Bob Harvey had thought? All this must be confused enough to the convicts' minds. But what they could no longer doubt was that the unknown island before which the Speedy had cast anchor was inhabited, and that there was, perhaps, a numerous colony ready to defend it. And yet no one was to be seen, neither on the shore nor on the heights. The beach appeared to be absolutely deserted. At any rate there was no trace of dwellings. Had the inhabitants fled into the interior? Thus probably the pirate captain reasoned, and doubtless, like a prudent man, he wished to reconnoitre the locality before he allowed his men to venture there. During an hour and a half no indication of attack or landing could be observed on board the brig. Evidently Bob Harvey was hesitating. Even with his strongest telescopes he could not have perceived one of the settlers crouched among the rocks. It was not even probable that his attention had been awakened by the screen of green branches and creepers hiding the windows of Granite House, and showing rather conspicuously on the bare rock. Indeed, how could he imagine that a dwelling was hollowed out at that height in the solid granite? From Claw Cape to the Mandible Capes, in all the extent of Union Bay, there was nothing to lead him to suppose that the island was or could be inhabited. At eight o'clock, however, the colonists observed a movement on board the Speedy. A boat was lowered, and seven men jumped into her. They were armed with muskets. One took the yoke lines, four others the oars, and the two others, kneeling in the bows, ready to fire, reconnoitred the island. Their object was no doubt to make an examination, but not to land, for in the latter case they would have come in larger numbers. The pirates from their lookout could have seen that the coast was sheltered by an islet, separated from it by a channel half a mile in width. However, it was soon evident to Cyrus Harding, 
on observing the direction followed by the boat, that they would not attempt to penetrate into the channel, but would land on the islet. Pencroft and Ayrton, each hidden in a narrow cleft of the rock, saw them coming directly towards them, and waited till they were within range. The boat advanced with extreme caution. The oars only dipped into the water at long intervals. It could now be seen that one of the convicts held a lead-line in his hand, and that he wished to fathom the depth of the channel, hollowed out by the current of the Mercy. This showed that it was Bob Harvey's intention to bring his brig as near as possible to the coast. About thirty pirates, scattered in the rigging, followed every movement of the boat, and took the bearings of certain landmarks which would allow them to approach without danger. The boat was not more than two cables' lengths off the islet when she stopped. The man at the tiller stood up and looked for the best place at which to land. At that moment two shots were heard. Smoke curled up from among the rocks of the islet. The man at the helm and the man with the lead line fell backwards into the boat. Ayrton's and Pencroft's balls had struck them both at the same moment. Almost immediately a louder report was heard. A cloud of smoke issued from the brig's side, and a ball, striking the summit of the rock which sheltered Ayrton and Pencroft, made it fly in splinters, but the two marksmen remained unhurt. Horrible imprecations burst from the boat, which immediately continued its way. The man who had been at the tiller was replaced by one of his comrades, and the oars were rapidly plunged into the water. However, instead of returning on board as might have been expected, the boat coasted along the islet so as to round its southern point. The pirates pulled vigorously at their oars, that they might get out of range of the bullets. They advanced to within five cable lengths of that part of the shore terminated by Flotsam Point, and after having rounded it in a semicircular line, still protected by the brig's guns, they proceeded towards the mouth of the Mercy. Their evident intention was to penetrate into the channel, and cut off the colonists posted on the islet in such a way that whatever their number might be, being placed between the fire from the boat and the fire from the brig, they would find themselves in a very disadvantageous position. A quarter of an hour passed while the boat advanced in this direction. Absolute silence, perfect calm reigned in the air and on the water. Pencroft and Ayrton, although they knew they ran the risk of being cut off, had not left their post, both that they did not wish to show themselves as yet to their assailants, and expose themselves to the Speedy's guns, and that they relied on Neb and Gideon Spilett, watching at the mouth of the river, and on Cyrus Harding and Herbert in ambush among the rocks at the chimneys. Twenty minutes after the first shots were fired, the boat was less than two cable lengths off the Mercy. As the tide was beginning to rise with its accustomed violence, caused by the narrowness of the straits, the pirates were drawn towards the river, and it was only by dint of hard rowing that they were able to keep in the middle of the channel. But as they were passing within good range of the mouth of the Mercy, two balls saluted them, and two more of their number were laid in the bottom of the boat. Neb and Spilett had not missed their aim. The brig immediately sent a second ball on the post betrayed by the smoke, but without any other result than that of splintering the rock. The boat now contained only three able men. Carried on by the current, it shot through the channel with the rapidity of an arrow, passed before Harding and Herbert, who, not thinking it within range, withheld their fire. Then, rounding the northern point of the islet with the two remaining oars, they pulled towards the brig. Hitherto the settlers had nothing to complain of. Their adversaries had certainly had the worst of it. The latter already counted four men seriously wounded, if not dead. They, on the contrary, unwounded, had not missed a shot. If the pirates continued to attack them in this way, if they renewed their attempt to land by means of a boat, they could be destroyed one by one. It was now seen how advantageous the engineers' arrangements had been. The pirates would think that they had to deal with numerous and well-armed adversaries, whom they could not easily get the better of. Half an hour passed before the boat, having to pull against the current, could get alongside the speedy. 
Frightful cries were heard when they returned on board with the wounded, and two or three guns were fired, with no results. But now about a dozen other convicts, maddened with rage, and possibly by the effect of the evening's potations, threw themselves into the boat. A second boat was also lowered, in which eight men took their places, and while the first pulled straight for the islet, to dislodge the colonists from thence, the second manoeuvred so as to force the entrance of the Mercy. The situation was evidently becoming very dangerous for Pencroft and Ayrton, and they saw that they must regain the mainland. However, they waited till the first boat was within range, when two well-directed balls threw its crew into disorder. Then Pencroft and Ayrton, abandoning their posts, under fire from the dozen muskets, ran across the islet at full speed, jumped into their boat, crossed the channel at the moment the second boat reached the southern end, and ran to hide themselves in the chimneys. They had scarcely rejoined Cyrus Harding and Herbert before the islet was overrun with pirates in every direction. Almost at the same moment fresh reports resounded from the Mercy Station, to which the second boat was rapidly approaching. Two out of the eight men who manned her were mortally wounded by Gideon Spilett and Neb, and the boat herself, carried irresistibly on to the reefs, was stove in at the mouth of the Mercy. But the six survivors, holding their muskets above their heads to preserve them from contact with the water, managed to land on the right bank of the river. Then, finding they were exposed to the fire of the ambush there, they fled in the direction of Flotsam Point, out of range of the balls. The actual situation was this. On the islet were a dozen convicts, of whom some were no doubt wounded, but who had still a boat at their disposal. On the island were six, but who could not by any possibility reach Granite House, as they could not cross the river, all the bridges being raised. Hallo! exclaimed Pencroft, as he rushed into the chimneys. "'Hallo, Captain! What do you think of it now?' "'I think,' answered the engineer, "'that the combat will now take a new form, for it cannot be supposed that the convicts will be so foolish as to remain in a position so unfavourable for them.' "'They won't cross the channel,' said the sailor. "'Ayrton and Mr. Spilett's rifles are there to prevent them. You know that they carry more than a mile.' "'No doubt.' replied Herbert. But what can two rifles do against the brig's guns? Well, the brig isn't in the channel yet, I fancy, said Pencroft. But suppose she does come there, said Harding. That's impossible, for she would risk running aground and being lost. It is possible, said Ayrton. The convicts might profit by the high tide to enter the channel, with the risk of grounding at low tide, it is true, but then, under the fire from her guns, our posts would be no longer tenable. "'Confound them!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'It really seems as if the blackguards were preparing to weigh anchor.' "'Perhaps we should be obliged to take refuge in Granite House,' observed Herbert. "'We must wait,' answered Cyrus Harding. "'But Mr. Spilett and Neb?' said Pencroft. They will know when it is best to rejoin us. Be ready, Ayrton. It is yours and Spilett's rifles which must speak now. It was only too true. The Speedy was beginning to weigh her anchor, and her intention was evidently to approach the islet. The tide would be rising for an hour and a half, and the ebb current, being already weakened, it would be easy for the brig to advance. But as to entering the channel, Pencroft, contrary to Ayrton's opinion, could not believe that she would dare to attempt it. In the meanwhile, the pirates who occupied the islet had gradually advanced to the opposite shore, and were now only separated from the mainland by the channel. Being armed with muskets alone, they could do no harm to the settlers, in ambush at the chimneys and the mouth of the Mercy, but, not knowing the latter to be supplied with long-range rifles, they on their side did not believe themselves to be exposed. Quite uncovered, therefore, they surveyed the islet and examined the shore. Their illusion was of short duration. Ayrton's and Gideon Spilett's rifles then spoke, and no doubt imparted some very disagreeable intelligence to two of the convicts, for they fell backwards. Then there was a general helter-skelter, 
the ten others, not even stopping to pick up their dead or wounded companions, fled to the other side of the islet, tumbled into the boat which had brought them, and pulled away with all their strength. Eight less! exclaimed Pencroft. Really, one would have thought that Mr. Spillett and Ayrton had given the word to fire together. Gentlemen, said Ayrton, as he reloaded his gun, this is becoming more serious. The brig is making sail. The anchor is weighed! exclaimed Pencroft. Yes, and she is already moving. In fact, they could distinctly hear the creaking of the windlass. The speedy was at first held by her anchor. Then, when that had been raised, she began to drift towards the shore. The wind was blowing from the sea. The jib and the fore-topsail were hoisted, and the vessel gradually approached the island. From the two posts of the Mercy and the Chimneys they watched her without giving a sign of life, but not without some emotion. What could be more terrible for the colonists than to be exposed, at a short distance, to the brig's guns, without being able to reply with any effect? How could they then prevent the pirates from landing? Cyrus Harding felt this strongly, and he asked himself what it would be possible to do. Before long he would be called upon for his determination. But what was it to be? To shut themselves up in Granite House, to be besieged there, to remain there for weeks, for months even, since they had an abundance of provisions? So far good, but after that! The pirates would not the less be masters of the island, which they would ravage at their pleasure, and in time they would end by having their revenge on the prisoners in Granite House. However, one chance yet remained. It was that Bob Harvey, after all, would not venture his ship into the channel, and that he would keep outside the islet. He would be still separated from the coast by half a mile, and at that distance his shot could not be very destructive. Never! repeated Pencroft. Bob Harvey will never, if he is a good seaman, enter that channel. He knows well that it would risk the brig, if the sea got up ever so little. And what would become of him without his vessel? In the meanwhile the brig approached the islet, and it could be seen that she was endeavouring to make the lower end. The breeze was light, and as the current had then lost much of its force, Bob Harvey had absolute command over his vessel. The route previously followed by the boats had allowed her to reconnoitre the channel, and she boldly entered it. The pirate's design was now only too evident. He wished to bring her broadside to bear on the chimneys, and from there to reply with shell and ball to the shot, which had till then decimated her crew. Soon the Speedy reached the point of the islet. She rounded it with ease. The mainsail was braced up, and the brig, hugging the wind, stood across the mouth of the Mercy. "'The scoundrels! They are coming!' said Pencroft. At that moment Cyrus Harding, Ayrton, the sailor, and Herbert were rejoined by Neb and Gideon Spilett. The reporter and his companion had judged it best to abandon the post at the Mercy, from which they could do nothing against the ship, and they had acted wisely. It was better that the colonists should be together at the moment when they were about to engage in a decisive action. Gideon Spilett and Neb had arrived by dodging behind the rocks though not without attracting a shower of bullets, which had not, however, reached them. "'Spill it! Neb!' cried the engineer. "'You are not wounded?' "'No,' answered the reporter. "'A few bruises only from the ricochet. But that cursed brig has entered the channel.' "'Yes,' replied Pencroft, "'and in ten minutes she will have anchored before Granite House.' "'Have you formed any plan, Cyrus?' asked the reporter. We must take refuge in Granite House while there is still time, and the convicts cannot see us. That is my opinion, too, replied Gideon Spilett. But once shut up, we must be guided by circumstances, said the engineer. Let us be off, then, and make haste, said the reporter. Would you not wish, Captain, that Ayrton and I should remain here? asked the sailor. What would be the use of that, Pencroft? replied Harding. No. We will not separate. There was not a moment to be lost. 
the colonists left the chimneys. A bend of the cliff prevented them from being seen by those in the brig, but two or three reports, and the crash of bullets on the rock, told them that the Speedy was at no great distance. To spring into the lift, hoist themselves up to the door of Granite House, where Top and Jupe had been shut up since the evening before, to rush into the large room, was the work of a minute only. It was quite time, for the settlers, through the branches, could see the Speedy, surrounded with smoke, gliding up the channel. The firing was incessant, and shot from the four guns struck blindly, both on the mercy post, although it was not occupied, and on the chimneys. The rocks were splintered, and cheers accompanied each discharge. However, they were hoping that Granite House would be spared, thanks to Harding's precaution of concealing the windows, when a shot, piercing the door, penetrated into the passage. "'We are discovered!' exclaimed Pencroft. The colonists had not, perhaps, been seen, but it was certain that Bob Harvey had thought proper to send a ball through the suspected foliage which concealed that part of the cliff. Soon he redoubled his attack, when another ball, having torn away the leafy screen, disclosed a gaping aperture in the granite. The colonists' situation was desperate. Their retreat was discovered. They could not oppose any obstacle to these missiles, nor protect the stone which flew in splinters around them. There was nothing to be done but to take refuge in the upper passage of Granite House, and leave their dwelling to be devastated, when a deep roar was heard, followed by frightful cries. Cyrus Harding and his companion rushed to one of the windows. The brig, irresistibly raised on a sort of water-spout, had just split in two, and in less than ten seconds she was swallowed up with all her criminal crew. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Three, Chapter Four. She is blown up, cried Herbert. Yes, blown up, just as if Ayrton had set fire to the powder returned Pencroft, throwing himself into the lift, together with Neb and the lad. "'But what has happened?' asked Gideon Spilett, quite stunned by this unexpected catastrophe. "'Oh, this time we shall know,' answered the engineer quickly. "'What shall we know?' "'Later, later. Come, Spilett. The main point is that these pirates have been exterminated.' And Cyrus Harding, hurrying away the reporter and Ayrton, joined Pencroft, Neb, and Herbert on the beach. Nothing could be seen of the brig, not even her masts. After having been raised by the water-spout, she had fallen on her side, and had sunk in that position, doubtless in consequence of some enormous leak. But as in that place the channel was not more than twenty feet in depth, it was certain that the sides of the submerged brig would reappear at low water. A few things from the wreck floated on the surface of the water. A raft could be seen consisting of spare spars, coops of poultry with their occupants still living, boxes and barrels, which gradually came to the surface, after having escaped through the hatchways. But no pieces of the wreck appeared, neither planks from the deck nor timber from the hull, which rendered the sudden disappearance of the Speedy perfectly inexplicable. However, two masts, which had been broken and escaped from the shrouds and stays, came up, and with their sails, some furled, and the others spread. But it was not necessary to wait for the tide to bring up these riches, and Ayrton and Pencroft jumped into the boat with the intention of towing the pieces of wreck either to the beach or to the islet. But just as they were shoving off, an observation from Gideon Spilett arrested them. "'What about those six convicts who disembarked on the right bank of the Mercy?' said he. 
In fact, it would not do to forget that the six men, whose boat had gone to pieces on the rocks, had landed at Flotsam Point. They looked in that direction. None of the fugitives were visible. It was probable that, having seen their vessel engulfed in the channel, they had fled into the interior of the island. "'We will deal with them later,' said Harding. "'As they are armed, they will still be dangerous, but as it is six against six, the chances are equal. To the most pressing business first. Ayrton and Pencroft pulled vigorously towards the wreck. The sea was calm, and the tide very high, as there had been a new moon but two days before. A whole hour at least would elapse before the hull of the brig could emerge from the water of the channel. Ayrton and Pencroft were able to fasten the masts and spars by means of ropes, the ends of which were carried to the beach. There, by the united efforts of the settlers, the pieces of wreck were hauled up. Then the boat picked up all that was floating, coops, barrels, and boxes, which were immediately carried to the chimneys. Several bodies floated also. Among them Ayrton recognized that of Bob Harvey, which he pointed out to his companion, saying with some emotion, "'That is what I have been, Bancroft.' "'But what you are no longer, brave Ayrton!' returned the sailor warmly. It was singular enough that so few bodies floated. Only five or six were counted, which were already being carried by the current towards the open sea. Very probably the convicts had not had time to escape, and the ship lying over on her side, the greater number of them had remained below. Now the current, and by carrying the bodies of these miserable men out to sea, would spare the colonists the sad task of burying them in some corner of their island. For two hours Cyrus Harding and his companions were solely occupied in hauling up the spars on to the sand, and then in spreading the sails which were perfectly uninjured to dry. They spoke little, for they were absorbed in their work, but what thoughts occupied their minds? The possession of this brig, or rather all that she contained, was a perfect mine of wealth. In fact, a ship is like a little world in miniature, and the stores of the colony would be increased by a large number of useful articles. It would be, on a large scale, equivalent to the chest found at Flotsam Point. "'And besides,' thought Pencroft, "'why should it be impossible to refloat the brig? If she has only a leak, that may be stopped up. A vessel from three to four hundred tons why, she is a regular ship compared to our Bonaventure, and we could go a long distance in her. We could go anywhere we liked. Captain Harding, Ayrton, and I must examine her. She would be well worth the trouble. In fact, if the brig were still fit to navigate, the colonists' chances of returning to their native land were singularly increased. But to decide this important question— it was necessary to wait until the tide was quite low, so that every part of the brig's hull might be examined. When their treasures had been safely conveyed on shore, Harding and his companions agreed to devote some minutes to breakfast. They were almost famished. Fortunately, the larder was not far off, and Neb was noted for being an expeditious cook. They breakfasted, therefore, near the chimneys and during their repast, as may be supposed, nothing was talked of but the event which had so miraculously saved the colony. "'Miraculous is the word,' repeated Pencroft, "'for it must be acknowledged that those rascals blew up just at the right moment. Granite House was beginning to be uncomfortable as a habitation.' "'And can you guess, Pencroft,' asked the reporter, "'how it happened, or what can have occasioned the explosion?' "'Oh, Mr. Spilett, nothing is more simple,' answered Pencroft. "'A convict vessel is not disciplined like a man of war. Convicts are not sailors. Of course the powder magazine was open, and as they were firing incessantly, some careless or clumsy fellow just blew up the vessel.' "'Captain Harding,' said Herbert, "'what astonishes me is that the explosion has not produced more effect. The report was not loud.' and besides there are so few planks and timbers torn out. It seems as if the ship had rather foundered than blown up. Does that astonish you, my boy? 
asked the engineer. "'Yes, Captain.' "'And it astonishes me also, Herbert,' replied he. "'But when we visit the hull of the brig, we shall no doubt find the explanation of the matter.' "'Why, Captain,' said Pencroft, "'you don't suppose that the Speedy simply foundered like a ship which is struck on a rock?' "'Why not?' observed Neb. "'If there are rocks in the channel—' "'Nonsense, Neb,' answered Pencroft. "'You did not look at the right moment. An instant before she sank, the brig, as I saw perfectly well, rose on an enormous wave, and fell back on her larboard side. Now, if she had only struck, she would have sunk quietly, and gone to the bottom like an honest vessel.' "'It was just because she was not an honest vessel,' returned Neb. "'Well, we shall soon see, Pencroft,' said the engineer. "'We shall soon see,' rejoined the sailor. "'But I would wager my head there are no rocks in the channel. "'Look here, Captain, to speak candidly, "'do you mean to say that there is anything marvellous in the occurrence?' "'Cyrus Harding did not answer. "'At any rate,' said Gideon Spilett, "'whether rock or explosion, you will agree, Pencroft, "'that it occurred just in the nick of time.' "'Yes, yes,' replied the sailor. "'But that is not the question. I ask Captain Harding if he sees anything supernatural in all this.' "'I cannot say, Pencroft,' said the engineer. "'That is all the answer I can make.' A reply which did not satisfy Pencroft at all. He stuck to an explosion, and did not wish to give it up. He would never consent to admit that in that channel— with its fine sandy bed, just like the beach, which he had often crossed at low water, there could be an unknown rock. And besides, at the time the brig foundered, it was high water, that is to say, there was enough water to carry the vessel clear over any rocks which would not be uncovered at low tide. Therefore there could not have been a collision. Therefore the vessel had not struck. So she had blown up and it must be confessed that the sailors' arguments were reasonable. Towards half-past one, the colonists embarked in the boat to visit the wreck. It was to be regretted that the brig's two boats had not been saved, but one, as has been said, had gone to pieces at the mouth of the Mercy, and was absolutely useless. The other had disappeared when the brig went down, and had not again been seen, having doubtless been crushed. The hull of the Speedy was just beginning to issue from the water. The brig was lying right over on her side, for her mast being broken, pressed down by the weight of the ballast displaced by the shock, the keel was visible along her whole length. She had been regularly turned over by the inexplicable but frightful submarine action, which had been at the same time manifested by an enormous water-spout. The settlers rowed round the hull and in proportion as the tide went down, they could ascertain, if not the cause which had occasioned the catastrophe, at least the effect produced. Towards the bows, on both sides of the keel, seven or eight feet from the beginning of the stem, the sides of the brig were frightfully torn. Over a length of at least twenty feet there opened two large leaks which would be impossible to stop up. Not only had the copper sheathing and the planks disappeared, reduced no doubt to powder, but also the ribs, the iron bolts, and tree nails which united them. From the entire length of the hull to the stern the false keel had been separated with an unaccountable violence, and the keel itself, torn from the carline in several places, was split in all its length. "'I've a notion,' exclaimed Pencroft, that this vessel will be difficult to get afloat again. It will be impossible, said Ayrton. At any rate, observed Gideon Spilett to the sailor, the explosion, if there has been one, has produced singular effects. It has split the lower part of the hull, instead of blowing up the deck and topsides. These great rents appear rather to have been made by a rock than by the explosion of a powder magazine. "'There is not a rock in the channel,' answered the sailor. "'I will admit anything you like, 
except the rock. Let us try to penetrate into the interior of the brig, said the engineer. Perhaps we shall then know what to think of the cause of her destruction. This was the best thing to be done, and it was agreed, besides, to take an inventory of all the treasures on board, and to arrange for their preservation. Access to the interior of the brig was now easy. The tide was still going down, and the deck was practicable. The ballast, composed of heavy masses of iron, had broken through in several places. The noise of the sea could be heard as it rushed out at the holes in the hull. Cyrus Harding and his companions, hatchets in hand, advanced along the shattered deck. Cases of all sorts encumbered it, and, as they had been but a very short time in the water, their contents were perhaps uninjured. They then busied themselves in placing all this cargo in safety. The water would not return for several hours, and these hours must be employed in the most profitable way. Ayrton and Pencroft had, at the entrance made in the hull, discovered tackle, which would serve to hoist up the barrels and chests. The boat received them, and transported them to the shore. They took the articles as they came, intending to sort them afterwards. At any rate, the settlers saw at once, with extreme satisfaction, that the brig possessed a very varied cargo, an assortment of all sorts of articles, utensils, manufactured goods, and tools, such as the ships which make the great coasting trade of Polynesia are usually laden with. It was probable that they would find a little of everything, and they agreed that it was exactly what was necessary for the colony of Lincoln Island. However, and Cyrus Harding observed it in silent astonishment, not only, as has been said, had the hull of the brig enormously suffered from the shock, whatever it was, that had occasioned the catastrophe, but the interior arrangements had been destroyed, especially towards the bows. Partitions and stanchions were smashed, as if some tremendous shell had burst in the interior of the brig. The colonists could easily go fore and aft, after having removed the cases as they were extricated. They were not heavy bales, which would have been difficult to remove, but simple packages, of which the stowage, besides, was no longer recognizable. The colonists then reached the stern of the brig, the part formerly surmounted by the poop. It was there that, following Ayrton's directions, they must look for the powder magazine. Cyrus Harding thought that it had not exploded, that it was possible some barrels might be saved, and that the powder, which is usually enclosed in metal coverings, might not have suffered from contact with the water. This, in fact, was just what had happened. They extricated from among a large number of shot twenty barrels, the insides of which were lined with copper. Pencroft was convinced, by the evidence of his own eyes, that the destruction of the Speedy could not be attributed to an explosion. That part of the hull in which the magazine was situated was, moreover, that which had suffered least. "'It may be so,' said the obstinate sailor. "'But as to a rock, there is not one in the channel.' "'Then how did it happen?' asked Herbert. "'I don't know,' answered Pencroft. Captain Harding doesn't know, and nobody knows, or ever will know. Several hours had passed during these researches, and the tide began to flow. Work must be suspended for the present. There was no fear of the brig being carried away by the sea, for she was already fixed as firmly as if moored by her anchors. They could, therefore, without inconvenience, wait until the next day to resume operations. But, as to the vessel herself, she was doomed, and it would be best to hasten to save the remains of her hull, as she would not be long in disappearing in the quicksands of the channel. It was now five o'clock in the evening. It had been a hard day's work for the men. They ate with good appetite, and, notwithstanding their fatigue, they could not resist, after dinner, their desire of inspecting the cases which composed the cargo of the Speedy. 
Most of them contained clothes, which, as may be believed, were well received. There was enough to clothe a whole colony, linen for everyone's use, shoes for everyone's feet. "'We are too rich!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'But what are we going to do with all this?' and every moment burst forth the hurrahs of the delighted sailor when he caught sight of the barrels of gunpowder, firearms, and sidearms, balls of cotton, implements of husbandry, carpenters, joiners, and blacksmith's tools, and boxes of all kinds of seeds, not in the least injured by their short sojourn in the water. Ah, two years before, how these things would have been prized! And now, even though the industrious colonists had provided themselves with tools, these treasures would find their use. There was no want of space in the storerooms of Granite House, but that daytime would not allow them to stow away the whole. It would not do also to forget that the six survivors of the Speedy's crew had landed on the island, for they were in all probability scoundrels of the deepest dye and it was necessary that the colonists should be on their guard against them. Although the bridges over the Mercy were raised, the convicts would not be stopped by a river or a stream, and rendered desperate, these wretches would be capable of anything. They would see later what plan it would be best to follow, but in the meantime it was necessary to mount guard over cases and packages heaped up near the chimneys and thus the settlers employed themselves in turn during the night. The morning came, however, without the convicts having attempted any attack. Master Jupe and Top, on guard at the foot of Granite House, would have quickly given the alarm. The three following days, the 19th, 20th, and 21st of October, were employed in saving everything of value, or of any use whatever, either from the cargo or rigging of the brig. At low tide they overhauled the hold, at high tide they stowed away the rescued articles. A great part of the copper sheathing had been torn from the hull, which every day sank lower. But before the sand had swallowed the heavy things which had fallen through the bottom, Ayrton and Pencroft, diving to the bed of the channel, recovered the chains and anchors of the brig, the iron of her ballast, and even four guns which, floated by means of empty casks, were brought to shore. It may be seen that the arsenal of the colony had gained by the wreck, as well as the storerooms of Granite House. Pencroft, always enthusiastic in his projects, already spoke of constructing a battery to command the channel and the mouth of the river. With four guns he engaged to prevent any fleet, however powerful it might be, from venturing into the waters of Lincoln Island. In the meantime, when nothing remained of the brig but a useless hulk, bad weather came on, which soon finished her. Cyrus Harding had intended to blow her up, so as to collect the remains on the shore, but a strong gale from the northeast and a heavy sea compelled him to economize his powder. In fact, on the night of the twenty-third, the hull entirely broke up, and some of the wreck was cast up on the beach. As to the papers on board, it is useless to say that, although he carefully searched the lockers of the poop, Harding did not discover any trace of them. The pirates had evidently destroyed everything that concerned either the captain or the owners of the Speedy, and as the name of her port was not painted on her counter, there was nothing which would tell them her nationality. However, by the shape of her boats, Ayrton and Pencroft believed that the brig was of English build. A week after the catastrophe, or rather, after the fortunate, though inexplicable, event to which the colony owed its preservation, nothing more could be seen of the vessel, even at low tide. The wreck had disappeared, and Granite House was enriched by nearly all it had contained. However, the mystery which enveloped its strange destruction would doubtless never have been cleared away if, on the 30th of November, Neb, strolling on the beach, had not found a piece of a thick iron cylinder bearing traces of explosion. The edges of this cylinder were twisted and broken, as if they had been subjected to the action of some explosive substance. 
Neb brought this piece of metal to his master, who was then occupied with his companions in the workshop of the chimneys. Cyrus Harding examined the cylinder attentively, then, turning to Pencroft, "'You persist, my friend,' said he, "'in maintaining that the Speedy was not lost in consequence of a collision?' "'Yes, Captain,' answered the sailor. "'You know as well as I do that there are no rocks in the channel.' "'But suppose she had run against this piece of iron,' said the engineer, showing the broken cylinder. "'Why, that bit of pipe!' exclaimed Pencroft, in a tone of perfect incredulity. "'My friends,' resumed Harding, "'you remember that before she foundered the brig rose on the summit of a regular water-spout.' "'Yes, Captain,' replied Herbert. "'Well, would you like to know what occasioned that water-spout?' "'It was this,' said the engineer, holding up the broken tube. "'That?' returned Pencroft. Yes, this cylinder is all that remains of a torpedo. A torpedo! exclaimed the engineer's companions. And who put the torpedo there? demanded Pencroft, who did not like to yield. All that I can tell you is that it was not I, answered Cyrus Harding. But it was there, and you have been able to judge of its incomparable power. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Five So then, all was explained by the submarine explosion of this torpedo. Cyrus Harding could not be mistaken, as, during the War of the Union, he had had occasion to try these terrible engines of destruction. It was under the action of this cylinder, charged with some explosive substance, nitroglycerin, picrate, or some other material of the same nature, that the water of the channel had been raised like a dome, the bottom of the brig crushed in, and she had sunk instantly, the damage done to her hull being so considerable that it was impossible to refloat her. The Speedy had not been able to withstand a torpedo that would have destroyed an ironclad as easily as a fishing-boat. Yes, all was explained, everything, except the presence of the torpedo in the waters of the Channel. My friends, then, said Cyrus Harding, we can no longer be in doubt as to the presence of a mysterious being, a castaway like us, perhaps, abandoned on our island, and I say this in order that Ayrton may be acquainted with all the strange events which have occurred during these two years. Who this beneficent stranger is— whose intervention has, so fortunately for us, been manifested on many occasions, I cannot imagine. What his object can be in acting thus, in concealing himself after rendering us so many services, I cannot understand. But his services are not the less real, and are of such a nature that only a man possessed of prodigious power could render them. Ayrton is indebted to him as much as we are, for, if it was the stranger who saved me from the waves after the fall from the balloon, evidently it was he who wrote the document, who placed the bottle in the channel, and who has made known to us the situation of our companion. I will add that it was he who guided that chest, provided with everything we wanted, and stranded it on Flotsam Point, that it was he who lighted that fire on the heights of the island which permitted you to land, that it was he who fired that bullet found in the body of the peccary, that it was he who plunged that torpedo into the channel which destroyed the brig, in a word, that all those inexplicable events, for which we could not assign a reason, are due to this mysterious being. Therefore, whoever he may be, whether shipwrecked or exiled on our island, 
we shall be ungrateful if we think ourselves freed from gratitude towards him. We have contracted a debt, and I hope that we shall one day pay it. "'You are right in speaking thus, my dear Cyrus,' replied Gideon Spilett. "'Yes, there is an almost all-powerful being, hidden in some part of the island, and whose influence has been singularly useful to our colony. I will add that the unknown appears to possess means of action which border on the supernatural, if in the events of practical life the supernatural were recognizable. Is it he who is in secret communication with us by the well in Granite House, and has he thus a knowledge of all our plans? Was it he who threw us that bottle, when the vessel made her first cruise? Was it he who threw Top out of the lake and killed the dugong? Was it he who, as everything leads us to believe, saved you from the waves, and that under circumstances in which any one else would not have been able to act? If it was he, he possesses a power which renders him master of the elements. The reporter's reasoning was just, and every one felt it to be so. Yes, rejoined Cyrus Harding, if the intervention of a human being is not more questionable for us, I agree that he has at his disposal means of action beyond those possessed by humanity. There is a mystery still, but if we discover the man, the mystery will be discovered also. The question, then, is, ought we to respect the incognito of this generous being, or ought we to do everything to find him out? What is your opinion on the matter? My opinion, said Pencroft, is that, whoever he may be, he is a brave man, and he has my esteem. Be it so, answered Harding. But that is not an answer, Pencroft. Master, then said Neb, my idea is that we may search as long as we like for this gentleman whom you are talking about, but that we shall not discover him till he pleases. That's not bad what you say, Neb, observed Pencroft. I am of Neb's opinion, said Gideon Spilett, but that is no reason for not attempting the adventure. Whether we find this mysterious being or not, we shall at least have fulfilled our duty towards him. And you, my boy, give us your opinion, said the engineer, turning to Herbert. Oh! cried Herbert, his countenance full of animation. How I should like to thank him, he who saved you first, and who has now saved us! "'Of course, my boy,' replied Pencroft. "'So would I and all of us. I am not inquisitive, but I would give one of my eyes to see this individual face to face. It seems to me that he must be handsome, tall, strong, with a splendid beard, radiant hair, that he must be seated on clouds, a great ball in his hands.' "'But, Pencroft,' answered Spilett, "'you are describing a picture of the Creator.' "'Possibly, Mr. Spilett.' replied the sailor, but that is how I imagine him. "'And you, Ayrton?' asked the engineer. "'Captain Harding,' replied Ayrton, "'I can give you no better advice in this matter. Whatever you do will be best. When you wish me to join you in your researches, I am ready to follow you.' "'I thank you, Ayrton,' answered Cyrus Harding, "'but I should like a more direct answer to the question I put to you.' You are our companion. You have already endangered your life several times for us, and you, as well as the rest, ought to be consulted in the matter of any important decision. Speak, therefore. Captain Harding, replied Ayrton, I think that we ought to do everything to discover this unknown benefactor. Perhaps he is alone. Perhaps he is suffering. Perhaps he has a life to be renewed. I, too, as you said, have a debt of gratitude to pay him. It was he. It could be only he who must have come to Tabor Island, who found there the wretch you knew, and who made known to you that there was an unfortunate man there to be saved. Therefore it is thanks to him that I have become a man again. No, I will never forget him. That is settled, then, said Cyrus Harding. We will begin our researches as soon as possible. 
We will not leave a corner of the island unexplored. We will search into its most secret recesses, and will hope that our unknown friend will pardon us in consideration of our intentions. For several days the colonists were actively employed in hay-making and the harvest. Before putting their project of exploring the yet unknown parts of the island into execution, they wished to get all possible work finished. It was also the time for collecting the various vegetables from the Tabor Island plants. All was stowed away, and happily there was no want of room in the Granite House, in which they might have housed all the treasures of the island. The products of the colony were there, methodically arranged, and in a safe place, as may be believed, sheltered as much from animals as from man. There was no fear of damp in the middle of that thick mass of granite. Many natural excavations situated in the upper passage were enlarged either by pickaxe or mine, and Granite House thus became a general warehouse, containing all the provisions, arms, tools, and spare utensils, in a word, all the stores of the colony. As to the guns obtained from the brig, they were pretty pieces of ordnance, which, at Pencroft's entreaty, were hoisted by means of tackle and pulleys right up into Granite House. Embrasures were made between the windows, and the shining muzzles of the guns could soon be seen through the granite cliff. From this height they commanded all Union Bay. It was like a little Gibraltar, and any vessel anchored off the islet would inevitably be exposed to the fire of this aerial battery. Captain, said Pencroft one day, it was the 8th of November, now that our fortifications are finished, it would be a good thing if we tried the range of our guns. Do you think that is useful? asked the engineer. It is more than useful. It is necessary. Without that, how are we to know to what distance we can send one of those pretty shot with which we are provided? Try them, Pencroft, replied the engineer. However, I think that in making the experiment, we ought to employ not the ordinary powder, the supply of which, I think, should remain untouched, but the pyroxyl which will never fail us. "'Can the cannon support the shock of the pyroxyl?' asked the reporter, who was not less anxious than Pencroft to try the artillery of Granite House. "'I believe so. However,' added the engineer, "'we will be prudent.' The engineer was right in thinking that the guns were of excellent make. Made of forged steel and breech-loaders, they ought consequently to be able to bear a considerable charge, and also have an enormous range. In fact, as regards practical effect, the transit described by the ball ought to be as extended as possible, and this tension could only be obtained under the condition that the projectile should be impelled with a very great initial velocity. Now, said Harding to his companions, the initial velocity is in proportion to the quantity of powder used. In the fabrication of these pieces, everything depends on employing a metal with the highest possible power of resistance, and steel is incontestably that metal of all others which resists the best. I have, therefore, reason to believe that our guns will bear without risk the expansion of the pyroxyl gas, and will give excellent results. We shall be a great deal more certain of that when we have tried them, answered Pencroft. It is unnecessary to say that the four cannons were in perfect order. Since they had been taken from the water, the sailor had bestowed great care upon them. How many hours he had spent in rubbing, greasing, and polishing them, and in cleaning the mechanism! And now the pieces were as brilliant as if they had been on board a frigate of the United States Navy. On this day, therefore, in presence of all the members of the colony, including Master Jupe and Top, the four cannon were successively tried. They were charged with pyroxyl, taking into consideration its explosive power, which, as has been said, is four times that of ordinary powder. The projectile to be fired was cylindroconic. Pencroft, holding the end of the quick match, stood ready to fire. At Harding's signal, he fired. The shot, passing over the islet, fell into the sea at a distance which could not be calculated with exactitude. The second gun was pointed at the rocks at the end of Flotsam Point, 
and the shot, striking a sharp rock nearly three miles from Granite House, made it fly into splinters. It was Herbert who had pointed this gun and fired it, and very proud he was of his first shot. Pencroft only was prouder than he. Such a shot, the honour of which belonged to his dear boy. The third shot, aimed this time at the downs forming the upper side of Union Bay, struck the sand at a distance of four miles, then having ricocheted, was lost in the sea in a cloud of spray. For the fourth piece, Cyrus Harding slightly increased the charge, so as to try its extreme range. Then, all standing aside for fear of its bursting, the match was lighted by means of a long cord. A tremendous report was heard, but the piece had held good, and the colonists rushing to the windows saw the shot graze the rocks of Mandible Cape, nearly five miles from Granite House, and disappear in Shark Gulf. "'Well, Captain!' exclaimed Pencroft, whose cheers might have rivaled the reports themselves. "'What do you say of our battery? All the pirates in the Pacific have only to present themselves before Granite House. Not one can land there now without our permission.' "'Believe me, Pencroft,' replied the engineer, "'it would be better not to have to make the experiment.' Well, said the sailor, what ought to be done with regard to those six villains who are roaming about the island? Are we to leave them to overrun our forests, our fields, our plantations? These pirates are regular jaguars, and it seems to me we ought not to hesitate to treat them as such. What do you think, Ayrton? added Pencroft, turning to his companion. Ayrton hesitated at first to reply, and Cyrus Harding regretted that Pencroft had so thoughtlessly put this question, and he was much moved when Ayrton replied in a humble tone, "'I have been one of those jaguars, Mr. Pencroft. I have no right to speak.' And with a slow step he walked away. Pencroft understood. "'What a brute I am!' he exclaimed. "'Poor Ayrton! He has as much right to speak here as any one.' "'Yes,' said Gideon Spilett but his reserve does him honour, and is right to respect the feeling which he has about his sad past. "'Certainly, Mr. Spilett,' answered the sailor, "'and there is no fear of my doing so again. I would rather bite my tongue off than cause Ayrton any pain. But to return to the question, it seems to me that these ruffians have no right to any pity, and that we ought to rid the island of them as soon as possible.' "'Is that your opinion, Pencroft?' asked the engineer. "'Quite my opinion.' "'And before hunting them mercilessly, you would not wait until they had committed some fresh act of hostility against us?' "'Isn't what they have done already enough?' asked Pencroft, who did not understand these scruples. "'They may adopt other sentiments,' said Harding, "'and perhaps repent.' "'They repent!' exclaimed the sailor shrugging his shoulders. "'Pencroft, think of Ayrton,' said Herbert, taking the sailor's hand. "'He became an honest man again.' Pencroft looked at his companions one after the other. He had never thought of his proposal being met with any objection. His rough nature could not allow that they ought to come to terms with the rascals who had landed on the island, with Bob Harvey's accomplices, the murderers of the crew of the Speedy and he looked upon them as wild beasts which ought to be destroyed without delay and without remorse. "'Come,' said he, "'everybody is against me. You wish to be generous to those villains. Very well. I hope we mayn't repent it.' "'What danger shall we run,' said Herbert, "'if we take care to be always on our guard?' "'Hm,' observed the reporter, who had not given any decided opinion. They are six and well armed. If they each lay hid in a corner, and each fired at one of us, they would soon be masters of the colony. Why have they not done so? said Herbert. No doubt because it was not their interest to do it. Besides, we are six also. Well, well, replied Pencroft, whom no reasoning could have convinced. Let us leave these good people to do what they like and don't think anything more about them. Come, Pencroft, said Neb, don't make yourself out so bad as all that. 
Suppose one of these unfortunate men were here before you, within good range of your gun, you would not fire. I would fire on him as I would on a mad dog, Neb, replied Pencroft coldly. Pencroft, said the engineer, you have always shown much deference to my advice. Will you, in this matter, yield to me? I will do as you please, Captain Harding, answered the sailor, who was not at all convinced. Very well. Wait, and we will not attack them unless we are attacked first. Thus their behavior towards the pirates was agreed upon, although Pencroft augured nothing good from it. They were not to attack them, but were to be on their guard. After all, the island was large and fertile. If any sentiment of honesty yet remained in the bottom of their hearts, these wretches might perhaps be reclaimed. Was it not their interest in the situation in which they found themselves to begin a new life? At any rate, for humanity's sake alone, it would be right to wait. The colonists would no longer as before be able to go and come without fear. Hitherto they had only wild beasts to guard against, and now six convicts of the worst description, perhaps, were roaming over their island. It was serious, certainly, and to less brave men it would have been security lost. No matter. At present the colonists had reason on their side against Pencroft. Would they be right in the future? That remained to be seen. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Three, Chapter Six. However, the chief business of the colonists was to make that complete exploration of the island which had been decided upon, and which would have two objects, to discover the mysterious being whose existence was now indisputable, and at the same time to find out what had become of the pirates, what retreat they had chosen, what sort of life they were leading, and what was to be feared from them. Cyrus Harding wished to set out without delay. But as the expedition would be of some days' duration, it appeared best to load the cart with different materials and tools, in order to facilitate the organization of the encampments. One of the onagers, however, having hurt its leg, could not be harnessed at present, and a few days' rest was necessary. The departure was, therefore, put off for a week, until the 20th of November. The month of November in this latitude corresponds to the month of May in the northern zones. It was, therefore, the fine season. The sun was entering the Tropic of Capricorn, and gave the longest days in the year. The time was, therefore, very favorable for the projected expedition, which, if it did not accomplish its principal object, would at any rate be fruitful in discoveries, especially of natural productions, since Harding proposed to explore those dense forests of the far west, which stretched to the extremity of the Serpentine Peninsula. During the nine days which preceded their departure, it was agreed that the work on Prospect Heights should be finished off. Moreover, it was necessary for Ayrton to return to the corral, where the domesticated animals required his care. It was decided that he should spend two days there, and return to Granite House after having liberally supplied the stables. As he was about to start, Harding asked him if he would not like one of them to accompany him, observing that the island was less safe than formerly. Ayrton replied that this was unnecessary, as he was enough for the work, and that besides he apprehended no danger. If anything occurred at the corral or in the neighborhood, he could instantly warn the colonists by sending a telegram to Granite House. Ayrton departed at dawn on the ninth taking the cart drawn by one onager, 
and two hours after the electric wire announced that he had found all in order at the corral. During these two days Harding busied himself in executing a project which would completely guard Granite House against any surprise. It was necessary to completely conceal the opening of the old outlet, which was already walled up and partly hidden under grass and plants, at the southern angle of Lake Grant. Nothing was easier, since if the level of the lake was raised two or three feet, the opening would be quite beneath it. Now, to raise this level they had only to establish a dam at the two openings made by the lake, and by which were fed Creek Glycerin and Falls River. The colonists worked with a will, and the two dams which besides did not exceed eight feet in width by three in height, were rapidly erected by means of well-cemented blocks of stone. This work finished, it would have been impossible to guess that at that part of the lake there existed a subterranean passage through which the overflow of the lake formerly escaped. Of course, the little stream which fed the reservoir of Granite House and worked the lift had been carefully preserved, and the water could not fail. The lift once raised, this sure and comfortable retreat would be safe from any surprise. This work had been so quickly done that Pencroft, Guinead Spellett, and Herbert found time to make an expedition to Port Balloon. The sailor was very anxious to know if the little creek in which the Bonaventure was moored had been visited by the convicts. "'Those gentlemen,' he observed, "'landed on the south coast, and if they followed the shore it is to be feared that they may have discovered the little harbour, and in that case I wouldn't give half a dollar for our Bonaventure.' Pencroft's apprehensions were not without foundation, and a visit to Port Balloon appeared to be very desirable. The sailor and his companions set off on the 10th of November, after dinner, well armed. Pencroft, ostentatiously slipping two bullets into each barrel of his rifle, shook his head in a way which betokened nothing good to any one who approached too near him, whether man or beast, as he said. Gideon Skillet and Herbert also took their guns, and about three o'clock all three left Granite House. Neb accompanied them to the turn of the Mercy, and after they had crossed, he raised the bridge. It was agreed that a gunshot should announce the colonists' return, and that at the signal Neb should return and re-establish the communication between the two banks of the river. The little band advanced directly along the road which led to the southern coast of the island. This was only a distance of three miles and a half, but Gideon Spilett and his companions took two hours to traverse it. They examined all the border of the road, the thick forest, as well as Tabor Marsh. They found no trace of the fugitives, who, no doubt, not having yet discovered the number of the colonists, or the means of defense which they had at their disposal, had gained the less accessible parts of the island. Arrived at Port Balloon, Pencroft saw with extreme satisfaction that the Bonaventure was tranquilly floating in the narrow creek. However, Port Balloon was so well hidden among high rocks that it could scarcely be discovered either from the land or the sea. "'Come,' said Pencroft, "'the blackguards have not been there yet. Long grass suits reptiles best, and evidently we shall find them in the far west.' "'Hence very lucky,' "'For if they had found the Bonaventure,' added Herbert, "'they would have gone off in her, "'and we should have been prevented from returning to Tabor Island.' "'Indeed,' remarked the reporter, "'it will be important to take a document there "'which will make known the situation of Lincoln Island, "'and Ayrton's new residence, "'in case the Scotch yacht returns to fetch him.' "'Well, the Bonaventure is always there, Mr. Spilett,' answered the sailor. She and her crew are ready to start at a moment's notice. I think, Pencroft, that that is a thing to be done after our exploration of the island is finished. It is possible, after all, that the stranger, if we manage to find him, may know as much about Tabor Island as about Lincoln Island. Do not forget that he is certainly the author of the document, and he may, perhaps, know how far we may count on the return of the yacht. But— exclaimed Pencroft. Who in the world can he be? 
The fellow knows us, and we know nothing about him. If he is a simple castaway, why should he conceal himself? We are honest men, I suppose, and the society of honest men isn't unpleasant to anyone. Did he come here voluntarily? Can he leave the island if he likes? Is he here still? Will he remain any longer? Chatting thus, Pencroft, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert got on board and looked about the deck of the Bonaventure. All at once, the sailor, having examined the bits to which the cable of the anchor were secured, Hallo! he cried. This is queer. What is the matter, Pencroft? asked the reporter. The matter is that it was not I who made this knot. And Pencroft showed a rope which fastened the cable to the bit itself. What? It was not you? asked Gideon Spilett. No, I can swear to it. This is a reef knot, and I always make a running bowlin. You must be mistaken, Pencroft. I am not mistaken, declared the sailor. My hand does it so naturally, and one's hand is never mistaken. How can the convicts have been on board? asked Herbert. I know nothing about that, answered Pencroft. But what is certain is that someone has weighed the Bonaventure's anchor and dropped it again. And look here, here is another proof. The cable of the anchor has been run out, and its service is no longer at the hawse hole. I repeat that someone has been using our vessel. But if the convicts had used her, they would have pillaged her, or rather gone off with her. Gone off? Where to? To Tabor Island? replied Pencroft. Do you think they would risk themselves in a boat of such small tonnage? We must besides be sure that they know of the islet, rejoined the reporter. However that may be, said the sailor, as sure as my name is Bonaventure Pencroft of the vineyard, our Bonaventure has sailed without us. The sailor was so positive that neither Gideon Spilett nor Herbert could dispute his statement. It was evident that the vessel had been moved, more or less, since Pencroft had brought her to Port Balloon. As to the sailor, he had not the slightest doubt that the anchor had been raised and then dropped again. Now what was the use of these two maneuvers, unless the vessel had been employed in some expedition? "'But how was it we did not see the Bonaventure pass in sight of the island?' observed the reporter, who was anxious to bring forward every possible objection. "'Why, Mr. Spilett,' replied the sailor, "'they would only have to start in the night with a good breeze, and they would be out of sight of the island in two hours.' "'Well,' resumed Gideon Spilett, "'I ask again, what object could the convicts have had in using the Bonaventure, and why, after they had made use of her, should they have brought her back to port?' "'Why, Mr. Spilett,' replied the sailor. We must put that among the unaccountable things, and not think anything more about it. The chief thing is that the Bonaventure was there, and she is there now. Only, unfortunately, if the convicts take her a second time, we shall very likely not find her again in her place. Then, Pencroft, said Herbert, would it not be wisest to bring the Bonaventure off to Granite House? Yes and no, answered Pencroft. Or rather, no. The mouth of the Mercy is a bad place for a vessel, and the sea is heavy there. But by hauling her up on the sand, to the foot of the chimneys? Perhaps yes, replied Pencroft. At any rate, since we must leave Granite House for a long expedition, I think the Bonaventure will be safer here during our absence, and we shall do best to leave her here until the island is rid of those blackguards. That is exactly my opinion, said the reporter. At any rate, in the event of bad weather, she will not be exposed here as she would be at the mouth of the Mercy. "'But suppose the convicts pay her another visit,' said Herbert. "'Well, my boy,' replied Pencroft, "'not finding her here, they would not be long in finding her on the sands of Granite House, and during our absence nothing could hinder them from seizing her. I agree, therefore, with Mr. Spilett, that she must be left in Port Balloon. But—' If on our return we have not rid the island of those rascals, it will be prudent to bring our boat to Granite House, until the time when we need not fear any unpleasant visits. "'That's settled. Let us be off,' said the reporter. Pencroft, Herbert, and Gideon Spilett, on their return to Granite House, 
told the engineer all that had passed, and the latter approved of their arrangements, both for the present and the future. He also promised the sailor that he would study that part of the channel situated between the islet and the coast, so as to ascertain if it would not be possible to make an artificial harbour there by means of dams. In this way the Bonaventure would be always within reach, under the eyes of the colonists, and if necessary, under lock and key. That evening a telegram was sent to Ayrton, requesting him to bring from the corral a couple of goats, which Neb wished to acclimatize to the plateau. Singularly enough, Ayrton did not acknowledge the receipt of the dispatch, as he was accustomed to do. That could not but astonish the engineer. But it might be that Ayrton was not at that moment in the corral, or even that he was on his way back to Granite House. In fact, two days had already passed since his departure, and it had been decided that on the evening of the tenth, or at the latest the morning of the eleventh, he should return. The colonists waited, therefore, for Ayrton to appear on Prospect Heights. Neb and Herbert even watched at the bridge, so as to be ready to lower it the moment their companion presented himself. But up to ten in the evening there were no signs of Ayrton. It was, therefore, judged best to send a fresh dispatch, requiring an immediate reply. The bell of the telegraph at Granite House remained mute. The colonists' uneasiness was great. What had happened? Was Ayrton no longer at the corral? Or if he was still there, had he no longer control over his movements? Could they go to the corral in this dark night? They consulted. Some wished to go, the others to remain. But, said Herbert, perhaps some accident has happened to the telegraphic apparatus, so that it works no longer? That may be said the reporter. "'Wait till to-morrow,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'It is possible, indeed, that Ayrton has not received our dispatch, or even that we have not received his.' They waited, of course not without some anxiety. At dawn of day, the 11th of November, Harding again sent the electric current along the wire, and received no reply. He tried again. The same result. Off to the corral, said he. And well armed, added Pencroft. It was immediately decided that Granite House should not be left alone, and that Neb should remain there. After having accompanied his friends to Creek Glycerin, he raised the bridge, and, waiting behind a tree, he watched for the return of either his companions or Ayrton. In the event of the pirates presenting themselves and attempting to force the passage, he was to endeavour to stop them by firing on them, and as a last resource he was to take refuge in Granite House, where, the lift once raised, he would be in safety. Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, Herbert, and Pencroft were to repair to the corral, and if they did not find Ayrton, search the neighbouring woods. At six o'clock in the morning, the engineer and his three companions had passed Creek Glycerin, and Neb posted himself behind a small mound crowned by several dragon-trees on the left bank of the stream. The colonists, after leaving the plateau of Prospect Heights, immediately took the road to the corral. They shouldered their guns, ready to fire on the slightest hostile demonstration. The two rifles and the two guns had been loaded with ball. The wood was thick on each side of the road, and might easily have concealed the convicts, who, owing to their weapons, would have been really formidable. The colonists walked rapidly, and in silence. Top preceded them, sometimes running on the road, sometimes taking a ramble into the wood, but always quiet, and not appearing to fear anything unusual. And they could be sure that the faithful dog would not allow them to be surprised, but would bark at the least appearance of danger. Cyrus Harding and his companions followed beside the road the wire which connected the corral with Granite House. After walking for nearly two miles, they had not, as yet, discovered any explanation of the difficulty. The posts were in good order. The wire regularly extended. However, at that moment, the engineer observed that the wire appeared to be slack, and on arriving at post number 74, Herbert, who was in advance, stopped, exclaiming, the wire is broken! 
his companions hurried forward, and arrived at the spot where the lad was standing. The post was rooted up and lying across the path. The unexpected explanation of the difficulty was here, and it was evident that the dispatches from Granite House had not been received at the corral, nor those from the corral at Granite House. "'It wasn't the wind that blew down this post,' observed Pencroft. "'No,' replied Gideon Spilett. "'The earth has been dug up round its foot, and it has been torn up by the hand of man.' "'Besides, the wire is broken,' added Herbert, showing that the wire had been snapped. "'Is the fracture recent?' asked Harding. "'Yes,' answered Herbert. "'It has certainly been done quite lately.' "'To the corral! To the corral!' exclaimed the sailor. The colonists were now halfway between Granite House and the corral, having still two miles and a half to go. They pressed forward with redoubled speed. Indeed, it was to be feared that some serious accident had occurred in the corral. No doubt, Ayrton might have sent a telegram which had not arrived, but this was not the reason why his companions were so uneasy, for, a more unaccountable circumstance, Ayrton, who had promised to return the evening before, had not reappeared. In short, it was not without a motive that all communications had been stopped between the corral and Granite House, and who but the convicts could have any interest in interrupting this communication. The settlers hastened on, their hearts oppressed with anxiety. They were sincerely attached to their new companion. Were they to find him struck down by the hands of those of whom he was formerly the leader? Soon they arrived, at the place where the road led along the side of the little stream which flowed from the Red Creek and watered the meadows of the corral. They then moderated their pace so that they should not be out of breath at the moment when a struggle might be necessary. Their guns were in their hands ready cocked. The forest was watched on every side. Top uttered sullen groans which were rather ominous. At last the palisade appeared through the trees. No trace of any damage could be seen. The gate was shut as usual. Deep silence reigned in the corral. Neither the accustomed bleating of the sheep nor Ayrton's voice could be heard. "'Let us enter,' said Cyrus Harding and the engineer advanced, while his companions, keeping watch about twenty paces behind him, were ready to fire at a moment's notice. Harding raised the inner latch of the gate, and was about to push it back, when Top barked loudly. A report sounded, and was responded to by a cry of pain. Herbert, struck by a bullet, lay stretched on the ground. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Part 3, Chapter 7. At Herbert's cry, Pencroft, letting his gun fall, rushed towards him. They have killed him, he cried. My boy, they have killed him. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett ran to Herbert. The reporter listened to ascertain if the poor lad's heart was still beating. He lives, said he, but he must be carried to Granite House. That is impossible, replied the engineer. Into the corral, then, said Pencroft. In a moment, said Harding. And he ran round the left corner of the palisade. There he found a convict, who, aiming at him, sent a ball through his hat. In a few seconds, before he had even time to fire his second barrel, he fell, struck to the heart by Harding's dagger, more sure even than his gun. During this time Gideon Spilett and the sailor hoisted themselves over the palisade, leaped into the enclosure, threw down the props which supported the inner door, ran into the empty house, and soon poor Herbert was lying on Ayrton's bed. In a few moments Harding was by his side. On seeing Herbert senseless, the sailor's grief was terrible. 
He sobbed, he cried, he tried to beat his head against the wall. Neither the engineer nor the reporter could calm him. They themselves were choked with emotion. They could not speak. However, they knew that it depended on them to rescue from death the poor boy who was suffering beneath their eyes. Gideon Spilett had not passed through the many incidents by which his life had been checkered without acquiring some slight knowledge of medicine. He knew a little of everything, and several times he had been obliged to attend to wounds produced either by a sword, bayonet, or shot. Assisted by Cyrus Harding, he proceeded to render the aid Herbert required. The reporter was immediately struck by the complete stupor in which Herbert lay, a stupor owing either to the hemorrhage or to the shock, the ball having struck a bone with sufficient force to produce a violent concussion. Herbert was deadly pale, and his pulse so feeble that Spilett only felt it beat at long intervals, as if it was on the point of stopping. These symptoms were very serious. Herbert's chest was laid bare, and the blood having been stanched with handkerchiefs, it was bathed with cold water. The contusion, or rather the contused wound, appeared. An oval below the chest between the third and fourth ribs. It was there that Herbert had been hit by the bullet. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett then turned the poor boy over. As they did so, he uttered a moan so feeble that they almost thought it was his last sigh. Herbert's back was covered with blood from another contused wound, by which the ball had immediately escaped. "'God be praised,' said the reporter. "'The ball is not in the body, and we shall not have to extract it.' "'But the heart,' asked Harding. "'The heart has not been touched. If it had been, Herbert would be dead.' "'Dead!' exclaimed Pencroft, with a groan. The sailor had only heard the last words uttered by the reporter. "'No, Pencroft,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'No, he is not dead. His pulse still beats. He has even uttered a moan. But for your boy's sake, calm yourself. We have need of all our self-possession. Do not make us lose it, my friend.' Pencroft was silent, but a reaction set in, and great tears rolled down his cheeks. In the meanwhile, Gideon Spilett endeavoured to collect his ideas and proceed methodically. After his examination, he had no doubt that the ball, entering in front, between the seventh and eighth ribs, had issued behind between the third and fourth. But what mischief had the ball committed in its passage? What important organs had been reached? A professional surgeon would have had difficulty in determining this at once, and still more so the reporter. However, he knew one thing. This was that he would have to prevent the inflammatory strangulation of the injured parts, then to contend with the local inflammation and fever which would result from the wound, perhaps mortal. Now, what styptics, what antiphlogistics ought to be employed? By what means could inflammation be prevented? At any rate, the most important thing was that the two wounds should be dressed without delay. It did not appear necessary to Gideon Spilett that a fresh flow of blood should be caused by bathing them in tapered water and compressing their lips. The hemorrhage had been very abundant, and Herbert was already too much enfeebled by the loss of blood. The reporter, therefore, thought it best to simply bathe the two wounds with cold water. Herbert was placed on his left side, and was maintained in that position. "'He must not be moved.' said Gideon Spilett. He is in the most favourable position for the wounds in his back and chest to separate easily, and absolute rest is necessary. "'What? Can't we carry him to Granite House?' asked Pencroft. "'No, Pencroft,' replied the reporter. "'I'll pay the villains off!' cried the sailor, shaking his fist in a menacing manner. "'Pencroft,' said Cyrus Harding. Gideon Spilett had resumed his examination of the wounded boy. Herbert was still so frightfully pale that the reporter felt anxious. "'Cyrus,' said he, "'I am not a surgeon. I am in terrible perplexity. You must aid me with your advice, your experience.' "'Take courage, my friend,' answered the engineer, pressing the reporter's hand. "'Judge coolly. Think only of this.' 
Herbert must be saved. These words restored in Gideon Spilett that self-possession which he had lost in a moment of discouragement on feeling his great responsibility. He seated himself close to the bed. Cyrus Harding stood near. Pencroft had torn up his shirt and was mechanically making lint. Spilett then explained to Cyrus Harding that he thought he ought first of all to stop the hemorrhage, but not close the two wounds, or cause their immediate cicatrization, for there had been internal perforation, and the separation must not be allowed to accumulate in the chest. Harding approved entirely, and it was decided that the two wounds should be dressed without attempting to close them by immediate coaptation. And now did the colonists possess an efficacious agent to act against the inflammation which might occur? Yes, they had one, for nature had generously lavished it. They had cold water, that is to say, the most powerful sedative that can be employed against inflammation of wounds, the most efficacious therapeutic agent in grave cases, and the one which is now adopted by all physicians. Cold water has, moreover, the advantage of leaving the wound in absolute rest, and preserving it from all premature dressing, a considerable advantage, since it has been found by experience. The contact with the air is dangerous during the first days. Gideon Spilett and Cyrus Harding reasoned thus with their simple good sense, and they acted as the best surgeon would have done. Compresses of linen were applied to poor Herbert's two wounds, and were kept constantly wet with cold water. The sailor had at first lighted a fire in the hut, which was not wanting in things necessary for life. Maple sugar, medicinal plants, the same which the lad had gathered on the banks of Lake Grant, enabled them to make some refreshing drinks, which they gave him without his taking any notice of it. His fever was extremely high, and all that day and night passed without his becoming conscious. Herbert's life hung on a thread, and this thread might break at any moment. The next day, the 12th of November, the hopes of Harding and his companions slightly revived. Herbert had come out of his long stupor. He opened his eyes. He recognized Cyrus Harding, the reporter, and Pencroft. He uttered two or three words. He did not know what had happened. They told him, and Spilett begged him to remain perfectly still, telling him that his life was not in danger, and that his wounds would heal in a few days. However, Herbert scarcely suffered at all, and the cold water with which they were continually bathed prevented any inflammation of the wounds. The separation was established in a regular way. The fever did not increase, and it might now be hoped that this terrible wound would not involve any catastrophe. Pencroft felt the swelling of his heart gradually subside. He was like a sister of mercy, like a mother by the bed of her child. Herbert dozed again, but his sleep appeared more natural. "'Tell me again that you hope, Mr. Spilett,' said Pencroft. "'Tell me again that you will save Herbert.' "'Yes, we will save him,' replied the reporter. "'The wound is serious, and perhaps even the ball has traversed the lungs, but the perforation of this organ is not fatal.' "'God bless you,' answered Pencroft. As may be believed, during the four and twenty hours they had been in the corral, the colonists had no other thought than that of nursing Herbert. They did not think either of the danger which threatened them should the convicts return, or of the precautions to be taken for the future. But on this day, while Pencroft watched by the sick bed, Cyrus Harding and the reporter consulted as to what it would be best to do. First of all, they examined the corral. There was not a trace of Ayrton. Had the unhappy man been dragged away by his former accomplices? Had he resisted and been overcome in the struggle? This last supposition was only too probable. Gideon Spilett, at the moment he scaled the palisade, had clearly seen some one of the convicts running along the southern spur of Mount Franklin, towards whom Top had sprung. 
it was one of those whose object had been so completely defeated by the rocks at the mouth of the Mercy. Besides, the one killed by Harding, and whose body was found outside the enclosure, of course belonged to Bob Harvey's crew. As to the corral, it had not suffered any damage. The gates were closed, and the animals had not been able to disperse in the forest. Nor could they see traces of any struggle, any devastation, either in the hut or in the palisade. The ammunition only, with which Ayrton had been supplied, had disappeared with him. "'The unhappy man has been surprised,' said Harding, and as he was a man to defend himself, he must have been overpowered. "'Yes, that is to be feared,' said the reporter. "'Then, doubtless, the convicts installed themselves in the corral, where they found plenty of everything, and only fled when they saw us coming. It is very evident, too, that at this moment Ayrton, whether living or dead, is not here. We shall have to beat the forest, said the engineer, and rid the island of these wretches. Pencroft's presentiments were not mistaken, when he wished to hunt them as wild beasts. That would have spared us all these misfortunes. Yes, answered the reporter, but now we have the right to be merciless. At any rate, said the engineer, we are obliged to wait some time, and to remain at the corral, until we can carry Herbert without danger to Granite House. But Neb, asked the reporter, Neb is in safety. But if, uneasy at our absence, he should venture to come? He must not come, returned Cyrus Harding quickly. He would be murdered on the road. It is very probable, however, that he will attempt to rejoin us. Ah, if the telegraph still acted, he might be warned. But that is impossible now. As to leaving Pencroft and Herbert here alone, we could not do it. Well, I will go alone to Granite House. No, no, Cyrus, answered the reporter. You must not expose yourself. Your courage would be of no avail. The villains are evidently watching the corral. They are hidden in the thick woods which surround it and if you go, we shall soon have to regret two misfortunes instead of one. But Neb, repeated the engineer, it is now four and twenty hours since he has had any news of us. He will be sure to come. And as he will be less on his guard than we should be ourselves, added Spilett, he will be killed. Is there really no way of warning him? While the engineer thought, his eyes fell on top who, going backwards and forwards, seemed to say, "'Am I not here?' "'Top!' exclaimed Cyrus Harding. The animal sprang at his master's call. "'Yes, Top will go,' said the reporter, who had understood the engineer. "'Top can go where we cannot. He will carry to Granite House the news of the corral, and he will bring back to us that from Granite House. "'Top can go where we cannot.' He will carry to Granite House the news of the corral, and he will bring back to us that from Granite House. Quick, said Harding, quick! Spilett rapidly tore a leaf from his notebook, and wrote these words. Herbert wounded. We are at the corral. Be on your guard. Do not leave Granite House. Have the convicts appeared in the neighborhood? Reply by top. This laconic note contained all that Neb ought to know and at the same time asked all that the colonist wished to know. It was folded and fastened to Top's collar in a conspicuous position. "'Top, my dog,' said the engineer, caressing the animal. "'Neb, Top! Neb! Go! Go!' Top bounded at these words. He understood. He knew what was expected of him. The road to the corral was familiar to him. In less than an hour he could clear it, and it might be hoped that where neither Cyrus Harding nor the reporter could have ventured without danger, Top, running among the grass or in the wood, would pass unperceived. The engineer went to the gate of the corral and opened it. "'Neb, Top, Neb!' repeated the engineer, again pointing in the direction of Granite House. Top sprang forwards, and almost immediately disappeared. "'He will get there.' said the reporter. Yes, and he will come back, the faithful animal. What o'clock is it? 
asked Gideon Spillet. Ten. In an hour he may be here. We will watch for his return. The gate of the corral was closed. The engineer and the reporter re-entered the house. Herbert was still in a sleep. Pencroft kept the compresses always wet. Spilett, seeing that there was nothing he could do at that moment, busied himself in preparing some nourishment, while attentively watching that part of the enclosure against the hill, at which an attack might be expected. The settlers awaited Top's return with much anxiety. A little before eleven o'clock, Cyrus Harding and the reporter, rifle in hand, were behind the gate, ready to open it at the first bark of their dog. They did not doubt that if Top had arrived safely at Granite House, Neb would have sent him back immediately. They had both been there for about ten minutes, when a report was heard, followed by repeated barks. The engineer opened the gate, and seeing smoke a hundred feet off in the wood, he fired in that direction. Almost immediately Top bounded into the corral, and the gate was quickly shut. "'Top! Top!' exclaimed the engineer, taking the dog's great honest head between his hands. A note was fastened to his neck, and Cyrus Harding read these words, traced in Neb's large writing. "'No pirates in the neighborhood of Granite House. I will not stir. Poor Mr. Herbert!' End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 3 Chapter 8 So the convicts were still there, watching the corral and determined to kill the settlers one after the other. There was nothing to be done but to treat them as wild beasts. But great precautions must be taken, for just now the wretches had the advantage on their side, seeing, and not being seen, being able to surprise by the suddenness of their attack, yet not to be surprised themselves. Harding made arrangements, therefore, for living in the corral, of which the provisions would last for a tolerable length of time. Ayrton's house had been provided with all that was necessary for existence, and the convicts, scared by the arrival of the settlers, had not had time to pillage it. It was probable, as Gideon Spillett observed, that things had occurred as follows. The six convicts, disembarking on the island, had followed the southern shore, and after having traversed the double shore of the Serpentine Peninsula, not being inclined to venture into the far west woods, they had reached the mouth of Falls River. From this point, by following the right bank of the watercourse, they would arrive at the spurs of Mount Franklin, among which they would naturally seek a retreat, and they could not have been long in discovering the corral, then uninhabited. There they had regularly installed themselves, awaiting the moment to put their abominable schemes into execution. Ayrton's arrival had surprised them, but they had managed to overpower the unfortunate man, and the rest may be easily imagined. Now the convicts, reduced to five, it is true, but well armed, were roaming the woods, and to venture there was to expose themselves to their attacks, which could be neither guarded against nor prevented. "'Wait! There is nothing else to be done,' repeated Cyrus Harding. When Herbert is cured, we can organize a general battu of the island, and have satisfaction of these convicts. That will be the object of our grand expedition at the same time. As the search for our mysterious protector, added Gideon Spilett, finishing the engineer's sentence. Ah, it must be acknowledged, my dear Cyrus, that this time his protection was wanting at the very moment when it was most necessary to us. Who knows? replied the engineer. "'What do you mean?' asked the reporter. "'That we are not at the end of our trouble yet, my dear Spilett. 
and that his powerful intervention may have another opportunity of exercising itself. But that is not the question now. Herbert's life before everything. That was the colonist's saddest thought. Several days passed, and the poor boy's state was happily no worse. Cold water, always kept at a suitable temperature, had completely prevented the inflammation of the wounds. It even seemed to the reporter that this water, being slightly sulfurous, which was explained by the neighborhood of the volcano, had a more direct action on the healing. The separation was much less abundant, and, thanks to the incessant care by which he was surrounded, Herbert returned to life, and his fever abated. He was, besides, subjected to a severe diet, and consequently his weakness was and would be extreme. But there was no want of refreshing drinks, and absolute rest was of the greatest benefit to him. Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, and Pencroft had become very skilful in dressing the lad's wounds. All the linen in the house had been sacrificed. Herbert's wounds, covered with compresses and lint, were pressed neither too much nor too little, so as to cause their citricization without affecting any inflammatory reaction. The reporter used extreme care in the dressing, knowing well the importance of it, and repeating to his companions that which most surgeons willingly admit, that it is perhaps rarer to see a dressing well done than an operation well performed. In ten days, on the 22nd of November, Herbert was considerably better. He had begun to take some nourishment. The color was returning to his cheeks, and his bright eyes smiled at his nurses. He talked a little, notwithstanding Pencroft's efforts, who talked incessantly to prevent him from beginning to speak, and told him the most improbable stories. Herbert had questioned him on the subject of Ayrton, whom he was astonished not to see near him, thinking that he was at the corral. But the sailor, not wishing to distress Herbert, contented himself by replying that Ayrton had rejoined Neb, so as to defend Granite House. Humph, said Pencroft. These pirates! They are gentlemen who have no right to any consideration, and the captain wanted to win them by kindness. I'll send them some kindness, but in the shape of a good bullet. And have they not been seen again? asked Herbert. No, my boy, answered the sailor, but we shall find them, and when you are cured we shall see if the cowards who strike us from behind will dare to meet us face to face. I am still very weak, my poor Pencroft. Well, your strength will return gradually. What's a ball through the chest? Nothing but a joke. I've seen many, and I don't think much of them. At last things appeared to be going on well and if no complication occurred, Herbert's recovery might be regarded as certain. But what would have been the condition of the colonists if his state had been aggravated? If, for example, the ball had remained in his body, if his arm or his leg had had to be amputated? No, said Spilett more than once, I have never thought of such a contingency without shuddering. And yet, if it had been necessary to operate— said Harding one day to him. You would not have hesitated? No, Cyrus, said Gideon Spilett, but thank God that we have been spared this complication. As in so many other conjectures, the colonists had appealed to the logic of that simple good sense of which they had made use so often, and once more, thanks to their general knowledge, it had succeeded. But might not a time come when all their science would be at fault? they were alone on the island. Now men in all states of society are necessary to each other. Cyrus Harding knew this well, and sometimes he asked if some circumstance might not occur which they would be powerless to surmount. It appeared to him besides that he and his companions, till then so fortunate, had entered into an unlucky period. During the two years and a half which had elapsed since their escape from Richmond, it might be said that they had had everything their own way. The island had abundantly supplied them with minerals, vegetables, animals, and as nature had constantly loaded them, their science had known how to take advantage of what she offered them. 
The well-being of the colony was therefore complete. Moreover, in certain occurrences, an inexplicable influence had come to their aid. But all that could only be for a time. In short, Cyrus Harding believed that fortune had turned against them. In fact, the convict's ship had appeared in the waters of the island, and if the pirates had been, so to speak, miraculously destroyed, six of them at least had escaped the catastrophe. They had disembarked on the island, and it was almost impossible to get at the five who survived. Ayrton had no doubt been murdered by these wretches, who possessed firearms, and at the first use that they had made of them, Herbert had fallen, wounded almost mortally. Were these the first blows aimed by adverse fortune at the colonists? This was often asked by Harding. This was often repeated by the reporter. And it appeared to him also that the intervention, so strange, yet so efficacious, which till then had served them so well, had now failed them. Had this mysterious being, whatever he was, whose existence could not be denied, abandoned the island? Had he in his turn succumbed? No reply was possible to these questions, but it must not be imagined that because Harding and his companions spoke of these things, they were meant to despair. Far from that. They looked their situation in the face. They analyzed their chances. They prepared themselves for any event. They stood firm and straight before the future, and if adversity was at last to strike them, it would find in them men prepared to struggle against it. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Three, Chapter Nine. The convalescence of the young invalid was regularly progressing. One thing only was now to be desired, that his state would allow him to be brought to Granite House. However well built and supplied the corral house was, it could not be so comfortable as the healthy granite dwelling. Besides, it did not offer the same security, and its tenants, notwithstanding their watchfulness, were here always in fear of some shot from the convicts. There, on the contrary, in the middle of that impregnable and inaccessible cliff, they would have nothing to fear, and any attacks on their persons would certainly fail. They therefore waited impatiently for the moment when Herbert might be moved without danger from his wound, and they were determined to make this move, although the communication through Jacamar Wood was very difficult. They had no news from Neb, but were not uneasy on that account. The courageous negro, well entrenched in the depths of Granite House, would not allow himself to be surprised. Top had not been sent again to him, as it appeared useless to expose the faithful dog to some shot which might deprive the settlers of their most useful auxiliary. They waited, therefore, although they were anxious to be reunited at Granite House. It pained the engineer to see his forces divided, for it gave great advantage to the pirates. Since Ayrton's disappearance they were only four against five, for Herbert could not yet be counted and this was not the least care of the brave boy, who well understood the trouble of which he was the cause. The question of knowing how, in their condition, they were to act against the pirates, was thoroughly discussed on the twenty-ninth of November by Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, and Pencroft, at a moment when Herbert was asleep and could not hear them. "'My friends,' said the reporter, after they had talked of Neb and of the impossibility of communicating with him, I think, like you, that to venture on the road to the corral would be to risk receiving a gunshot without being able to return it. But do you not think that the best thing to be done now is to openly give chase to these wretches? 
"'That is just what I was thinking,' answered Pencroft. "'I believe we're not fellows to be afraid of a bullet, and as for me, if Captain Harding approves, I'm ready to dash into the forest. Why, hang it, man, one man is equal to another.' "'But is he equal to five? asked the engineer. "'I will join Pencroft,' said the reporter, "'and both of us well armed and accompanied by top. "'My dear Spilett, and you, Pencroft,' answered Harding, "'let us reason coolly. "'If the convicts were hid in one spot of the island, "'if we knew that spot, and had only to dislodge them, "'I would undertake a direct attack. "'But is there not occasion to fear, on the contrary, "'that they are sure to fire the first shot?' "'Well, Captain,' cried Pencroft, "'a bullet does not always reach its mark.' "'That which struck Herbert did not miss, Pencroft,' replied the engineer. "'Besides, observe that if both of you left the corral, "'I should remain here alone to defend it. "'Do you imagine that the convicts will not see you leave it? "'That they will not allow you to enter the forest, "'and that they will not attack it during your absence?' knowing that there is no one here but a wounded boy and a man? "'You are right, Captain,' replied Pencroft, his chest swelling with sullen anger. "'You are right, and they will do all they can to retake the corral, which they know to be well stored, and alone you could not hold it against them.' "'Oh, if we were only at Granite House!' "'If we were at Granite House,' answered the engineer, the case would be very different. There I should not be afraid to leave Herbert with one, while the other three went to search the forests of the island. But we are at the corral, and it is best to stay here until we can leave it together." Cyrus Harding's reasoning was unanswerable, and his companions understood it well. "'If only Ayrton was still one of us,' said Gideon Spilett. "'Poor fellow!' His return to social life will have been but of short duration. "'If he is dead,' added Pencroft, in a peculiar tone. "'Do you hope, then, Pencroft, that the villains have spared him?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'Yes, if they had any interest in doing so.' "'What? You suppose that Ayrton, finding his old companions, forgetting all that he owes us, who knows?' answered the sailor who did not hazard this shameful supposition without hesitating. Pencroft, said Harding, taking the sailor's arm, that is a wicked idea of yours, and you will distress me much if you persist in speaking thus. I will answer for Ayrton's fidelity. And I also, added the reporter quickly. Yes, yes, Captain, I was wrong, replied Pencroft. It was a wicked idea indeed that I had and nothing justifies it. But what can I do? I'm not in my senses. This imprisonment in the corral wearies me horribly, and I have never felt so excited as I do now. Be patient, Pencroft, replied the engineer. How long will it be, my dear Spilett, before you think Herbert may be carried to Granite House? That is difficult to say, Cyrus, answered the reporter for any imprudence might involve terrible consequences. But his convalescence is progressing, and if he continues to gain strength, in eight days from now, well, we shall see. Eight days! That would put off the return to Granite House until the first days of December. At this time two months of spring had already passed. The weather was fine, and the heat began to be great, the forests of the island were in full leaf, and the time was approaching when the usual crops ought to be gathered. The return to the plateau of Prospect Heights would, therefore, be followed by extensive agricultural labors, interrupted only by the projected expedition through the island. It can therefore be well understood how injurious this seclusion in the corral must have been to the colonists. But if they were compelled to bow before necessity, they did not do so without impatience. Once or twice the reporter ventured out into the road and made the tour of the palisade. Top accompanied him, and Gideon Spilett, his gun cocked, was ready for any emergency. He met with no misadventure, and found no suspicious traces. 
his dog would have warned him of any danger, and, as Top did not bark, it might be concluded that there was nothing to fear, at that moment at least, and that the convicts were occupied in another part of the island. However, on his second sortie, on the 27th of November, Gideon Spillett, who had ventured a quarter of a mile into the woods, towards the south of the mountain, remarked that Top scented something. The dog had no longer his unconcerned manner. He went backwards and forwards, ferreting among the grass and bushes as if his smell had revealed some suspicious object to him. Gideon Spillett followed Top, encouraged him, excited him by his voice, while keeping a sharp lookout, his gun ready to fire, and sheltering himself behind the trees. It was not probable that Top scented the presence of man, for in that case he would have announced it by half-uttered, sullen, angry barks. Now, as he did not growl, it was because danger was neither near nor approaching. Nearly five minutes passed thus, Top rummaging, the reporter following him prudently, when all at once the dog rushed towards a thick bush and drew out a rag. It was a piece of cloth, stained and torn, which Spillett immediately brought back to the corral. There it was examined by the colonists, who found that it was a fragment of Ayrton's waistcoat, a piece of that felt, manufactured solely by the Granite House factory. "'You see, Pencroft,' observed Harding, "'there has been resistance on the part of the unfortunate Ayrton. The convicts have dragged him away in spite of himself. Do you still doubt his honesty?' "'No, Captain,' answered the sailor, "'and I repented of my suspicion a long time ago. But it seems to me that something may be learned from the incident.' "'What is that?' asked the reporter. "'It is that Ayrton was not killed at the corral, that they dragged him away living since he has resisted. Therefore, perhaps, he is still living.' "'Perhaps, indeed,' replied the engineer, who remained thoughtful." This was a hope to which Ayrton's companions could still hold. Indeed, they had before believed that, surprised in the corral, Ayrton had fallen by a bullet, as Herbert had fallen. But if the convicts had not killed him at first, if they had brought him living to another part of the island, might it not be admitted that he was still their prisoner? Perhaps, even, one of them had found in Ayrton his old Australian companion Ben Joyce, the chief of the escaped convicts, and who knows but that they had conceived the impossible hope of bringing Ayrton to themselves. He would have been very useful to them, if they had been able to make him turn traitor. This incident was, therefore, favorably interpreted at the corral, and it no longer appeared impossible that they should find Ayrton again. On his side, if he was only a prisoner, Ayrton would no doubt do all he could to escape from the hands of the villains, and this would be a powerful aid to the settlers. "'At any rate,' observed Gideon Spilett, "'if happily Ayrton did manage to escape, he would go directly to Granite House, for he could not know of the attempted assassination of which Herbert has been a victim, and consequently would never think of our being imprisoned in the corral.' "'Oh, I wish that he was there at Granite House,' cried Pencroft, "'and that we were there, too. For although the rascals can do nothing to our house, they may plunder the plateau, our plantations, our poultry-yard.' Pencroft had become a thorough farmer, heartily attached to his crops. But it must be said that Herbert was more anxious than any to return to Granite House, for he knew how much the presence of the settlers was needed there and it was he who was keeping them at the corral. Therefore one idea occupied his mind, to leave the corral and when. He believed he could bear removal to Granite House. He was sure his strength would return more quickly in his room, with the air and sight of the sea. Several times he pressed Gideon Spilett, but the latter, fearing, with good reason, that Herbert's wounds, half-healed, might reopen on the way did not give the order to start. However, something occurred which compelled Cyrus Harding and his two friends 
to yield to the lad's wish, and God alone knew that this determination might cause them grief and remorse. It was the twenty-ninth of November, seven o'clock in the evening. The three settlers were talking in Herbert's room, when they heard Top utter quick barks. Harding, Pencroft, and Spilett seized their guns and ran out of the house. Top, at the foot of the palisade, was jumping, barking, but it was with pleasure, not anger. "'Someone is coming.' "'Yes. It is not an enemy.' "'Neb, perhaps?' "'Or Ayrton?' These words had hardly been exchanged between the engineer and his two companions when a body leaped over the palisade and fell on the ground inside the corral. It was Jupe, Master Jupe in person, to whom Top immediately gave a most cordial reception. Jupe! exclaimed Pencroft. Neb has sent him to us, said the reporter. Then, replied the engineer, he must have some note on him. Pencroft rushed up to the orang. Certainly if Neb had any important matter to communicate to his master, he could not employ a more sure or more rapid messenger, who could pass where neither the colonists could, nor even Top himself. Cyrus Harding was not mistaken. At Jupe's neck hung a small bag, and in this bag was found a little note traced by Neb's hand. The despair of Harding and his companions may be imagined when they read these words. Friday? Six o'clock in the morning, plateau invaded by convicts, Neb. They gazed at each other without uttering a word. Then they re-entered the house. What were they to do? The convicts on Prospect Heights. That was disaster, devastation, ruin. Herbert, on seeing the engineer, the reporter, and Pencroft re-enter, guessed that their situation was aggravated, and when he saw Jupe, he no longer doubted that some misfortune menaced Granite House. "'Captain Harding,' said he, "'I must go. I can bear the journey. I must go.' Gideon Spilett approached Herbert, then having looked at him. "'Let us go, then,' said he. The question was quickly decided whether Herbert should be carried on a litter, or in the cart which had brought Ayrton to the corral. The motion of the litter would have been more easy for the wounded lad but it would have necessitated two bearers. That is to say, there would have been two guns less for defence if an attack was made on the road. Would they not, on the contrary, by employing the cart, leave every arm free? Was it impossible to place the mattress on which Herbert was lying in it, and to advance with so much care that any jolt should be avoided? It could be done. The cart was brought. Pencroft harnessed the onager. Cyrus Harding and the reporter raised Herbert's mattress and placed it on the bottom of the cart. The weather was fine. The sun's bright rays glanced through the trees. "'Are the guns ready?' asked Cyrus Harding. They were. The engineer and Pencroft, each armed with a double-barreled gun, and Gideon Spilett carrying his rifle, had nothing to do but start. "'Are you comfortable, Herbert?' asked the engineer. "'Ah, Captain,' replied the lad, "'don't be uneasy. I shall not die on the road.' While speaking thus, it could be seen that the poor boy had called up all his energy, and by the energy of a powerful will had collected his failing strength. The engineer felt his heart sink painfully. He still hesitated to give the signal for departure, but that would have driven Herbert to despair, killed him, perhaps. Forward, said Harding. The gate of the corral was opened. Jupe and Top, who knew when to be silent, ran in advance. The cart came out, the gate was reclosed, and the onager, led by Pencroft, advanced at a slow pace. Certainly it would have been safer to have taken a different road than that which led straight from the corral to Granite House, but the cart would have met with great difficulties in moving under the trees. It was necessary, therefore, to follow this way, although it was well known to the convicts. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett walked one on each side of the cart, ready to answer to any attack. However, it was not probable that the convicts would have left the plateau of Prospect Heights. 
Neb's note had evidently been written and sent as soon as the convicts had shown themselves there. Now this note was dated six o'clock in the morning, and the act of Orang, accustomed to come frequently to the corral, had taken scarcely three-quarters of an hour to cross the five miles which separated it from Granite House. They would, therefore, be safe at that time, and if there was any occasion for firing, it would probably not be until they were in the neighbourhood of Granite House. However, the colonists kept a strict watch. Top and Jupe the latter armed with his club, sometimes in front, sometimes beating the wood at the sides of the road, signalized no danger. The cart advanced slowly under Pencroft's guidance. It had left the corral at half-past seven. An hour after, four out of the five miles had been cleared, without any incident having occurred. The road was as deserted as all that part of the Jacamar wood which lay between the Mercy and the lake. There was no occasion for any warning. The wood appeared as deserted as on the day when the colonists first landed on the island. They approached the plateau. Another mile and they would see the bridge over Creek Glycerin. Cyrus Harding expected to find it in its place, supposing that the convicts would have crossed it, and that, after having passed one of the streams which enclosed the plateau, they would have taken the precaution to lower it again so as to keep open a retreat. At length an opening in the trees allowed the sea horizon to be seen, but the cart continued its progress, for not one of its defenders thought of abandoning it. At that moment Pencroft stopped the onager, and in a hoarse voice, "'Oh, the villains!' he exclaimed, and he pointed to a thick smoke rising from the mill, the sheds, and the buildings at the poultry-yard. A man was moving about in the midst of the smoke. It was Neb. His companions uttered a shout. He heard and ran to meet them. The convicts had left the plateau nearly half an hour before, having devastated it. "'And Mr. Herbert?' asked Neb. Gideon Spilett returned to the cart. Herbert had lost consciousness. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Ten Of the convicts, the dangers which menace Granite House the ruins with which the plateau was covered, the colonists thought no longer. Herbert's critical state outweighed all other considerations. Would the removal prove fatal to him by causing some internal injury? The reporter could not affirm it, but he and his companions almost despaired of the result. The cart was brought to the bend of the river. There some branches, disposed as a litter, received the mattress on which lay the unconscious Herbert. Ten minutes after, Cyrus Harding, Spilett, and Pencroft were at the foot of the cliff, leaving Neb to take the cart on to the plateau of Prospect Heights. The lift was put in motion, and Herbert was soon stretched on his bed in Granite House. What cares were lavished on him to bring him back to life? He smiled for a moment on finding himself in his room, but could scarcely even murmur a few words, so great was his weakness. Gideon Spilett examined his wounds. He feared to find them reopened, having been imperfectly healed. There was nothing of the sort. From whence, then, came this prostration? Why was Herbert so much worse? The lad then fell into a kind of feverish sleep, and the reporter and Pencroft remained near the bed. During this time Harding told Neb all that had happened at the corral and Neb recounted to his master the events of which the plateau had just been the theatre. It was only during the preceding night that the convicts had appeared on the edge of the forest, at the approaches to Creek Glycerin. Neb, 
who was watching near the poultry-yard, had not hesitated to fire at one of the pirates, who was about to cross the stream, but in the darkness he could not tell whether the man had been hit or not. At any rate it was not enough to frighten away the band, and Neb had only just time to get up to Granite House, where at least he was in safety. But what was he to do there? How prevent the devastations with which the convicts threatened the plateau? Had Neb any means by which to warn his master? And besides, in what situation were the inhabitants of the corral themselves? Cyrus Harding and his companions had left on the 11th of November, and it was now the 29th. It was, therefore, nineteen days since Neb had had other news than that brought by Top. Disastrous news. Ayrton disappeared. Herbert severely wounded. The engineer, reporter, and sailor, as it were, imprisoned in the corral. What was he to do? asked poor Neb. Personally he had nothing to fear, for the convicts could not reach him in Granite House. But the buildings, the plantations, all their arrangements at the mercy of the pirates. Would it not be best to let Cyrus Harding judge of what he ought to do, and to warn him at least of the danger which threatened him? Neb then thought of employing Jupe, and confiding a note to him. He knew the orang's great intelligence, which had been often put to the proof. Jupe understood the word corral, which had been frequently pronounced before him and it may be remembered, too, that he had often driven the cart thither in company with Pencroft. Day had not yet dawned. The active orang would know how to pass unperceived through the woods, of which the convicts besides would think he was a native. Neb did not hesitate. He wrote the note, he tied it to Jupe's neck, he brought the ape to the door of Granite House, from which he let down a long cord to the ground. Then, several times, he repeated these words, Joop! Joop! Corral! Corral! The creature understood, seized the cord, glided rapidly down to the beach, and disappeared in the darkness, without the convict's attention having been in the least excited. "'You did well, Neb,' said Harding. "'But perhaps in not warning us you would have done still better.' And in speaking thus, Cyrus Harding thought of Herbert, whose recovery the removal had so seriously checked. Neb ended his account. The convicts had not appeared at all on the beach. Not knowing the number of the island's inhabitants, they might suppose that Granite House was defended by a large party. They must have remembered that during the attack by the brig numerous shot had been fired both from the lower and upper rocks, and no doubt they did not wish to expose themselves but the plateau of Prospect Heights was open to them, and not covered by the fire of Granite House. They gave themselves up, therefore, to their instinct of destruction, plundering, burning, devastating everything, and only retiring half an hour before the arrival of the colonists, whom they believed still confined in the corral. On their retreat Neb hurried out. He climbed the plateau at the risk of being perceived and fired at, tried to extinguish the fire which was consuming the buildings of the poultry-yard, and had struggled, though in vain, against it until the cart appeared at the edge of the wood. Such had been these serious events. The presence of the convicts constituted a permanent source of danger to the settlers in Lincoln Island, until then so happy, and who might now expect still greater misfortunes. Spilett remained in Granite House with Herbert and Pencroft while Cyrus Harding, accompanied by Neb, proceeded to judge for himself of the extent of the disaster. It was fortunate that the convicts had not advanced to the foot of Granite House. The workshop at the chimneys would in that case not have escaped destruction. But after all, this evil would have been more easily reparable than the ruins accumulated on the plateau of Prospect Heights. Harding and Neb proceeded towards the Mercy, and ascended its left bank without meeting with any trace of the convicts, nor on the other side of the river, in the depths of the wood, could they perceive any suspicious indications. Besides, it might be supposed that in all probability either the convicts knew of the return of the settlers to Granite House, by having seen them pass on the road from the corral, or, 
after the devastation of the plateau, they had penetrated into Jacamar Wood, following the course of the Mercy, and were thus ignorant of their return. In the former case they must have returned towards the corral, now without defenders, and which contained valuable stores. In the latter they must have regained their encampment, and would wait an opportunity to recommence the attack. It was, therefore, possible to prevent them, but any enterprise to clear the island was now rendered difficult by reason of Herbert's condition. Indeed, their whole force would have been barely sufficient to cope with the convicts, and just now no one could leave Granite House. The engineer and Neb arrived on the plateau. Desolation reigned everywhere. The fields had been trampled over. The ears of wheat, which were nearly full-grown, lay on the ground. The other plantations had not suffered less. The kitchen garden was destroyed. Happily, Granite House possessed a store of seed which would enable them to repair these misfortunes. As to the wall and buildings of the poultry-yard and the onager's stable, the fire had destroyed all. A few terrified creatures roamed over the plateau. The birds, which during the fire had taken refuge on the waters of the lake, had already returned to their accustomed spot and were dabbling on the banks. Everything would have to be reconstructed. Cyrus Harding's face, which was paler than usual, expressed an internal anger which he commanded with difficulty, but he did not utter a word. Once more he looked at his devastated fields, and at the smoke which still rose from the ruins, then he returned to Granite House. The following days were the saddest of any that the colonists had passed on the island. Herbert's weakness visibly increased. It appeared that a more serious malady, the consequence of the profound physiological disturbance he had gone through, threatened to declare itself, and Gideon Spilett feared such an aggravation of his condition that he would be powerless to fight against it. In fact, Herbert remained in an almost continuous state of drowsiness, and symptoms of delirium began to manifest themselves. Refreshing drinks were the only remedies at the colonist's disposal. The fever was not as yet very high, but it soon appeared that it would probably recur at regular intervals. Gideon Spilett first recognized this on the 6th of December. The poor boy, whose fingers, nose, and ears had become extremely pale, was at first seized with slight shiverings, horripilations, and tremblings. His pulse was weak and irregular, his skin dry, his thirst intense. To this soon succeeded a hot fit. His face became flushed, his skin reddened, his pulse quick. Then a profuse perspiration broke out after which the fever seemed to diminish. The attack had lasted nearly five hours. Gideon Spilett had not left Herbert, who, it was only too certain, was now seized by an intermittent fever, and this fever must be cured at any cost before it should assume a more serious aspect. "'And in order to cure it,' said Spilett to Cyrus Harding, "'we need a febrifuge.' A febrifuge, answered the engineer. We have neither Peruvian bark nor sulphate of quinine. No, said Gideon Spilett, but there are willows on the border of the lake, and the bark of the willow might, perhaps, prove to be a substitute for quinine. Let us try it without losing a moment, replied Cyrus Harding. The bark of the willow has, indeed, been justly considered as a succedaneum for Peruvian bark as has also that of the horse-chestnut tree, the leaf of the holly, the snake-root, etc. It was evidently necessary to make trial of this substance, although not so valuable as Peruvian bark, and to employ it in its natural state, since they had no means of extracting its essence. Cyrus Harding went himself to cut from the trunk of a species of black willow a few pieces of bark, he brought them back to Granite House, and reduced them to a powder, which was administered that same evening to Herbert. The night passed without any important change. Herbert was somewhat delirious, but the fever did not reappear in the night, 
and did not return either during the following day. Pencroft again began to hope. Gideon Spilett said nothing. It might be that the fever was not quotidian, but tertian, and that it would return next day. Therefore he awaited the next day with the greatest anxiety. It might have been remarked besides that during this period Herbert remained utterly prostrate, his head weak and giddy. Another symptom alarmed the reporter to the highest degree. Herbert's liver became congested, and soon a more intense delirium showed that his brain was also affected. Gideon Spilett was overwhelmed by this new complication. He took the engineer aside. "'It is a malignant fever,' said he. "'A malignant fever!' cried Harding. "'You are mistaken, Spilett. A malignant fever does not declare itself spontaneously. Its germ must previously have existed.' "'I am not mistaken,' replied the reporter. Herbert no doubt contracted the germ of this fever in the marshes of the island. He has already had one attack. Should a second come on, and should we not be able to prevent a third, he is lost. But the willow bark? That is insufficient, answered the reporter, and the third attack of a malignant fever, which is not arrested by means of quinine, is always fatal. Fortunately, Pencroft heard nothing of this conversation, or he would have gone mad. It may be imagined what anxiety the engineer and the reporter suffered during the day of the 7th of December and the following night. Towards the middle of the day the second attack came on. The crisis was terrible. Herbert felt himself sinking. He stretched his arms towards Cyrus Harding, towards Spilett, towards Pencroft. He was so young to die. The scene was heart-rending. They were obliged to send Pencroft away. The fit lasted five hours. It was evident that Herbert could not survive a third. The night was frightful. In his delirium Herbert uttered words which went to the heart of his companions. He struggled with the convicts. He called to Ayrton. He poured forth entreaties to that mysterious being that powerful unknown protector, whose image was stamped upon his mind. Then he again fell into a deep exhaustion, which completely prostrated him. Several times Gideon Spilett thought that the poor boy was dead. The next day, the 8th of December, was but a succession of the fainting fits. Herbert's thin hands clutched the sheets. They had administered further doses of pounded bark, but the reporter expected no result from it. "'If before to-morrow morning we have not given him a more energetic febrifuge,' said the reporter, "'Herbert will be dead.' Night arrived. The last night, it was too much to be feared, of the good, brave, intelligent boy, so far in advance of his years, and who was loved by all as their own child." The only remedy which existed against this terrible, malignant fever, the only specific which could overcome it, was not to be found in Lincoln Island. During the night of the 8th of December, Herbert was seized by a more violent delirium. His liver was fearfully congested, his brain affected, and already it was impossible for him to recognize anyone. Would he live until the next day? until that third attack which must infallibly carry him off? It was not probable. His strength was exhausted, and in the intervals of fever he lay as one dead. Towards three o'clock in the morning Herbert uttered a piercing cry. He seemed to be torn by a supreme convulsion. Neb, who was near him, terrified, ran into the next room where his companions were watching. Top, at that moment, barked in a strange manner. All rushed in immediately and managed to restrain the dying boy, who was endeavouring to throw himself out of his bed, while Spilett, taking his arm, felt his pulse gradually quicken. It was five in the morning. The rays of the rising sun began to shine in at the windows of Granite House. It promised to be a fine day, and this day was to be poor Herbert's last. A ray glanced on the table placed near the bed. Suddenly Pencroft, uttering a cry, pointed to the table. On it lay a little oblong box, 
of which the cover bore these words, Sulfate of Quinine. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 3, Chapter 11 Gideon Spillett took the box and opened it. It contained nearly two hundred grains of a white powder, a few particles of which he carried to his lips. The extreme bitterness of the substance precluded all doubt. It was certainly the precious extract of quinine, that pre-eminent antifebrile. This powder must be administered to Herbert without delay. How it came there might be discussed later. "'Some coffee,' said Spilett. In a few moments Ned brought a cup of the warm infusion. Gideon Spilett threw into it about eighteen grains of quinine, and they succeeded in making Herbert drink the mixture. There was still time, for the third attack of the malignant fever had not yet shown itself. How they longed to be able to add that it would not return! Besides, it must be remarked, the hopes of all had now revived. The mysterious influence had been again exerted, and in a critical moment when they had despaired of it. In a few hours Herbert was much calmer. The colonists could now discuss this incident. The intervention of the stranger was more evident than ever. But how had he been able to penetrate during the night into Granite House? It was inexplicable, and in truth, the proceedings of the genius of the island were not less mysterious than was that genius himself. During this day the sulphate of quinine was administered to Herbert every three hours. The next day some improvement in Herbert's condition was apparent. Certainly he was not out of danger, intermittent fevers being subject to frequent and dangerous relapses, but the most assiduous care was bestowed on him. And besides, the specific was at hand, nor, doubtless, was he who had brought it far distant. And the hearts of all were animated by returning hope. This hope was not disappointed. Ten days after, on the 20th of December, Herbert's convalescence commenced. He was still weak, and strict diet had been imposed upon him, but no access of fever supervened. And then the poor boy submitted with such docility to all the prescriptions ordered him. He longed so to get well. Pencroft was as a man who had been drawn up from the bottom of an abyss. Fits of joy approaching delirium seized him. When the time for the third attack had passed by, he nearly suffocated the reporter in his embrace. Since then he always called him Dr. Spillett. The real doctor, however, remained undiscovered. "'We will find him,' repeated the sailor. Certainly this man, whoever he was, might expect a somewhat too energetic embrace from the worthy Pencroft. The month of December ended, and with it the year 1867, during which the colonists of Lincoln Island had of late been so severely tried. They commenced the year 1868 with magnificent weather, great heat, and a tropical temperature, delightfully cooled by the sea breeze. Herbert's recovery progressed, and from his bed, placed near one of the windows of Granite House, he could inhale the fresh air, charged with ozone, which could not fail to restore his health. His appetite returned, and what numberless delicate, savory little dishes Ned prepared for him! "'It is enough to make one wish to have a fever oneself,' said Pencroft. During all this time the convicts did not once appear to, in the vicinity of Granite House. There was no news of Ayrton, and though the engineer and Herbert still had some hopes of finding him again, their companions did not doubt but that the unfortunate man had perished. However, this uncertainty could not last, and when once the lad should have recovered, the expedition, the result of which must be so important, 
would be undertaken. But they would have to wait a month, perhaps, for all the strength of the colony must be put into requisition to obtain satisfaction from the convicts. However, Herbert's convalescence progressed rapidly. The congestion of the liver had disappeared, and his wounds might be considered completely healed. During the month of January, important work was done on the plateau of Prospect Heights, but it consisted solely in saving as much as was possible from the devastated crops, either of corn or vegetables. The grain and the plants were gathered, so as to provide a new harvest for the approaching half-season. With regard to rebuilding the poultry wall, yard, or stables, Cyrus Harding preferred to wait. While he and his companions were in pursuit of the convicts, the latter might very probably pay another visit to the plateau, and it would be useless to give them an opportunity of recommencing their work of destruction. When the island should be cleared of these miscreants, they would set about rebuilding. The young convalescent began to get up in the second week of January, at first for one hour a day, then two, then three. His strength visibly returned, so vigorous was his constitution. He was now eighteen years of age. He was tall, and promised to become a man of noble and commanding presence. From this time his recovery, while still requiring care, and Dr. Spillett was very strict, made rapid progress. Towards the end of the month Herbert was already walking about on Prospect Heights and the beach. He derived from several sea-baths, which he took in company with Pencroft and Neb, the greatest possible benefit. Cyrus Harding thought he might now settle the day for their departure, for which the 15th of February was fixed. The nights, very clear at this time of year, would be favourable to the researches they intended to make all over the island. The necessary preparations for this exploration were now commenced, and were important, for the colonists had sworn not to return to Granite House until their twofold object had been achieved. On the one hand, to exterminate the convicts, and rescue Ayrton, if he was still living, on the other, to discover who it was that presided so effectually over the fortunes of the colony. Of Lincoln Island, the settlers knew thoroughly all the eastern coast from Claw Cape to the Mandible Capes, the extensive Tadorn Marsh, the neighborhood of Lake Grant, Jackamar Wood, between the road to the Corral and the Mercy, the courses of the Mercy and Red Creek, and lastly the spurs of Mount Franklin, among which the corral had been established. They had explored, though only in an imperfect manner, the vast shore of Washington Bay from Claw Cape to Reptile End, the woody and marshy border of the west coast, and the interminable downs, ending at the open mouth of Shark Gulf but they had in no way surveyed the woods which covered the Serpentine Peninsula, all to the right of the Mercy, the left bank of the Falls River, and the wilderness of spurs and valleys which supported three-quarters of the base of Mount Franklin, to the east, the north, and the west, and where doubtless many secret retreats existed. Consequently, many millions of acres of the island had still escaped their investigations. It was, therefore, decided that the expedition should be carried through the far west, so as to include all that region situated on the right of the Mercy. It might perhaps be better worth while to go direct to the corral, where it might be supposed that the convicts had again taken refuge, either to pillage or to establish themselves there. But either the devastation of the corral would have been an accomplished fact by this time, and it would be too late to prevent it, or it had been the convicts' interest to entrench themselves there, and there would be still time to go and turn them out on their return. Therefore, after some discussion, the first plan was adhered to, and the settlers resolved to proceed through the wood to Reptile End. They would make their way with their hatchets, and thus lay the first draft of a road which would place Granite House in communication with the end of the peninsula for a length of from sixteen to seventeen miles. The cart was in good condition. The onagers, well rested, could go a long journey. Provisions, camp effects, a portable stove, and various utensils were packed in the cart, as also weapons and ammunition, 
carefully chosen from the now complete arsenal of Granite House. But it was necessary to remember that the convicts were, perhaps, roaming about the woods, and then in the midst of these thick forests a shot might quickly be fired and received. It was therefore resolved that the little band of settlers should remain together and not separate under any pretext whatever. It was also decided that no one should remain at Granite House. Top and Jupe themselves were to accompany the expedition, the inaccessible dwelling needing no guard. The 14th of February, eve of the departure, was consecrated entirely to repose, and thanksgiving addressed by the colonists to the Creator. A place in the cart was reserved for Herbert, who, though thoroughly convalescent, was still a little weak. The next morning, at daybreak, Cyrus Harding took the necessary measures to protect Granite House from any invasion. The ladders, which were formerly used for the ascent, were brought to the chimneys and buried deep in the sand, so that they might be available on the return of the colonists, for the machinery of the lift had been taken to pieces, and nothing of the apparatus remained. Pencroft stayed the last in Granite House in order to finish this work, and he then lowered himself down by means of a double rope held below, and which, when once hauled down, left no communication between the upper landing and the beach. The weather was magnificent. "'We shall have a warm day of it,' said the reporter, laughing. "'Pooh, Dr. Spilett,' answered Pencroft, "'we shall walk under the shade of the trees and shan't even see the sun.' "'Forward,' said the engineer." The cart was waiting on the beach before the chimneys. The reporter made Herbert take his place in it during the first hours, at least, of the journey, and the lad was obliged to submit to his doctor's orders. Neb placed himself at the onagers' heads. Cyrus Harding, the reporter, and the sailor walked in front. Top bounded joyfully along. Herbert offered a seat in his vehicle to Jupe, who accepted it without ceremony. The moment for departure had arrived, and the little band set out. The cart first turned the angle of the mouth of the Mercy, then, having ascended the left bank for a mile, crossed the bridge, at the other side of which commenced the road to Port Balloon, and there the explorers, leaving this road on their left, entered the cover of the immense woods which formed the region of the far west. For the first two miles the widely scattered trees allowed the cart to pass with ease. From time to time it became necessary to cut away a few creepers and bushes, but no serious obstacle impeded the progress of the colonists. The thick foliage of the trees threw a grateful shade on the ground. Deodars, Douglas firs, Casuarinas, Banksias, gum trees, dragon trees, and other well-known species succeeded each other far as the eye could reach. The feathered tribes of the island were all represented, grouse, jacamars, pheasants, lories, as well as the chattering cockatoos, parrots, and parroquets. Agoutis, kangaroos, and capybaras fled swiftly at their approach, and all this reminded the settlers of the first excursions they had made on their arrival at the island. Nevertheless, observed Cyrus Harding. I notice that these creatures, both birds and quadrupeds, are more timid than formerly. These woods have therefore been recently traversed by the convicts, and we shall certainly find some traces of them. And in fact in several places they could distinguish traces, more or less recent, of the passage of a band of men. Here branches broken off the trees, perhaps to mark out the way, there the ashes of a fire, and footprints in clayey spots, but nothing which appeared to belong to a settled encampment. The engineer had recommended his companions to refrain from hunting. The reports of the firearms might give the alarm to the convicts, who were perhaps roaming through the forest. Moreover, the hunters would necessarily ramble some distance from the cart, which it was dangerous to leave unguarded. In the after part of the day, when about six miles from Granite House, their progress became much more difficult. In order to make their way through some thickets, they were obliged to cut down trees. Before entering such places, 
Harding was careful to send in Top and Jupe, who faithfully accomplished their commission, and when the dog and orang returned without giving any warning, there was evidently nothing to fear, either from convicts or wild beasts, two varieties of the animal kingdom, whose ferocious instincts placed them on the same level. On the evening of the first day, the colonists encamped about nine miles from Granite House, on the border of a little stream falling into the Mercy, and of the existence of which they had till then been ignorant. It evidently, however, belonged to the hydrographical system to which the soil owed its astonishing fertility. The settlers made a hearty meal, for their appetites were sharpened, and measures were then taken that the night might be passed in safety. If the engineer had had only to deal with wild beasts, jaguars or others, he would have simply lighted fires all around his camp, which would have sufficed for its defence. But the convicts would be rather attracted than terrified by the flames, and it was, therefore, better to be surrounded by the profound darkness of night. The watch was, however, carefully organized. Two of the settlers were to watch together, and every two hours it was agreed that they should be relieved by their comrades. And so, notwithstanding his wish to the contrary, Herbert was exempted from guard. Pencroft and Gideon Spilett in one party, the engineer and Neb in another, mounted guard in turns over the camp. The night, however, was but a few hours. The darkness was due rather to the thickness of the foliage than to the disappearance of the sun. The silence was scarcely disturbed by the howling of jaguars and the chattering of the monkeys, the latter appearing to particularly irritate Master Jupe. The night passed without incident, and on the next day, the 15th of February, the journey through the forest, tedious rather than difficult, was continued. This day they could not accomplish more than six miles, for every moment they were obliged to cut a road with their hatchets. Like true settlers, the colonists spared the largest and most beautiful trees, which would besides have cost immense labor to fell, and the small ones only were sacrificed. But the result was that the road took a very winding direction, and lengthened itself by numerous detours. During the day Herbert discovered several new specimens not before met with in the island, such as the tree-fern, with its leaves spread out like the waters of a fountain, locust-trees, on the long pods of which the onagers browsed greedily, and which supplied a sweet pulp of excellent flavour. There, too, the colonists again found groups of magnificent quarries, their cylindrical trunks, crowned by a cone of verdure, rising to a height of two hundred feet. These were the tree kings of New Zealand, as celebrated as the cedars of Lebanon. As to the fauna, there was no addition to those species already known to the hunters. However, they saw, though unable to get near them, a couple of those large birds peculiar to Australia, a sort of cassowary, called emu, five feet in height, and with brown plumage, which belonged to the tribe of waders. Top darted after them as fast as his four legs could carry him, but the emus distanced him with ease, so prodigious was their speed. As to the traces left by the convicts, a few more were discovered. Some footprints found near an apparently recently extinguished fire were attentively examined by the settlers. By measuring them one after the other, according to their length and breadth, the marks of five men's feet were easily distinguished. The five convicts had evidently camped on this spot, but, and this was the object of so minute an examination, a sixth footprint could not be discovered, which in that case would have been that of Ayrton. "'Ayrton was not with them,' said Herbert. "'No,' answered Pencroft. And if he was not with them, it was because the wretches had already murdered him. But then these rascals have not a den to which they may be tracked like tigers. No, said the reporter. It is more probable that they wander at random, and it is their interest to rove about until the time when they will be masters of the island. The masters of the island, exclaimed the sailor. 
"'The masters of the island,' he repeated, and his voice was choked, as if his throat was seized in an iron grasp. Then, in a calmer tone, "'Do you know, Captain Harding,' said he, "'what the ball is which I have rammed into my gun?' "'No, Pencroft. It is the ball that went through Herbert's chest, and I promise you it won't miss its mark.' But this just retaliation would not bring Ayrton back to life, and from the examination of the footprints left in the ground, they must, alas, conclude that all hopes of ever seeing him again must be abandoned. That evening they encamped fourteen miles from Granite House, and Cyrus Harding calculated that they could not be more than five miles from Reptile Point. And indeed, the next day the extremity of the peninsula was reached, and the whole length of the forest had been traversed, but there was nothing to indicate the retreat in which the convicts had taken refuge, nor that, no less secret, which sheltered the mysterious unknown. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Twelve The next day, the 18th of February, was devoted to the exploration of all that wooded region forming the shore from Reptile End to Falls River. The colonists were able to search this forest thoroughly, for as it was comprised between the two shores of the Serpentine Peninsula, it was only from three to four miles in breadth. The trees, both by their height and their thick foliage, bore witness to the vegetative power of the soil, more astonishing here than in any other part of the island. One might have said that a corner from the virgin forests of America or Africa had been transported into this temperate zone. This led them to conclude that the superb vegetation found a heat in the soil, damp in its upper layer, but warmed in the interior by volcanic fires, which could not belong to a temperate climate. The most frequently occurring trees were caries and eucalypti of gigantic dimensions. But the colonists' object was not simply to admire the magnificent vegetation. They knew already that in this respect Lincoln Island would have been worthy to take the first rank in the Canary Group, to which the first name given was that of the Happy Isles. Now, alas, their island no longer belonged to them entirely. Others had taken possession of it. Miscreants polluted its shores, and they must be destroyed to the last man. No traces were found on the western coast, although they were carefully sought for. No more footprints, no more broken branches, no more deserted camps. "'This does not surprise me,' said Cyrus Harding to his companions. The convicts first landed on the island in the neighborhood of Flotsam Point, and they immediately plunged into the far west forest after crossing Tador Marsh. They then followed almost the same route that we took on leaving Granite House. This explains the traces we found in the wood. But, arriving on the shore, the convicts saw at once that they would discover no suitable retreat there, and it was then that, going northwards, again, they came upon the corral. "'Where they have perhaps returned,' said Pencroft. "'I do not think so,' answered the engineer for they would naturally suppose that our researches would be in that direction. The corral is only a storehouse to them, and not a definitive encampment. "'I am of Cyrus's opinion,' said the reporter, "'and I think that it is among the spurs of Mount Franklin that the convicts will have made their lair.' "'Then, Captain, straight to the corral,' cried Pencroft. "'We must finish them off. Until now we have only lost time.' "'No, my friend,' replied the engineer. "'You forget that we have a reason for wishing to know if the forests of the far west do not contain some habitation. 
Our exploration has a double object, Pencroft. If, on the one hand, we have to chastise crime, we have, on the other, an act of gratitude to perform. That was well said, Captain, replied the sailor. But, all the same, it is my opinion that we shall not find the gentleman until he pleases. And truly Pencroft only expressed the opinion of all. It was probable that the stranger's retreat was not less mysterious than he himself. That evening the cart halted at the mouth of Falls River. The camp was organized as usual, and the customary precautions were taken for the night. Herbert, become again the healthy and vigorous lad he was before his illness, derived great benefit from this life in the open air, between the sea breezes and the vivifying air from the forests. His place was no longer in the cart, but at the head of the troop. The next day, the 19th of February, the colonists, leaving the shore, where, beyond the mouth, basalts of every shape were so picturesquely piled up, ascended the river by its left bank. The road had been already partly cleared in their former excursions, made from the corral to the west coast. The settlers were now about six miles from Mount Franklin. The engineer's plan was this, to minutely survey the valley forming the bed of the river, and to cautiously approach the neighborhood of the corral. If the corral was occupied, to seize it by force, if it was not, to entrench themselves there and make it the center of the operations which had for their object the exploration of Mount Franklin. This plan was unanimously approved by the colonists, for they were impatient to regain entire possession of their island. They made their way then along the narrow valley separating two of the largest spurs of Mount Franklin. The trees, crowded on the river's bank, became rare on the upper slopes of the mountain. The ground was hilly and rough, very suitable for ambushes, and over which they did not venture without extreme precaution. Top and Jup skirmished on the flanks, springing right and left through the thick brushwood, and emulating each other in intelligence and activity. But nothing showed that the banks of the stream had been recently frequented. Nothing announced either the presence or the proximity of the convicts. Toward five in the evening the cart stopped nearly six hundred feet from the palisade. A semicircular screen of trees still hid it. It was necessary to reconnoitre the corral, in order to ascertain if it was occupied. To go there openly, in broad daylight, when the convicts were probably in ambush, would be to expose themselves, as poor Herbert had done, to the firearms of the ruffians. It was better, then, to wait until night came on. However, Gideon Spilett wished without further delay to reconnoitre the approaches to the corral, and Pencroft, who was quite out of patience, volunteered to accompany him. "'No, my friends,' said the engineer, "'wait till night. I will not allow one of you to expose himself in open day.' "'But, Captain,' answered the sailor, little disposed to obey, "'I beg of you, Pencroft,' said the engineer. "'Very well,' replied the sailor, who vented his anger in another way by bestowing on the convicts the worst names in his maritime vocabulary. The colonists remained therefore near the cart, and carefully watched the neighboring parts of the forest. Three hours passed thus. The wind had fallen, and absolute silence reigned under the great trees. The snapping of the smallest twig, a footstep on the dry leaves, the gliding of a body among the grass, would have been heard without difficulty. All was quiet. Besides, Top, lying on the grass, his head stretched out on his paws, gave no sign of uneasiness. At eight o'clock the day appeared far enough advanced for the reconnaissance to be made under favourable conditions. Gideon Spilett declared himself ready to set out, accompanied by Pencroft. Cyrus Harding consented. Top and Jup were to remain with the engineer, Herbert, and Neb, for a bark or a cry at a wrong moment would give the alarm. "'Do not be imprudent,' said Harding to the reporter and Pencroft. 
you have not to gain possession of the corral, but only to find out whether it is occupied or not. All right, answered Pencroft. And the two departed. Under the trees, thanks to the thickness of their foliage, the obscurity rendered any object invisible beyond a radius of from thirty to forty feet. The reporter and Pencroft, halting at any suspicious sound, advanced with great caution. They walked a little distance apart from each other, so as to offer a less mark for a shot, and, to tell the truth, they expected every moment to hear a report. Five minutes after leaving the cart, Gideon Spilett and Pencroft arrived at the edge of the wood before the clearing beyond which rose the palisade. They stopped. A few straggling beams still fell on the field clear of trees. Thirty feet distant was the gate of the corral, which appeared to be closed. The thirty feet, which it was necessary to cross from the wood to the palisade, constituted the dangerous zone, to borrow a ballistic term. In fact, one or more bullets fired from behind the palisade might knock over any one who ventured on to the zone. Gideon Spilett and the sailor were not men to draw back, but they knew that any imprudence on their part, of which they would be the fairest victims, would fall afterwards on their companions. If they themselves were killed, what would become of Harding, Neb, and Herbert? But Pencroft, excited at feeling himself so near the corral where he supposed the convicts had taken refuge, was about to press forward when the reporter held him back with a grasp of iron. "'In a few minutes it will be quite dark,' whispered Spilett in the sailor's ear. "'Then will be the time to act.' Pencroft, convulsively clasping the butt-end of his gun, restrained his energies and waited, swearing to himself. Soon the last of the twilight faded away. Darkness, which seemed as if it issued from the dense forest, covered the clearing. Mount Franklin rose like an enormous screen before the western horizon, and night spread rapidly over all, as it does in regions of low latitudes. Now was the time. The reporter and Pencroft, since posting themselves on the edge of the wood, had not once lost sight of the palisade. The corral appeared to be absolutely deserted. The top of the palisade formed a line, a little darker than the surrounding shadow, and nothing disturbed its distinctness. Nevertheless, if the convicts were there, they must have posted one of their number to guard against any surprise. Spilett grasped his companion's hand, and both crept towards the corral, their guns ready to fire. They reached the gate without the darkness being illuminated by a single ray of light. Pencroft tried to push open the gate which, as the reporter and he had supposed, was closed. However, the sailor was able to ascertain that the outer bars had not been put up. It might then be concluded that the convicts were there in the corral, and that very probably they had fastened the gate in such a way that it could not be forced open. Gideon Spilett and Pencroft listened. Not a sound could be heard inside the palisade. The musmans and the goats, sleeping, no doubt, in their huts, in no way disturbed the calm of night. The reporter and the sailor, hearing nothing, asked themselves whether they had not better scale the palisades and penetrate into the corral. This would have been contrary to Cyrus Harding's instructions. It is true that the enterprise might succeed, but it might also fail. Now, if the convicts were suspecting nothing, if they knew nothing of the expedition against them, if, lastly, there now existed a chance of surprising them, ought this chance to be lost by inconsiderately attempting to cross the palisades? This was not the reporter's opinion. He thought it better to wait until all the settlers were collected together before attempting to penetrate into the corral. One thing was certain, that it was possible to reach the palisade without being seen and also that it did not appear to be guarded. This point settled, there was nothing to be done but to return to the cart where they would consult. 
Pencroft probably agreed with this decision, for he followed the reporter without making any objection when the latter turned back to the wood. In a few minutes the engineer was made acquainted with the state of affairs. Well, said he, after a little thought, I now have reason to believe that the convicts are not in the corral. We shall soon know, said Pencroft, when we have scaled the palisade. To the corral, my friends, said Cyrus Harding. Shall we leave the cart in the wood? asked Neb. No, replied the engineer. It is our wagon of ammunition and provisions, and, if necessary, it would serve as an entrenchment. Forward, then, said Gideon Spilett. The cart emerged from the wood and began to roll noiselessly towards the palisade. The darkness was now profound, the silence as complete as when Pencroft and the reporter crept over the ground. The thick grass completely muffled their footsteps. The colonists held themselves ready to fire. Jup, at Pencroft's orders, kept behind. Neb led Top in a leash to prevent him from bounding forward. The clearing soon came in sight. It was deserted. Without hesitating, the little band moved towards the palisade. In a short space of time the dangerous zone was passed. Neb remained at the onager's heads to hold them. The engineer, the reporter, Herbert, and Pencroft proceeded to the door, in order to ascertain if it was barricaded inside. It was open. What do you say now? asked the engineer, turning to the sailor and Spilett. Both were stupefied. "'I can swear,' said Pencroft, "'that this gate was shut just now.' The colonists now hesitated. Were the convicts in the corral when Pencroft and the reporter made their reconnaissance? It could not be doubted, as the gate then closed could only have been opened by them. Were they still there? or had one of their number just gone out? All these questions presented themselves simultaneously to the minds of the colonists, but how could they be answered? At that moment Herbert, who had advanced a few steps into the enclosure, drew back hurriedly and seized Harding's hand. "'What's the matter?' asked the engineer. "'A light!' "'In the house?' "'Yes.' All five advanced, and indeed— through the window fronting them, they saw glimmering a feeble light. Cyrus Harding made up his mind rapidly. "'It is our only chance,' said he to his companions, "'of finding the convicts collected in this house, suspecting nothing. They are in our power. Forward!' The colonists crossed through the enclosure, holding their guns ready in their hands. The cart had been left outside under the charge of Jup and Top, who had been prudently tied to it. Cyrus Harding, Pencroft, and Gideon Spilett on one side, Herbert and Neb on the other, going along by the palisade, surveyed the absolutely dark and deserted corral. In a few moments they were near the closed door of the house. Harding signed to his companions not to stir, and approached the window, then feebly lighted by the inner light. He gazed into the apartment. On the table burned a lantern. Near the table was the bed formerly used by Ayrton. On the bed lay the body of a man. Suddenly Cyrus Harding drew back, and in a hoarse voice, Ayrton! he exclaimed. Immediately the door was forced rather than opened, and the colonists rushed into the room. Ayrton appeared to be asleep. His countenance showed that he had long and cruelly suffered. On his wrist and ankles could be seen great bruises. Harding bent over him. "'Ayrton!' cried the engineer, seizing the arm of the man whom he had just found again under such unexpected circumstances. At this exclamation Ayrton opened his eyes, and gazing at Harding, then at the others, "'You!' he cried. "'You!' "'Ayrton! Ayrton!' repeated Harding. "'Where am I?' "'In the house in the corral.' Alone? Yes. But they will come back, cried Ayrton. Defend yourselves! Defend yourselves! And he fell back exhausted. Spilett, exclaimed the engineer, 
We may be attacked at any moment. Bring the cart into the corral. Then barricade the door, and all come back here. Pencroft, Neb, and the reporter hastened to execute the engineer's orders. There was not a moment to be lost. Perhaps even now the cart was in the hands of the convicts. In a moment the reporter and his two companions had crossed the corral and reached the gate of the palisade behind which Top was heard growling sullenly. The engineer, leaving Ayrton for an instant, came out ready to fire. Herbert was at his side. Both surveyed the crest of the spur overlooking the corral. If the convicts were lying in ambush there, they might knock the settlers over one after the other. At that moment the moon appeared in the east, above the black curtain of the forest, and a white sheet of light spread over the interior of the enclosure. The corral, with its clumps of trees, the little stream which watered it, its wide carpet of grass, was suddenly illuminated. From the side of the mountain, the house and a part of the palisade stood out white in the moonlight. On the opposite side, towards the door, the enclosure remained dark. A black mass soon appeared. This was the cart entering the circle of light, and Cyrus Harding could hear the noise made by the door as his companion shut it and fastened the interior bars. But at that moment Top, breaking loose, began to bark furiously and rushed to the back of the corral, to the right of the house. "'Be ready to fire, my friends!' cried Harding. The colonists raised their pieces and waited the moment to fire. Top still barked, and Jup, running towards the dog, uttered shrill cries. The colonists followed him, and reached the borders of the little stream, shaded by large trees. And there, in the bright moonlight, what did they see? Five corpses stretched on the bank. They were those of the convicts who, four months previously, had landed on Lincoln Island. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Thirteen How had it happened? Who had killed the convicts? Was it Ayrton? No. For a moment before he was dreading their return. But Ayrton was now in a profound stupor, from which it was no longer possible to rouse him. After uttering those few words he had again become unconscious, and had fallen back motionless on the bed. The colonists, a prey to a thousand confused thoughts, under the influence of violent excitement, waited all night without leaving Ayrton's house or returning to the spot where lay the bodies of the convicts. It was very probable that Ayrton would not be able to throw any light on the circumstances under which the bodies had been found, since he himself was not aware that he was in the corral. But at any rate he would be in a position to give an account of what had taken place before this terrible execution. The next day Ayrton awoke from his torpor and his companions cordially manifested all the joy they felt on seeing him again, almost safe and sound, after a hundred and four days' separation. Ayrton then in a few words recounted what had happened, or at least as much as he knew. The day after his arrival at the corral, on the 10th of last November, at nightfall, he was surprised by the convicts, who had scaled the palisade. They bound and gagged him, then he was led to a dark cavern at the foot of Mount Franklin, where the convicts had taken refuge. His death had been decided upon, and the next day the convicts were about to kill him, when one of them recognized him and called him by the name which he bore in Australia. The wretches had no scruples as to murdering Ayrton. They spared Ben Joyce. But from that moment Ayrton was exposed to the importunities of his former accomplices. They wished him to join them again, 
and relied upon his aid to enable them to gain possession of Granite House, to penetrate into that hitherto inaccessible dwelling, and to become masters of the island after murdering the colonists. Ayrton remained firm. The once convict, now repentant and pardoned, would rather die than betray his companions. Ayrton, bound, gagged, and closely watched, lived in this cave for four months. Nevertheless the convicts had discovered the corral a short time after their arrival in the island, and since then they had subsisted on Ayrton's stores, but did not live at the corral. On the 11th of November two of the villains, surprised by the colonists' arrival, fired at Herbert, and one of them returned, boasting of having killed one of the inhabitants of the island, but he returned alone. His companion, as is known, fell by Cyrus Harding's dagger. Ayrton's anxiety and despair may be imagined when he learned the news of Herbert's death. The settlers were now only four, and, as it seemed, at the mercy of the convicts. After this event, and during all the time that the colonists, detained by Herbert's illness, remained in the corral, the pirates did not leave their cavern, and even after they had pillaged the plateau of Prospect Heights, they did not think it prudent to abandon it. The ill-treatment inflicted on Ayrton was now redoubled. His hands and feet still bore the bloody marks of the cords which bound him day and night. Every moment he expected to be put to death, nor did it appear possible that he could escape. Matters remained thus until the third week of February. The convicts, still watching for a favourable opportunity, rarely quitted their retreat, and only made a few hunting excursions, either to the interior of the island or the south coast. Ayrton had no further news of his friends, and relinquished all hope of ever seeing them again. At last, the unfortunate man, weakened by ill-treatment, fell into a prostration so profound that sight and hearing failed him. From that moment, that is to say, since the last two days, he could give no information whatever of what had occurred. But, Captain Harding, he added, since I was imprisoned in that cavern, how is it that I find myself in the corral? How is it that the convicts are lying yonder dead in the middle of the enclosure? answered the engineer. Dead! cried Ayrton, half rising from his bed, notwithstanding his weakness. His companions supported him. He wished to get up, and with their assistance he did so. They then proceeded together towards the little stream. It was now broad daylight. There, on the bank, in the position in which they had been stricken by death in its most instantaneous form, lay the corpses of the five convicts. Ayrton was astounded. Harding and his companions looked at him without uttering a word. On a sign from the engineer, Neb and Pencroft examined the bodies, already stiffened by the cold. They bore no apparent trace of any wound. Only, after carefully examining them, Pencroft found on the forehead of one, on the chest of another, on the back of this one, on the shoulder of that, a little red spot, a sort of scarcely visible bruise, the cause of which it was impossible to conjecture. "'It is there that they have been struck,' said Cyrus Harding. "'But with what weapon?' cried the reporter. "'A weapon lightning-like in its effects, and of which we have not the secret.' "'And who has struck the blow?' asked Pencroft. "'The avenging power of the island,' replied Harding. "'He who brought you here, Ayrton, whose influence has once more manifested itself, who does for us all that which we cannot do for ourselves, and who, his will accomplished, conceals himself from us.' "'Let us make search for him, then,' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Yes, we will search for him,' answered Harding but we shall not discover this powerful being who performs such wonders until he pleases to call us to him. This invisible protection, which rendered their own action unavailing, both irritated and piqued the engineer. The relative inferiority which it proved was of a nature to wound a haughty spirit. 
a generosity evinced in such a manner as to elude all tokens of gratitude, implied a sort of disdain on those on whom the obligation was conferred, which in Cyrus Harding's eyes marred, in some degree, the worth of the benefit. "'Let us search,' he resumed, "'and God grant that we may some day be permitted to prove to this haughty protector that he has not to deal with ungrateful people. What would I not give could we repay him, by rendering him in our turn, although at the price of our lives, some signal service? From this day the thoughts of the inhabitants of Lincoln Island were solely occupied with the intended search. Everything incited them to discover the answer to this enigma, an answer which would only be the name of a man endowed with a truly inexplicable and in some degree superhuman power. In a few minutes the settlers re-entered the house, where their influence soon restored to Ayrton his moral and physical energy. Neb and Pencroft carried the corpses of the convicts into the forest, some distance from the corral, and buried them deep in the ground. Ayrton was then made acquainted with the facts which had occurred during his seclusion, he learned Herbert's adventures, and through what various trials the colonists had passed. As to the settlers, they had despaired of ever seeing Ayrton again, and had been convinced that the convicts had ruthlessly murdered him. And now, said Cyrus Harding, as he ended his recital, a duty remains for us to perform. Half of our task is accomplished, but although the convicts are no longer to be feared, it is not owing to ourselves that we are once more masters of the island. Well, answered Gideon Spilett, let us search all this labyrinth of the spurs of Mount Franklin. We will not leave a hollow, not a hole unexplored. Ah, if ever a reporter found himself face to face with a mystery, it is I who now speak to you, my friends. And we will not return to Granite House until we have found our benefactor said Herbert. Yes, said the engineer, we will do all that is humanly possible to do. But I repeat, we shall not find him until he himself permits us. Shall we stay at the corral? asked Pencroft. We shall stay here, answered Harding. Provisions are abundant, and we are here in the very centre of the circle we have to explore. Besides, if necessary, the cart will take us rapidly to Granite House. "'Good,' answered the sailor. "'Only I have a remark to make. "'What is it? "'Here is the fine season getting on, "'and we must not forget that we have a voyage to make.' "'A voyage?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'Yes, to Tabor Island,' answered Pencroft. "'It is necessary to carry a notice there "'to point out the position of our island, "'and say that Ayrton is here "'in case the Scotch yacht should come to take him off. Who knows if it is not already too late? But, Pencroft, asked Ayrton, how do you intend to make this voyage? In the Bonaventure? The Bonaventure, exclaimed Ayrton, she no longer exists. My Bonaventure exists no longer, shouted Pencroft, bounding from his seat. No, answered Ayrton. The convicts discovered her in her little harbour only eight days ago. They put to sea in her, and—' "'And?' said Pencroft, his heart beating. "'And not having Bob Harvey to steer her, they ran on the rocks, and the vessel went to pieces. "'Oh, the villains, the cutthroats, the infamous scoundrels!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Pencroft,' said Herbert, taking the sailor's hand, "'we will build another Bonaventure, a larger one.' We have all the ironwork, all the rigging of the brig at our disposal. But do you know, returned Pencroft, that it will take at least five or six months to build a vessel of from thirty to forty tons? We can take our time, said the reporter, and we must give up the voyage to Tabor Island for this year. Oh, my Bonaventure, my poor Bonaventure, cried Pencroft almost broken-hearted at the destruction of the vessel, of which he was so proud. The loss of the Bonaventure was certainly a thing to be lamented by the colonists, 
and it was agreed that this loss should be repaired as soon as possible. This settled, they now occupied themselves with bringing their researches to bear on the most secret parts of the island. The exploration was commenced at daybreak on the 19th of February, and lasted an entire week. The base of the mountain, with its spurs and their numberless ramifications, formed a labyrinth of valleys and elevations. It was evident that there, in the depths of these narrow gorges, perhaps even in the interior of Mount Franklin itself, was the proper place to pursue their researches. No part of the island could have been more suitable to conceal a dwelling whose occupant wished to remain unknown. But so irregular was the formation of the valleys, that Cyrus Harding was obliged to conduct the exploration in a strictly methodical manner. The colonists first visited the valley opening to the south of the volcano, and which first received the waters of Falls River. There Ayrton showed them the cavern, where the convicts had taken refuge and in which he had been imprisoned until his removal to the corral. This cavern was just as Ayrton had left it. They found there a considerable quantity of ammunition and provisions, conveyed thither by the convicts in order to form a reserve. The whole of the valley bordering on the cave, shaded by fir and other trees, was thoroughly explored, and on turning the point of the southwestern spur, the colonists entered a narrower gorge, similar to the picturesque columns of basalt on the coast. Here the trees were fewer. Stones took the place of grass. Goats and musmons gambled among the rocks. Here began the barren part of the island. It could already be seen that, of the numerous valleys branching off at the base of Mount Franklin, three only were wooded and rich in pasturage like that of the corral, which bordered on the west on the Falls River Valley and on the east on the Red Creek Valley. These two streams, which lower down became rivers by the absorption of several tributaries, were formed by all the springs of the mountain, and thus caused the fertility of its southern part. As to the Mercy, it was more directly fed from ample springs concealed under the cover of Jacamar Wood, and it was by springs of this nature, spreading in a thousand streamlets, that the soil of the Serpentine Peninsula was watered. Now of these three well-watered valleys, either might have served as a retreat to some solitary who would have found there everything necessary for life. But the settlers had already explored them, and in no part had they discovered the presence of man. Was it then in the depths of those barren gorges, in the midst of the piles of rock, in the rugged northern ravines, among the streams of lava, that this dwelling and its occupant will be found? The northern part of Mount Franklin was at its base composed solely of two valleys, wide, not very deep, without any appearance of vegetation, strewn with masses of rock, paved with lava, and varied with great blocks of mineral. This region required a long and careful exploration, it contained a thousand cavities, comfortless no doubt, but perfectly concealed and difficult of access. The colonists even visited dark tunnels, dating from the volcanic period, still black with the passage of the fire, and penetrated into the depths of the mountain. They traversed these sombre galleries, waving lighted torches, they examined the smallest excavations, they sounded the shallowest depths, but all was dark and silent. It did not appear that the foot of man had ever before trodden these ancient passages, or that his arm had ever displaced one of these blocks, which remained as the volcano had cast them up above the waters at the time of the submersion of the island. However, although these passages appeared to be absolutely deserted, and the obscurity was complete. Cyrus Harding was obliged to confess that absolute silence did not reign there. On arriving at the end of one of these gloomy caverns, extending several hundred feet into the interior of the mountain, he was surprised to hear a deep rumbling noise, increased in intensity by the sonorousness of the rocks. Gideon Spilett, who accompanied him, 
also heard these distant mutterings, which indicated a revivification of the subterranean fires. Several times both listened, and they agreed that some chemical process was taking place in the bowels of the earth. "'Then the volcano is not totally extinct?' said the reporter. "'It is possible that since our exploration of the crater,' replied Cyrus Harding, "'some change has occurred. Any volcano, although considered extinct, may evidently again burst forth.' "'But if an eruption of Mount Franklin occurred,' asked Spilett, "'would there not be some danger to Lincoln Island?' I do not think so, answered the engineer. The crater, that is to say the safety valve, exists, and the overflow of smoke and lava would escape, as it did formerly, by this customary outlet. Unless the lava opened a new way for itself towards the fertile parts of the island. And why, my dear Spilett, answered Cyrus Harding, should it not follow the road naturally traced out for it? Well, volcanoes are capricious returned the reporter. Notice, answered the engineer, that the inclination of Mount Franklin favors the flow of water towards the valleys which we are exploring just now. To turn aside this flow, an earthquake would be necessary to change the mountain's center of gravity. But an earthquake is always to be feared at these times, observed Gideon Spilett. Always, replied the engineer, especially when the subterranean forces begin to awake, as they risk meeting with some obstruction after a long rest. Thus, my dear Spilett, an eruption would be a serious thing for us, and it would be better that the volcano should not have the slightest desire to wake up. But we could not prevent it, could we? At any rate, even if it should occur, I do not think Prospect Heights would be seriously threatened. Between them and the mountain the ground is considerably depressed, and if the lava should ever take a course towards the lake, it would be cast on the downs and the neighboring parts of Shark Gulf. We have not yet seen any smoke at the top of the mountain to indicate an approaching eruption, said Gideon Spilett. No, answered Harding. Not a vapor escapes from the crater, for it was only yesterday that I attentively surveyed the summit but it is probable that at the lower part of the chimney time may have accumulated rocks, cinders, hardened lava, and that this valve of which I spoke may at any time become overcharged. But at the first serious effort every obstacle will disappear, and you may be certain, my dear Spilett, that neither the island, which is the boiler, nor the volcano, which is the chimney, will burst under the pressure of gas. Nevertheless, I repeat, it would be better that there should not be an eruption. And yet we are not mistaken, remarked the reporter. Mutterings can be distinctly heard in the very bowels of the volcano. You are right, said the engineer, again listening attentively. There can be no doubt of it. A commotion is going on there, of which we can neither estimate the importance nor the ultimate result. Cyrus Harding and Spilett, on coming out, rejoined their companions, to whom they made known the state of affairs. "'Very well!' cried Pencroft. "'The volcano wants to play his pranks. Let him try, if he likes. We will find his master.' "'Who?' asked Neb. "'Our good genius, Neb, our good genius, who will shut his mouth for him, if he so much as pretends to open it.' As may be seen, the sailor's confidence in the tutelary deity of his island was absolute, and certainly the occult power, manifested until now in so many inexplicable ways, appeared to be unlimited, but also it knew how to escape the colonists' most minute researches, for in spite of all their efforts, in spite of the more than zeal, the obstinacy with which they carried on their exploration, the retreat of the mysterious being could not be discovered. From the 19th to the 25th of February, the circle of investigation was extended to all the northern region of Lincoln Island, whose most secret nooks were explored. The colonists even went the length of tapping every rock. 
the search was extended to the extreme verge of the mountain. It was explored thus to the very summit of the truncated cone terminating the first row of rocks, then to the upper ridge of the enormous hat, at the bottom of which opened the crater. They did more. They visited the gulf, now extinct, but in whose depths the rumbling could be distinctly heard. However, no sign of smoke or vapour, no heating of the rock, indicated an approaching eruption. But neither there nor in any other part of Mount Franklin did the colonists find any traces of him of whom they were in search. Their investigations were then directed to the downs. They carefully examined the high lava cliffs of Shark Gulf from the base to the crest, although it was extremely difficult to reach even the level of the gulf. No one. Nothing. Indeed, in these three words was summed up so much fatigue uselessly expended, so much energy producing no results, that somewhat of anger mingled with the discomfiture of Cyrus Harding and his companions. It was now time to think of returning, for these researches could not be prolonged indefinitely. The colonists were certainly right in believing that the mysterious being did not reside on the surface of the island, and the wildest fancies haunted their excited imaginations. Pencroft and Neb, particularly, were not contented with the mystery, but allowed their imaginations to wander into the domain of the supernatural. On the 25th of February the colonists re-entered Granite House, and by means of the double cord, carried by an arrow to the threshold of the door, they re-established communication between their habitation and the ground. A month later they commemorated, on the 25th of March, the third anniversary of their arrival on Lincoln Island. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 3, Chapter 14 Three years had passed away since the escape of the prisoners from Richmond, and how often during those three years had they spoken of their country, always present in their thoughts. They had no doubt that the Civil War was at an end, and to them it appeared impossible that the just cause of the North had not triumphed. But what had been the incidents of this terrible war? How much blood had it not cost? How many of their friends must have fallen in the struggle? They often spoke of these things, without as yet being able to foresee the day when they would be permitted once more to see their country. To return thither, were it but for a few days, to renew the social link with the inhabited world, to establish a communication between their native land and their island, then to pass the longest, perhaps the best, portion of their existence in this colony, founded by them, and which would then be dependent on their country, was this a dream impossible to realize? There were only two ways of accomplishing it. Either a ship must appear off Lincoln Island, or the colonists must themselves build a vessel strong enough to sail to the nearest land. Unless, said Pencroft, our good genius himself provides us with the means of returning to our country. And really, had any one told Pencroft and Neb that a ship of three hundred tons was waiting for them in Shark Gulf, or at Port Balloon, they would not even have made a gesture of surprise. In their state of mind nothing appeared improbable. But Cyrus Harding, less confident, advised them to confine themselves to fact, and more especially so with regard to the building of a vessel, a really urgent work, since it was for the purpose of depositing, as soon as possible, at Tabor Island a document indicating Ayrton's new residence. As the Bonaventure no longer existed, six months at least would be required for the construction of a new vessel. Now winter was approaching, and the voyage would not be made before the following spring. 
"'We have time to get everything ready for the fine season,' remarked the engineer, who was consulting with Pencroft about these matters. "'I think, therefore, my friend, that since we have to rebuild our vessel, it will be best to give her larger dimensions. The arrival of the Scotch yacht at Tabor Island is very uncertain. It may even be that, having arrived several months ago, she has again sailed after having vainly searched for some trace of Ayrton. Will it not then be best to build a ship which, if necessary, could take us either to the Polynesian archipelago or to New Zealand? What do you think? I think, Captain, answered the sailor, I think that you are as capable of building a large vessel as a small one. Neither the wood nor the tools are wanting. It is only a question of time. And how many months would be required to build a vessel of from 250 to 300 tons? asked Harding. Seven or eight months at least, replied Pencroft. But it must not be forgotten that winter is drawing near, and that in severe frost wood is difficult to work. We must calculate on several weeks' delay, and if our vessel is ready by next November, we may think ourselves very lucky. Well, replied Cyrus Harding, that will be exactly the most favorable time for undertaking a voyage of any importance, either to Tabor Island or to a more distant land. So it will, Captain, answered the sailor. Make out your plans, then. The workmen are ready, and I imagine that Ayrton can lend us a good helping hand. The colonists, having been consulted, approved the engineer's plan, and it was indeed the best thing to be done. It is true that the construction of a ship of from two to three hundred tons would be great labor, but the colonists had confidence in themselves, justified by their previous success. Cyrus Harding then busied himself in drawing the plan of the vessel and making the model. During this time his companions employed themselves in felling and carting trees to furnish the ribs, timbers, and planks. The forest of the far west supplied the best oaks and elms. They took advantage of the opening already made on their last excursion to form a practicable road, which they named the Far West Road, and the trees were carried to the chimneys, where the dockyard was established. As to the road in question, the choice of trees had rendered its direction somewhat capricious, but at the same time it facilitated the access to a large part of the Serpentine Peninsula. It was important that the trees should be quickly felled and cut up, for they could not be used while yet green, and some time was necessary to allow them to get seasoned. The carpenters, therefore, worked vigorously during the month of April, which was troubled only by a few equinoctial gales of some violence. Master Jupe aided them dexterously, either by climbing to the top of a tree to fasten the ropes, or by lending his stout shoulders to carry the lopped trunks. All this timber was piled up under a large shed, built near the chimneys, and there awaited the time for use. The month of April was tolerably fine, as October often is in the northern zone. At the same time other work was actively continued, and soon all trace of devastation disappeared from the plateau of Prospect Heights. The mill was rebuilt, and new buildings rose in the poultry-yard. It had appeared necessary to enlarge their dimensions, for the feathered population had increased considerably. The stable now contained five onagers, four of which were well broken, and allowed themselves to be either driven or ridden, and a little colt. The colony now possessed a plough, to which the onagers were yoked like regular Yorkshire or Kentucky oxen. The colonists divided their work, and their arms never tired. Then who could have enjoyed better health than these workers? And what good humor enlivened the evenings in Granite House, as they formed a thousand plans for the future? As a matter of course, Ayrton shared the common lot in every respect, and there was no longer any talk of his going to live at the corral. Nevertheless, he was still sad and reserved, and joined more in the work than in the pleasures of his companions. But he was a valuable workman at need, strong, skillful, ingenious, intelligent. He was esteemed and loved by all, and he could not be ignorant of it. 
In the meanwhile, the corral was not abandoned. Every other day one of the settlers, driving the cart or mounted on an onager, went to look after the flock of musmons and goats and bring back the supply of milk required by Neb. These excursions at the same time afforded opportunities for hunting. Therefore, Herbert and Gideon Spilett, with Top in front, traversed more often than their companions the road to the corral, and with the capital guns which they carried, capybaras, agoutis, kangaroos, and wild pigs for large game, ducks, grouse, jacamars, and snipe for small game, were never wanting in the house. The produce of the warren, of the oyster-bed, several turtles which were taken, excellent salmon which came up the mercy, vegetables from the plateau, wild fruit from the forest, were riches upon riches, and Neb, the head cook, could scarcely by himself store them away. The telegraphic wire between the corral and Granite House had of course been repaired, and it was worked whenever one or other of the settlers was at the corral, and found it necessary to spend the night there. Besides, the island was safe now, and no attacks were to be feared, at any rate from men. However, that which had happened might happen again. A descent of pirates, or even of escaped convicts, was always to be feared. It was possible that companions or accomplices of Bob Harvey had been in the secret of his plans, and might be tempted to imitate him. The colonists, therefore, were careful to observe the sea around the island, and every day their telescope covered the horizon enclosed by Union and Washington Bays. When they went to the corral they examined the sea to the west with no less attention, and by climbing the spur their gaze extended over a large section of the western horizon. Nothing suspicious was discerned, but still it was necessary for them to be on their guard. The engineer one evening imparted to his friends a plan which he had conceived for fortifying the corral. It appeared prudent to him to heighten the palisade, and to flank it with a sort of blockhouse, which, if necessary, the settlers could hold against the enemy. Granite House might, by its very position, be considered impregnable. Therefore the corral, with its buildings, its stores, and the animals it contained, would always be the object of pirates, whoever they were, who might land on the island, and should the colonists be obliged to shut themselves up there, they ought also to be able to defend themselves without any disadvantage. This was a project which might be left for consideration, and they were, besides, obliged to put off its execution until the next spring. About the 15th of May the keel of the new vessel lay along the dockyard, and soon the stern and stern-post, mortised at each of its extremities, rose almost perpendicularly. The keel, of good oak, measured one hundred and ten feet in length, this allowing a width of five and twenty feet to the midship beam. But this was all the carpenters could do before the arrival of the frost and bad weather. During the following weeks they fixed the first of the stern timbers, but were then obliged to suspend work. During the last days of the month the weather was extremely bad. The wind blew from the east, sometimes with the violence of a tempest. The engineer was somewhat uneasy on account of the dockyard sheds, which besides he could not have established in any other place near to Granite House, for the islet only imperfectly sheltered the shore from the fury of the open sea, and in great storms the waves beat against the very foot of the granite cliff but very fortunately these fears were not realized. The wind shifted to the southeast, and there the beach of Granite House was completely covered by Flotsam Point. Pencroft and Ayrton, the most zealous workmen at the new vessel, pursued their labor as long as they could. They were not men to mind the wind tearing at their hair, nor the rain wetting them to the skin, and a blow from a hammer is worth just as much in bad as in fine weather. But when a severe frost succeeded this wet period, the wood, its fibers acquiring the hardness of iron, became extremely difficult to work, and about the 10th of June shipbuilding was obliged to be entirely discontinued. 
Cyrus Harding and his companions had not omitted to observe how severe was the temperature during the winters of Lincoln Island. The cold was comparable to that experienced in the states of New England, situated at almost the same distance from the equator. In the northern hemisphere, or at any rate in the part occupied by British America and the north of the United States, this phenomenon is explained by the flat conformation of the territories bordering on the pole and on which there is no intumescence of the soil to oppose any obstacle to the north winds. Here, in Lincoln Island, this explanation would not suffice. "'It has even been observed,' remarked Harding one day to his companions, "'that in equal latitudes the islands and coast regions are less tried by the cold than inland countries. I have often heard it asserted that the winters of Lombardy, for example, are not less rigorous than those of Scotland, which results from the sea restoring during the winter the heat which it received during the summer. Islands are, therefore, in a better situation for benefiting by this restitution. "'But then, Captain Harding,' asked Herbert, "'why does Lincoln Island appear to escape the common law?' "'That is difficult to explain,' answered the engineer. However, I should be disposed to conjecture that this peculiarity results from the situation of the island in the southern hemisphere, which, as you know, my boy, is colder than the northern hemisphere. Yes, said Herbert, and icebergs are met with in lower latitudes in the south than in the north of the Pacific. That is true, remarked Pencroft, and when I have been serving on board whalers I have seen icebergs off Cape Horn. The severe cold experienced in Lincoln Island, said Gideon Spilett, may then perhaps be explained by the presence of floes or icebergs comparatively near to Lincoln Island. Your opinion is very admissible indeed, my dear Spilett, answered Cyrus Hardy, and it is evidently to the proximity of icebergs that we owe our rigorous winters. I would draw your attention also to an entirely physical cause which renders the southern colder than the northern hemisphere. In fact, since the sun is nearer to this hemisphere during the summer, it is necessarily more distant during the winter. This explains, then, the excess of temperature in the two seasons, for if we find the winters very cold in Lincoln Island, we must not forget that the summers here, on the contrary, are very hot. "'But why, if you please, Captain?' asked Pencroft, knitting his brows. Why should our hemisphere, as you say, be so badly divided? It isn't just that. Friend Pencroft, answered the engineer, laughing, whether just or not, we must submit to it, and here lies the reason for this peculiarity. The earth does not describe a circle around the sun, but an ellipse, as it must by the laws of rational mechanics. Now the earth occupies one of the foci of the ellipse, and so at one point in its course is at its apogee, that is, at its farthest from the sun, and at another point it is at its perigee, or nearest to the sun. Now it happens that it is during the winter of the southern countries that it is at its most distant point from the sun, and consequently in a situation for those regions to feel the greatest cold. Nothing can be done to prevent that, and men, Pencroft, however learned they may be, can never change anything of the cosmographical order established by God himself. And yet, added Pencroft, persisting, the world is very learned. What a big book, Captain, might be made with all that is known. And what a much bigger book still with all that is not known, answered Harding. At last, for one reason or another, the month of June brought the cold with its accustomed intensity, and the settlers were often confined to Granite House. Ah, how wearisome this imprisonment was to them, and more particularly to Gideon Spilett. Look here, said he to Neb one day, I would give you by notarial deed all the estates which will come to me some day, if you were a good enough fellow to go, no matter where, and subscribe to some newspaper for me. Decidedly the thing that is most essential to my happiness is the knowing every morning what has happened the day before in other places than this. 
Neb began to laugh. "'Pon my word,' he replied, "'the only thing I think about is my daily work.' The truth was that indoors as well as out there was no want of work. The colony of Lincoln Island was now at its highest point of prosperity, achieved by three years of continued hard work. The destruction of the brig had been a new source of riches. Without speaking of the complete rig which would serve for the vessel now on the stocks, utensils and tools of all sorts, weapons and ammunition, clothes and instruments were now piled in the storerooms of Granite House. It had not even been necessary to resort again to the manufacture of the coarse felt materials. Though the colonists had suffered from cold during their first winter, the bad season might now come without their having any reason to dread its severity. Linen was plentiful also, and besides they kept it with extreme care. From chloride of sodium, which is nothing else than sea salt, Cyrus Harding easily extracted the soda and chlorine. The soda, which it was easy to change into carbonate of soda, and the chlorine, of which he made chloride of lime, were employed for various domestic purposes, and especially in bleaching linen. Besides, they did not wash more than four times a year, as was done by families in the olden times, and it may be added that Pencroft and Gideon Spilett, while waiting for the postman to bring him his newspaper, distinguished themselves as washermen. So passed the winter months, June, July, and August. They were severe, and the average observations of the thermometer did not give more than eight degrees of Fahrenheit. It was therefore lower in temperature than the preceding winter. But then, what splendid fires blazed continually on the hearths of Granite House, the smoke marking the granite wall with long zebra-like streaks. Fuel was not spared, as it grew naturally a few steps from them. Besides, the chips of the wood destined for the construction of the ship enabled them to economize the coal, which required more trouble to transport. Men and animals were all well. Master Jup was a little chilly, it must be confessed. This was perhaps his only weakness and it was necessary to make him a well-padded dressing-gown. But what a servant he was, clever, zealous, indefatigable, not indiscreet, not talkative, and he might have been with reason proposed as a model for all his biped brothers in the old and new worlds. "'As for that,' said Pencroft, "'when one has four hands at one's service, of course one's work ought to be done so much the better.' and, indeed, the intelligent creature did it well. During the seven months which had passed since the last researches made round the mountain, and during the month of September which brought back fine weather, nothing was heard of the genius of the island. His power was not manifested in any way. It is true that it would have been superfluous, for no incident occurred to put the colonists to any painful trial. Cyrus Harding even observed that if by chance the communication between the unknown and the tenants of Granite House had ever been established through the granite, and if Top's instinct had, as it were, felt it, there was no further sign of it during this period. The dog's growling had entirely ceased, as well as the uneasiness of the orang. The two friends, for they were so, no longer prowled round the opening of the inner well nor did they bark or whine in that singular way which from the first the engineer had noticed. But could he be sure that this was all that was to be said about this enigma, and that he should never arrive at a solution? Could he be certain that some conjecture would not occur which would bring the mysterious personage on the scene? Who could tell what the future might have in reserve? At last the winter was ended but an event, the consequences of which might be serious, occurred in the first days of the returning spring. On the 7th of September, Cyrus Harding, having observed the crater, saw smoke curling round the summit of the mountain, its first vapours rising in the air. End of chapter
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Fifteen the colonists, warned by the engineer, left their work and gazed in silence at the summit of Mount Franklin. The volcano had awoke, and the vapour had penetrated the mineral layer heaped at the bottom of the crater. But would the subterranean fires provoke any violent eruption? This was an event which could not be foreseen. However, even while admitting the possibility of an eruption, it was not probable that the whole of Lincoln Island would suffer from it. The flow of volcanic matter is not always disastrous, and the island had already undergone this trial, as was shown by the streams of lava hardened on the northern slopes of the mountain. Besides, from the shape of the crater, the opening broken in the upper edge, the matter will be thrown to the side opposite the fertile regions of the island. However, the past did not necessarily answer for the future. Often, at the summit of volcanoes, the old craters close and new ones open. This had occurred in the two hemispheres, at Etna, Popocatapotl, at Orizaba, and on the eve of an eruption there is everything to be feared. In fact, an earthquake, a phenomenon which often accompanies volcanic eruptions, is enough to change the interior arrangement of a mountain and to bring new outlets for the burning lava. Cyrus Harding explained these things to his companions, and without exaggerating the state of things, he told them all the pros and cons. After all, they could not prevent it. It did not appear likely that Granite House would be threatened unless the ground was shaken by an earthquake. But the corral would be in great danger should a new crater open in the southern side of Mount Franklin. From that day the smoke never disappeared from the top of the mountain, and it could even be perceived that it increased in height and thickness, without any flame mingling in its heavy volumes. The phenomenon was still concentrated in the lower part of the central crater. However, with the fine days work had been continued. The building of the vessel was hastened as much as possible, and by means of the waterfall on the shore, Cyrus Harding managed to establish an hydraulic sawmill, which rapidly cut up the trunks of trees into planks and joists. The mechanism of this apparatus was as simple as those used in the rustic sawmills of Norway. A first horizontal movement to move the piece of wood, a second vertical movement to move the saw, this was all that was wanted, and the engineer succeeded by means of a wheel, two cylinders, and pulleys properly arranged. Towards the end of the month of September, the skeleton of the vessel, which was to be rigged as a schooner, lay in the dockyard. The ribs were almost entirely completed, and all the timbers having been sustained by a provisional band, the shape of the vessel could already be seen. The schooner, sharp in the bows, very slender in the afterpart, would evidently be suitable for a long voyage if wanted but laying the planking would still take a considerable time. Very fortunately, the ironwork of the pirate brig had been saved after the explosion. From the planks and injured ribs, Pencroft and Ayrton had extracted the bolts and a large quantity of copper nails. It was so much work saved for the smiths, but the carpenters had much to do. Shipbuilding was interrupted for a week for the harvest, the haymaking, and the gathering in of the different crops on the plateau. This work finished, every moment was devoted to finishing the schooner. When night came, the workmen were really quite exhausted. So as not to lose any time, they had changed the hours for their meals. They dined at twelve o'clock, and only had their supper when daylight failed them. They then ascended to Granite House, when they were always ready to go to bed. Sometimes, however, when the conversation bore on some interesting subject, the hour for sleep was delayed for a time. The colonists then spoke of the future, and talked willingly of the changes which a voyage in the schooner to inhabited lands would make in their situation. 
but always, in the midst of these plans, prevailed the thought of a subsequent return to Lincoln Island. Never would they abandon this colony, founded with so much labor and with such success, and to which a communication with America would afford a fresh impetus. Pencroft and Neb especially hoped to end their days there. Herbert, said the sailor, you will never abandon Lincoln Island? Never, Pencroft, and especially if you make up your mind to stay there. That was made up long ago, my boy, answered Pencroft. I shall expect you. You will bring me your wife and children, and I shall make jolly chaps of your youngsters. That's agreed, replied Herbert, laughing and blushing at the same time. And you, Captain Harding, resumed Pencroft enthusiastically, you will still be the governor of the island. Ah, how many inhabitants could it support? Ten thousand at least. They talked in this way, allowing Pencroft to run on, and at last the reporter actually started a newspaper, the New Lincoln Herald. So is man's heart, the desire to perform a work which will endure, which will survive him is the origin of his superiority over all other living creatures here below. It is this which has established his dominion, and this it is which justifies it over all the world. After that, who knows if Jupe and Top had not themselves their little dream of the future? Ayrton silently said to himself that he would like to see Lord Glenarvan again, and show himself to all restored. One evening, on the 15th of October, the conversation was prolonged later than usual. It was nine o'clock. Already long, badly concealed yawns gave warning of the hour of rest, and Pencroft was proceeding towards his bed, when the electric bell, placed in the dining-room, suddenly rang. All were there, Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, Herbert, Ayrton, Pencroft, Neb. Therefore none of the colonists were at the corral. Cyrus Harding rose. His companions stared at each other, scarcely believing their ears. "'What does that mean?' cried Neb. "'Was it the devil who rang it?' No one answered. "'The weather is stormy,' observed Herbert. "'Might not its influence of electricity—' Herbert did not finish his phrase. The engineer, towards whom all eyes were turned, shook his head negatively. "'We must wait.' said Gideon Spilett. If it is a signal, whoever it may be who has made it, he will renew it. "'But who do you think it is?' cried Neb. "'Who?' answered Pencroft. "'But he—' The sailor's sentence was cut short by a new tinkle of the bell. Harding went to the apparatus and sent this question to the corral. "'What do you want?' A few minutes later the needle, moving on the alphabetic dial, gave this reply to the tenants of Granite House. "'Come to the corral immediately.' "'At last!' exclaimed Harding. "'Yes, at last. The mystery was about to be unveiled. The colonists' fatigue had disappeared before the tremendous interest which was about to urge them to the corral, and all wish for rest had ceased. Without having uttered a word, in a few moments they had left Granite House, and were standing on the beach.' Jup and Top alone were left behind. They could do without them. The night was black. The new moon had disappeared at the same time as the sun. As Herbert had observed, great stormy clouds formed a lowering and heavy vault, preventing any star rays. A few lightning flashes, reflections from a distant storm, illuminated the horizon. It was possible that a few hours later the thunder would roll over the island itself. The night was very threatening. But however deep the darkness was, it would not prevent them from finding the familiar road to the corral. They ascended the left bank of the Mercy, reached the plateau, passed the bridge over Creek Glycerin, and advanced through the forest. They walked at a good pace, a prey to the liveliest emotions. There was no doubt but that they were now going to learn the long search for answer to the enigma the name of that mysterious being, so deeply concerned in their life, so generous in his influence, so powerful in his action. Must not this stranger have indeed mingled with their existence, have known the smallest details, 
have heard all that was said in Granite House to have been able always to act in the very nick of time? Every one, wrapped up in its own reflections, pressed forward. Under the arch of trees the darkness was such that even the edge of the road could not be seen. Not a sound in the forest. Both animals and birds, influenced by the heaviness of the atmosphere, remained motionless and silent. Not a breath disturbed the leaves. The footsteps of the colonists alone resounded on the hardened ground. During the first quarter of an hour the silence was only interrupted by this remark from Pencroft. We ought to have brought a torch. And by this reply from the engineer, we shall find one at the corral. Harding and his companions had left Granite House at twelve minutes past nine. At forty-seven minutes past nine they had traversed three out of the five miles which separated the mouth of the Mercy from the corral. At that moment sheets of lightning spread over the island and illumined the dark trees. The flashes dazzled and almost blinded them. Evidently the storm would not be long in bursting forth. The flashes gradually became brighter and more rapid. Distant thunder growled in the sky. The atmosphere was stifling. The colonists proceeded as if they were urged onwards by some irresistible force. At ten o'clock a vivid flash showed them the palisade, and as they reached the gate the storm burst forth with tremendous fury. In a minute the corral was crossed, and Harding stood before the hut. Probably the house was occupied by the stranger, since it was from thence that the telegram had been sent. However, no light shone through the window. The engineer knocked at the door. No answer. Cyrus Harding opened the door, and the settlers entered the room, which was perfectly dark. A light was struck by Neb, and in a few moments the lantern was lighted, and the light thrown into every corner of the room. There was no one there. Everything was in the state in which it had been left. "'Have we been deceived by an illusion?' murmured Cyrus Harding. No, that was not possible. The telegram had clearly said, Come to the corral immediately. They approached the table specially devoted to the use of the wire. Everything was in order, the pile on the box containing it, as well as all the apparatus. Who came here the last time? asked the engineer. I did, Captain, answered Ayrton. And that was? Four days ago. Ah, a note! cried Herbert, pointing to a paper lying on the table. On this paper were written these words in English. Follow the new wire. Forward! cried Harding, who understood that the dispatch had not been sent from the corral, but from the mysterious retreat, communicating directly with Granite House by means of a supplementary wire joined to the old one. Neb took the lighted lantern, and all left the corral. The storm then burst forth with tremendous violence. The interval between each lightning flash and each thunderclap diminished rapidly. The summit of the volcano, with its plume of vapor, could be seen by occasional flashes. There was no telegraphic communication in any part of the corral between the house and the palisade, but the engineer, running straight to the first post, saw by the light of a flash a new wire hanging from the isolator to the ground. "'There it is,' said he. This wire lay along the ground, and was surrounded by an isolating substance like a submarine cable, so as to assure the free transmission of the current. It appeared to pass through the wood and the southern spurs of the mountain, and consequently it ran towards the west. "'Follow it,' said Cyrus Harding. And the settlers immediately pressed forward, guided by the wire." The thunder continued to roar with such violence that a word could not be heard. However, there was no occasion for speaking, but to get forward as fast as possible. Cyrus Harding and his companions then climbed the spur rising between the Corral Valley and that of Falls River, which they crossed at its narrowest part. The wire, sometimes stretched over the lower branches of the trees, sometimes lying on the ground, guided them surely. The engineer had supposed that the wire would perhaps stop at the bottom of the valley, and that the stranger's retreat would be there. 
Nothing of the sort. They were obliged to ascend the southwestern spur, and redescend on that arid plateau terminated by the strangely wild basalt cliff. From time to time one of the colonists stooped down and felt for the wire with his hands, but there was now no doubt that the wire was running directly towards the sea. There, to a certainty, in the depths of those rocks, was the dwelling so long sought for in vain. The sky was literally on fire. Flash succeeded flash. Several struck the summit of the volcano in the midst of the thick smoke. It appeared there as if the mountain was vomiting flame. At a few minutes to eleven the colonists arrived on the high cliff overlooking the ocean to the west. The wind had risen. The surf roared five hundred feet below. Harding calculated that they had gone a mile and a half from the corral. At this point the wire entered among the rocks, following the steep side of a narrow ravine. The settlers followed it at the risk of occasioning a fall of the slightly balanced rocks, and being dashed into the sea. The descent was extremely perilous, but they did not think of the danger. They were no longer masters of themselves, and an irresistible attraction drew them towards this mysterious place, as the magnet draws iron. Thus they almost unconsciously descended this ravine, which even in broad daylight would have been considered impracticable. The stones rolled and sparkled like fiery balls when they crossed through the gleams of light. Harding was first, Ayrton last. On they went, step by step. Now they slid over the slippery rock, then they struggled to their feet and scrambled on. At last the wire touched the rocks on the beach. The colonists had reached the bottom of the basalt cliff. There appeared a narrow ridge, running horizontally and parallel with the sea. The settlers followed the wire along it. They had not gone a hundred paces when the ridge, by a moderate incline, sloped down to the level of the sea. The engineer seized the wire, and found that it disappeared beneath the waves. His companions were stupefied. A cry of disappointment, almost a cry of despair, escaped them. Must they then plunge beneath the water and seek there for some submarine cavern? In their excited state they would not have hesitated to do it. The engineer stopped them. He led his companions to a hollow in the rocks, and there— We must wait, said he. The tide is high. At low water the way will be open. But what can make you think, asked Pencroft, he would not have called us if the means had been wanting to enable us to reach him. Cyrus Harding spoke in a tone of such thorough conviction that no objection was raised. His remark, besides, was logical. It was quite possible that an opening, practicable at low water, though hidden now by the high tide, opened at the foot of the cliff. There was some time to wait. The colonists remained silently crouching in a deep hollow. Rain now began to fall in torrents. The thunder was re-echoed among the rocks with a grand sonorousness. The colonists' emotion was great. A thousand strange and extraordinary ideas crossed their brains, and they expected some grand and superhuman apparition, which alone could come up to the notion they had formed of the mysterious genius of the island. At midnight, Harding carrying the lantern, descended to the beach to reconnoitre. The engineer was not mistaken. The beginning of an immense excavation could be seen under the water. There the wire, bending at a right angle, entered the yawning gulf. Cyrus Harding returned to his companions and said simply, In an hour the opening will be practicable. Is it there, then? said Pencroft. Did you doubt it? returned Harding. "'But this cavern must be filled with water to a certain height,' observed Harbert. "'Either the cavern will be completely dry,' replied Harding, "'and in that case we can traverse it on foot, "'or it will not be dry, and some means of transport will be put at our disposal.' An hour passed. All climbed down through the rain to the level of the sea. There was now eight feet of the opening above the water. It was like the arch of a bridge under which rushed the foaming water. 
Leaning forward, the engineer saw a black object floating on the water. He drew it towards him. It was a boat, moored to some interior projection of the cave. This boat was iron-plated. Two oars lay at the bottom. "'Jump in,' said Harding. In a moment the settlers were in the boat. Neb and Ayrton took the oars. Pencroft the rudder. Cyrus Harding in the bows, with a lantern, lighted the way. The elliptical roof, under which the boat at first passed, suddenly rose. But the darkness was too deep, and the light of the lantern too slight, for either the extent, length, height, or depth of the cave to be ascertained. Solemn silence reigned in this basaltic cavern. Not a sound could penetrate into it, even the thunder peals could not pierce its thick sides. Such immense caves exist in various parts of the world, natural crypts dating from the geological epoch of the globe. Some are filled by the sea, others contain entire lakes in their sides, such as Fingal's Cave in the island of Staffa, one of the Hebrides, such are the caves of Morgat in the Bay of Duarnene in Brittany, the caves of Bonifacio in Corsica, those of Lise of Fjord in Norway, such are the immense mammoth caverns in Kentucky, five hundred feet in height and more than twenty miles in length. In many parts of the globe nature has excavated these caverns and preserved them for the admiration of man. Did the cavern which the settlers were now exploring extend to the centre of the island? For a quarter of an hour the boat had been advancing, making detours, indicated to Pencroft by the engineer in short sentences, when all at once, "'More to the right!' he commanded. The boat, altering its course, ran up alongside the right wall. The engineer wished to see if the wire still ran along the side. The wire was there fastened to the rock. Forward, said Harding. And the two oars, plunging into the dark waters, urged the boat onwards. On they went for another quarter of an hour, and a distance of half a mile must have been cleared from the mouth of the cave, when Harding's voice was again heard. Stop, said he. The boat stopped, and the colonists perceived a bright light illuminating the vast cavern, so deeply excavated in the bowels of the island, of which nothing had ever led them to suspect the existence. At the height of a hundred feet rose the vaulted roof, supported on basalt shafts. Irregular arches, strange mouldings, appeared on the columns erected by nature in thousands from the first epochs of the formation of the globe. The basalt pillars fitted one into the other, measured from forty to fifty feet in height, and the water, calm in spite of the tumult outside, washed their base. The brilliant focus of light, pointed out by the engineer, touched every point of rock and flooded the walls with light. By reflection the water reproduced the brilliant sparkles, so that the boat appeared to be floating between two glittering zones. They could not be mistaken in the nature of the irradiation thrown from the glowing nucleus, whose clear rays were shattered by all the angles, all the projections of the cavern. This light proceeded from an electric source, and its white color betrayed its origin. It was the sun of this cave, and it filled it entirely. At a sign from Cyrus Harding, the oars again plunged into the water, causing a regular shower of gems and the boat was urged forward towards the light, which was now not more than half a cable's length distant. At this place the breadth of the sheet of water measured nearly three hundred and fifty feet, and beyond the dazzling centre could be seen an enormous basaltic wall, blocking up any issue on that side. The cavern widened here considerably, the sea forming a little lake. But the roof, the side walls, the end cliff, all the prisms, all the peaks, were flooded with the electric fluid, so that the brilliancy belonged to them, and as if the light issued from them. In the centre of the lake a long cigar-shaped object floated on the surface of the water, silent, motionless. The brilliancy which issued from it escaped from its sides as from two kilns heated to a white heat. 
This apparatus, similar in shape to an enormous whale, was about two hundred and fifty feet long, and rose about ten or twelve above the water. The boat slowly approached it. Cyrus Harding stood up in the bows. He gazed, a prey to violent excitement. Then, all at once, seizing the reporter's arm, "'It is he! It can only be he!' he cried. "'He!' Then, falling back on the seat, he murmured a name which Gideon Spilett alone could hear. The reporter evidently knew this name, for it had a wonderful effect upon him, and he answered in a hoarse voice, "'He! An outlawed man!' "'He!' said Harding. At the engineer's command the boat approached this singular floating apparatus. The boat touched the left side, from which escaped a ray of light through a thick glass. Harding and his companions mounted on the platform. An open hatchway was there. All darted down the opening. At the bottom of the ladder was a deck, lighted by electricity. At the end of this deck was a door, which Harding opened. A richly ornamented room, quickly traversed by the colonists, was joined to a library, over which a luminous ceiling shed a flood of light. At the end of the library a large door, also shut, was opened by the engineer. An immense saloon, a sort of museum, in which were heaped up, with all the treasures of the mineral world, works of art, marvels of industry, appeared before the eyes of the colonists, who almost thought themselves suddenly transported into a land of enchantment. Stretched on a rich sofa, they saw a man, who did not appear to notice their presence. Then Harding raised his voice, and to the extreme surprise of his companions, he uttered these words. "'Captain Nemo, you asked for us. We are here.'" End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 3 Chapter 16 At these words the reclining figure rose, and the electric light fell upon his countenance. A magnificent head, the forehead high, the glance commanding, beard white, hair abundant and falling over the shoulders. His hand rested upon the cushion of the divan from which he had just risen. He appeared perfectly calm. It was evident that his strength had been gradually undermined by illness, but his voice seemed yet powerful, as he said in English, and in a tone which evinced extreme surprise. "'Sir, I have no name.' "'Nevertheless, I know you,' replied Cyrus Harding. Captain Nemo fixed his penetrating gaze upon the engineer, as though he were about to annihilate him. Then, falling back amid the pillows of the divan, "'After all, what matters now?' he murmured. "'I am dying.' Cyrus Harding drew near the captain, and Gideon Spilett took his hand. It was of a feverish heat. Ayrton, Pencroft, Herbert, and Neb stood respectfully apart in an angle of the magnificent saloon, whose atmosphere was saturated with the electric fluid. Meanwhile Captain Nemo withdrew his hand, and motioned the engineer and the reporter to be seated. All regarded him with profound emotion. Before them they beheld that being whom they had styled the genius of the island, the powerful protector whose intervention, in so many circumstances, had been so efficacious the benefactor to whom they owed such a debt of gratitude. Their eyes beheld a man only, and a man at the point of death, where Pencroft and Neb had expected to find an almost supernatural being. But how happened it that Cyrus Harding had recognized Captain Nemo? Why had the latter so suddenly risen on hearing this name uttered, a name which he believed known to none? The captain had resumed his position on the divan and leaning on his arm, he regarded the engineer seated near him. "'You know the name I formerly bore, sir?' 
he asked. "'I do,' answered Cyrus Harding, "'and also that of this wonderful submarine vessel.' <laughs> "'The Nautilus,' said the captain, with a faint smile. "'The Nautilus.' "'But do you know who I am?' "'I do. "'It is nevertheless many years since I have held any communication with the inhabited world. Three long years have I passed in the depth of the sea, the only place where I have found liberty. Who then can have betrayed my secret?' "'A man who was bound to you by no tie, Captain Nemo, and who, consequently, cannot be accused of treachery.' THE FRENCHMAN WHO WAS CAST ON BOARD MY VESSEL BY CHANCE SIXTEEN YEARS SINCE? THE SAME. HE AND HIS TWO COMPANIONS DID NOT THEN PERISH IN THE MAELSTROM, IN THE MIDST OF WHICH THE NAUTILUS WAS STRUGGLING? THEY ESCAPED, AND A BOOK HAS APPEARED UNDER THE TITLE OF TWENTY THOUSAND LEAGUES UNDER THE SEA, WHICH CONTAINS YOUR HISTORY. THE HISTORY OF A FEW MONTHS ONLY OF MY LIFE, INTERRUPTED THE CAPTAIN IMPETUOUSLY. It is true, answered Cyrus Harding, but a few months of that strange life have sufficed to make you known, as a great criminal, doubtless, said Captain Nemo, a haughty smile curling his lips. Yes, a rebel, perhaps an outlaw against humanity. The engineer was silent. Well, sir? It is not for me to judge you, Captain Nemo, answered Cyrus Harding at any rate as regards your past life. I am, with the rest of the world, ignorant of the motives which induced you to adopt this strange mode of existence, and I cannot judge of effects without knowing their causes. But what I do know is, that a beneficent hand has constantly protected us since our arrival in Lincoln Island, that we all owe our lives to a good, generous, and powerful being, and that this being so powerful, good, and generous, Captain Nemo, is yourself. It is I, answered the captain simply. The engineer and the reporter rose. Their companions had drawn near, and the gratitude with which their hearts were charged was about to express itself in their gestures and words. Captain Nemo stopped them by a sign, and in a voice which betrayed more emotion than he doubtless intended to show, "'Wait till you have heard all,' he said. Footnote. The history of Captain Nemo has, in fact, been published under the title of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Here, therefore, will apply the observation already made as to the adventures of Ayrton, with regard to the discrepancy of dates. Readers should therefore refer to the note already published on this point. End of footnote. And the captain, in a few concise sentences, ran over the events of his life. His narrative was short, yet he was obliged to summon up his whole remaining energy to arrive at the end. He was evidently contending against extreme weakness. Several times Cyrus Harding entreated him to repose for a while, but he shook his head, as a man to whom the morrow may never come. And when the reporter offered his assistance, "'It is useless,' he said. My hours are numbered. Captain Nemo was an Indian, the Prince Dakar, son of a Raja of the then independent territory of Bundelkund. His father sent him, when ten years of age, to Europe, in order that he might receive an education in all respects complete, and in the hopes that by his talents and knowledge he might one day take a leading part in raising his long-degraded and heathen country to a level with the nations of Europe. From the age of ten years to that of thirty, Prince Dakar, endowed by nature with her richest gifts of intellect, accumulated knowledge of every kind, and in science, literature, and art his researches were extensive and profound. He travelled over the whole of Europe. His rank and fortune caused him to be everywhere sought after, but the pleasures of the world had for him no attractions. Though young and possessed of every personal advantage, he was ever grave, sombre even, devoured by an unquenchable thirst for knowledge, and cherishing in the recesses of his heart the hope that he might become a great and powerful ruler of a free and enlightened people. Still, for long, the love of science triumphed over all other feelings. 
He became an artist deeply impressed by the marvels of art, a philosopher to whom no one of the higher sciences was unknown, a statesman versed in the policy of European courts. To the eyes of those who observed him superficially, he might have passed for one of those cosmopolitans, curious of knowledge, but disdaining action, one of those opulent travellers, haughty and cynical, who move incessantly from place to place, and are of no country. This artist, this philosopher, this man was, however, still cherishing the hope instilled into him from his earliest days. Prince Dakar returned to Bundelkund in the year 1849. He married a noble Indian lady, who was imbued with an ambition not less ardent than that by which he was inspired. Two children were born to them, whom they tenderly loved. But domestic happiness did not prevent him from seeking to carry out the object at which he aimed. He waited an opportunity. At length, as he vainly fancied, it presented itself. Instigated by princes equally ambitious and less sagacious and more unscrupulous than he was, the people of India were persuaded that they might successfully rise against their English rulers, who had brought them out of a state of anarchy and constant warfare and misery, and had established peace and prosperity in their country. Their ignorance and gross superstition made them the facile tools of their designing chiefs. In 1857 the great Sepoy revolt broke out. Prince Dakar, under the belief that he should thereby have the opportunity of attaining the object of his long-cherished ambition, was easily drawn into it. He forthwith devoted his talents and wealth to the service of this cause. He aided it in person, he fought in the front ranks, he risked his life equally with the humblest of the wretched and misguided fanatics. He was ten times wounded in twenty engagements, seeking death but finding it not. But at length the sanguinary rebels were utterly defeated, and the atrocious mutiny was brought to an end. Never before had the British power in India been exposed to such danger, and if, as they had hoped, the sepoys had received assistance from without, the influence and supremacy in Asia of the United Kingdom would have been a thing of the past. The name of Prince Dakar was at that time well known. He had fought openly and without concealment. A price was set upon his head, but he managed to escape from his pursuers. Civilization never recedes. The law of necessity ever forces it onwards. The sepoys were vanquished, and the land of the Rajas of old fell again under the rule of England. Prince Dakar, unable to find that death he courted, returned to the mountain fastnesses of Bundukund. There, alone in the world, overcome by disappointment at the destruction of all his vain hopes, a prey to profound disgust for all human beings, filled with hatred of the civilized world, he realized the wreck of his fortune, assembled some score of his most faithful companions, and one day disappeared, leaving no trace behind. Where, then, did he seek that liberty denied him upon the inhabited earth? Under the waves, in the depths of the ocean, where none could follow. The warrior became the man of science. Upon a deserted island of the Pacific he established his dockyard, and there a submarine vessel was constructed from his designs. By methods which will at some future day be revealed, he had rendered subservient the illimitable forces of electricity which, extracted from inexhaustible sources, was employed for all the requirements of his floating equipage, as a moving, lighting, and heating agent. The sea, with its countless treasures, its myriads of fish, its numberless wrecks, its enormous mammalia, and not only all that nature supplied, but also all that man had lost in its depths, sufficed for every want of the prince and his crew and thus was his most ardent desire accomplished, never again to hold communication with the earth. He named his submarine vessel the Nautilus, called himself simply Captain Nemo, and disappeared beneath the seas. During many years this strange being visited every ocean, from pole to pole. 
Outcast of the inhabited earth, in these unknown worlds he gathered incalculable treasures. The millions lost in the Bay of Vigo, in 1702, by the galleons of Spain, furnished him with a mine of inexhaustible riches which he devoted always, anonymously, in favour of those nations who fought for the independence of their country. Footnote. This refers to the insurrection of the Candiotes, who were, in fact, largely assisted by Captain Nemo. End of footnote. For long, however, he had held no communication with his fellow creatures, when, during the night of the 6th of November, 1866, three men were cast on board his vessel. They were a French professor, his servant, and a Canadian fisherman. These three men had been hurled overboard by a collision which had taken place between the Nautilus and the United States frigate Abraham Lincoln, which had chased her. Captain Nemo learned from this professor that the Nautilus, taken now for a gigantic mammal of the whale species, now for a submarine vessel carrying a crew of pirates, was sought for in every sea. He might have returned these three men to the ocean, from whence chance had brought them in contact with his mysterious existence. Instead of doing this he kept them prisoners, and during seven months they were enabled to behold all the wonders of a voyage of twenty thousand leagues under the sea. One day, the 22nd of June, 1867, these three men, who knew nothing of the past history of Captain Nemo, succeeded in escaping in one of the Nautilus's boats. But as at this time the Nautilus was drawn into the vortex of the Maelstrom, off the coast of Norway, the captain naturally believed that the fugitives, engulfed in that frightful whirlpool, found their death at the bottom of the abyss. He was unaware that the Frenchman and his two companions had been miraculously cast on shore, that the fishermen of the Lafotten Islands had rendered them assistance, and that the professor, on his return to France, had published that work in which seven months of the strange and eventful navigation of the Nautilus were narrated and exposed to the curiosity of the public. For a long time after this, Captain Nemo continued to live thus, traversing every sea. But one by one his companions died, and found their last resting place in their cemetery of coral in the bed of the Pacific. At last Captain Nemo remained the solitary survivor of all those who had taken refuge with him in the depths of the ocean. He was now sixty years of age. Although alone, he succeeded in navigating the Nautilus towards one of those submarine caverns which had sometimes served him as a harbor. One of these ports was hollowed beneath Lincoln Island, and at this moment furnished an asylum to the Nautilus. The captain had now remained there six years, navigating the ocean no longer, but awaiting death, and that moment when he should rejoin his former companions, when by chance he observed the descent of the balloon which carried the prisoners of the Confederates. Clad in his diving dress, he was walking beneath the water at a few cables' length from the shore of the island, when the engineer had been thrown into the sea. Moved by a feeling of compassion, the captain saved Cyrus Harding. His first impulse was to fly from the vicinity of the five castaways, but his harbor refuge was closed, for in consequence of an elevation of the basalt, produced by the influence of volcanic action, he could no longer pass through the entrance of the vault. Though there was sufficient depth of water to allow a light craft to pass the bar, there was not enough for the Nautilus whose draught of water was considerable. Captain Nemo was compelled, therefore, to remain. He observed these men thrown without resources upon a desert island, but had no wish to be himself discovered by them. By degrees he became interested in their efforts when he saw them honest, energetic, and bound to each other by the ties of friendship. As if despite his wishes, he penetrated all the secrets of their existence. By means of the diving dress he could easily reach the well in the interior of Granite House, and climbing by the projections of rock to its upper orifice, he heard the colonists as they recounted the past, and studied the present and future. He learned from them the tremendous conflict of America with America itself 
for the abolition of slavery. Yes, these men were worthy to reconcile Captain Nemo with that humanity which they represented so nobly in the island. Captain Nemo had saved Cyrus Harding. It was he also who had brought back the dog to the chimneys, who rescued Top from the waters of the lake, who caused to fall at Flotsam Point the case containing so many things useful to the colonists, who conveyed the canoe back into the stream of the Mercy, who cast the cord from the top of Granite House at the time of the attack by the baboons, who made known the presence of Ayrton upon Tabor Island, by means of the document enclosed in the bottle, who caused the explosion of the brig by the shock of a torpedo placed at the bottom of the canal, who saved Herbert from certain death by bringing the sulphate of quinine, and finally it was he who had killed the convicts with the electric balls, of which he possessed the secret, and which he employed in the chase of submarine creatures. Thus were explained so many apparently supernatural occurrences, and which all proved the generosity and power of the captain. Nevertheless, this noble misanthrope longed to benefit his protégés still further. There yet remained much useful advice to give them, and, his heart being softened by the approach of death, he invited, as we are aware, the colonists of Granite House to visit the Nautilus by means of a wire which connected it with the corral. Possibly he would not have done this had he been aware that Cyrus Harding was sufficiently acquainted with his history to address him by the name of Nemo. The captain concluded the narrative of his life. Cyrus Harding then spoke. He recalled all the incidents which had exercised so beneficent an influence upon the colony, and in the names of his companions and himself, thanked the generous being to whom they owed so much. But Captain Nemo paid little attention. His mind appeared to be absorbed by one idea, and without taking the proffered hand of the engineer, "'Now, sir,' said he, "'now that you know my history, your judgment.' In saying this, the captain evidently alluded to an important incident witnessed by the three strangers thrown on board his vessel, and which the French professor had related in his work, causing a profound and terrible sensation. Some days previous to the flight of the professor and his two companions, the Nautilus, being chased by a frigate in the north of the Atlantic, had hurled herself as a ram upon this frigate, and sunk her without mercy. Cyrus Harding understood the captain's allusion, and was silent. "'It was an enemy's frigate!' exclaimed Captain Nemo, transformed for an instant into the Prince Dakar. "'An enemy's frigate! It was she who attacked me. I was in a narrow and shallow bay. The frigate barred my way, and I sank her.' A few minutes of silence ensued. Then the captain demanded, "'What think you of my life, gentlemen?' Cyrus Harding extended his hand to the ci devant prince, and replied gravely, "'Sir, your error was in supposing that the past can be resuscitated, and in contending against inevitable progress. It is one of those errors which some admire, others blame, which God alone can judge. He who is mistaken in an action which he sincerely believes to be right may be an enemy, but retains our esteem.' Your error is one that we may admire, and your name has nothing to fear from the judgment of history, which does not condemn heroic folly, but its results. The old man's breast swelled with emotion, and, raising his hand to heaven, "'Was I wrong, or in the right?' he murmured. Cyrus Harding replied, "'All great actions return to God, from whom they are derived.' Captain Nemo, we, whom you have succored, shall ever mourn your loss. Herbert, who had drawn near the captain, fell on his knees and kissed his hand. A tear glistened in the eyes of the dying man. My child, he said, may God bless you. End of chapter
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Seventeen Day had returned. No ray of light penetrated into the profundity of the cavern. It being high water, the entrance was closed by the sea. But the artificial light, which escaped in long streams from the skylights of the Nautilus, was as vivid as before, and the sheet of water shone around the floating vessel. An extreme exhaustion now overcame Captain Nemo, who had fallen back upon the divan. It was useless to contemplate removing him to Granite House, for he had expressed his wish to remain in the midst of those marvels of the Nautilus which millions could not have purchased, and to wait there for that death which was swiftly approaching. During a long interval of prostration, which rendered him almost unconscious, Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett attentively observed the condition of the dying man. It was apparent that his strength was gradually diminishing. That frame, once so robust, was now but the fragile tenement of a departing soul. All of life was concentrated in the heart and head. The engineer and reporter consulted in whispers. Was it possible to render any aid to the dying man? Might his life, if not saved, be prolonged for some days? He himself had said that no remedy could avail, and he awaited with tranquillity that death which had for him no terrors. "'We can do nothing,' said Gideon Spilett. "'But of what is he dying?' asked Pencroft. "'Life is simply fading out,' replied the reporter. "'Nevertheless,' said the sailor, "'if we move him into the open air and the light of the sun, he might perhaps recover.' "'No, Pencroft,' answered the engineer. "'It is useless to attempt it. Besides, Captain Nemo would never consent to leave his vessel. He has lived for a dozen years on board the Nautilus, and on board the Nautilus he desires to die. Without doubt Captain Nemo heard Cyrus Harding's reply, for he raised himself slightly, and in a voice more feeble, but always intelligible. "'You are right, sir,' he said. "'I shall die here. It is my wish. And therefore... I have a request to make of you." Cyrus Harding and his companions had drawn near the divan, and now arranged the cushions in such a manner as to better support the dying man. They saw his eyes wander over all the marvels of this saloon, lighted by the electric rays which fell from the arabesques of the luminous ceiling. He surveyed, one after the other, the pictures hanging from the splendid tapestries of the partitions the chef d'oeuvre of the Italian, Flemish, French, and Spanish masters, the statues of marble and bronze on their pedestals, the magnificent organ leaning against the after-partition, the aquarium in which bloomed the most wonderful productions of the sea, marine plants, zoophytes, chaplets of pearls of inestimable value, and finally his eyes rested on this device, inscribed over the pediment of the museum the motto of the nautilus mobilis in mobile his glance seemed to rest fondly for the last time on these masterpieces of art and of nature to which he had limited his horizon during a sojourn of so many years in the abysses of the sea cyrus harding respected the captain's silence and waited till he should speak after some minutes, during which, doubtless, he passed in review his whole life, Captain Nemo turned to the colonists and said, "'You consider yourselves, gentlemen, under some obligations to me?' "'Captain, believe us that we would give our lives to prolong yours.' "'Promise, then,' continued Captain Nemo, "'to carry out my last wishes, and I shall be repaid for all I have done for you.' We promise," said Cyrus Harding, and by this promise he bound both himself and his companions. 
Gentlemen, resumed the captain, tomorrow I shall be dead. Herbert was about to utter an exclamation, but a sign from the captain arrested him. Tomorrow I shall die, and I desire no other tomb than the Nautilus. It is my grave. All my friends repose in the depths of the ocean. Their resting place shall be mine. These words were received with profound silence. Pay attention to my wishes, he continued. The Nautilus is imprisoned in this grotto, the entrance of which is blocked up. But although egress is impossible, the vessel may at least sink in the abyss, and there bury my remains. The colonists listened reverently to the words of the dying man. Tomorrow, after my death, Mr. Harding, continued the captain, yourself and companions will leave the Nautilus, for all the treasures it contains must perish with me. One token alone will remain of you of Prince Dakar, with whose history you are now acquainted. That coffer yonder contains diamonds of the value of many millions, most of them mementos of the time when, husband and father, I thought happiness possible for me, and a collection of pearls gathered by my friends and myself in the depths of the ocean. Of this treasure, at a future day, you may make good use. In the hands of such men as yourself and your comrades, Captain Harding, money will never be a source of danger. From on high I shall still participate in your enterprises, and I fear not, but that they will prosper. After a few moments' repose, necessitated by his extreme weakness, Captain Nemo continued, "'Tomorrow you will take the coffer, you will leave the saloon, of which you will close the door. Then you will ascend on to the deck of the Nautilus, and you will lower the main hatch, so as entirely to close the vessel.' "'It shall be done, Captain,' answered Cyrus Harding. "'Good. You will then embark in the canoe which brought you hither. But before leaving the Nautilus, go to the stern, and there open two large stopcocks, which you will find upon the water-line. The water will penetrate into the reservoirs, and the Nautilus will gradually sink beneath the water, to repose at the bottom of the abyss. And comprehending a gesture of Cyrus Harding, the captain added, Fear nothing, you will but bury a corpse. Neither Cyrus Harding nor his companions ventured to offer any observation to Captain Nemo. He had expressed his last wishes, and they had nothing to do but to conform to them. "'I have your promise, gentlemen,' added Captain Nemo. "'You have, Captain,' replied the engineer. The captain thanked the colonists by a sign, and requested them to leave him for some hours. Gideon Spilett wished to remain near him, in the event of a crisis coming on, but the dying man refused, saying, "'I shall live until to-morrow, sir.' All left the saloon, passed through the library and the dining-room, and arrived forward in the machine-room where the electrical apparatus was established, which supplied not only heat and light, but the mechanical power of the Nautilus. The Nautilus was a masterpiece containing masterpieces within itself, and the engineer was struck with astonishment. The colonists mounted the platform, which rose seven or eight feet above the water. There they beheld a thick glass lenticular covering, which protected a kind of large eye, from which flashed forth light. Behind this eye was apparently a cabin containing the wheels of the rudder, and in which was stationed the helmsman when he navigated the Nautilus over the bed of the ocean, which the electric rays would evidently light up to a considerable distance. Cyrus Harding and his companions remained for a time silent, for they were vividly impressed by what they had just seen and heard, and their hearts were deeply touched by the thought that he whose arm had so often aided them, the protector whom they had known but a few hours, was at the point of death. 
whatever might be the judgment pronounced by posterity upon the events of this, so to speak, extra-human existence, the character of Prince Dakar would ever remain as one of those whose memory time can never efface. "'What a man!' said Pencroft. "'Is it possible that he can have lived at the bottom of the sea? And it seems to me that perhaps he has not found peace there any more than elsewhere.' "'The Nautilus,' observed Ayrton, "'might have enabled us to leave Lincoln Island and reach some inhabited country.' "'Good heavens!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'I, for one, would never risk myself in such a craft. To sail on the seas, good, but under the seas, never.' "'I believe, Pencroft,' answered the reporter, "'that the navigation of a submarine vessel such as the Nautilus ought to be very easy, and that we should soon become accustomed to it. There would be no storms, no lee-shore to fear.' At some feet beneath the surface, the waters of the ocean are as calm as those of a lake. "'That may be,' replied the sailor. "'But I prefer a gale of wind on board a well-found craft. A vessel is built to sail on the sea and not beneath it.' "'My friends,' said the engineer, "'it is useless, at any rate as regards the Nautilus, to discuss the question of submarine vessels. The Nautilus is not ours.' and we have not the right to dispose of it. Moreover, we could in no case avail ourselves of it. Independently of the fact that it would be impossible to get it out of this cavern, whose entrance is now closed by the uprising of the basaltic rocks, Captain Nemo's wish is that it shall be buried with him. His wish is our law, and we will fulfill it. After a somewhat prolonged conversation, Cyrus Harding and his companions again descended to the interior of the Nautilus. There they took some refreshment, and returned to the saloon. Captain Nemo had somewhat rallied from the prostration which had overcome him, and his eyes shone with their wonted fire. A faint smile even curled his lips. The colonists drew around him. "'Gentlemen,' said the captain, "'you are brave and honest men.' You have devoted yourself to the common weal. Often have I observed your conduct. I have esteemed you. I esteem you still. Your hand, Mr. Harding. Cyrus Harding gave his hand to the captain, who clasped it affectionately. It is well, he murmured. He resumed. But enough of myself. I have to speak concerning yourselves, and this Lincoln Island upon which you have taken refuge. You now desire to leave it? To return, Captain, answered Pencroft quickly. To return, Pencroft, said the Captain, with a smile. I know it is true, your love for this island. You have helped to make it what it now is, and it seems to you a paradise. Our project, Captain, interposed Cyrus Harding, is to annex it to the United States, and to establish for our shipping a port so fortunately situated in this part of the Pacific. "'Your thoughts are with your country, gentlemen,' continued the captain. "'Your toils are for her prosperity and glory. You are right. One's native land. There should one live. There die. And I, I die far from all I loved.' "'You have some last wish to transmit?' said the engineer with emotion, some souvenir to send to those friends you have left in the mountains of India? No, Captain Harding, no friends remain to me. I am the last of my race, and to all whom I have known I have long been as are the dead. But to return to yourselves, solitude, isolation, are painful things, and beyond human endurance. I die of having thought it possible to live alone. You should, therefore, dare all in the attempt to leave Lincoln Island, and see once more the land of your birth. I am aware that those wretches have destroyed the vessel you have built. We propose to construct a vessel, said Gideon Spilett, sufficiently large to convey us to the nearest land. But if we should succeed, sooner or later we shall return to Lincoln Island. 
we are attached to it by too many recollections ever to forget it. It is here that we have known Captain Nemo, said Cyrus Harding. It is here only that we can make our home, added Herbert. And here shall I sleep the sleep of eternity, if, replied the captain. He paused for a moment, and instead of completing the sentence, said simply, Mr. Harding, I wish to speak with you alone. The engineer's companions, respecting the wish, retired. Cyrus Harding remained but a few minutes alone with Captain Nemo, and soon recalled his companions, but he said nothing to them of the private matters which the dying man had confided to him. Gideon Spilett now watched the captain with extreme care. It was evident that he was no longer sustained by his moral energy, which had lost the power of reaction against his physical weakness. The day closed without change. The colonists did not quit the Nautilus for a moment. Night arrived, although it was impossible to distinguish it from day in the cavern. Captain Nemo suffered no pain, but he was visibly sinking. His noble features, paled by the approach of death, were perfectly calm. Inaudible words escaped at intervals from his lips, bearing upon various incidents of his checkered career. Life was evidently ebbing slowly, and his extremities were already cold. Once or twice more he spoke to the colonists who stood around him, and smiled on them with that last smile which continues after death. At length, shortly after midnight, Captain Nemo by a supreme effort succeeded in folding his arms across his breast, as if wishing in that attitude to compose himself for death. At one o'clock his glance alone showed signs of life. A dying light gleamed in those eyes once so brilliant. Then, murmuring the words, God and my country, he quietly expired. Cyrus Harding, bending low, closed the eyes of him who had once been the Prince Dakar, and was now not even Captain Nemo. Herbert and Pencroft sobbed aloud. Tears fell from Ayrton's eyes. Neb was on his knees by the reporter's side, motionless as a statue. Then Cyrus Harding, extending his hand over the forehead of the dead, said solemnly, May his soul be with God. Turning to his friends, he added, Let us pray for him whom we have lost. Some hours later the colonists fulfilled the promise made to the captain by carrying out his dying wishes. Cyrus Harding and his companions quitted the Nautilus, taking with them the only memento left them by their benefactor, the coffer which contained wealth amounting to millions. The marvelous saloon, still flooded with light, had been carefully closed. The iron door leading on deck was then securely fastened in such a manner as to prevent even a drop of water from penetrating to the interior of the Nautilus. The colonists then descended into the canoe, which was moored to the side of the submarine vessel. The canoe was now brought around to the stern. There, at the water line, were two large stopcocks, communicating with the reservoirs employed in the submersion of the vessel. The stopcocks were opened, the reservoirs filled, and the Nautilus, slowly sinking, disappeared beneath the surface of the lake. But the colonists were yet able to follow its descent through the waves. The powerful light it gave forth lighted up the translucent water, while the cavern became gradually obscure. At length this vast effusion of electric light faded away, and soon after the Nautilus, now the tomb of Captain Nemo, reposed in its ocean bed. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 3, Chapter 18 At break of day the colonists regained in silence the entrance of the cavern, to which they gave the name of Dakar Grotto, in memory of Captain Nemo. It was now low water, and they passed without difficulty under the arcade, washed on the right by the sea. The canoe was left here, carefully protected from the waves. As additional precaution, Pencroft, Neb, and Ayrton drew it up on a little beach which bordered one of the sides of the grotto, in a spot where it could run no risk of harm. The storm had ceased during the night. The last low mutterings of thunder died away in the west. Rain fell no longer, but the sky was yet obscured by clouds. On the whole, this month of October, the first of the southern spring, was not ushered in by satisfactory tokens, and the wind had a tendency to shift from one point of the compass to another, which rendered it impossible to count upon settled weather. Cyrus Harding and his companions, on leaving Dakar Grotto, had taken the road to the corral. On their way Neb and Herbert were careful to preserve the wire which had been laid down by the captain between the corral and the grotto, and which might at a future time be of service. The colonists spoke but little on the road. The various incidents of the night of October 15th had left a profound impression on their minds. The unknown being whose influence had so effectually protected them, the man whom their imagination had endowed with supernatural powers, Captain Nemo, was no more. His Nautilus and he were buried in the depths of the abyss. To each one of them their existence seemed even more isolated than before. They had been accustomed to count upon the intervention of that power which existed no longer, and Gideon Spilett and even Cyrus Harding could not escape this impression. Thus they maintained a profound silence during their journey to the corral. Towards nine in the morning the colonists arrived at Granite House. It had been agreed that the construction of the vessel should be actively pushed forward, and Cyrus Harding more than ever devoted his time and labor to this object. It was impossible to divine what future lay before them. Evidently the advantage to the colonists would be great of having at their disposal a substantial vessel, capable of keeping the sea even in heavy weather, and large enough to attempt in case of need, a voyage of some duration. Even if, when their vessel should be completed, the colonists should not resolve to leave Lincoln Island as yet, in order to gain either one of the Polynesian archipelagos of the Pacific, or the shores of New Zealand, they might at least, sooner or later, proceed to Tabor Island, to leave there the notice relating to Ayrton. This was a precaution rendered indispensable by the possibility of the Scotch yacht reappearing in those seas, and it was of the highest importance that nothing should be neglected on this point. The works were then resumed. Cyrus Harding, Pencroft, and Ayrton, assisted by Neb, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert, except when unavoidably called off by other necessary occupations, worked without cessation. It was important that the new vessel should be ready in five months, that is to say, by the beginning of March if they wished to visit Tabor Island before the equinoctial gales rendered the voyage impracticable. Therefore the carpenters lost not a moment. Moreover, it was unnecessary to manufacture rigging, that of the Speedy having been saved entire, so that the whole only of the vessel need to be constructed. The end of the year 1868 found them occupied by these important labors, to the exclusion of almost all others. At the expiration of two months and a half, the ribs had been set up, and the first planks adjusted. It was already evident that the plans made by Cyrus Harding were admirable, and that the vessel would behave well at sea. Pencroft brought to the task a devouring energy, and would even grumble when one or the other abandoned the carpenter's axe for the gun of the hunter. It was nevertheless necessary to keep up the stores of Granite House in view of the approaching winter. But this did not satisfy Pencroft. 
the brave, honest sailor was not content when the workmen were not at the dockyard. When this happened he grumbled vigorously, and by way of venting his feelings did the work of six men. The weather was very unfavourable during the whole of the summer season. For some days the heat was overpowering, and the atmosphere, saturated with electricity, was only cleared by violent storms. It was rarely that the distant growling of the thunder could not be heard, like a low but incessant murmur, such as is produced in the equatorial regions of the globe. The 1st of January, 1869, was signalized by a storm of extreme violence, and the thunder burst several times over the island. Large trees were struck by the electric fluid and shattered and among others one of those gigantic nettle-trees which had shaded the poultry-yard at the southern extremity of the lake. Had this meteor any relation to the phenomenon going on in the bowels of the earth? Was there any connection between the commotion of the atmosphere and that of the interior of the earth? Cyrus Harding was inclined to think that such was the case, for the development of these storms was attended by the renewal of volcanic symptoms. It was on the 3rd of January that Herbert, having ascended at daybreak to the plateau of Prospect Heights to harness one of the onagers, perceived an enormous hat-shaped cloud rolling from the summit of the volcano. Herbert immediately apprised the colonists, who at once joined him in watching the summit of Mount Franklin. "'Ah!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Those are not vapours this time. It seems to me that the giant is not content with breathing.' He must smoke. This figure of speech employed by the sailor exactly expressed the changes going on at the mouth of the volcano. Already for three months had the crater emitted vapors more or less dense, but which were as yet produced only by an internal ebullition of mineral substances. But now the vapors were replaced by a thick smoke, rising in the form of a grayish column, more than three hundred feet in width at its base and which spread like an immense mushroom to a height of from seven to eight hundred feet above the summit of the mountain. "'The fire is in the chimney,' observed Gideon Spilett. "'And we can't put it out,' replied Herbert. "'The volcano ought to be swept,' observed Neb, who spoke as if perfectly serious. "'Well said, Neb!' cried Pencroft, with a shout of laughter. "'And you'll undertake the job, no doubt.' Cyrus Harding attentively observed the dense smoke emitted by Mount Franklin, and even listened, as if expecting to hear some distant muttering. Then, turning towards his companions, from whom he had gone somewhat apart, he said, "'The truth is, my friends, we must not conceal from ourselves that an important change is going forward. The volcanic substances are no longer in a state of ebullition. They have caught fire.' and we are undoubtedly menaced by an approaching eruption. "'Well, Captain,' said Pencroft, "'we shall witness the eruption, and if it is a good one, we'll applaud it. I don't see that we need concern ourselves further about the matter.' "'It may be so,' replied Cyrus Harding, "'for the ancient track of the lava is still open, and thanks to this the crater has hitherto overflowed towards the north. And yet—' And yet, as we can derive no advantage from an eruption, it might be better it should not take place," said the reporter. "'Who knows?' answered the sailor. "'Perhaps there may be some valuable substances in this volcano which it will spout forth, and which we may turn to good account.' Cyrus Harding shook his head with the air of a man who augured no good from the phenomenon whose development had been so sudden. He did not regard so lightly as Pencroft the results of an eruption. If the lava, in consequence of the position of the crater, did not directly menace the wooded and cultivated parts of the island, other complications might present themselves. In fact, eruptions are not unfrequently accompanied by earthquakes, and an island of the nature of Lincoln Island, formed of substances so varied, basalt on one side, granite on the other, lava on the north, rich soil on the south, substances which consequently could not be firmly attached to each other, would be exposed to the risk of disintegration. 
although, therefore, the spreading of the volcanic matter might not constitute a serious danger, any movement of the terrestrial structure which should shake the island might entail the gravest consequences. "'It seems to me,' said Ayrton, who had reclined so as to place his ear to the ground, "'it seems to me that I can hear a dull, rumbling sound, like that of a wagon loaded with bars of iron.' The colonists listened with the greatest attention, and were convinced that Ayrton was not mistaken. The rumbling was mingled with a subterranean roar, which formed a sort of rinforzando, and died slowly away, as if some violent storm had passed through the profundities of the globe. But no explosion, properly so termed, could be heard. It might therefore be concluded that the vapours and smoke found a free passage through the central shaft and that the safety valve being sufficiently large, no convulsion would be produced, no explosion was to be apprehended. "'Well, then,' said Pencroft, "'are we not going back to work? Let Mount Franklin smoke, groan, bellow, or spout forth fire and flame as much as it pleases. That is no reason why we should be idle. Come, Ayrton, Neb, Herbert, Captain Harding, Mr. Spilett, Every one of us must turn to at our work to-day. We are going to place the keelson, and a dozen pair of hands would not be too many. Before two months I want our new Bonadventure, for we shall keep the old name, shall we not, to float on the waters of Port Balloon. Therefore there is not an hour to lose. All the colonists, their services thus requisitioned by Pencroft, descended to the dockyard, and proceeded to place the keelson a thick mass of wood which forms the lower portion of a ship, and unites firmly the timbers of the hull. It was an arduous undertaking, in which all took part. They continued their labours during the whole of this day, the 3rd of January, without thinking further of the volcano, which could not besides be seen from the shore of Granite House. But once or twice large shadows, veiling the sun, which described its diurnal arc through an extremely clear sky, indicated that a thick cloud of smoke passed between its disk and the island. The wind, blowing on the shore, carried all these vapours to the westward. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett remarked these sombre appearances, and from time to time discussed the evident progress of the volcanic phenomena, but their work went on without interruption. It was, besides, of the first importance from every point of view, that the vessel should be finished with the least possible delay. In presence of the eventualities which might arise, the safety of the colonists would be to a great extent secured by their ship. Who could tell that it might not prove some day their only refuge? In the evening, after supper, Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert again ascended to the plateau of Prospect Heights. It was already dark, and the obscurity would permit them to ascertain if flames or incandescent matter thrown up by the volcano were mingled with the vapour and smoke accumulated at the mouth of the crater. "'The crater is on fire,' said Herbert, who more active than his companions first reached the plateau. Mount Franklin, distant about six miles, now appeared like a gigantic torch around the summit of which turned fuliginous flames. So much smoke, and possibly scoriae and cinders were mingled with them, that their light gleamed but faintly amid the gloom of the night. But a kind of lurid brilliancy spread over the island, against which stood out confusedly the wooded masses of the heights. Immense whirlwinds of vapour obscured the sky, through which glimmered a few stars. The change is rapid! said the engineer. "'That is not surprising,' answered the reporter. "'The reawakening of the volcano already dates back some time. You may remember, Cyrus, that the first vapours appeared about the time we searched the sides of the mountain to discover Captain Nemo's retreat. It was, if I mistake not, about the 15th of October.' "'Yes,' replied Herbert. Two months and a half ago!' The subterranean fires have therefore been smouldering for ten weeks," resumed Gideon Spilett, and it is not to be wondered at that they now break out with such violence. "'Do you not feel a certain vibration of the soil?' asked Cyrus Harding. "'Yes,' replied Gideon Spilett. 
but there is a great difference between that and an earthquake. I do not affirm that we are menaced with an earthquake, answered Cyrus Harding. May God preserve us from that. No, these vibrations are due to the effervescence of the central fire. The crust of the earth is simply the shell of a boiler, and you know that such a shell, under the pressure of steam, vibrates like a sonorous plate. It is this effect which is being produced at this moment. "'What magnificent flames!' exclaimed Herbert. At this instant a kind of bouquet of flames shot forth from the crater, the brilliancy of which was visible even through the vapours. Thousands of luminous sheets and barbed tongues of fire were cast in various directions. Some, extending beyond the dome of smoke, dissipated it, leaving behind an incandescent powder. This was accompanied by successive explosions, resembling the discharge of a battery of machine-guns. Cyrus Harding, the reporter, and Herbert, after spending an hour on the plateau of Prospect Heights, again descended to the beach, and returned to Granite House. The engineer was thoughtful and preoccupied, so much so, indeed, that Gideon Spilett inquired if he apprehended any immediate danger, of which the eruption might directly or indirectly be the cause. "'Yes and no,' answered Cyrus Harding. "'Nevertheless,' continued the reporter, "'would not the greatest misfortune which could happen to us be an earthquake which would overturn the island? Now, I do not suppose that this is to be feared, since the vapours and lava have found a free outlet.' True, replied Cyrus Harding, and I do not fear an earthquake in the sense in which the term is commonly applied to convulsions of the soil provoked by the expansion of subterranean gases, but other causes may produce great disasters. How so, my dear Cyrus? I am not certain. I must consider. I must visit the mountain. In a few days I shall learn more on this point." Gideon Spilett said no more, and soon, in spite of the explosions of the volcano, whose intensity increased, and which were repeated by the echoes of the island, the inhabitants of Granite House were sleeping soundly. Three days passed by, the 4th, 5th, and 6th of January. The construction of the vessel was diligently continued, and without offering further explanations, the engineer pushed forward the work with all his energy. Mount Franklin was now hooded by a sombre cloud of sinister aspect, and, amid the flames, vomited forth incandescent rocks, some of which fell back into the crater itself. This caused Pencroft, who would only look at the matter in the light of a joke, to exclaim, "'Ha! The giant is playing a cup and ball! He is a conjurer!' In fact, the substances thrown up fell back again into the abyss, and it did not seem that the lava— though swollen by the internal pressure, had yet risen to the orifice of the crater. At any rate, the opening on the northeast, which was partly visible, poured out no torrent upon the northern slope of the mountain. Nevertheless, however pressing was the construction of the vessel, other duties demanded the presence of the colonists on various portions of the island. Before everything it was necessary to go to the corral, where the flocks of musmons and goats were enclosed, and replenished the provision of forage for those animals. It was accordingly arranged that Ayrton should proceed thither the next day, the 7th of January, and as he was sufficient for the task to which he was accustomed, Pencroft and the rest were somewhat surprised on hearing the engineer say to Ayrton, "'As you are going to-morrow to the corral, I will accompany you.' "'But Captain Harding!' exclaimed the sailor. Our working days will not be many, and if you go also we shall be two pair hands short. We shall return to-morrow, replied Cyrus Harding, but it is necessary that I should go to the corral. I must learn how the eruption is progressing. The eruption! Always the eruption! answered Pencroft, with an air of discontent. An important thing, truly, this eruption. I trouble myself very little about it. Whatever might be the sailor's opinion, the expedition projected by the engineer was settled for the next day. Herbert wished to accompany Cyrus Harding, but he would not vex Pencroft by his absence. 
The next day, at dawn, Cyrus Harding and Ayrton, mounting the cart drawn by two onagers, took the road to the corral and set off at a round trot. Above the forest were passing large clouds, to which the crater of Mount Franklin incessantly added fuliginous matter. These clouds, which rolled heavily in the air, were evidently composed of heterogeneous substances. It was not alone from the volcano that they derived their strange opacity and weight. Scoriae, in a state of dust, like powdered pumice stone, and grayish ashes as small as the finest feculae, were held in suspension in the midst of their thick folds. These ashes are so fine that they have been observed in the air for whole months. After the eruption of 1783 in Iceland, for upwards of a year the atmosphere was thus charged with volcanic dust, through which the rays of the sun were only with difficulty discernible. But more often this pulverized matter falls, and this happened on the present occasion. Cyrus Harding and Ayrton had scarcely reached the corral when a sort of black snow like fine gunpowder fell, and instantly changed the appearance of the soil. Trees, meadows, all disappeared beneath the covering several inches in depth. But, very fortunately, the wind blew from the northeast, and the greater part of the cloud dissolved itself over the sea. "'This is very singular, Captain Harding,' said Ayrton. "'It is very serious,' replied the engineer. "'This powdered pumice-stone, all this mineral dust, proves how grave is the convulsion going forward in the lower depths of the volcano.' but can nothing be done nothing except to note the progress of the phenomenon do you therefore ayrton occupy yourself with the necessary work at the corral in the meantime i will ascend just beyond the source of red creek and examine the condition of the mountain upon its northern aspect then well captain harding then we will pay a visit to dakar grotto i wish to inspect it at any rate, I will come back for you in two hours. Ayrton then proceeded to enter the corral, and, while awaiting the engineer's return, busied himself with the musmons and goats, which seemed to feel a certain uneasiness in presence of these first signs of an eruption. Meanwhile Cyrus Harding ascended the crest of the eastern spur, past Red Creek, and arrived at the spot where he and his companions had discovered a sulphurous spring at the time of their first exploration. How changed was everything! Instead of a single column of smoke he counted thirteen, forced through the soil as if violently propelled by some piston. It was evident that the crust of the earth was subjected in this part of the globe to a frightful pressure. The atmosphere was saturated with gases and carbonic acid, mingled with aqueous vapors. Cyrus Harding felt the volcanic tufa with which the plain was strewn, and which was but pulverized cinders hardened into solid blocks by time, tremble beneath him, but he could discover no traces of fresh lava. The engineer became more assured of this when he observed all the northern part of Mount Franklin. Pillars of smoke and flame escaped from the crater. A hail of scoriae fell on the ground but no current of lava burst from the mouth of the volcano, which proved that the volcanic matter had not yet attained the level of the superior orifice of the central shaft. "'But I would prefer that it were so,' said Cyrus Harding to himself. "'At any rate, I should then know that the lava had followed its accustomed track. Who can say that it may not take a new course? But the danger does not consist in that. Captain Nemo foresaw it clearly.' No, the danger does not lie there. Cyrus Harding advanced towards the enormous causeway whose prolongation enclosed the narrow shark gulf. He could now sufficiently examine on this side the ancient channels of the lava. There was no doubt in his mind that the most recent eruption had occurred at a far distant epoch. He then returned by the same way, listening attentively to the subterranean mutterings which rolled like long-continued thunder, interrupted by deafening explosions. At nine in the morning he reached the corral. Ayrton awaited him. "'The animals are cared for, Captain Harding,' said Ayrton. "'Good, Ayrton. 
They seem uneasy, Captain Harding. Yes, instinct speaks through them, and instinct is never deceived. Are you ready? Take a lamp, Ayrton, answered the engineer. We will start at once. Ayrton did as desired. The onagers, unharnessed, roamed in the corral. The gate was secured on the outside, and Cyrus Harding, preceding Ayrton, took the narrow path which led westward to the shore. The soil they walked upon was choked with the pulverized matter fallen from the cloud. No quadruped appeared in the woods. Even the birds had fled. Sometimes a passing breeze raised the covering of ashes, and the two colonists, enveloped in a whirlwind of dust, lost sight of each other. They were then careful to cover their eyes and mouths with handkerchiefs, for they ran the risk of being blinded and suffocated. It was impossible for Cyrus Harding and Ayrton, with these impediments, to make rapid progress. Moreover, the atmosphere was close, as if the oxygen had been partly burned up, and had become unfit for respiration. At every hundred paces they were obliged to stop to take breath. It was therefore past ten o'clock when the engineer and his companion reached the crest of the enormous mass of rocks of basalt and porphyry which composed the northwest coast of the island. Ayrton and Cyrus Harding commenced the descent of this abrupt declivity, following almost step for step the difficult path which, during that stormy night, had led them to Dakar Grotto. In open day the descent was less perilous, and besides, the bed of ashes which covered the polished surface of the rock enabled them to make their footing more secure. The ridge at the end of the shore, about forty feet in height, was soon reached. Cyrus Harding recollected that this elevation gradually sloped towards the level of the sea. Although the tide was at present low, no beach could be seen, and the waves, thickened by the volcanic dust, beat upon the basaltic rocks. Cyrus Harding and Ayrton found without difficulty the entrance to Dakar Grotto, and paused for a moment at the last rock before it. "'The iron boat should be there,' said the engineer. "'It is here, Captain Harding,' replied Ayrton, drawing towards him the fragile craft, which was protected by the arch of the vault. "'On board, Ayrton.' The two colonists stepped into the boat. A slight undulation of the waves carried it farther under the low arch of the crypt, and there Ayrton, with the aid of flint and steel, lighted the lamp. He then took the oars, and the lamp having been placed in the bow of the boat, so that its rays fell before them, Cyrus Harding took the helm, and steered through the shades of the grotto. The Nautilus was there no longer to illuminate the cavern with its electric light. Possibly it might not yet be extinguished, but no ray escaped from the depths of the abyss in which reposed all that was mortal of Captain Nemo. The light afforded by the lamp, although feeble, nevertheless enabled the engineer to advance slowly, following the wall of the cavern. A death-like silence reigned under the vaulted roof, or at least in the interior portion, for soon Cyrus Harding distinctly heard the rumbling which proceeded from the bowels of the mountain. "'That comes from the volcano,' he said. Besides these sounds, the presence of chemical combinations was soon betrayed by their powerful odour, and the engineer and his companion were almost suffocated by sulphurous vapours. "'This is what Captain Nemo feared,' murmured Cyrus Harding, changing countenance. "'We must go to the end, notwithstanding.' Forward, replied Ayrton, bending to his oars and directing the boat towards the head of the cavern. Twenty-five minutes after entering the mouth of the grotto, the boat reached the extreme end. Cyrus Harding then, standing up, cast the light of the lamp upon the walls of the cavern, which separated it from the central shaft of the volcano. What was the thickness of this wall? It might be ten feet, or a hundred feet, it was impossible to say but the subterranean sounds were too perceptible to allow of the supposition that it was of any great thickness. The engineer, after having explored the wall at a certain height horizontally, fastened the lamp to the end of an oar, and again surveyed the basaltic wall at a greater elevation. There, 
through scarcely visible clefts and joinings, escaped a pungent vapour, which infected the atmosphere of the cavern. The wall was broken by large cracks, some of which extended to within two or three feet of the water's edge. Cyrus Harding thought for a brief space. Then he said in a low voice, Yes, the captain was right. The danger lies there, and a terrible danger. Ayrton said not a word, but, upon a sign from Cyrus Harding, resumed the oars, and half an hour later the engineer and he reached the entrance of Dakar Grotto. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Mysterious Island, by Jules Verne. Part 3, Chapter 19 The next day, the eighth day of January, after a day and night passed at the corral, where they left all in order, Cyrus Harding and Ayrton arrived at Granite House. The engineer immediately called his companions together, and informed them of the imminent danger which threatened Lincoln Island, and from which no human power could deliver them. "'My friends,' he said, and his voice betrayed the depth of his emotion, "'our island is not among those which will endure while this earth endures. It is doomed to more or less speedy destruction.' the cause of which it bears within itself, and from which nothing can save it. The colonists looked at each other, then at the engineer. They did not clearly comprehend him. "'Explain yourself, Cyrus,' said Gideon Spilett. "'I will do so,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'Or rather I will simply afford you the explanation which, during our few minutes of private conversation, was given me by Captain Nemo.' "'Captain Nemo!' exclaimed the colonists. "'Yes, and it was the last service he desired to render us before his death.' "'The last service!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'The last service! You will see that though he is dead he will render us others yet.' "'But what did the captain say?' inquired the reporter. "'I will tell you, my friends,' said the engineer. "'Lincoln Island does not resemble the other islands of the Pacific.' and a fact of which Captain Nemo has made me cognizant must sooner or later bring about the subversion of its foundation. "'Nonsense! Lincoln Island! It can't be!' cried Pencroft, who, in spite of the respect he felt for Cyrus Harding, could not prevent a gesture of incredulity. "'Listen, Pencroft,' resumed the engineer, "'I will tell you what Captain Nemo communicated to me, and which I myself confirmed yesterday.' during the exploration of Dakar Grotto. This cavern stretches under the island as far as the volcano, and is only separated from its central shaft by the wall which terminates it. Now this wall is seamed with fissures and clefts which already allow the sulphurous gases generated in the interior of the volcano to escape. Well, said Pencroft, his brow suddenly contracting, well then, I saw that these fissures widen under the internal pressure from within, that the wall of basalt is gradually giving way, and that after a longer or shorter period it will afford a passage to the waters of the lake which fill the cavern. Good, replied Pencroft, with an attempt at pleasantry. The sea will extinguish the volcano, and there will be an end of the matter. Not so, said Cyrus Harding. Should a day arrive when the sea, rushing through the wall of the cavern, penetrates by the central shaft into the interior of the island to the boiling lava, Lincoln Island will that day be blown into the air, just as would happen to the island of Sicily were the Mediterranean to precipitate itself into Mount Etna. The colonists made no answer to these significant words of the engineer. They now understood the danger by which they were menaced. It may be added that Cyrus Harding had in no way exaggerated the danger to be apprehended. Many persons have formed an idea that it 
would be possible to extinguish volcanoes, which are almost always situated on the shores of a sea or lake, by opening a passage for the admission of the water. But they are not aware that this would be to incur the risk of blowing up a portion of the globe, like a boiler whose steam is suddenly expanded by intense heat. The water, rushing into a cavity whose temperature might be estimated at thousands of degrees, would be converted into steam with a sudden energy which no enclosure could resist. It was not therefore doubtful that the island, menaced by a frightful and approaching convulsion, would endure only so long as the wall of Dakar Grotto itself should endure. It was not even a question of months, nor of weeks, but of days. It might be of hours. The first sentiment which the colonists felt was that of profound sorrow. They thought not so much of the peril which menaced themselves personally, but of the destruction of the island which had sheltered them, which they had cultivated, which they loved so well, and had hoped to render so flourishing. So much effort ineffectually expended, so much labor lost. Pencroft could not prevent a large tear from rolling down his cheek, nor did he attempt to conceal it. Some further conversation now took place. The chances yet in favor of the colonists were discussed, but finally it was agreed that there was not an hour to be lost, that the building and fitting of the vessel should be pushed forward with their utmost energy, and that this was the sole chance of safety for the inhabitants of Lincoln Island. All hands, therefore, set to work on the vessel. What could it avail to sow, to reap, to hunt, to increase the stores of Granite House? The contents of the storehouse and outbuildings contain more than sufficient to provide the ship for a voyage, however long might be its duration. But it was imperative that the ship should be ready to receive them before the inevitable catastrophe should arrive. Their labors were now carried on with feverish ardor. By the 23rd of January the vessel was half-decked over. Up to this time no change had taken place on the summit of the volcano. Vapor and smoke mingled with flames, and incandescent stones were thrown up from the crater. But during the night of the 23rd, in consequence of the lava attaining the level of the first stratum of the volcano, the hat-shaped cone which formed over the latter disappeared. A frightful sound was heard. The colonists at first thought the island was rent asunder and rushed out of Granite House. This occurred about two o'clock in the morning. The sky appeared on fire. The superior cone, a mass of rock a thousand feet in height, and weighing thousands of millions of pounds, had been thrown down upon the island making it tremble to its foundation. Fortunately, this cone inclined to the north, and had fallen upon the plain of sand and tufa, stretching between the volcano and the sea. The aperture of the crater being thus enlarged, projected towards the sky a glare so intense, that by the simple effect of reflection, the atmosphere appeared red-hot. At the same time, a torrent of lava, bursting from the new summit, poured out in long cascades, like water escaping from a vase too full, and a thousand tongues of fire crept over the sides of the volcano. "'The corral! The corral!' exclaimed Ayrton. It was, in fact, towards the corral that the lava was rushing, as the new crater faced the east, and consequently the fertile portions of the island. The springs of Red Creek and Jacamar Wood were menaced with instant destruction. At Ayrton's cry the colonists rushed to the onager's stables. The cart was at once harnessed. All were possessed by the same thought, to hasten to the corral and set at liberty the animals it enclosed. Before three in the morning they arrived at the corral. The cries of the terrified musmans and goats indicated the alarm which possessed them. Already a torrent of burning matter and liquefied minerals fell from the side of the mountain upon the meadows as far as the side of the palisade. The gate was burst open by Ayrton, and the animals, bewildered with terror, fled in all directions. An hour afterwards the boiling lava filled the corral, converting into vapor the water of the little rivulet which ran through it. 
burning up the house like dry grass, and leaving not even a post of the palisade to mark the spot where the corral once stood. To contend against this disaster would have been folly, nay, madness. In presence of nature's grand convulsions, man is powerless. It was now daylight, the 24th of January. Cyrus Harding and his companions, before returning to Granite House, desired to ascertain the probable direction this inundation of lava was about to take. The soil sloped gradually from Mount Franklin to the east coast, and it was to be feared that, in spite of the thick Jackamar wood, the torrent would reach the plateau of Prospect Heights. "'The lake will cover us,' said Gideon Spilett. "'I hope so,' was Cyrus Harding's only reply. The colonists were desirous of reaching the plain upon which the superior cone of Mount Franklin had fallen, but the lava arrested their progress. It had followed on one side the valley of Red Creek, and on the other that of Falls River, evaporating those watercourses in its passage. There was no possibility of crossing the torrent of lava. On the contrary, the colonists were obliged to retreat before it. The volcano, without its crown, was no longer recognizable, terminated as it was by a sort of flat table which replaced the ancient crater. From two openings in its southern and eastern sides, an unceasing flow of lava poured forth, thus forming two distinct streams. Above the new crater a cloud of smoke and ashes, mingled with those of the atmosphere, massed over the island. Loud peals of thunder broke, and could scarcely be distinguished from the rumblings of the mountain, whose mouth vomited forth ignited rocks, which, hurled to more than a thousand feet, burst in the air like shells. Flashes of lightning rivaled in intensity the volcano's eruption. Towards seven in the morning the position was no longer tenable by the colonists, who accordingly took shelter in the borders of Jacamar Wood. Not only did the projectiles begin to rain around them, but the lava, overflowing the bed of Red Creek, threatened to cut off the road to the corral. The nearest rows of trees caught fire, and their sap, suddenly transformed into vapor, caused them to explode with loud reports, while others, less moist, remained unhurt in the midst of the inundation. The colonists had again taken the road to the corral. They proceeded but slowly, frequently looking back, but in consequence of the inclination of the soil, the lava gained rapidly in the east, and as its lower waves became solidified, others, at boiling heat, covered them immediately. Meanwhile the principal stream of Red Creek Valley became more and more menacing. All this portion of the forest was on fire, and enormous wreaths of smoke rolled over the trees whose trunks were already consumed by the lava. The colonists halted near the lake, about half a mile from the mouth of Red Creek. A question of life or death was now to be decided. Cyrus Harding, accustomed to the consideration of important crises, and aware that he was addressing men capable of hearing the truth, whatever it might be, then said, Either the lake will arrest the progress of the lava, and a part of the island will be preserved from utter destruction, or the stream will overrun the forests of the far west, and not a tree or plant will remain on the surface of the soil. We shall have no prospect but starvation upon these barren rocks, a death which will probably be anticipated by the explosion of the island. In that case, replied Pencroft, folding his arms and stamping his foot, What's the use of working any longer on the vessel? Pencroft, answered Cyrus Harding, we must do our duty to the last. At this instant the river of lava, after having broken a passage through the noble trees it devoured in its course, reached the borders of the lake. At this point there was an elevation of the soil which, had it been greater, might have sufficed to arrest the torrent. To work! cried Cyrus Harding. The engineer's thought was at once understood. It might be possible to dam, as it were, the torrent, and thus compel it to pour itself into the lake. The colonists hastened to the dockyard. They returned with shovels, picks, axes, 
and by means of banking the earth with the aid of fallen trees they succeeded in a few hours in raising an embankment three feet high and some hundreds of paces in length. It seemed to them, when they had finished, as if they had scarcely been working more than a few minutes. It was not a moment too soon. The liquefied substances soon after reached the bottom of the barrier. The stream of lava swelled like a river about to overflow its banks, and threatened to demolish the sole obstacle which could prevent it from overrunning the whole far west. But the dam held firm, and after a moment of terrible suspense the torrent precipitated itself into Grant Lake from a height of twenty feet. The colonists, without moving or uttering a word, breathlessly regarded this strife of the two elements. What a spectacle was this conflict between water and fire! What pen could describe the marvellous horror of the scene? What pencil could depict it? The water hissed as it evaporated by contact with the boiling lava. The vapour whirled in the air to an immeasurable height, as if the valves of an immense boiler had been suddenly opened. But however considerable might be the volume of water contained in the lake, it must eventually be absorbed, because it was not replenished, while the stream of lava, fed from an inexhaustible source, rolled on without ceasing new waves of incandescent matter. The first waves of lava which fell in the lake immediately solidified and accumulated so as to speedily to emerge from it. Upon their surface fell other waves, which in their turn became stone, but a step nearer the centre of the lake. In this manner was formed a pier which threatened to gradually fill up the lake, which could not overflow, the water displaced by the lava being evaporated. The hissing of the water rent the air with a deafening sound, and the vapour, blown by the wind, fell in rain upon the sea. The pier became longer and longer and the blocks of lava piled themselves one on another. Where formerly stretched the calm waters of the lake now appeared an enormous mass of smoking rocks, as if an upheaving of the soil had formed immense shoals. Imagine the waters of the lake aroused by a hurricane, then suddenly solidified by an intense frost, and some conception may be formed of the aspect of the lake three hours after the eruption of this irresistible torrent of lava. This time water would be vanquished by fire. Nevertheless it was a fortunate circumstance for the colonists that the effusion of lava should have been in the direction of Lake Grant. They had before them some day's respite. The plateau of Prospect Heights, Granite House, and the dockyard were for the moment preserved and these few days it was necessary to employ in planking and carefully caulking the vessel and launching her. The colonists would then take refuge on board the vessel, content to rig her after she should be afloat on the waters. With the danger of an explosion which threatened to destroy the island there could be no security on shore. The walls of Granite House, once so sure a retreat, might at any moment fall in upon them. During the six following days, from the 25th to the 30th of January, the colonists accomplished as much of the construction of their vessel as twenty men could have done. They hardly allowed themselves a moment's repose, and the glare of the flames which shot from the crater enabled them to work night and day. The flow of lava continued, but perhaps less abundantly. This was fortunate, for Lake Grant was almost entirely choked up, and if more lava should accumulate it would inevitably spread over the plateau of Prospect Heights and thence upon the beach. But if the island was thus partially protected on this side, it was not so with the western part. In fact, the second stream of lava, which had followed the valley of Falls River, a valley of great extent, the land on both sides of the creek being flat, met with no obstacle. The burning liquid had then spread through the forest of the far west, at this period of the year, when the trees were dried up by a tropical heat, the forest caught fire instantaneously, in such a manner that the conflagration extended itself both by the trunks of the trees and by their higher branches, whose interlacement favoured its progress. It even appeared that the current of flame spread more rapidly among the summits of the trees 
than the current of lava at their bases. Thus it happened that the wild animals, jaguars, wild boars, capybaras, koalas, and game of every kind, mad with terror, had fled to the banks of the Mercy and to the Tadorn Marsh, beyond the road to Port Balloon. But the colonists were too much occupied with their task to pay any attention to even the most formidable of these animals. They had abandoned Granite House, and would not even take shelter at the chimneys, but encamped under a tent near the mouth of the Mercy. Each day Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett ascended the plateau of Prospect Heights. Sometimes Herbert accompanied them, but never Pencroft, who could not bear to look upon the prospect of the island now so utterly devastated. It was, in truth, a heart-rending spectacle. All the wooded part of the island was now completely bare. One single clump of green trees raised their heads at the extremity of Serpentine Peninsula. Here and there were a few grotesque blackened and branchless stumps. The site of the devastated forest was even more barren than Tadorn Marsh. The eruption of lava had been complete. Where formerly sprang up that charming verdure, the soil was now nothing but a savage mass of volcanic tufa. In the valleys of the Falls and Mercy Rivers no drop of water now flowed towards the sea, and should Lake Grant be entirely dried up, the colonists would have no means of quenching their thirst. But fortunately the lava had spared the southern corner of the lake, containing all that remained of the drinking water of the island. Towards the northwest stood out the rugged and well-defined outlines of the sides of the volcano, like a gigantic claw hovering over the island. What a sad and fearful sight, and how painful to the colonists, who from a fertile domain covered with forest irrigated by watercourses, and enriched by the produce of their toils, found themselves, as it were, transported to a desolate rock, upon which, but for their reserves of provisions, they could not even gather the means of subsistence. "'It is enough to break one's heart,' said Gideon Spilett one day. "'Yes, Spilett,' answered the engineer. "'May God grant us the time to complete this vessel, now our sole refuge.' Do you not think, Cyrus, that the violence of the eruption has somewhat lessened? The volcano still vomits forth lava, but somewhat less abundantly, if I mistake not. It matters little, answered Cyrus Harding. The fire is still burning in the interior of the mountain, and the sea may break in at any moment. We are in the condition of passengers whose ship is devoured by a conflagration which they cannot extinguish and who know that sooner or later the flames must reach the powder magazine. To work, spell it, to work, and let us not lose an hour. During eight days more, that is to say until the 7th of February, the lava continued to flow, but the eruption was confined within the previous limits. Cyrus Harding feared above all lest the liquefied matter should overflow the shore, for in that event the dockyard could not escape. Moreover, about this time the colonists felt in the frame of the island vibrations which alarmed them to the highest degree. It was the 20th of February. Yet another month must elapse before the vessel would be ready for sea. Would the island hold together till then? The intention of Pencroft and Cyrus Harding was to launch the vessel as soon as the hull should be complete. The deck, the upper works, the interior woodwork and the rigging might be finished afterwards, but the essential point was that the colonists should have an assured refuge away from the island. Perhaps it might be even better to conduct the vessel to Port Balloon, that is to say, as far as possible from the centre of eruption, for at the mouth of the Mercy, between the islet and the wall of granite, it would run the risk of being crushed in the event of any convulsion. All the exertions of the voyagers were therefore concentrated upon the completion of the hull. Thus the 3rd of March arrived, and they might calculate upon launching the vessel in ten days. Hope revived in the hearts of the colonists, who had, in this fourth year of their sojourn on Lincoln Island, suffered so many trials. Even Pencroft lost in some measure 
the sombre taciturnity occasioned by the devastation and ruin of his domain. His hopes, it is true, were concentrated upon his vessel. "'We shall finish it,' he said to the engineer. "'We shall finish it, Captain, and it is time, for the season is advancing, and the equinox will soon be here. Well, if necessary, we must put into Tabor Island to spend the winter. But think of Tabor Island after Lincoln Island. Ah, how unfortunate! Who could have believed it possible? Let us get on, was the engineer's invariable reply. And they worked away without losing a moment. Master, asked Neb a few days later, do you think all this could have happened if Captain Nemo had been still alive? Certainly, Neb, answered Cyrus Harding. I, for one, don't believe it, whispered Pencroft to Neb. Nor I, answered Neb seriously. During the first week of March, appearances again became menacing. Thousands of threads, like glass, formed of fluid lava, fell like rain upon the island. The crater was again boiling with lava which overflowed the back of the volcano. The torrent flowed along the surface of the hardened tufa, and destroyed the few meagre skeletons of trees which had withstood the first eruption. The stream, flowing this time towards the southwest shore of Lake Grant, stretched beyond Creek Glycerin, and invaded the plateau of Prospect Heights. This last blow to the work of the colonists was terrible. The mill, the buildings of the inner court, the stables, were all destroyed. The affrighted poultry fled in all directions. Top and Jupe showed signs of the greatest alarm, as if their instinct warned them of an impending catastrophe. A large number of the animals of the island had perished in the first eruption. Those which survived found no refuge but Tadorn Marsh, save a few to which the plateau of Prospect Heights afforded asylum. But even this last retreat was now closed to them, and the lava torrent, flowing over the edge of the granite wall, began to pour down upon the beach its cataracts of fire. The sublime horror of this spectacle passed all description. During the night it could only be compared to a Niagara of molten fluid, with its incandescent vapors above and its boiling masses below. The colonists were driven to their last entrenchment, and although the upper seams of the vessel were not yet caulked, they decided to launch her at once. Pencroft and Ayrton therefore set about the necessary preparations for the launching, which was to take place the morning of the next day, the ninth of March. But during the night of the 8th an enormous column of vapor escaping from the crater rose with frightful explosions to a height of more than three thousand feet. The wall of Dakar Grotto had evidently given way under the pressure of gases, and the sea, rushing through the central shaft into the igneous gulf, was at once converted into vapor. But the crater could not afford a sufficient outlet for this vapor. An explosion, which might have been heard at a distance of a hundred miles, shook the air. Fragments of mountains fell into the Pacific, and in a few minutes the ocean rolled over the spot where Lincoln Island once stood. End of chapter